A Maiden's Unwanted Heroic Tale, Volume 6, The One Who Pierced Through, by Hifumi Shiguro, translated by Snowcat at Innovel Translation, audiobook by Masquerade at Masquerade Audiobooks, Chapter 114, A Nightmarish Ceremony, Forged Stone Shining in the Sun Albanaria, the White Capital. A grand festival was being held in the royal capital. Half a month had passed since the struggle over the right to the throne, and today was the throne succession ceremony of Her Majesty Queen Alberin. The young princess, who had crushed the evil royal prince who was trying to usurp the throne, and the warrior who protected her the voices of praise for Christ and resounded in the royal capital. A throne set up on top of an extraordinarily large and luxurious carriage. Sitting there was a young girl dressed in the same white as the royal capital Crescenta Fana Vera Alberin. Her golden hair shone red in the sunlight, and her appearance was that of a goddess, even at such a young age. The people of the royal city saw the princess they had heard so much about, and all praised her beauty. It was said that it was the new queen's will to show her true face without a veil. She wanted her reign to be closer to her people, and to lead them to happiness as the blood of the same kingdom flows through their veins that's why she didn't hide her face with a veil and showed her true face as a fellow human being. The appearance of Crescenta was different from the previous kings, and there was a sense of intimacy. She smiled softly and prettily and waved her hands from side to side. A king is a lineage of a god. The king and the people do not touch each other, nor does the king smile at the people. The king was above the clouds to be revered. In spite of that, everyone thought that the figure of the young and beautiful queen who smiled at them was that she was truly trying to go beyond her position and give her heart to the people. There were other differences from the usual ceremony. On the same carriage as the young queen, a silver-haired girl stood diagonally to her left. The girl who stood in the carriage where the king should be alone wore a white dress with black lines and red roses on her chest, and she looked restless as she put her hand on her stomach and looked from side to side. The petite girl's beauty was tranquil compared to the queen, with her flowery smile. However, her beauty was no less than that of the queen. She looked like a grown-up version of the two young queen. The people whispered to each other who she was. What they eventually came up with was a rumor that had been heard during the civil war. Chrische, the cursed child the princess who was erased from the genealogy. A peerless swordsman who led a young princess to victory, and a monster who took countless heads and defeated the Black Lion, the royal Prince Gildenstein. Comparing her beauty to that of the princess, one would have thought that she was indeed a princess. Saying they were sisters, that's certainly true, because their faces were identical. That was cursed child everyone was surprised at that, but she was simply beautiful in her dress. She was a maiden like a fairy, the exact opposite of what they had heard. Considering the image of a giant woman over six shaku tall and a monster with a strong arm, they couldn't help but say that it was a letdown, and most of them were fascinated by her beauty. She seemed to be an unfortunate princess who was just caught in the middle of the palace's internal turmoil. The man with the featureless face whispered something like that to those who are concerned about her. I see, I see. The people took his words seriously and nodded. The reputation of the royal prince was terrible to begin with, and there was nothing evil in the appearance of the two who were called the cursed child. When put that way, it made sense. From the beginning, Things in the royal palace there were many things that people in the lower ranks didn't understand. Some of them were even indignant that they were called cursed childs. In the line of people, such well-informed people appeared here and there, whispering to those who was confused. You heard it too. I knew it was strange. Later in the tavern, as they talk and talk about the ceremony, they will accept the new rumor as the truth. People like to accept the stories, tale, they like as the truth. The story of the exiled princess who stood up and took up the sword for her sister, whom she had reunited with after being chased out of the royal palace. Together, the two princesses joined hands and, despite the loss of their hero Christund, became the new heroes of salvation themselves, defeating the great evil Gildenstein. The question of whether Chris J had in truth taken credit for what she was said to have done in was a trivial matter. Having lost their hero Bogan Christ and they just kept on cheering, hoping to welcome a new hero. Thus the heroic epic that a maiden wanted bore fruit in this way. In front of the two princesses are two generals, Selene Christand and Nozan Vereich, both wearing beautiful armor. 
Behind the line are the gallant figures of the corps commanders. They follow behind them, showing that the kingdom's military might has not been lost. Having won their victory through military prowess and righteousness, they head toward the royal castle with praises. Even as they passed by, the city was still enveloped in an unending stream of cheers. A few koku before. I told you, it's black. You really don't understand. Today is white. You. Celine held her anger at the scene and held the black dress in front of her. Berry faced her gaze head on and held the white dress in front of her. Chris Che and Chris Genta stand between them. And there was Anne and Elvina who were rushing back and forth. The dress war that has been going on since last night, it is still going on even now. Chris J enjoyed a pre-breakfast before eating, picking up leftovers from the previous night. After returning from the battlefield, Chris's daily life was in a state of degradation, and she was enjoying her days while flirting with Berry. She ate between meals and ate five times a day. She bathed and washed with Berry. When the sun went down, they would go to bed and get a good night's sleep together. The happy life that had just returned was short-lived the tragedy that struck Chris J in the estate given to her by the royal family crushed it all. As if it's a routine, not only was breakfast skipped today, but also the pre-breakfast, and she is holding her stomach in hunger. Today is also an unveiling day. Anyway, Chris J is a core commander, and on top of that, she's a warrior with more feats than anyone else. I even agreed to let her wear a dress instead of armor, and now you still want to be selfish. Today is an important day that will determine the people's impression of Krishsama. Being called a cursed child, in order to correct such evaluation, it is natural to think that white is better than black because it shows integrity and innocence. I'm telling you, that will overlap with Kriskenta. Look, it will be all white. Celine pointed a finger at Kriskenta. Kriskenta was also Kriskenta, she was suffering the same pain as Chris J. Yesterday, after a hard day of political work, they were having dinner and even then, she sensed a turbulent atmosphere. Berry smiled and invited her to take a bath together with Chris J, and just when she thought she was being strangely kind to her, she was dragged into this dispute. Chris Genta had been dressed in a dress since early this morning. She has completed her preliminary handwork and is free from paperwork today. Today was a busy day with the coronation, parade, and victory ceremony all taking place on the same day, so she was free from such chores and plans to carry out her long plan spending the ceremony alone with one Isama operation however that plan was thrown out of order. In addition to her own hunger, Chris J was like a stone statue waiting for the storm to pass, not even looking at Chris Genta. Chris Genta's spending the ceremony alone with one Isama operation had already failed. Last night, Chris Genta said that it would be nice to match. Isn't that so? I I said that, but. Certainly Chris Genta said that. Yesterday, in the bathroom. The reason she was pleasing Chris Genta was to get her words. Barry was a cunning woman. Then it is settled, isn't it? Your Royal Highness no, Her Majesty the Queen desired it, so today it will be matching. That's how you're cheating. I've known it since before, but you're too cowardly. If you're a servant of Christ and, why don't you face me fair and square? Bang, Celine hit the desk. Ha, huh, Berry shook her head. To think Oju-sama would call me cowardly. So when troubled, Oju-sama criticizes other personalities hum. Oju-sama hasn't changed since you were young. I've seen you since I was little, but I'm exasperated. How about growing up a little? Why don't you do something about your condescending attitude? Geez, it doesn't matter which one. It's silly to think about the color of the dress the hunger and the pointless arguments. Therefore, the third force, Kriskenta Alberin, queen from today, very great, who has exhausted her patience decided to enter anew. The I don't care, I want my breakfast as soon as possible alliance includes the center of the agenda, Chris J. Christand, ex-royalty, quite noble, who is reluctant to be a part of the group. The center of the agenda, Chris Christand, ex-royalty, rather noble, expressed passive participation, or rather, stared at her little sister with eyes of expectation. Ridiculous. It's even more ridiculous that you can't even put up with one breakfast. Are you still the queen if you can't stand it just because you're hungry? I I never said I was hungry. No. Then it's fine. Hey, you. However, the I don't care, 
I want my breakfast as soon as possible was dismissed by Celine Christand, daughter of a hero. General, the leader of the Christche dress should be Black Council, one member, only the chairman. The alliance rapidly loses momentum due to the lack of a cause, and Chris J hopes along with the alliance, which she had expressed passive participation, were also devastated. No, it's certainly ridiculous. However, the one who extended a helping hand to such a third power was Berry Argon, servant. The leader of cute dresses are the best for Krishsama, assertive fundamentalism. At Berry's words, Krish's cheeks broke into a smile as if she were looking at God. Kriskentasama has already expressed her hope that white is better. Her Majesty's awe-inspiring words, there is no such thing taking it back, and it can be said that the conclusion of this discussion has already been decided. However, heresy. Krish's god was steeped in self-interest. You, so how many times do I have to tell you how cowardly that is? You are the one who is being obstinate with what has been decided, Ojusama. Even if it were a majority vote, the white side would win by two to one. Naturally, the discussion became extremely chaotic, and couldn't even interject because of her previous blunder and watched the progress, and Elvina was terrified by the content of their remarks, which did not even consider the queen to be the queen. A servant. Berry, who is supposed to be the lowest rank among them, always takes the initiative and takes control of the situation. She was shown the extreme of hypocritical courtesy, she even wondered if the soft appearance when she interacted with her for the past few days was a lie. The superhuman she imagined based on what she heard from Chris J was there. Then, the sound of knocking rang out. When and asked who it was, it was Galen who appeared. Her Majesty the Queen, please excuse me. Why yeah? Galen frowned as he felt the unusual atmosphere that had been drifting from before entering the room. Celine, Berry, what are you doing? We're in the middle of choosing a dress, Galansama. We've been arguing since last night. The tired Kriskenta said that, and then whispered in his ear to supplement. Though he couldn't grasp the situation from that, Galen understood that it seemed that they were arguing over the color of the dress worn by Chris J, whether it was white or black. I see. I don't know, but she's a big deal for a noble woman. Which one does Chris J want? Oh, Jasama. Chris J, ah. Uh. Chris J. Chris Sama. The old man couldn't read the air. Feeling their eyes on her, Chris J shook her head hurriedly. Chris J didn't want to be the brunt of this endless debate anymore. Ha ha. Well, Chris J is not really interested in it, right? I don't mind. Gao Len withdrew easily. If the old man thinks that Chris J is interested in dressing up, it's not the old man who dotes on his grandchild, or not. That said, time is limited. There's a reason for both, and both can't back down. There's a good way to do it in times like this. What's the best way? It's a coin. In most cases, we decided on head or tail. Oh, that's a good idea. Berry clapped her hands happily, took out a coin, and placed it on her thumb. Celine frowned. A vivid flow Berry, who had the upper hand, suddenly surrendered to luck. Is such a thing possible? No, it's not. Now, Ojusama, head or tail. Wait, I have a bad feeling about this. You're so skillful, I feel like you're capable of manipulating both sides at will. Ojusama sure doubts me. Of course. Celine glared at Berry, who sighed quietly and dropped her shoulders. Saying guess can't help it, she flipped the coin. With a very precise trajectory, the coin lands in Celine's hand. It was a very brilliant handling of the coin. I knew it. I thought it was strange. I will flip the coin. When I catch the coin, you will declare whether it is heads or tails. What do you think? Yes, let's decide with that. Berry's appearance as if she had given up Celine was relieved. For the time being, the situation would have been restored to 50-50. All that was left was luck and a fair fight. Serene handed the dress she was holding to Crescenta, who was standing next to her. Taking a deep breath, she prayed to God for victory, stared at Berry, and flicked the coin vigorously with all the strength she could muster in her fingertips. But at that moment, I thought if it's Ojusama, you would say that. Hum. The look of disappointment fades from Berry's face, and her eyes filled with triumph. Her gaze was on the spinning coin, catching its exact turn and trajectory. With ruthless ease, 
The coin landed on the back of Serene's left hand, and she covered it with her right hand as a conditioned reflex. But it was too late. Everything was too late. As if to indicate this, Berry smiled. Head. Fufu, I've mastered most of the games that can be played without going outside. It was a mistake. Ojusama should have had the one who flipped the coin and Ojusama the one who guessed head or tail. But Ojusama, who doubted me, chose to flip the coin herself. Now, go ahead, head or tail. As she said that, Berry handed Krishje the white dress. Okay, Krishsama, here is today's dress. She was sure of the coin on Selene's hand before it was even opened. A sense of defeat arose and the word coward came out. Kriskenta, who was watching the situation as if she really didn't care either way from the bottom of her heart, asked Galen. Um, more importantly, Galensama, what do you need here? Ah, I want to check the placement and route again. Just to make extra sure I'd like Her Majesty to join us and have Chris J and Celine take a look at it. While receiving the white dress from Berry, Chris J stiffened at the words she heard. Chapter 115, The Queen and Alberinia. The Queen's coronation ceremony continued while listening to the civil official's long, drawn-out, flowery words. After finishing the ceremony, there was a short break, and the victory ceremony began. The reason for doing it on the same day was a financial problem. Musicians, chefs, the nobles' transportation, for when a single ceremony is held, a huge amount of money will be released. If they were held together, the amount of money needed would be reduced by half, and even if it was not reduced that much, in a time where the kingdom was in a in turbulent situation, she wanted to avoid a situation where the leading nobles involved in the defense of the country gathered in one place as much as possible. The coronation the sacred ceremony to welcome the new queen. Although there were many who opposed the inclusion of another event on that day, Kriskenta insisted that her coronation was not due to her own efforts, but due to the efforts of all her subjects, and the ceremony became like this. Speaking honestly, Kriskenta would have preferred to avoid such a ceremony, but it was necessary for the sake of formality, both domestically and internationally, and if it had to be done, made it be done in the most meaningful way possible. Since the spies in the palace were not to be trusted because of their close relationship with Guildenstein, the control of the populace consisted of Eluga's personal spy organization and Dargris of Kilzaren, who pledged his allegiance to Krisje. In the parade, they spread the word Krisje as a poor princess who was forced out of the royal palace as a cursed child due to trouble within the royal palace. First impressions mattered more than anything else. Dressed in her finery, Chris J was more than good-looking enough to be a princess. At the very least, she did not look like an evil cursed child, so it was easy to make that kind of impression. And once she made an impression like that and made them think, that's a cursed child, even if a groundless rumor that she is a cursed child is spread again, the people will not accept it. Guildenstein had already spread the rumor once. Inevitably, the second time would have less effect. On top of that, Kriskenta wanted to restore Chris J to the rightful royal family and make her a queen, decoration only. She would be able to enhance her own reputation as a princess who did not desire, political, power and who supported her sister through righteousness, and she also would be able to move around more easily both politically and diplomatically. She would also be able to spend more time with her sister. Although there were advantages in many ways, becoming a queen would also mean that Chris's freedom would be restricted, and she would not be able to fully utilize her power. And there was also the problem of Krish's personality. Kriskenta should be the one to handle such troublesome matters. That's what Kriskenta said from the beginning, and Chris J has her own job to do. Even as she had anticipated Kriskenta's offer, it was quickly turned down. Cooking and doing housework with Berry, and military service. Chris J had no desire for power in her head, and spending time with Berry was her number one priority. The angry Kriskenta was soothed with three cookies and two pets on the head, and in the end she gave up. Still, the idea that Chris J should have some degree of political power was still present in Kriskenta's mind. She was young, of course, but she also had an extraordinary record of success that cannot be compared to anyone else. As far as she had heard, her popularity as a commander may be a problem, but she had the power to overturn even a strategic disadvantage all by herself. She should be placed in a special position, separate from other generals, 
and should have the power to eliminate problems that may arise when she tries to create something new based on her own ideas. The position of the army's supreme commander is highly problematic considering Krish's character. A position without her losing her freedom, without being bound, yet in a position of power, the right-hand man and advisor of Queen Kriskenta. Kriskenta decided to establish such a standing position. A great white hall with countless towering pillars. In the center of it, on the crimson carpet, the commanders who played an active role in this war were lined up, and on the side were the civil official nobles who were in charge of government affairs and the musicians. In front of the carpet was a small staircase and a throne, and seated on it was the young Queen Kriskenta. Please open your eyes. She began by speaking about the people and nobles lost in the civil war, followed by a moment of silent prayer. Breaking the silence, Kreskenta commanded in a sweet and somewhat cloying voice. The dead are mingled with the kingdom's blood, and we will carry on their will. Despite many sorrows, we must not just look toward the past and stay still. We must look to the bright future of the kingdom. From her appearance, Kreskenta showed an unimaginable calmness. She received a lot of stares, but she didn't show even the slightest hint of tension. From the moment she sat down on the throne, she was already a queen. As if boasting of centuries-long reign, she presented herself with dignity. From now on, it will be time to honor those who have served with distinction in this war. But first, I have something to tell all of you here. It's about my sister, Anu. She continued without paying attention to the slight buzz in the air. She had already spoken about this to the influential nobles. The original first princess who was chased away from the royal palace as a cursed child and erased from the family tree, come this way, Krishjay Rinia Kristansama. With the sound of her voice, Krishjay stood up wearing her white dress. She then walked forward and climbed the stairs and stood next to Krishenta, the place where only royalty is allowed to set foot. One of the civil officials was distraught, but was reprimanded by the other civil servants. Not a few of you know what happened to my sister. How my sister was treated and how she ended up being chased out of the royal palace. I will not say much about the failure of the royal family at this time. Royalty does not make mistakes and is an infallible existence. But Kreskenta dared to use the word failure. The previous civil war, whatever the truth is, on the surface it was a civil war triggered by the usurpation of the throne by the royal prince and was the most serious of royal family failure. Since he had already caused a failure that could not be concealed, there would be no problem to put Chris's problem in this way as well. Originally, my sister should be the one to sit on this throne as the first successor to the throne. However, in order to honor the one who picked her up and raised her, the patriotic hero and the former Margrave Christ and Bogan Christansama, as a noble of the Christ and family, she pledged the other day that she would support me as a warrior, and has relinquished the throne to me. Of course, Krishje had never said such a thing, but he kept quiet. I will proceed appropriately so Wanisama just stays silent and stands when called, and as Kraskenta wished, she stands there with the figure of a lady. After the parade, she was allowed to eat a cookie or so, but her face was somewhat sad as she endured her hunger, which fit well with the atmosphere of the occasion. She also looked like she's mourning the death of Bogan, her predecessor, the appearance is not bad. She was caught up in a foolish conspiracy that derailed her destiny. My elder sister said that. However, as a member of the royal family, as a queen, I think it is unreasonable to treat such an older sister as a mere noble and vassal. Kreskenta looked at those kneeling on the red carpet. Selene, Nozen, Kolkis, Granmeld, Eluga all of them were people who knew Krishje well and that she will also receive a conferring of decoration today. Of course, she had already spoken to them. Even if not, there is no one here who does not know of her achievements as one of the Christ and Army Corps commanders. With her natural talent and skill with the sword, although she is not much older than me, she wields a sword on the front lines, defeating countless enemy commanders, as well as those of the traitorous generals Oregon Hilkintos, Cure Marcellus, and even the usurper, my uncle Gildenstein with her own hand, and led us to victory. The number of heads of corps commanders she took directly in this war was seven, and the number of heads of battalion commanders would reach even twenty. The number of the heads of the centurions would be too absurd to even count it, and Krish's prowess in relentlessly hunting down the leaders was extraordinary. Two of the enemy general's achievements belonged to battalion commanders Begil and Nozen, 
both of which were greatly influenced by her, and one of them was the enemy's supreme commander. It was not an exaggeration to say that she had led the princess to victory, it was indeed an unquestionable fact. Even Crescenta, who believed in her sister's success, was astonished at the results. No one here would question this. Considering only military exploits and abilities, the position of supreme commander, field marshal would be appropriate. However, due to her age and her loyalty to the current Margrave Christ and Selene Sama, she said that she could not accept it. However, considering all the circumstances, it is not possible to put my older sister just to the position of a commander of an army. Therefore, along with my coronation, I have decided to establish a suitable peerage. Crescenta smiled. Krish's lips pouted slightly. Then Wanisama should be the supreme commander. Definitely. Chris J is not good at that kind of thing, so Celine should be the one to do it. Chris J has to go here and there, so Chris J should just stay in the Christ and army and... Idiot, if people even have doubt about Chris J being the field marshal then they will definitely complain that I'm too young to be a field marshal. At least General Vereich. It was the end of a long debate. Rinia, a word which represents warrior in the old language, a true knight. A one-generation title that can only be obtained through military exploits on the battlefield. Even if you look at the history books, you can say that her military deeds are unparalleled. Crescenta stood up and picked up the treasured sword leaning beside her. It was Baziria, a great sword that only the king was allowed to wield. And solemnly, Crescenta held it out to Crisje. Crisje accepted it while standing, without kneeling. She was equal to the queen, Crescenta at least, it was a sign that Crescenta would treat her as such. As mine, as the queen's sword. As a symbol of that might. As the half of me that possesses the will and power to crush foreign enemies and protect the land. Sister, Anu, will receive the title of Alberinia Heavenly Sword, the highest rank of military officer alongside that of Marshal. Knight of the Thunder Vesrinia. As Bogan had, it is a common practice to add a name to honorary titles to reward those who have achieved military feats beyond that of a regular knight, as a sign of their valor. Nicknames such as Nercrinia, which means guardian in Oregon case, and Sarkarinia, which means black lion in Gildenstein case, were often given aliases to indicate their valor. But this was not the case this time. She will serve as the kingdom's military advisor standing alongside the supreme commander the marshal. The actual authority will be the same as the marshal so far, but the highest authority holder will continue to be the marshal. It would be a position similar to that of an supreme commander. That too there was a civilian officer trying to argue, but Crescenta's purple eyes were soon turned to them. Due to Margrave Vereich's turning down the position, Margrave Christand, who has also made a great contribution to the civil war at a young age, will be appointed marshal. As an assistant, I will appoint Count Farron, who has a long military career and has performed numerous military exploits. Those kneeling on the red carpet took these words as only natural. If one was to be the marshal, the best candidate would be Nozan. However, he cannot leave the East under the current circumstances where relations with the surrounding areas are in jeopardy. Since the current civil war broke out shortly after he was posted to the East as a general, the rebuilding of the East has ended halfway and it is not possible to have someone else take over in this state. If that's the case, then it would be Celine, who was the other general. Despite her youthfulness, she has a knack for using people, and if the experienced General Eliga Farron were to assist her, he would be able to compensate for her youth and fulfill the role sufficiently. In fact, there was no one else who could be said to be suitable. The old General Felworth Keithreton was the most likely candidate, as he had originally been a general, but he had joined the side of Gildenstein and was under house arrest. Naturally, at this point in time, he could not be in a position to hold all the real power in the army as the supreme commander. From the point of view of those who fought together, the personnel affairs were justified however. This is not the case for the case for civilians and military officers lined up to the left and right, in short, those who did not participate in this civil war and just waited and watched, or even passively cooperated with Gildenstein. Selene and Nozan, who were named, had just become generals, while Eluga and Krische were originally corps commanders. Even if one could consider Krische as royalty and accept it, there was dissatisfaction with the other appointments. 
Those who had originally held the rank of central general naturally viewed the appointments as those of her own people. Crescenta looked at the situation and said, I know there are people who are dissatisfied, but I have decided this on top of acknowledging that. When she looks around with her purple-colored eyes, she can easily see it. Hostility, repulsion, suspicion. Crescenta's eyes have only captured that since she was born. Facial expressions, gestures. Without spilling such subtle emotions, she identifies the individual and takes it into her head as information. Eventually, it was to get rid of them. Crescenta does not tolerate those who directed their malice at her. The uprising. I have had many people try to kill me, and in the process, I lost my servant Nora, who had helped and supported me since I was born. I didn't know who to trust, nor who to ask help from. I spent my days in a situation where I didn't even know that. She cast her eyes down. So she looked sad. If that will make them drop their guard, she will play the weak. And even bow down. Crescenta doesn't hesitate or feel guilty about deceiving people like that. Everything is the result of my lack of capability, I'm not going to use my age as an excuse. However, I didn't know much about everyone who served me, and I became frightened and terrified, and as a result, I ran away from the royal palace. And, I was saved by the previous Margrave Christand. With the help of my sister and many people, I was able to return like this, but even now, she wiped away the tears that had welled up and looked up. A princess who was frail and young, but had a strong will. She should look like that. Just for a little bit, I'd like to ask for your patience. Who is this person, what does he excel at, and how should he be treated? Time to find that out. I am aware that it may be seen as a blatant intentional choice from those who have sided with me in this battle but please, please forgive my immaturity. Crescenta continues. I ask you to endure it for now. I will surely respond to your sincerity in time. I will be a king who can reciprocate. Until then please. With the face of a weak queen, she invited pity from those who saw her. Chapter 116, Ceremony Once Again. Here, Crescenta. An, eh eh. From the victory ceremony to the banquet, there was a short break. The victory ceremony was followed by a brief interlude between the victory ceremony and the banquet, during which Celine, the chairperson of the Council of Christe Dresses Black, suggested that Christe should change her dress, and for a time it looked as if the country might once again be in the throes of civil war. However, Christe Christand, who belongs to the whichever is fine just, I want to have breakfast as soon as possible alliance proposed a truce, saying that she felt sorry for Crescenta, who could not even eat properly at the dinner party, and suggested that they have a snack time. This is only for the queen, Crescenta's sake. However, there was a sophisticated scheme hidden in this proposal, if she spoiled Crescenta, the leader of the alliance, and pamper her until she's full, she would be able to go around the dinner party with Berry without any complaints later. Suggestion while leaning against Berry a cute dress is the best for Krishsama leader. Berry also agreed saying it's true that Krishkentasama will be busy after all as there's also a benefit for herself. Thus, the civil war was averted. Crescenta, who was in the middle of changing clothes, was in her underwear, sitting on Krish's lap, and she was pleased to be fed by Krishche herself. Apart from Serene, who was somewhat displeased with the situation, the scene was peaceful. Crescenta Sama, how about this one? NN, anything is fine. Glancing at the black dress Berry showed, Crescenta answered. Her body, which didn't show any growth of a woman at all, was hidden by her grown-up pale pink underwear, and Crescenta rubbed her cheek against Chris's chest. It seems that it's her true intention that she didn't care about the dress and was only focusing on being spoiled by her older sister. Crescenta sure is a spoiled kid, said Chris J putting on a big sister air while petting her head and occasionally letting out a small yawn. She woke up very early in the morning, and the ceremony was not only a little sleepy, but also not very interesting. Chris J is a little sleepy, and Berry chuckled when she saw that. Ha! Marshall. I feel heavy now. I mean, there is no other suitable person other than Celine Sama. It can't be helped. She climbed on her sleepy sister. She puts her chin on Chris's shoulder and said to Celine seated behind Chris J, who was leaning back on a chair. Having the real power in the military is the most important thing. So that when it comes to is, we can use its strength. 
In order to let everyone know that we can take such measures, I personally find it easier for Selene Sama to do various things than General Vareich. It was politics. Crescento is too young and has no track record. It is only natural that people would underestimate her. If they underestimate her, they will turn hostile. Some would try to take advantage of her. It was always violence that silenced those kind of people without question, and that violence is the military. Naturally, it was more convenient to have Selene, who has closer relations with Crescenta, than the General Nozan, when she need to exercise the power of the military. If all they wanted was to proceed peacefully, she could have put the martial position on hold and let Crisje temporarily assume its role as the Alberinia. Later, a marshal in name only would be chosen from among those who were dissatisfied with Crescenta a random suitable candidate and used as bait to establish order in the royal court. But Crescenta wants to seize power over the entire royal palace as soon as possible. Considering that she would have to resort to forceful measures to achieve this, it was more preferable to take advantage of the situation of the end of the civil war and keep the military as a whole under her under the cover of confusion. Crescenta intended to eventually replace more than half of the civilian officers. She hated wasting time and money on them. And whatever the circumstances, it is an oath I have with your name that I will repay this favor. Moving the Margrave as the leader of the nobility and the marshal to king's territory. I want to spend time with Wanisama in the safest place. At the very least, the benefits should be worth the responsibility and hard work. I know. My head just hasn't catch up yet. Ha, huh, Selene sighed. Her first battle was against the Holy Empire. In order to not bring shame as Bogan's successor, she took the first step as a military officer since then. In just half a year, she became a military officer's highest rank, Marshal. It's not just a matter of promotion. The only people who were not perplexed would be the idiots here, Chris J and Chris Genta. Chris J think it's good, but Celine is slow because she take her time to think, it's better to be in the back where she can calmly think about things. You. Shut up. I know. Celine pinched Chris J cheek from behind her and pouted. Accumulation of experience plays a large part in the ability to judge and make decisions on the fly. At present, Celine was still weak in such areas, and cannot be said to be first-rate as a frontline commander. Although her tactical and strategic thinking itself is excellent, her sense alone cannot compensate for his inexperience. She still remember being lectured by Chris J that if she couldn't kill him with fifteen men, she should have dragged more of the Black Century's member and killed Gildenstein even if it's really pushing it. Combat is always to the minimum, and on top of that, one should aim for the shortest. Chris J had a point when she said that if everything will be over by defeating Gildenstein, the highest priority should be to put all her efforts into the fight and settle it quickly. From the start, in that situation even without Chris J, just five minutes, just a little more, and with a trivial move, she might have been able to obtain victory without relying on Chris J. There were many sacrifices, and the battle left her with nothing but regrets. Even if she tried her best, the result was not the best and it was a result borne by Selene's inexperienced. Because she understood her inexperienced, she also had the feeling that she wanted to continue to study for a while, and that's why the position of Marshal, that fell on her lap suddenly, was very heavy. Regardless of how Oju-sama feels. As a servant, I am happy that Oju-sama is away from the front lines. Berry said quietly while checking the dress for any phrase. When Serene glared at her, Berry smiled wryly and shook her head. I don't know the battlefield, so I can't say anything arrogant. I don't think that Oju-sama is inexperienced, in fact, I think Oju-sama is doing the best she can. That's no consolation you know. Selene pinched Krish's cheeks muni muni. You you you, you you you, Chris J groaned. Oju-sama is stretching yourself too much. Since Oju-sama is the successor of Gatushu-sama, Oju-sama probably want to fight like Gatushu-sama, but that will surely not come true. Gatushu-sama as blessed with ingenuity, skill, and luck, running through countless battlefields for decades, continuing to demonstrate military exploits, and surviving through many crises, he was truly a hero. Berry smiled as she recalled. Is the Oju-sama intending to overthrow the various things that the head of the family has built, with a mere few years of effort? Is Oju-sama's, the Gatushu-sama respected by the officers and soldiers of Christ and, such a small goal? 
That is, of course, there may be many things to learn on the battlefield. If you don't learn it, you may not be able to surpass Gatushu-sama. But isn't that fine? Gatushu-sama and Oju-sama are two different people, and their lives and what they can learn from them are also different. Barry placed the dress on the table and gently stroked Celine's head. Celine made a frown, but did not resist. Even if the Oju-sama can't learn what Gatushu-sama has learned, there will be times when Oju-sama can learn things that Gatushu-sama was unable to learn. I think that it will be fine if someday Oju-sama can achieve something that is not inferior to the head of the family in some way. Her hands are tender and loving, just as her mother did to herself when she was a child. Barry always treats Celine like a child, especially since the position of marshal is not something that Oju-sama wishes to obtain, it should rather be seen as just a stroke of luck. I believe that Oju-sama can fulfill such a responsible role better than anyone else, so I do not feel uneasy about that. You mean to tell me that you're worried about me being on the front lines? Celine said that and Barry laughed happily. Fufu, you shouldn't look at it like that. Well, I can't say that I don't have that kind of feeling from the point of view of someone who could only wait, but it's not limited to the young lady. She moved her hand that was stroking Celine's head to Chris's, and she narrowed her eyes. Chris J mouth relaxed, and Serene removed her hands. It's my selfish desire. Please forgive me. How can you say that when you don't even feel bad about it at all, really? My, did you find out? Barry laughed mischievously and picked up Crescenta who was in her underwear. Crescenta, who had been enjoying the pleasure of being on Krish's lap, looked up at Barry and glared at her. Now, it's time for you to get dressed, Crescenta-sama. We still have a little time. Please let go. Krish-sama, once you've finished changing your clothes, let's take a little nap, shall we? Yes. Crescenta, change your clothes. Why you coward? Barry gets her dressed regardless of Crescenta's complaints. Chris J also helps with that, happily. Celine, who was staring at that scene, smiled wryly and sat down in her chair again, following in her father's footsteps. Become a worthy successor to her father. What was important to her? Celine thought about it, and just looked at them. The madder twilight streamed into the glass-enclosed large hall, and the many wonderful dishes seemed to shine in that light. Same dining format as before. Celine with Elvina, Crescenta with On, and Christche with Berry. As expected, it didn't go like before. Naturally, Celine, who had become the highest rank of military officer, and Christche who hold position equal to that, were greeted by aristocrats whose faces she didn't even know from here and there. Christche was starting to get fed up with it, but it was Eluga who came to the rescue. Ha, ah, Christche is hungry, Pico Pico. Ha ha, as one would expect it's hard to eat after becoming Her Majesty's sword. Eluga called out to the two of them under the guise of an important conversation, and he took them out to the balcony. Since Eluga had the title of assistant to the Supreme Commander there were only a few people who could interrupt him. A koku and a half after the dinner party began, Chris J was finally able to have a decent meal. Next to Eluga was a slender noblewoman Eluga's wife. Her eyes were slightly wrinkled, but she was a tall, tight-fitting beauty with elegant golden hair. Their age seems quite separated, but the way her arms are around him was harmonious, and she looked at him a few times, as if she is troubled. Oh, excuse me, I haven't introduced her yet, have I? This is my wife, Vanatella. Nice to meet you, ah. Uh -huh. Vanatella looked Eluga seemed even more troubled. As a daughter of the Christand family, it would be better to call her Krishsama. However, the head of the family is already Celine, and Chris J on her own was a great noble who has been given the title of Alberinia. It seemed inappropriate to call her that. From what she had heard, Chris J was originally the first princess, if that is the case, she felt that the appropriate way to call her would be Her Royal Highness if she were to attach her peerage she felt that it would be appropriate to call her as Grand Duchess Christand. However, she was not officially granted the status of Grand Duchess as a sibling of the King Vanatella was at a loss as to how to treat this girl. Chris J tilted her head, and Eluga also tilted his head at the state of his wife. Only Berry nodded as if she understood and told her. I have heard that Margrave Farron shares the joys and sorrows on the battlefield with Krishsama and has a relationship that transcends position. 
Please don't be reserved. I hope that Krishsama have the same relationship as before. Is that so? Pleased to meet you, Krishsama. Vanatella bowed gracefully, and Krishje responded. Finally, Eluga noticed and chuckled, feeling bad about this. I'm sorry. Krishsama is not very particular about this kind of thing. Take it easy. I would appreciate it if you had told me that first. Vanatella glanced at Eluga somewhat sullenly, then turned her gaze again to Chris J. She looked at her hair and beauty and smiled happily. I heard from my husband, but Krishsama really is beautiful. That's a nice dress, it suits you very well. Um, yes, thank you very much. Vanatelasama's dress is also very beautiful. Krish's eyes were glancing at the food she had brought to the table. When Vanatella sensed her gaze and smiled wryly, telling her not to worry, Chris J looked at Eluga and Berry as if she was a little troubled, and they both smiled as well. It looked like you couldn't even eat, so I called out Krishkama. Please don't worry about it. Hee <laughs> hee, yes. Do you want to eat too, skeleton? Ha ha ha, I'm a small eater but guess I'll have some. Vanatella stiffens at the mention of skeleton and Berry looks at her apologetically. She was embarrassed to be in Vanatella, but she was dumbfounded by the look on her husband, Shujin, head of household, face, and shook her head, giving Berry a wry smile. It seems like it's true that their relationship surpassed their position. Fufu, skeleton. Vanatella shook her shoulders in a funny way and looked at Eluga, covering her mouth. Eluga must have assumed this would happen when he brought his wife. He didn't seem to care about it in particular, as he ate the meal with Chris J with the looks of a good-natured old man, which should be called the look of an evil look of a god of death. Even though he's bothered by it care so much. Every time our son sees his face, he would cries. After coming back, I thought he is in such good mood, so this is why. Krishsama also said that he was very good to her on the battlefield. With this face, I wasn't worried about cheating, but I'm convinced. He might look like this but he like children are, no, it's rude to say that. No, Fufu, Krishsama is that kind of person. When she smiled wryly, Vanatella returned her smile and stared at Berry's face. Could it be, Lazurasama's? Ah, yes. Sorry for the delay, let me introduce myself, I'm G.R. younger sister, Berry Argan. I see. No wonder I thought you two looked alike. I've met Lazurasama several times, and we've been on good terms with each other, but both Shaw sisters are all beautiful, aren't they? No. Berry shook her head, troubled, and Vanatella approached her face with concern. I don't know if this is the right thing to say at a celebration, but I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. It was a painful thing, but I've sorted out my mind. I'm glad to hear that but please don't take it too hard. Please rely on me at any time. I've heard a lot about Berisama from Lazurasama, so I can't think about it as just someone else's problem. Vanatella grabs Berry by the shoulder and looked at her face. I've heard about you from Lazurasama, but it's such a shame that such a beautiful woman is only a servant. What do you think? Are you interested in a marriage proposal? Hmm, that. She was small in stature with large brown eyes framed by long lashes, which made her look very young. However, her face was very well-groomed, and her gestures and facial expressions were calm and somewhat mature. That gap was attractive. Berry has an indescribable charm. She is a talented person who can't be left alone for Vanatella, who has been a matchmaker for many people Vanatella brings her face closer. Even like this I have many connection. I'm sure I'll find someone who fits Berisama's preference. If it's someone as young and beautiful as Berisama, you will surely be popular. Please leave it to me. Hmm, I'm not that young. I'll already be thirty soon. Even though Berry answered with a troubled look, she brought her face even closer. I was thirty-five when I became my husband's, Shujin, wife. Berisama is still quite young. Don't worry. Ha, ha. Berry takes a step back and leans back slightly. Vanatella stepped further. This is a bad habit, Vanatella. Stop it. It was Eluga who stopped her. Vanatella glares at Aruga, and she sighs as she puts her hands on her hips, saying even though we're having fun. Really, how troubling. Why don't you calm down a little? I think it's a great loss for someone like Berry to be single. Though you might not understand it. 
It's just your hobby, right? I apologize for my wife. And no, Vanatella asked Berry, who had a wry smile on her face. But are you really not interested in marriage proposals? I'm not lying in what I said, though I think Berisama would have a lot to choose from. That's, um. Berry lets her gaze wander to Chris J, who has been watching events unfold as her cheeks puff up with food. When Chris J noticed her gaze, she staggered over to Berry, entwined her arms and loosened her cheeks. Berry will be together with Chris J forever, so she won't get married. Right, Berry. Fufu, yes. Berry smiled happily and she caressed Chris's cheek lovingly. Chris J happily pressed her body in Berry's arms and squinted her eyes. I am content with my present life in Christand, so I have no connection with such things. I am sorry for your concern. When Berry bowed, Vanatella looked at Chris J and Berry. I see, it seems that it was unnecessary concern. She nodded as if she was convinced by something. Chapter 117, Place to Return to The underground laboratory of the royal palace looked a bit like a large warehouse, with countless books on the shelves. There were countless books on the shelves, metal rods of unknown use, and piles of magic crystals placed here and there. Elvina finished sorting the piles of magic crystals and duplicate it then turned her attention to her master. Krishsama, I finished with the whole process but… Is that so? How many did you make? Twelve. If you include the ones from the other day, that makes fifty-six. When the finished magic crystal is packed in a dedicated box, Chris J crossed her arms and turned to the object in front of her. There was a doll made of a metal rod and a birdcage lying on the table. It had four limbs and a head as if it were a simplified human body, and each joint of the four limbs had a total of twenty-four magic crystals. There was one large magic crystal in the birdcage-like body and another in the head cage. Each joint was connected by a chain, giving the figure the appearance of a poorly made model. The seven shaku frame looked creepy, and the cold blue glow of the magic crystal was chilling. That. Krishsama. It seems that minimal movements can be done. Will it move? It moves. Chris J gets on the small pedestal. She puts her finger on the fuselage the magical crystal of the heart on the table. Blue light shines through each magic crystals as if propagated by the magic power sent from her fingertips. Clank, clank, the sound of the chain echoes. The doll rose and stood up. The body of the seven shaku is likely to hit the ceiling in this basement, and Elvina braces herself a little at the sight of something non-human moving in front of her. Clinging to its metallic body were imaginary muscles formed by blue magic. Though its body was thin, there was a strange sense of intimidation. The doll moved one hand of its hand to the front and put it on its chest. It makes a saluting motion. After all, the joints of the legs and arms shouldn't be chains, it is better to connect it properly to some extent. The loss of magic power is great. Chris J narrowed her eyes and looked at the doll's limbs. The doll walked around the table in a circle. Clank, clank, every time it walked, the chain, metal, and the sound of the floor echoed. It is something that will never be injured and will never die. It was an iron soldier that will continue to fight as long as it had magic power. There is still some problems when it comes to fighting, but it moves properly, right? It moves, yes. When finished, this strange doll would kill her on the battlefield with sword, axe, and spear. A weapon for murder the bizarreness of what the girl was making in between her free time of household chores gave Elvina an indescribable chill. It had been less than a week since they had begun work on it. But it was already taking shape. Imaginary muscles created and worn by possessor of magic power. Its deployment and processing were replaced by the magic crystal, which become the flesh and blood that moves a metal dolls that do not speak. The formula engraved on the magic crystal was elaborate. It is inscribed with a complex formula that is beyond Elvina's comprehension, and she didn't even know what was functioning what. This doll was made of something that she could understand logically, theory, reason, but couldn't comprehend. If we want to imitate the human body, it may be better to distribute the load with two bones that are thinner than one. In particular, Considering that its feet are heavier than humans, it seems better to expand the ground area a little more. It seems like it would be stuck in the ground. Chris J took a piece of parchment and writes down the information on her mind. She did not use any kind of measurement, 
but her drawing was precise and accurate to the last detail. The orders for its parts were dispersed among multiple craftsmen. This was partly to prevent information leakage, but more importantly, it was simply more efficient to distribute the orders. After a while, the doll returns to the stand, and when it lies down again, it stops. Silence reigned once again, as if nothing had happened. Any problems with the duplication crystal? Ah, yes, depending on the quality of the magic crystal the result will be a little weird, but if you use it for magical measurement, there is probably no problem. I've tried to fine-tune the ones that I can fix, but I'm not sure if I'm getting it right. Which one? These three. When Elvina handed it to her, Chris J nodded and returned it with a glance. It's enough. Let's finish with what we made now. Yes. Elvina, can you deliver this? That's the end of Elvina's work. Hmm, Elvina can go home and rest for three days. Are you sure? Yes, it's a reward because Elvina did her best. It's dangerous, so please take an escort. Elvina bowed her head happily. I'll probably be at home, if Krishsama need anything please just call me. Chris J doesn't think there will be anything, but Chris J will let you know if there's anything. Please have a good night's rest. One of the small estates in the royal territory used as a place to prepare for guests was given directly to Christ and family and had become the Christ and estate come the princess's bedchamber. Although it is somewhat smaller than the original Christ and estate, there are at most six of them staying there, including Elvina, who often goes back to Kalua and Mia's house outside the royal domain. The small estate was more than enough space for all six of them. Chris J, Chris Genta, and Berry sometimes use the same room, and even considering guest rooms you could say there was too much excess room. Ahahi, today was a critical pumpkin pie. The pumpkin is better in the royal capital. Yes, all the foods are all good, shopping is fun, though sometimes it feels lonely. As usual, Chris J was on Berry's lap on the sofa. The two of them, after taking a hot bath, were dressed in negligee as usual the distance between them had long since disappeared, and they were in no condition for outsider to see. The texture of the fabric, which reveals a thin layer of skin, was lascivious, and Chris J, wrapped in a blanket draped over Berry's shoulders, occasionally changes position to bury her face in her chest, hugging and kissing her. The two of them were alone in the decadent space, and the civil war, which has been over for less than a month, was a distant memory. The only word to describe Chris J when she was in her room was depravity. When she woke up, she had a pre-breakfast consisting of last night's leftovers and prepares breakfast. After finishing breakfast and cleaning up, she heads to the royal castle with her lunchbox, where she does some work, comes back during snack time to help with cleaning, then cooks dinner, eats it, and then takes a bath with and gets a good night's sleep with Berry. Chris J life cycle was like that and her schedule was set up so that she spends as much time as possible with Berry. Compared to Celine and Crescenta, who were busy with paperwork and political affairs after dinner, Krish's appearance was more depraved, but the reason for this was the meeting with neighboring countries scheduled for the next month. The meeting was to be held under the guise of unveiling the new queen, it is a regular event that is held every time the king changed. The kingdom of Anna in the north is a given, but the Elderland kingdom in the west, the Galshan Republic in the south, and the Holy Els Ren Empire, which had only recently recovered from the recent war, have also been invited to attend the meeting, and letters have been received from each country stating that they will participate. Although only the Holy Empire of Els Ren has yet to reply, it would be diplomatically difficult to attack the kingdom now as long as the other three countries have expressed their participation. The kingdom had at least two months of peace. Despite the kingdom's exhaustion, the possibility of an invasion at this time of year, when winter was about to begin, was not high to begin with, but now that the seeds of such an invasion had been completely squashed, time could be devoted to repairing the country. The reason why Crescenta was the first to present herself to the neighboring countries after she became queen was for this purpose, and the attempt was going well. Oh, that's right. Chris J gets off of Berry and pulled out some magic crystals from her bag. She then placed them on the table, picked one up, and showed it to Berry. This is. It's a duplication magic crystal Chris J made as a trial. It seemed practical enough, so Chris J thought to give one to Berry. Duplication. Berry, who did not seem to understand what it was, picked it up and looked at the formula engraved inside. 
Inside the crystal were countless lines forming a geometric three-dimensional pattern. The only thing that can be read at a glance was that this was a formula that affects something else, and she could only understand that it was a very sophisticated formula. It's okay to duplicate the everlasting magic light, right? Elvin held up one of the magic crystals bringing it closer to an everlasting magic lamp. Attach it to the lamp and let the magic flow through it. Like this. The magic crystal in her hand was placed against the lamp in Chris J hand, and magic power is poured into it. The duplication magic crystal in the palm of Berry shone, and a small new formula was engraved inside. It was a simple formula for the everlasting magic lamp, which only emits light. So it can remember the formula of the everlasting magic lamp, and the same procedure was used to make a new magic crystal. Then, Chris J held a new blank magic crystal. She pressed it against Berry's magic crystal and looked at her. Berry understood the intention and poured magic power into it. I see. In no time at all, the formula for the everlasting magic lamp was engraved on the blank magic crystal. It is a magical crystal that temporarily store a formula and then write it. Elvina has been named a duplication crystal, so Chris J call it that for now. Duplication crystal. This time is a simple everlasting magic lamp, but Chris J think it's quite convenient because it can be used for more complex ones. It is not that difficult to carve a new formula into a magic crystal. If it is a simple one like everlasting magic lamp, Berry can made it from scratch. However, this was kind of like making a sculpture using magic power. The more advanced it becomes, the more difficult it becomes, requiring the help of a magician or sorcerer who specialized in that field. It was can't just be described with a single word, convenient. It's amazing, this is. The first thing that comes to Berry's mind was the magic of the past and she frowned. Chris J was always a few steps ahead of the time. She is talented but her idea was always one generation ahead. Don't worry. Chris J give this only to Berry. Hum. It is designed to react to the magic power that is poured into it for the first time and engrave it inside a special formula. The replica crystal is not designed to work well for anyone other than Berry, and aside from Elvina, who uses it for her work, Chris J and Berry are the only ones who have it. Chris J smiled as she sat on Berry's lap. Chris J can actually make it easier, but Chris J thought about it and made it that way. If it's this way, Chris J thought Berry will not mind it. Is that so? Berry also smiled and gently stroked her head. Once memorized, the formula can also be erased by magic, Chris J made so only Berry can know how to erase it too. She waved her fingertips to draw a formula in the air and combined it with the formula of the duplication crystal. The combined effect is that the everlasting magic lamp formula engraved inside disappears. It is not that difficult. After watching and memorizing it, Berry asked. That, can I really not help? She had heard that Chris J was making something together with Elvina using magic crystal. Berry taught Elvina about the elementary magical crystal knowledge instead of the explanation from Chris J, which is too difficult and intuitive. It was certainly not because she wouldn't be able to help. However, Chris J chose Elvina, not Berry, as her assistant. Berry was busy with the estate. She knew Chris J was being considerate of her. Now that Ansama is here, the mansion is also smaller than before. If Krishsama needs help, I, can I help you? There was something in her heart that she couldn't understand, and it suddenly leaked out of her mouth. Chris J looked up at Berry, lowered her eyes and hugged her. A, hey, of course, it would be best to have Berry help Chris J, but, how should Chris J put it? Chris J stammered as if at a loss for words. Stammered as if at a loss for words. Berry couldn't see her face, only her silver hair but Berry shook her head, seeing that. I'm sorry for asking such a strange question. I've heard it before. Um, it's not that Chris J doesn't like Berry or anything like that. It's okay, I understand. She looked up at Berry and shook her head, as if she wanted to say something. Then Chris J hurriedly told her that it was her selfishness. Selfishness? Chris J kills a lot of people. Chris J will also kill a lot more in the future. But because Chris J is weird, Chris J doesn't really feel sad or pained when Chris J kills people. Chris J is fine with it. But when Berry sees Chris J like that, 
Berry feels pain and sad, right? Berry opened her eyes wide and took in her words. Chris J pressed her face against her chest again, sighed and told Berry. Chris J, in the palace, is thinking up tools for war and stuff. Chris J is always thinking about how to easily win without any harm and kill a lot. Chris J is only thinking about war, killing people. That's why, um, Chris J doesn't want Berry to see that kind of Chris J, so. Krish Sama. That's why Chris J want Berry to stay at the mansion. When Chris J comes back from the castle, forgetting about it as much as possible, cooking with Berry, helping Berry, and doing things like always, um, just like before, Chris J want it that way. Berry squeezed her small body and pressed her lips to her head. There was an indescribable feeling inside her, and she just stroked the girl's head. Understood, Krish Sama. I won't ask it again. Um, um, it's not like Chris J doesn't like being asked, or anything like that um. The soft lips of the girl who raised her face. She held it with her thumb and traced it, and she smiled. I don't think so. I was the one who asked the silly question. Can you forgive me? With her lips still pressed down, Chris J nodded in embarrassment. Without accurately conveying her intention, and without any intention to convey it. But that's fine. Berry stroked her cheek and put their lips together. Chris J was not surprised, as if he had expected it, but she also relaxed as if relieved. After that, Berry hugged the girl's body for a while. Chapter 118 Black Flag Special Force and the Naked Princess, The Princess's New Clothes Outside the walls of Albanaria Rampart A large-scale training ground was built there. The barracks can be seen in the distance, and the surrounding area was a grassy plain. There, soldiers repeatedly marched in line then stop, or swung their blades at the training scarecrows. Soldiers overflowing with enthusiasm. The sky is clear. However, the cold wind was still chilly, signaling the arrival of winter. Standing there is a girl with the heavenly sword, Alberinia. There she, Chris J. Christ and showed her majestic gallant figure not. She wears a brimless hand-sewn hat up to her ears, a long white scarf wrapped around her nose, and hand-sewn gloves. She was there, with her fluffy, lumpy look, the second-ranked general from the top in the kingdom. Bald Eagle, are you sure your stomach is okay? Chris J, accompanied by Elvina, asked with a sharp, doubtful look in her eyes. Ninety percent of the pressure has been lost from what was supposed to be a glare to Chris J, her figure made those around her loosen their tension instead. Dagra laughed and slapped his stomach. Ha ha, as you can see, I'm completely healed. Liar's no good you know? Of course, I've been resting for more than a month, so I'm rather full of energy. Chris J stared at him then, nodded, and looked around her. There were quite a few members of Black Century there, but there were also some who were strange for them to be here. Some were missing one arm, one leg, or limping it didn't change that they were members of Black Century, but they were wounded soldiers who could no longer fight on the battlefield. Mia, is this all of them? Yes. The rest are still recovering or have already left the army and returned to their hometowns. Please make sure to send a letter to those who have returned home too. There's a jobs. Yes. Fortunately 46 soldiers escaped with minor injuries or at least no permanent damage. If we count only those who survived, the number would be around 70. The number of wounded soldiers here was about 15, but it could be said that the number was enough for Krish's request. The reason they were brought together was to give them their next assignment. Although they could no longer fight on the front lines, they were soldiers who could be trusted to a certain extent, and above all, they were valuable human resources who could handle magic power. Chris J didn't want just let them go like that. Although there was some affection and good intentions for them in Chris J, to not waste the cost of the training was a big aspect of it, and the reason she called them here was purely for her own benefit. Nevertheless, everyone was happy that she was willing to take care of them, who would find it difficult to do normal labor, and they looked at her happily. They had been treated as special soldiers in the past, but they felt that it was largely due to their strength in battle. However, even for those who could no longer fight, she was willing to do her best for them. Even if they got injured and could no longer go out on the battlefield, she's willing to take care of them naturally. Such reassurances led to loyalty to her and their liking and respect for Chris J deepened more and more. Among the injured, the only ones who is literate are Nugger and Zats. Anyone else? 
Yes, m- me too. And, Arjun, the one that was born in blacksmiths and craftsmen family are, Kiris and Pell, but, can you do simple crafts? Like measuring armor, that sort of thing, that kind of thing. If that's the case, I can do it even with one arm. I can do it too. Chris J nodded, and told them as though she had just come up with an idea. Neki, you are also reasonably good with your hands, right? You will also be a member of the crafts unit, just like the others. Yes, m. One hundred subordinates Chris J knew their brief profiles and special skills as if it's a matter of course. While sitting on the ground with one leg, Neki saluted happily as he was called. The crafts team will be helping Chris J to make something. Chris shall tell you ahead of time, be very careful with the information. Don't tell anyone about what you are doing, including to the Black Century, friends, and family, unless you have permission to do so. Understood. Each of them raises their voices and saluted. Chris J turned to the Black Century as well. You guys too are not to ask what the craft team is doing. In principle, this will be treated as a serious leak of information, and anyone who leaks it will be punished accordingly. The words she said contained a very serious meaning. The term serious information refers to information that could have a significant impact on military operations, tactics, etc. If it was leaked, regardless of whether it was intentional or not, the punishment would be the death penalty. Although Chris J was usually very lovely, she also had a cool-headedness that made her not think of life as a life. Because they know that, she didn't think there will be any need to be concerned about it. Later, the wounded soldiers will sort out the blacks. Last time it was urgent and Chris J had no choice but to do it, but it is not practical for Chris J to be present all the time at the recruitment so the wounded will replace Chris J. When Chris J told them, those who had not been called looked at each other. What is it? Chris J asked, and one of them opened his mouth. I know it's an honorable mission, but, for us, to determine who possesses magical power is. It's okay, Elvina. Yes. Even though Kalua, Mia, and Chris J were present here, still she was in front of soldiers. With a slightly nervous look, Elvina hands them the baskets one by one. They looked at the magic crystals and then at Chris J, puzzled. Daz, flow magic power through it and apply it to Elvina's hand. Yes, m. The one-armed soldier did as he was told and pressed the magic crystal into Elvina's hand, excuse me, then he frowned for a moment in surprise. The tingle, Pyri, it come right? Yes, m. I feel a little shock. Though we call it magic power possessors, everyone possesses a weak magic power. The difference between humans that can actually exercise it as imaginary muscles and those who can't are the amount of magical power, but Chris J doesn't think you guys can judge that. Putting aside if it was actually used as an imaginary muscle, it is difficult to sense the magical power that is hidden. Naturally, it wouldn't be impossible for a person skilled in handling magic, but only Chris J would be able to sort out hundreds of people like that. Even to Chris J it's work that need a lot of focus, of course she didn't think they could do it. That's why she created this. It is a device that notifies the bearer of a certain amount of magical power by sending a tingling, pyri pyri, reaction to the bearer. You will carry it with you during the recruiting process, and you will select the new members one by one. Chris J crossed her arms and looked around at the Black Century. Naturally, Chris J wants to replenish the reduced number of personnel, but Chris J also wants to increase the troop to 200 men by the end of winter, yo day at noon, there will be a meeting with the officer in charge of recruitment under the pretext to sort out the new recruits, and I will be there from around the day after tomorrow. Daz will be the leader, and Chris shall give you the right to appoint the assistants. After that take care of the rest to Mia appropriately, randomly. Please ask Elvina about how to use it after this. As usual Chris J threw it wholesale to others then pointed to the magic crystal. That Pyrurin has been reconfigured for the first person to use it and is made so that others won't be able to use it. However, not losing the supplies is the basic of basic as a soldier, so please don't lose the things that Chris J took the trouble to made. Pyrurin. Fufu, it's a good name right? It's Pyrurin because it's tingling, Pyrapiri. In response to Mia's stunned murmur, Chris J confidently said that, putting her hand on her waist and sticking out her chest. Kalua looked at Elvina, but Elvina shook her head as if troubled. 
Then since that one is a duplication crystal, so that this one will also be easy to understand inspection crystal. No, Chris J just got a revelation. Chris J came up with a good name. A good name, is it? Yes. Piririn. You see, your hands will feel tingly and Ktish think it's very easy to understand. See, what do you think? Chris J think it's really good, but... Elvina, too, had her own thoughts about the name given in front of her, but that did not stop Chris J. At the very least, it is certain that the various things Chris J makes are not public product. The inspection crystal the one Chris J named Piririn was also a special magic crystal that is not generally distributed, and was a special tool used to select the Black Century under her command. Then, of course, its existence should be kept secret, and in that sense, it didn't seem bad to give it a silly name that you can't imagine its use from. Although it's far from what Chris J called very easy to understand, it makes more sense to name it Piririn as a kind of cryptic word rather than an easy-to-understand name such as Inspection Crystal. Tiff that's right, it's good. I feel like it's a good name. I it sounds cute too. Right, the name just comes to Chris J. Elvina herself could not decide whether she did not want to dampen Chris who was foo-fun confident of herself or whether such rational reasons were more important, but whatever the reason. The Inspection Crystal was named Piririn, at least in Krish's mind, it had taken root. Since this cannot be completely concealed, the handling of information is different from that of the craft team, but please refrain from spreading it yourself. If other countries develop something like Piririn, our advantage will fade. Piririn team should keep this in mind. Krish Sama, that Piririn team? The one-armed soldier Daz turns a half grasping at the straw eye at the indescribable name. It's about you guys. Officially, it's the first Piririn squad of the Black Flag Special Forces Company under the direct control of Alberinia, the kingdom's central army. From now on, you will be the first Piririn squad leader, Daz. The powerful word of the first Piririn squad leader made Daz stiffen. The people who were watching looked at him with pity, and some of them burst out laughing and shook their shoulders. The former 8th squad leader man of Vela who had faced Nakuris Feliza even as he lost one of his arm, precisely because of that that the gap was so big. Ah, Chris J forgot to mention, but there are plans to augment the century, so from today onwards, we will nominally upgrade it from a century to a company. Chris J wanted to name it Blackie, Kurofuyo, Black Spot, Blackie Spotty, Company since it was a good opportunity, but Celine strongly requested it to be called Black Flag Special Force. That's what we'll call ourselves from then on. However, even those who had been laughing were chilled by the words that she said in a dissatisfied tone. If we were leave the naming rights to her, then tomorrow it would be my turn too horrifying. If it had been originally under the direct control of Alberinia of the Royal Central Army, there is a possibility that the military would have created the first Piririn squad of the Blackie Company. Everyone deepened their appreciation for Krish's older sister, the Kingdom Marshal Selene Christand. Dagra rubbed his eyes at the many words he heard after returning for the first time in a while. He everyone is delighted with the honor of being personally named by Her Excellency the Marshal. Is that so? Hmm, Blackie Company is. However, that's right, to be given names directly by Her Excellency Marshal and Krishsama is much too august, and I dare say it is an excessive reward for these people. People would think that it's favoritism. After this, if you can leave trivial things like naming the new squad to us, the reward of being given the right to name them is more than enough for these people, and that alone will boost their morale. Chem, Chem, Chris J nodded and examined the proposal. Dagra is basically a man who never says the wrong thing. In that sense, Chris J could trust him. Hmm. Bald eagles certainly have a point. Is it a problem if Chris J treats you too special? Of course. All the members of the squad are deeply grateful for Krishsama thoughtfulness. However, jealousy is everywhere. That, I think it would be better to use the name Piririn squad only within the company, and to use some random, another name, for the public. Is it no good? Chris J looked up at Dagra with puppy eyes. There was something about the sad girl's gaze that made it hard to say no. I it's not that it's no good. I, yes. I feel that it's a very wonderful name but as expected, I'm worried about the envious gazes of those around us, that's just for the sake of convenience, publicly calling it Selection Squad for example. Dagra glared at Daz. 
Daz, isn't that so? Don't you think that such a name is too much of an honor? His eyes told him to go along with his story, and Daz saluted as quickly as he could. Yes, sir. That's right, Krishsama. As something like, no, Piririn Squad, is much too wonderful. Calling it that outside, might cause the other soldiers to envy us and bear a grudge against us. As Krishsama can see, of course, that's only for publicly, we all consider it a great honor, so we do not deny Krishsama calling us that. How about it? Chris J. Scarfrapped lips pouted in discontent, but she it's not like she couldn't understand what they were saying. No. Absolutely not. Idiot. No one wants to call it Blackie Company in public. You're going to embarrass the whole kingdom. Ha, huh, let's see. Let's make it the Black Flag Special Force. It's final. Okay. Blackie Company is no good, okay? Understand? Unlike Celine, who ignored Chris J. consent or refusal, Dagra and the others repeatedly praised Krish's naming as too wonderful and too honorable. I see. They must be heartbroken too. Understanding their feelings Chris J., who thought she was doing that, nodded with a serious face even though she was dissatisfied. Understood, it can't be helped. Chris J. think that Celine's sense is a little strange after all, but to acknowledge and accept your partner's bad points is also affection. Chris J. swallowed her dissatisfaction, partly because Celine was above her in terms of the military command system. Well, anyway. Daz, the role of the Piririn team is the most important and important for the Black Flag Special Force that was worn out in the Civil War the other day. There are nine of you, so please make a proper schedule and make a serious selection. Yes, mm. As for Bald Eagle, while considering a new composition in anticipation of an increase in personnel, and train appropriately. As always, when new recruits come in, Teach them how to use magic and make them soldiers who can withstand actual battles. The personnel authority within the unit is entrusted to Bald Eagle, no permission is required. Dagra and Mia saluted, and Chris J continued. Perhaps we should give some name to the training of mana usage. Hum, Fuyo Fuyo. Krishsama, please leave that to me. I don't want to cut Krishsama's busy time with such trivial matters. And just when Chris J thought Chris J could come up with something. Well, that's fine. Phew, Chris J let out a sigh. Everyone except Chris J was the one who wanted to sigh, but of course she didn't notice. Also, as Chris J thought from the operation so far, we're a squad that tends to act alone and fight without support. Bald Eagle, Chris will arrange for the doctor to come over for a few days from tomorrow. Please make sure that the instructor trained all of you well in first aid, including the treatment for the seriously wounded. Yes, mm. Now that everyone has experienced actual combat, everyone will be more serious. I am grateful for your consideration. Well, if they were treated quickly, there would be people who wouldn't have died or lost their limbs. This company is expensive, so please be aware of that and cherish your life. Berza, please let your team take the lead in this training. Berza, the 17th squad leader who was born as a pharmacist, was mainly in charge of first aid in the company. However, in terms of knowledge, he was no match for someone who has studied medicine in the city. He should have been given a proper lecture at least once. The purpose is to raise the overall technical level, but it's a good opportunity. Learn what you can learn. Yes. This time I realized my lack of strength. 17th Squad will continue to operate as an official emergency medical team. If necessary, Please prioritize your studies over combat training. Chris J will lend you an easy-to-understand medical book later. Berza saluted Chris J nodded and looked around at the soldiers. Chris J have also read a lot, but after all injury is the most important thing in the beginning. No matter how good your skills are, you can't do anything if it's too late. It is important that everyone has some level of knowledge. Face your training with that in mind. Understood. Chris J asked, and everyone saluted. It was a nice answer. Chapter 119, Homecoming. The royal capital was roughly divided into three parts, the castle walls that surround the royal territory, the high-class residential area within the walls, which was generally called the first-class city, and the castle town that spreads out around it. Due to Elvina's work in the royal territory, they decided to rent a room in a housing complex in the first-class city because it would be problematic for her to travel back and forth between the city and the royal territory. 
Although it was a housing complex, it was in the first-class city. The building was good and the rent was reasonable, but there was also a rent subsidy given to the Black Flag Special Force on the condition that they live in the royal capital, so Kalua, Mia, and Elvina will have no financial problems renting a room together. Ahahaha, <laughs> no I mean, Yuzaja-chan is funny in many ways, but the thing that blew me away the most is her naming sense. It's no laughing matter, geez. The army I was wondering what to do when Krishsama said, okay, let's name the new unit Blackie, Kurofuyo, company. Just imagining what would have happened if the marshal hadn't stopped her when she submitted the documents gives me shivers. Mia glared at Kalua who was lying on the sofa and sighed. With a wry smile, Elvina puts the food basket she bought in the castle town on the table. Most of the items sold in the first-class city were high-end items to the three of them, so usually they went shopping in the castle town. Dagra's family, who also moved in his highly paid even in the Black Flag Special Forces, has set up a house in the castle town because the cost of living in the first-class city was higher than the rent. That said, when Elvina comes back to their house instead of staying at the estate, Chris J and Berry usually give her some ingredients to take home with her, so it was not that inconvenient for them. Elvina, do you need help? No, please rest. More than that, Nasan, do you have any injury? Don't worry, Yuzaja-chan won't injure anyone during training. For the first time in a long time, Kalua was being trained by Chris J. She was thrown and knocked over dozens of times, but the only injuries she suffered were scrapes. She didn't even have a bruise. Chris J always stopped her sword at the last minute, and even when she threw Kalua, she held back so as not to injure her. The fact that there is such a difference in ability that in itself was a fact that she didn't really want to welcome, but Kalua also didn't just lose. She learned what she needed to learn, and she was able to cope with Krish's attacks better than before. Of course, this was with Krish's holding back, but even so, she was making progress little by little. It's not okay. If you leave it alone, it might leave a mark, right? Take off your clothes. I'll apply some light medicine on it for now. I think it won't matter much having one or two more though. Kalua did as she was told, took off her clothes and exposed herself in her underwear. Her abdominal muscles could be seen slightly, her body well proportioned and supple with scars here and there, but a beautiful body nonetheless. Mia groaned and glared at her perfected physical beauty. It's a shame that such a beautiful body is treated so roughly. It's not just a scratch or two. Even though some of it can't be helped, Kalua should take a little better care of her body. Yes, yes. Geez. Mia cleaned off the dirt and dabbed some cheap spirits on the wound. It was tough and tasteless to drink, but it seemed to be the best way to get rid of the miasma, and since Dagra was injured, Chris J had strictly ordered everyone in the squad to carry a small bottle. Elvina, who was watching the situation closely, said to Mia. Later, when we wash, I'll apply the medicine to her. Is that so? Then please, Elvina, if I do it will be sloppy so. Yes. Even though Elvina nodded, she kept her eyes on Mia for a while. She stared at Mia's face for a long time, thinking about something. It was Mia who was puzzled. M. Um, Elvina, what's wrong? No, Nasan doesn't really make any specific, special, friends, so it's a little fresh. Hmm. <clears throat> Is that so? Kalua. Kalua, lying sloppily on the couch in her underwear, thinking. Hmm. <clears throat> I wonder. Well, there was no weirdo like Mia in the village. I'm not a weirdo. Mia sure doesn't know how she is, Mia smells like Yuzaja-chan. I didn't. In the village, I was called the serious and hard worker Mia you know. Elvina watched the exchange observantly, and she asked Kalua. Did both of you know each other before joining the army? No, after entering. Kalua smiled remembering it and said. I think I've told you this before, but when we formed our current unit, we didn't even know what we were going to do. It was a pretty dangerous place with mostly amateurs, with different origins and no coherence, but Mia alone acted suspicious as if she was asking to be attacked. I think the beginning was when I called out to her because it was dangerous. I didn't want to become a soldier because I liked it. I was just thinking that there might be a job for me like carrying cargo or something like that, and then suddenly I was thrown in there. She was definitely a countryside girl Mia didn't have a shred of sex appeal, but she was good-looking and could be described as naive and pretty. 
Most of the people who become soldiers are rough people. Even though the century consisted mostly of second and third sons of merchants and farmers, Mia was like a chicken that was carrying its own pot and vegetables. Dagra was a very strict man, so discipline soon set in, but even so, there were many dangerous moments. Mia was cute like a chick back then you know, she always followed me around wherever I went. Shut up. Fufu, now that I think about it, you're just like Elvina in the past. Elvina blushed and Mia glared at Kalua. Anyone would be like that, in my position. But why is Mia working outside the village R? Ah, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have asked. Elvina bowed her head in a panic. Mia looked lovely and still did her job well as a seconding command. She was a good-looking, hard-working person with a good personality, so she would be a sought-after person in the village. The reason why she had no choice but to leave the village and find a job for her she shouldn't have asked it lightly. Um, it's just a normal migrant worker, so I don't think there is such a deep reason. Migrant worker, is it? Yeah, I had a lot of families and I didn't have any kind of connection. I also didn't think it would be a good idea to stay at home all the time. Just then, it was in the middle of a big recruitment drive for the Christ and Army, so I thought there might be a lot of work available. Elvina tilted her head. She wondered if a village where someone Mia had no connection to love affairs would be a village full of beautiful women or something. If it's someone like Mia, surely there's many people who would want to take your hand. You're teasing me, aren't you? No, I'm serious, but... When she said that, Mia glared at Elvina. Elvina looked at Kalua as if she's troubled, and Kalua waved at her in exasperation. Although the form was different, Elvina's question was already a road that Kalua had gone through. Mia said, for some reason, I had a lot of guys who were really nice to me, but they were all just friends. This child is a big airhead. I'm not. And just what's with the way you say it? If you're not, you would probably still be living happily in the village. From Kalua's point of view, Mia's case was pretty serious. It looks heavy, I'll help you. It's fine, I might look like this, but I'm strong R, ah, do you want me to take that too? Mia, what do you think of me? Chem? Hmm, ah, maybe you should put on a little more muscle. After that, you should first do your own work properly rather than helping me. I want Mia to cook at my house every day. Is Obasan feeling unwell? No, no, that's not it, with me. You know, it's no good. If your aunt is having a hard time, you have to take care of her. But she's not feeling well, I have to go visit her. What does your aunt like? In this manner, Mia had unknowingly sunk countless men. In a village where people usually get married at fifteen or sixteen, Mia was already over twenty she seems to have left the village abruptly following the soldiers who came to recruit her, thinking it would not be a good idea to continue to cause trouble for her family. According to Mia herself, this was the result of considering it seriously, but those around her are probably even more deeply troubled by her decision to leave the village. Kalua's words seemed to have convinced Elvina, and she nodded her head as she looked at Mia. She had gotten a general idea of Mia's personality over the past month or so. Making a fool of me. Humph, I'm a country bumpkin after all. So quick to sulk. Well, if you had the chance to go back to the village next time, I'm sure you'd know I wasn't kidding you. But, the northern village was it? Yes. A rural village in the woods. Well, I don't think I'll have a chance to go back, it's a long way from the royal capital. Although light remittances were made through the firm, there was still a considerable distance. Mia said that she would not be able to afford to return home herself for some time. But the opportunity came unexpectedly quick. Hmm. Homecoming, is it? Yes. The Obasan who took care of Chris J in the village seems to be a little unwell. Chris J won't be able to get another chance like this for a while, so Chris J was told to go. A few days later, in a room at the training ground in a small office assigned to the Black Flag Special Forces. In addition to Dagra, Mia, and Kalua, there's a few others in the room, working on training plans, prepping for the new organization's deployment, and doing some simple paperwork. We'll probably be on snow-covered roads in the middle of the trip, so I think Killick's squad, which can do a lot of things, would be the best choice for escorting. Unless the bald waggle has a need for them, Chris J will borrow them for escort and chores. Depending on the depth of the snow, the wagons would also switch from wheels to sleds. 
Because of the abundance of snow in the winter in the kingdom, there are many carriages that are designed to use both wheels and sleds in summer and winter, but since it takes some time to replace the wheels, Killick's squad, which includes several craftsmen, is the best choice. Killick, who had accompanied the team on its recent trip to Northanna and had originally served as a caravan escort, was also somewhat familiar with the task of escorting carriages. I see, if that's the case, but how far will you go? It's Kalka, northeast from Gargain. It's a place where rock salt is mined. Kalka. It was Mia who muttered that. When Krishje tilted her head, Mia said, So Krishsama was from Kalka. I'm from Kilnan, so it's just the next village over. There is quite a distance to call it next to each other though. In terms of location, it was between Kalka and Gargain, where the Kristan's estate was located. The salt that was usually used in the village was Kalka's rock salt, and she had heard the name often, and in addition to the peddlers, the wagons from Kalka to the city would stop at Kernan on the way to the city to wholesale salt on a regular basis. Is that so? When Chris J went to Kristan's estate, Chris J stopped by briefly. Eh, hey, um, was it about two or three years ago? Hmm, that's right. Mia explores her memories. The Kalka carriage, which usually stops by twice a month back and forth, was as much a deliverer of letters and other items as it was a peddler. Every time they visited, there would be some talk of. The Kalka carriage had a girl on it today. I didn't get a good look at her because she was wearing a hood, but she looked quite beautiful. Is that so? A beautiful child. Wait, that. I don't know the circumstances, but maybe that's what it means. I heard that the village was attacked by bandits and quite a few were killed. There were also things she remembered. Mia had imagined on her own that she was an unlucky beautiful girl who lost her family and was sold to an aristocrat but perhaps, or rather, she was definitely Chris J. Later, rumors circulated that a girl who had killed a number of bandits had been kicked out of the village as an abnormal person, but no one believed them because it was too absurd, and the men in the carriage denied it saying it was an outlandish story, so they soon disappeared. But if it was Chris J, then it must have been true. Krishsama has always been Krishsama hum. Question mark. No, it's nothing. Mia said as if she was astonished. Kalua, who was watching the exchange, thought for a moment and then opened her mouth. Mia, why don't you go together? It seems that if you miss this opportunity, you will rarely have a chance to go to the north of the kingdom. Hmm, I also have a lot of things to do. No, don't worry about it. Dagra interrupted. He folded his arms and chuckled at Mia. It would be nice to at least show your face to the family back home. Originally, what we had to do was not so different from that of an ordinary century. I can go around by myself even without my adjutant. But. I told you to stop with the buts, really. While I wasn't there, you did your best in a tough battle. On top of that, you're here safe and sound with all limbs intact. This must also be some kind of fate. Dagra said and turned to face Chris J. Krishsama, if possible, please let Mia and Kalua accompany you. Yes, then Kilik's squad, Mia and Kalua, that makes it seven people, including chores it will be enough. It will probably be about a month. Yes, m. Well then, Chris J has a lot of things to do. Mia, please prepare appropriately, randomly. Chris will prepare food, so Mia's everything about the camping. Ah, yes. Chris J said so and left the room, and Mia pondered with a reluctant look. Mia, go and arrange for a carriage. I'm going to go to Killix. Ah, yes. Understood. Mia left the room with an oh well, and Kalua looked at her from behind. Commander, can I talk to you for a moment? Hum, ah. And while thinking a little, she called out to Dagra. Chapter 120 The Million Pumpkin Woman that was when the four of them were relaxing at night. Kreskenta who was, woof woofing, cun, snuggled up to Chris J, who was sitting on Berry's lap. Spooked by the visitor's knock that was too energetic, she flew and sat down on the chair next to Celine and who opened the door strangely energetic and entered the room without even waiting for their approval and said, come in, come in. It was Galen who followed her into the room with a wry smile. She was so excited that she didn't even bother to knock but no one bothered to tell Anne. Barry stood up with a wry smile and invited Galen to his seat. Obasan? Yeah, I heard she's been sick a lot lately, 
but she seems to have collapsed in the middle of field work the other day. Well, it seems it was about two weeks ago though. When Chris J asked what happened, Galen showed the letter and said that. It is quite a distance from the village of Kalka to the royal capital. It would take two weeks for the letter to reach him. I thought about going to see her, but, after all, what would make Gala the happiest is Chris J. Of course, there is the matter of Chris's work. Both Galen and Chris J have work to do in the royal capital. That said, with Celine as the marshal and Eluga as her assistant, Galen became Alberinia's Chris's adjutant, which means that half of the military's work was Galen's. Chris J had completed the paperwork related to the reorganization of the army earlier than anyone else in short, she was ready to leave everything to Keith and the others, so there was no particular work to be done in that area, and as long as Galen remained in charge of the details, there would be no problems. Galen's concern was about Chris's other work. However, there was no urgent schedule on that side either. The basics of the project had already been communicated to the craft squad, and it would take a certain amount of time to produce the parts. The work that Chris J had to do had already been done, and there would not be much of a problem if she continued after she came back. Gala-san, is. She's the one who used to take care of Chris J a lot. She taught Chris J how to bake pies, remember? The scales tilted inside Chris J, and she was a little lost. A round trip would take about a month. It was certainly not close. Although there was no problem with leaving the royal capital, there were things she could do as much as she wanted. Of course, she loved Gala, who had taken care of her ever since she was little, but was she the kind of person who she should throw away her works for? Chris J pondered it. I see. That's worrisome. Berry's vague words. Hearing that, Chris J immediately drew her conclusion. Okay. But is Celine okay? It's okay. I'm busy but it's not like I need Chris J help. The martial adjutant is doing his best after all. The kingdom has lost a lot in the civil war, and the entire army is currently being reorganized. The imperial state troops brought in by Crescenta were sticking to the western and eastern parts of the country, where there are particular problems, so while there were no problems in terms of national defense, it was not so easy to fill in the lost generals and corps commanders. Although they could pay money to recruit soldiers, commanders cannot be replaced. While dealing with these issues, Celine saw it as a good opportunity to establish a military school in the capital. The foundation was created by taking the structure of the General Staff Department, which was originally located in the northern part of the country and was in the process of planning, and was now recruiting from among the nobles. The purpose was to re-educate the second and third sons, who were capable but unable to take over their families, as assistants to generals, corps commanders, and battalion commanders, and to have them compete with each other to incorporate the top performers into the army as general staff members. It goes without saying that weak and small nobles, even among large nobles, if they were the third and fourth sons, their career would at most be a corporal or a centurion in the front line. Naturally, the casualty rate is high, and the loss of personnel who have received advanced education from an early age in noble families was a significant disadvantage. There have been many cases of people with superior brains but poor sword skills being lost for nothing, and this had been a long-standing problem in this area. The purpose of this project was to create a place where such hidden gems could be given opportunities. Contrary to them, there were many commanders in the military who excel in Vela and rose through the ranks, but who rely on their intuition and do nothing but recklessly. There were two types of commanders in the military, those who excel in Vela but lack brains, and those who cannot wield swords but excel in brains. If you combine the two, you would be able to combine each good aspect to some extent, supplement the lacking parts, and become a first-class commander Bogan's idea was to create a great commander using multiple people, and to further strengthen and stabilize the army. Originally, the military demanded an excessive amount of processing from commanders, and no matter how good a general was, if the war dragged on, their performance would decline. Besides the adjutant, an assistant officer was necessary to reduce the burden, and Bogan believed that a major improvement in the military organization was necessary, and the existence of the staff officer was born there. Depending on the situation, unlike the adjutants who take command themselves, they create new people who are in charge of strategy planning and clerical calculation work based on that knowledge. This would reduce the burden on the commander, thereby simply improving his command ability, 
and stabilizing the tactical side of the operation by having a general staff member in charge of strategy planning. It was Eluger who showed strong motivation for this. Originally, he was the one who put the most effort into the general staff under Bogan, but the problem was the lack of funds and the number of people who were interested in the project. This time, however, he had the Queen's backing. These problems had been solved, and many letters had already been received expressing interest in this endeavor. The problem was the current commanders who were satisfied with the current system. The question was how to treat the general staff as a rank so that they didn't become a threat to their interests, but they were still in the process of turning one building into a school and bringing in books. It was still a long way off it would be a few years before it would take off and take solid shape. For the time being, the best of the personnel gathered there would be thrown directly into the military, and they will be assigned to the commander who has been promoted through this reorganization and lacks ability, as a temporary staff officer treated as an assistant to the adjutant general. The current goal was to minimize the deterioration of the military's capabilities, and since it's still in the recruitment stage before it gets busy, it's fine to think about the details later. Fortunately, many of the nobles were enthusiastic, Crescenta's willingness to step forward was probably one of the reasons for this. The heroes, the last dream entrusted by former General Christ, and I must return the debt and loyalty I received from him. She did not know that Bogan had such an idea in mind when she said she wanted to create something like this, but when it came time for the meeting, she made up a long story and pushed it through, saying that it was a dream that Bogan had told her once upon a time. She was a queen made up of nothing but lies and acting. Her Majesty the Queen was sitting next to Selene, pouting her lips and alternately glaring at Berry and Selene. Argensama is so unfair, and so on could be heard from her gaze. If Christche goes, Berry will naturally follow. She was probably not happy that they are going on a trip together for a month. Selene patted her head so that Galen wouldn't see it, and this time her cheeks puffed out. She was a complete child, a different person from the one she had been during her political duties. Selene said to Christche with a wry smile, It will be unveiled next month, if you miss this chance, you won't be able to go home soon, so go now. I also have something I want to ask of Berry. The luggage at the estate, right? Berry nodded. Although they brought some necessary items such as clothes from there, almost all the furnishings and furniture were left behind in Gargan's estate. As expected, they couldn't leave all the household goods, including luxury items, to someone else, and were putting off what to do with it. This would also be a good opportunity. Incidentally, can you also help me with the sale of the estate? Yes. For Celine, it's where she spent her whole life a home full of memories with her parents. It was probably the same for Berry. Nonetheless, leaving a mansion without living in it would only hurt and cost money. It's too big to leave for sentimentality, so it's much better to sell it for money and have someone live in it. You can choose what you want to bring, at a minimum. You can sell the rest. I know you're not one to do it, but don't bring too much of this and that. I understand. The house has a lot of decorations to begin with and I'll try to keep as few as possible. What would you like, Oju-sama? All of the books, and my father's liquor. I'd like to give it to my father's acquaintance. Yes, Oju-sama. Galen nodded and smiled. A softness came over his wrinkled face. I'm glad that you have some business over there too. As expected, I was a little worried about just visiting, sick visit, for a month, but it was quite hectic until a little while ago after all. Thanks to you, we've reached the finish line, Galansama. Selene smiled back and looked at Chris J. Well, I hope you're not stretching your wings too far and getting any dumber. Chris J is not an idiot. You're the only one in the world who would tries to name an elite unit as Blackie Company, really. It would have been dangerous if I hadn't noticed. The name of the unit that was written among the documents submitted for the reorganization of Krish's army was a mysterious organization called the Blackie Company under Alberinia's direct control. Celine suffered from headaches. She was glad from the bottom of her heart that she had not stamped the seal on the document. Still bitter and dissatisfied, Chris J. Lips pouted and Berry said that's no good then she chided Serene with a wry smile. Don't dig up what's already done like that. Doesn't Oju-sama feel sorry for Krish-sama? It's your fault for neglecting it too much. Bald eagle, skeleton, woof-woof, 
I was still patient with thinking it would be okay if it was just a nickname, but Bald Eagle, Skeleton, Woof Woof, all three of them love the nicknames Chris J gave them. Moo, Chris J puffed out her cheeks, objected, and Barry stroked her head troublingly, repeating to Celine that it was no good. It's a problem for you to pamper her like that, isn't it? I'm always on Krishsama's side. Cuckoo, it's good that you're on good terms. Galen said happily and stood up. Chris J, if you're going to Gargain, why don't you pop over to Cause and say hello? Tell him I'm doing well. I don't think I'll have the chance to go. Cause was a former subordinate of Galen and a skilled blacksmith. He was the one who had forged Krish's sword. Remembering his aged face, Chris J nodded. Yes, Chris J understand. Thank you. Well then, your majesty, Galen bows and leaves. And went out to see him off Crescenta immediately jumped to Chris J. Then, while hugging Chris J, she glared at Barry. It's unfair, it's just the two of you traveling. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but. Even Crescenta was with Barry the whole time during the Civil War, right? That's fundamentally different. I don't want Argonsama, I want to be with Wanisama. What a selfish child. Look, it's a cookie. Ah, uh, um. She couldn't help but to eat while glaring at her. This Crescenta doesn't have the option of not eating the given cookie. An attack to make herself docile her figure that accepted the cookie head-on despite knowing that it was truly the majestic royal family, the Queen of Alberon. She swallowed one, then the second. Idiot Celine said exasperated while looking at the sight of Crescenta happily mogu mogu while loosening her cheeks. If you're going there, you should have another sword forged. Sword is it? That's right. It's not something you can make right away, and if the one you're using now breaks, wouldn't it be a problem? It's not an ordinary sword that can be obtained on the fly, so a spare is necessary. Chris J won't break. You're going to have it forged. Do you understand? Her tone was final. Chris J nodded while groaning. Ten thousand pumpkins for a spare sword. Paying such a large amount of money would be a waste of money for Chris J. Barry, I'm sorry, but I leave that to you too. Yeah. If we're this far away, we can't even continue like before. Starting from Nozen and Kolkis, as well as Bogan's subordinates, they usually had their swords forged at that store, but now they're all scattered. Sales will drop significantly. It was only polite to offer them a little extra for all the help they had been given. He has helped me in many ways, not only in business but also in other areas, such as giving them a sword for free to one of Bogan's men who had no money to begin with. Three small gold coins Berry paid the price that a normal person would be able to spend five or six years without working, in order to repay such an invisible debt only for one of Chris J's swords, but Chris J was still unfamiliar with that kind of amount. Celine, Chris J's sword won't break, so. You always have poor thinking in that area, hum, really. Why is Wanisama so stubborn about that? Crescenta tilted her head and Chris J sighed. Because, it's a waste of money to buy 10,000 pumpkins for one sword, after all, putting aside the first one, for the second one is. 10,000 pumpkins. Crescenta thought for a moment and looked at Chris J exasperated. What is Wanisama talking about when it's only two or three small gold coins? Wanisama, who do you think you are? Wanisama is the first princess and the second rank general in the kingdom, you know? Ha, ah, listen here, Crescenta. In the village, a family can live comfortably with two pumpkins a day. Ten thousand pumpkins is a huge amount of money. Wanisama, please look at this. Saying that, Crescenya pointed to her own head, a silver hair ornament shaped like a crescent moon. It is like a barrette, a small one piece. Chris J tilted her head to ask what it mean, and Chris Genta said. This one cost ten gold coins. A. Hey. Next Chris Genta showed her left wrist. There is a bracelet made by intertwining two types of metal, gold and silver. Next is this bracelet, a very fine piece of gold and silver work, with some gemstones scattered. Let me see it will probably cost more than two or three dozen small gold coins. A, hey, ah, this necklace also has a brightly colored scarlet stone attached to it, and it's also fairly large, this will usually cost 50 pieces. Depending on the situation, 70 to 80. The one-piece dress I'm wearing right now can easily exceed three small gold coins, 
and it's made by a famous tailor who has a long relationship with the royal family. Chris J was stunned, and Chris Genta, exasperated, said to her, For a tiara's it can't be priced just at 100 or 200, and if I'm going to a formal banquet, one of my dresses can easily cost a few hundred small gold coins, sometimes over a thousand. Do you understand? It's embarrassing for me to see Wanisama, who was so active only using a sword worth three small gold coins. Chris J was surprised and puzzled by the amount of money that Chris Genta had embraced. Even the current amount was roughly 300,000 pumpkins. Chris Genta was a bit of an idiot, goofy, and spoiled, but she's the million pumpkins woman. What Chris J had was astonishment. She was stunned by the truth. Seriously, Wanisama. Why don't you think about your position a little more? Considering your current position, Wanisama's sword is too cheap, geez. Berry, who was listening behind them, gave a wry smile. Chris Genta's statement was a little excessive as a royalty, but Chris J was also Chris J and was too stingy. It was good for her to cherish things, but it was a problem to be reserved and not accept even necessary things. Especially when it comes to weapons, she would like her to have at least a spare sword to protect herself. Well, that's right. Chris J has almost never touched the salary and the rewards she received. Considering that, one sword is trivial. You you you. The kingdom provides subsidies for the corps that Christ and commands to organize, and it covers most of the maintenance costs for the Black Flag Special Force and commanders that they employ on a permanent basis, and the salary is only a small supplement. The cost of living was low because Christ and now has two breadwinners, Celine and Chris J, a few servants, and Chris J, who hates to waste money, saves most of her wages. The rewards from the war with the Empire and the recent civil war are still untouched, and the savings only kept accumulating, partly due to Chris's character of only paying for what she needed. She was not particular about ornaments or what she wore, and the only thing she spent money on was things related to cooking. Although there were expenses for work recently, they were still trivial, so there was no need to hesitate to buy a few swords. That said, it's probably just a matter of personality. Chris J was the type to save money and was too reluctant to spend money. Although it would be a shame to see her get into the habit of spending money, Berry thought it would be good for her to learn how to spend money in a more noble way. Chris's sense of money was at best those of a town girl who loves cooking, and was far from her current status which could be said to be a great noble. If Berry says so, then. Yeah, just like what was said in the past, the reason nobles receive so much money is to distribute it to various people. Of course, it's good to save money for future big expenses, but that shouldn't be the goal. Yes. Fufu, if Krishsama understands then that's fine. Berry stroked Krish's head, and Celine looked at them exasperated and sighed. You're so honest when Berry is the one who is saying it hum, really. It's all about your usual attitude, Oju-sama. You're just spoiling her, geez. That's right, Argan-sama always just takes the best. Argan-sama is cheating, Mew. No, Chris Genta. If you leave her alone, she will immediately try to speak ill of Berry after all. Chris Genta may only speak woof for a while. Yu 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 Crescenta glared at Berry while chewing on the cookie. When Chris J called her name once more, Chris Genta reluctantly let out a woof. That being said, Chris Genta, you say it's cheap, but do you know how many cookies Chris Genta is eating right now worth for one pumpkin? On the contrary, Chris J thinks Chris Genta should understand the value of pumpkins a little more. I it's not like I bought it. Woof. You you you, woof. She was taught by her younger sister about the value of money in a condescending manner, a frustration that lingered in her heart for some reason. From there, Chris J passionately explained the value of pumpkins to the millions of pumpkin women. Chris Genta, who could only say nothing. Chapter 121 Front, Back, and Middle The Reception Room of the Royal Palace There was an old man with a large stature. His hair brushed back and his long beard had turned white, and his face was deeply wrinkled. Even so, his narrow eyes were somehow tinged with sharpness, and something that should be called a vigor seemed to rise from the old man's body. Seated directly in front of him with reddish-gold hair Queen Crescenta wearing a pale blue dress. Next to her sat Chris J, who had taken off her overcoat, in a one-piece dress. Before Wanisama leaves for the fun trip I would like to ask you, Wanisama, to be present. 
The day before Chris J left for her trip, she was invited by Chris Genta to be here. The person who wished to meet Chris J was the old man in front of her, Felworth Keithreton, a hero of the kingdom who once made a name for himself and had once turned his blade against her. I am glad to see you are well, your majesty. And you too, Krishsama. Yes, Duke Keithreton. You look lively too. What is your business today? The rebel who pointed his blade at the princess. However, Crescenta ordered him to be confined rather than executed, claiming that he had been taken hostage by Gildenstein and that he had gone to war unwillingly. She felt that it would be a shame to kill a man who was still so influential and prestigious in the army. He was a skilled general and had originally held the rank of marshal before retiring from the military. His return was desirable for the kingdom that had lost many generals. Crescenta had received a letter from him stating that he wanted to talk with Chris J as well, and Crescenta was not sure what to do, but when she knew that Chris J will be leaving the royal's territory, she accepted it. One of the reasons was that she wanted to carry out Operation I'll Show Wanisama My Cool Side as a queen to raise Chris's opinion of her before she left for her trip, but aside from that nothing would happen if she just spent a lot of time worrying about it. She wanted to decide how to deal with this man as soon as possible. If he obediently became her pawn, then fine, and if he didn't, then that's the end of it. She would kill him sooner or later. That's all there was to it. First of all, I want to thank you for your efforts to save my life. I don't mind. You are the general who has contributed to the kingdom longer than anyone else, I felt that it was a pity to lose your life for something like this. You also had your own convictions, it's a pity that it wasn't on my side. Crescenta's eyes were downcast with the princess's face. Chris J wanted to go home early and do something about the estate, but she nibbled at the cookie, sensing that it seemed like it would be a long story. She and Felworth had been enemies on the battlefield, but now that it was over, the man was of no importance to Chris J. She did think he's an excellent general when she heard the details of the battle from Nozen, but that's it. If he was going to be an enemy, she would kill him, and if he was going to be an ally, she would just let it be. She had no interest in him personally. Felworth smiled at Chris J, and Chris Genta opened her mouth. But it's all over. Let's let bygones be bygones for the time being. I would be more than happy for you to talk to me in the same way as before. For a while after that, it was more like a chat. Chris Genta talked to him about his relatives, his health, and other topics of casual conversation without going into too much depth. Crescenta remembered everything from his family structure and servants to the names of his pets and the number of horses he had. It was easy enough to make a topic out of it, and she asked him a series of easy-to-answer questions to lighten the mood. She didn't want him to forget that he turned the blade on her once, but if she was going to make him her vassal from now on, she also didn't want him to feel too much guilt about it. Especially a warrior like Felworth is a creature who places more importance on appearance than on his own interests. If she made him feel too much guilt for being a traitor, there was a possibility that he would become too self-punishing and voluntarily seek punishment, such as giving up his title as a nobleman. Naturally, there will be no benefit there, only the loss of one talented person. For now, Crescenta decided that it would be better to ease his tension and guilt with an appropriate topic for the time being, and then move on to the main topic. Nonetheless, what worried her was Chris J who was bored next to her and turning into a cookie cracker. Seeing this, Crescenta felt a sense of unease that continuing this conversation would not only raise Chris J rating of her, but rather lower it, so she cut it off at an appropriate point and went to the main topic. After finishing her question, creating a slight silence, and nudging Felworth subtly, the old man began by saying why he had joined his highness's side. I've watched his highness grow since he was a child. Teaching him how to use the sword, teaching him tactics. I should say it's more parental affection than conviction. Parental affection? I had initially planned to sit out the civil war, since I had long since retired from the service of His Majesty King Alvaza, whose death marked the end of my service to the kingdom. Alvaza was Crescenta's grandfather. Felworth was a general who fought alongside King Alvaza, who was known for his bravery, and retired from the field shortly after his replacement. I know the circumstances better than others. His Highness has his arguments, and Her Majesty the Queen has her arguments, which one is right, which one has a greater cause. However that's a trivial matter. 
and at all times the winner is always right in the end. To begin with, I am not interested in the truth. The usurper is his highness, and Her Majesty the Queen is the new king of justice who defeated him that's fine. It was as if he was implying that the real usurper was Crescenta. But Crescenta listened calmly, and Felworth laughed quietly. His highness must have understood that. It was just one word he asked me to cooperate in the fight that he betted his being on. He just wanted to have pure power and fight to decide who was worthy of being a king. Whether or not there is a future in this ridiculous life of mine, it's a gamble. I just don't have enough hands to beat the game. I need you, Felworth. Come with me. It is not that I saw a just cause in his highness, or that I had any ill thought for her majesty, but simply obligation, and the parental affection of one who has seen his everything up till now. It was simply sentiment that made me turn the blade. Hence, I helped his highness. Felworth smiled sadly and looked at Chris J. Chris J. frowned and tilted her head, Felworth asked. What were his highness' last moments like? Chris J. killed him by beheading him. Chris J. thought he would give up at the last minute after running around that much from Chris J. What an incomprehensible person. He was still smiling even after he died, Chris J. added with a nonchalant look. Chris Genter looked at Felworth at her older sister's words, which were tinged with dislike for Gildenstein, but the old man only nodded, smiling, I see. Then good. I'm sure it was a satisfying end. With those words, silence flowed for a while. Chris Genter pondered how to use him as a pawn, and Chris J. cursed her misfortune for being forced to participate in this incomprehensible discussion, pricking her lips. Chris J. looked at the two who fell silent while she ate a cookie, and then opened her mouth. Um, if the talk is over, Chris J. would like to go back to the estate to help Barry. Oh, Wanisama, please wait a minute. Just a little longer. Chris Genter held Chris J. as she tried to get up, and Felworth, a little startled by Chris Genter's appearance, asked. Barry is. Chris Dan's servant. Chris J. was supposed to clean up the estate with Barry today, but Chris J. is here after being called by Chris Genter. Disgruntled, stared at Felworth, and the old man laughed. Cuckoo, the Alberinia, second only to the marshal, is cleaning up together with her servants. For Chris J., that's the bonus. Chris J. is just in the army so that it doesn't get in the way of Berry's cooking and cleaning the mansion. Chris J. said. Felworth looked at Chris J. for a moment, and then seemed to be convinced. I see, a bonus is it? That's right. Are you done with what you want to ask Chris J.? Chris J. heard that Duke Keithreton was the one that called Chris J. Truly. There was something I wanted to ask Chris Sama. But it's something that I've half heard, he smiled wryly. I wanted to ask Chris Sama what you are fighting for. Why did you take up your sword and stand on the battlefield? What kind of person are you? I wanted to know that, so I put Chris Sama's name in the letter. Chris J. is on the battlefield for Celine and Chris Genter. Chris J. doesn't really want to go to the battlefield, and if the two of them is fine with it, Chris would like to live quietly somewhere in the mountains where we won't be related to that kind of thing. Chris J. crossed her arms grumpily. In Chris's short life, the worst person she met was Gildenstein. He was a man she hated to the extent that she didn't even want to remember him, and he was so unpleasant that she wished she could have hurt him more before killing him. As a military man, she didn't care to be divided between friend and foe, and she had nothing against Felworth, who was her enemy in that regard, but the way Felworth seemed to mourn him was unpleasant to her. Gildenstein deserved to die for Chris J. He was the one she had decided to kill without fail. What was the reason for repeating such talk in front of Chris J? Chris J doesn't really understand the aesthetic sense of just cause you're talking about, and Chris J doesn't care about your relationship or the dead his highness. He killed Gatushu sama and make everyone sad. From Chris's point of view of the, he's an eyesore and an unpleasant one. He deserves to die. Chris J turned her inorganic purple eyes to Felworth. Chris Genter hurriedly called out, but Chris J continued. Chris J killed him because he deserved to die. If you don't like it, just say so clearly and point your sword at Chris J. If you do, Chris J will kill you just as quickly after all. Felworth looks into her cold eyes and smiled wryly. Then he sipped his tea and shook his head. I'm sorry if I made you feel uncomfortable. Certainly, from Krishsama's point of view, 
He is an enemy I didn't give enough consideration. But Felworth continued with a smile. No life deserves to be attached to an old man like me. Threats are meaningless to those who don't fear them. Remember it. Whether or not it's meaningless is for the cliché to decide. Because at least Chris J will be refreshed just by making you unable. The point is whether Chris J can tolerate it or not. When Chris J told him that, displeased, Felworth smiled pleasantly. Ha ha, I see. There is that way of thinking. Simple is good. So, I was just overcomplicating simple things hum. Where the fun was in this conversation was incomprehensible to Chris J. Crescenta looked at Chris J and Felworth in a situation where she could no longer interject in any way, and then acted restlessly as if she wanted to say something. Chris J sighed at Crescenta's restlessness and picked up a cookie, shoving it into her mouth. Crescenta bit it as a conditioned reflex. Please forgive me. I don't hold a grudge against Krishsama, nor am I blaming Krishsama for killing his highness. Rather, I am grateful. Grateful? Yeah, after exhausting all of his ingenuity, it ended in one-on-one -on -one combat that would be more precious than any kind of death, and it would be the deepest desire of a warrior. For his highness, who cursed for being born into the royal family, above all else his death was his salvation. Of course, for Krishsama, he was a hateful opponent, and that salvation was unwilling, but even so, I, who have seen his highness since he was born, think it was a good thing. Felworth continued. Still, it is true that I lacked consideration. If you say that you cannot forgive me, I have no hesitation in atoning for it with my life. He's a troublesome person. At any rate, Chris J hates him so much that Chris J wishes Chris J could kill him three times. No, for, uh, about five times, so please talk about that kind of thing when Chris J isn't there. Haha, ha, I'll keep that in mind. Chris J said with a clear expression of dissatisfaction. It's troublesome, so Chris J will ask, but Chris Genta wants you to return to become a general. That's the reason why Chris Genta didn't judge the officers and soldiers who joined his highness this time. The reason why you joined his highness is irrelevant now, and all Chris J wants to ask is whether you will become our force or not. Felworth laughed and stroked his long beard. To direct Chris Genta, who was eating a cookie, looked at her sister as if to say that would not be good, but the cookie was in her mouth. She couldn't even physically interject. Irrelevant. Krishsama doesn't have any feelings of resentment against antagonizing you. It's just a matter of fighting under a different flag. The war's over, and Chris J doesn't care unless you bring it up. Fortunately, Celine, General Vareich, and Skay, Deputy Marshal Farron don't seem to have anything against you, so there's no particular problem. If you say that you are grateful, Chris J thinks you should work as hard as you can to return that gratitude. Felworth observed Chris J. Chris J picked up the cookie grumpily and gave it to Chris Genta. It was a strange situation, not knowing whether it was a serious discussion or not, but Felworth nodded slowly. I guess I should say she's a clear-cut person. There's danger, but there's nothing to worry about. Do you hate war? I don't like it. There are people who are willing to fight, but Chris J would rather cook with Berry than wasting time with that. Ha ha, is that so? I'm so used to the battlefield that I felt a little nostalgic the other day. In some respects, it's a charming place, but, but it's true that it's not a good place either. If Krishsama was someone who would be fascinated by it, I would have some thoughts about it as well. Felworth smiled. It was just as Margrave Farron said. Please forgive my repeated rude questions. Skeleton? Ah, did you meet with the deputy marshal? Yeah, the other day. So you really are calling him Skeleton? Yes, it's a nickname. Felworth nodded happily and stood up, saluting. After meeting Krishsama, I was convinced. I will accept that offer. I'm not long for life. I can't say that it will be decades from now, but if I can still be of help then it's my pleasure. Hmm. Yes, well, if you say so, that's fine. Crescenta, do you still have anything to talk about? You, no. Crescenta, who was endlessly inserted cookies, finally swallowed everything and looked at Felworth. Her dignity as a queen has already been completely chewed up along with the cookies. She was not sure what kind of face she should make, but for the time being she told him as a queen. T the marshal will give you instructions later. Until then. Yes, 
Understood. But your majesty and Krishsama seem to be on very good terms with each other. You seem to have a good relationship, and your face is softer than before. I didn't mean to look scary but... Emotions are something that will ooze out, it's difficult to cover up everything. Those who know will understand it, however, if it's the way your majesty is now, there's nothing to worry about. Surely, the kingdom will become a good country in the future. Felworth said this as if looking somewhere with distant eyes. What kind did you say? What a straightforward question. It was originally the estate of Central General Cure Marcellus. The death of the head of the family, after being defeated in a civil war. The Duke of Marcellus donated most of his assets to the kingdom, and although the house was not demolished, he sold some of the estate he owned to make up for it. The mansion in the first-class city is one of them, and it is currently being used by Eluga as the residence of the Farron house. It happened the other day when Eluga was welcoming Felworth, who was visiting there. Felworth asked him about Chris J. I know a fair amount about the royal cursed child. I have seen His Majesty King Alvaza I, who wept, and who laid his own son in his hands as a baby who doesn't cry. That was about three hundred years ago, when the lords who ruled the provinces became powerful, and the shadow of royal authority began to wane, it was said that a baby that didn't cry was born. Lane. A beautiful princess named Strong Light became queen at fifteen and took the Duke of Gassel, a powerful nobleman at the time, as her husband. A few years later, the Duke died a suspicious death, and she took advantage of this to absorb the Duke of Gassel as a foothold, seizing power from the lords either peacefully or by force, and in just ten years, she reshaped the kingdom into what it is today. She then launched invasions of neighboring countries, greatly expanding the size of the kingdom's territory, she might be called a great lord for that accomplishment alone. However, contrary to her glorious achievements, she had a lot of dishonorable rumors. She was a lecherous person, and used her appearance to commit many infidelities. She used her power to ruthlessly murder all of her subjects who opposed her, and even took the Duke of Gassel as her husband to gain control, it was rumored at the time that she was the one who killed him, and was said to be a freak who would do anything for her own benefit. No matter how big or small, the baby who doesn't cry is said to have excellent intellect and sensibility that differs from that of ordinary people. At one time they left behind great achievements, and at other times they disturbed stability and harmony. How about history? I just looked at the book briefly. Right. Are you aware of the split with the Holy Empire? Yes. Just about what was written. There are few books written about that era in the kingdom's books. Another baby who didn't cry to Lane, who had many children. She was also named Lane by the Queen, and with her birth, the Queen became the Great Lane. Gravelaine. Born she came to be called Elslane, Little Lane. Gravelaine strongly loved Elslane, who was superior to all her other children, but unlike her who is cheerful, Elslane was a quiet and gentle princess who liked to paint. Was it political or was it because of their individual personality? At some point, the relationship between the two became strained, and Elslane rebelled with many of her subjects, who were dissatisfied with the Queen's reign of terror. The kingdom that held a vast territory was split in two, and Elslane created the Republic of Elslane, a little paradise. The kingdom naturally turned its forces against the Republic, and the war was expected to end soon. The Republican system that Elslane established was headed by a parliament. If there is a difference of opinion, it is natural that the response will be delayed accordingly, and Gravelaine was a queen full of decisiveness. There was no reason not to exploit this vulnerability, and the Republic was forced into a position of inferiority due to the difference in military power. However, the Republican Assembly loses its original form as it was cornered, and when Elslane, who led the rebellion, was given real power again, the Republic gradually begins to resist the invasion of the kingdom. Elslane spread her teachings, based on the utopia depicted in her paintings, and once she had won the people over to her side, they began to call themselves the Holy Empire with her at its head, and from there the battle was even and lasted for several decades. The kingdom lost much of the territory it had held until then, and although peace was made between the two countries following the assassination of Queen Gravelaine, all that was left were desolate lands and people. For this reason, babies who don't cry were considered taboos in the kingdom. The kingdom and the empire, the two leaders of each were said to have been baby who doesn't cry, 
and it was said that the royal family decided to kill the children born in such a way as a cursed child. I investigated the cursed child during the time of his majesty the former King Alvaza. Luckily, I had a connection with the imperial state, so I was able to see it, whether it was good or bad, should I say that it was a painful decision made for the sake of the stability of the kingdom? It's a ridiculous story. Eluga said, moistening his lips with alcohol. He loves Chris J and he thought so from the bottom of his heart. Cry or not cry, even if you can tell the difference, where is a human being who can discern the good and bad of the baby? All people have both good and bad sides, and if there is something that can be said to be true goodness, I would like to see it. Everyone has a good side and a bad side. There were those who tried to be good, but there was no such thing as true goodness. The same goes for evil. Eluga thought that the two sides of a coin were still just one piece in the end. Krishsama is certainly different from humans. Some would call her a deviant. But she at least tries to know good and evil, and respects what is good. She has a much purer heart than a fellow with stupid wisdom. Hmm. Are there no worries? If there is anything in this world that is free from anxiety, it must be the one that has welcomed death. At least I will use the rest of my life to help master cliché. Even if I can't say she's safe, as long as she has someone watching over her, that's fine. Felworth stroked his long beard as if surprised by Eliga's words. Then he said, how surprising. I didn't expect you, a misanthropist, would say that far. What a misanthropist. I like innocent people more than anything. It's because of my face, children are often scared of me. Eluga smiled wryly and continued. Ha ha, but now Krishsama calls me skeleton. In the past, I used to worry about it, but when that person called me that, before I knew it, this face seemed like something isn't that bad. She is a troubling person and a mysterious person. Felworth was troubled as to what to say, but Aruga laughed. Anyway, it would be nice to meet her once. Whether you like it or not, personal likes and dislikes are divided, but she's a pleasant person, at least, she's not a bad person. The words told with a wicked look on his face did not feel like a lie. When Felworth heard that, he nodded deeply. Chapter 122 Belgash Civil War Once one crosses the Dragon's Moor and enters the north, one will find a silver landscape. The whole area was covered in white snow, shining brightly in the sunlight peeking through the clouds. The snow must have come early this year. It was a beautiful sight to behold, but on the other hand, it was not convenient for travel. Sorry to keep you waiting. It's okay, it can't be helped. Removing the carriage wheels and replacing them with a sled. If it were possible, they had wanted to let it last until the Belgash fortress, but if the wheels were to be buried, then they had no choice but to change it. Killick, Mia, and the others unloaded the wagon and sweated as they replaced the wheels. Chris J was feeding the horses, wearing a blanket over her shoulders and over her thick, fluffy clothes. A particularly large horse Barurun devoured the carrots and brought its muzzle to Chris J. Chris J helplessly gave him another carrot. This horse had strangely grown attached to Chris J. She had no choice but to bring it back to the royal's territory, but since it was so attached to her, they ended up keeping it in Christand. The main reason Serene decided to keep it was to make Chris J overcome her dislike of horses, but although Chris J and Berry took care of it, she would not get on the horse's back. However, Chris J also felt that it would be a shame for the horse to be left as a mere ornament, so she sent the horse out to help pull the cart. Originally, the kingdom's horses had many breeds suitable for pulling horses. Because they are often ridden by heavily armed nobles, most of the horses in the army were heavy breeds rather than light breeds, and slender horses like those used by nomads in the southeast were not that preferable. Barurun was no exception to this rule and was big enough to pull a carriage, and he pulled the carriage in which Chris J was riding without any particular reluctance. Barurun sure eats better than others. It looks really lively. Isn't it cold? I don't know. Maybe they are more resistant to the cold than humans. Berry looked at the fluffy cliché and chuckles. Berry was in her usual apron dress. The only protection from the cold she wore was a pair of leather gloves and boots and the rest was just a cloak. The others were also wearing slightly warmer clothes, and Chris J was wearing two heavy clothes, but she was still cold. 
Barry stroked Barurun's neck after adjusting the cliché's slightly misaligned muffler. But really, he's an obedient child, isn't he? I heard that he was quite violent when Ojusama rode it. NN. Selene is a bit rough for some reason after all. I guess it's compatibility. The other day, Selene's horse was out of commission due to poor health, so she rode Barurun as a substitute, but it seemed that Selene had a lot of trouble. What is with that horse? But as far as Berry saw it, it didn't seem like a particularly problematic horse. Bogan's horses on the battlefield often had some quirk, and Berry, who had been taking care of them, felt that horses had their own personality. But from her experience, Barurun was a good, though too energetic child. It was originally a rambunctious horse, and Berry wondered if she would be all right, but he soon took to her and was obedient now. It was very docile. Get along well with other child okay, Barurun. Don't fight with the child next to you, okay? When she imitated Berry and hit the neck with a pop, it let out a gallant neigh. Berry, who saw the situation, chuckled. Chris J was truly a child, acting like a big sister to the horse, and it made her smile. Then she looked up, noticed the position of the sun, and said, Looks like we will stay at Belgash Fortress today. If we go until Gargane, it will already become pitch black by the time we arrive. Yes. Eh he, but the kitchen there is quite splendid, and it's been a long time since Chris J has been able to cook properly. Belgash Fortress. After the war ended, many soldiers returned to their hometowns, and this fortress, which was once overflowing with soldiers, was deserted. All that remained were the minimum number of soldiers to defend the fort, many of whom would serve as guards here until they were no longer able to fulfill their duties. For them, this fortress was like a community like a village or a town, their home and hometown. Naturally, they all cooperated with each other, trying to make life here as good as possible, and enriching their daily lives by caring for each other. However, the peace and tranquility of their lives was suddenly disrupted. In the kitchen, which had been strict but peaceful, a civil war broke out. Hmm, how is it? Let's see. Shall we put some nerip in it? Yes. Her elegant silver hair was tied up and swayed like a horse's tail. The enchanting princess Chris J. Christ and moved around the kitchen. Second in rank in the kingdom, her great exploits on the battlefield earned her the title Alberini, second only to Marshall, and now she was happily chopping herbs with a kitchen knife instead of a sword. She was dressed in a clean white one-piece dress. The way her long hem fluttered, and she occasionally stretched out and reached for the top shelf was truly sweet. The fairy of the kitchen was exactly this girl. Is this much fine? Hmm, it might be better to chop it a little coarser. And the one showering that girl with her affectionate smile was as if a water spirit inviting travelers. She was the red-haired servant Berry Argan. In contrast to the lovely girl who moved around with a trot, her movements were graceful, relaxed and calm. She was a noble figure that lived up to her status as a noble. Her low, friendly demeanor, yet elegant gestures from time to time, her small stature and bountiful chest, and her tight waist there was a pureness that suddenly made those who were captivated by them feel ashamed of themselves. Even the sight of her tasting the food with a ladle in her hand was sexy, but there was something about her playing and whispering with the fairy that made her lose all sense of reality. Baking in the oven was a whole roasted chicken. The belly was stuffed with herbs and vegetables, and the outside was carefully rubbed with salt, pepper, and garlic, etc. The skin was repeatedly smeared carefully with dripping meat juices, giving it a jewel-like luster. In the pot, the beef was slowly simmering with vegetables, and the stew with red wine was making a clattering sound. Watching them from a distance were the men in the kitchen. On a snowy night, when they had already finished their work and were taking a break before cleaning up, two princesses and black-clad soldiers suddenly arrived at Belgash Fortress. They told the fort soldiers that they had given up on reaching Gargane today because of the snow, and asked to borrow the kitchen. A visitor was more beautiful than snow. When the head chef Zalbach heard the report, he immediately ordered the kitchen to be cleaned up, and by the time they arrived, he had cleaned the corner that they would use as much as possible and polished it to the point not a single speck of dust was left. Now they were conducting a follow-up cleaning, but that chore was only a front, most of their attention was focused on the two little cooks. Their culinary skills were brilliant. Those who cooked as their job have much to learn from the two of them. 
but they were more interested in feast for their eyes. For those who work in the fortress, where there was nothing to do unless you go into town, there was no better pastime than watching the two cook. Berry, the meat is almost ready. Yeah, the sauce looks good too. Cut it up and put it on the plate. Ah, can someone please? Having used this place for a long time before, Berry also knew where the dishes and utensils were located. However, there were seventeen plates in the place where dishes were usually placed. One plate for each person to serve the meat, nine plates for nine people. And one more plate for serving the whole roasted chicken and putting down the bread, for a total of eighteen plates. There was one plate missing there. Tension ran high in the kitchen. The head chef, Zalbach, was the first one to react. He instantly grabbed the plate he had just finished washing, wiped off the remaining water droplets, and took a smooth flowing step toward the girls. He spun the plate at high speed so that the two wouldn't see it, and even the smallest drop of water that cannot be wiped off was flicked away what he was holding was the supreme plate. He moved faster than anyone else, however he did not want to give them an imperfect plate, so he used his years of experience and skill to create the perfect plate. As if it had been prepared from the beginning, Zalbarka's movements were smooth and steady. The head chef Zalbark would later recall. Was I fully prepared to welcome them? I have done what I could in that situation, but I felt like I couldn't say it was perfect. We had to clear the place for them in a hurry, and we were all struggling to get the dishes washed and cleaned from there. So, I kept all kinds of tableware on hand so that I could respond at any time, and I was ready to move at any time. It was half reflex the moment I grabbed the plate and stepped toward them. I was so focused that time seemed to have stopped. The prediction based on experience was only possible for Zalbark, who had been in charge of this kitchen for many years. A sudden visitor wasn't such a rare story. Remain calm in any situation, and do not neglect the minimum preparations so as not to be lacking. That was the basic among the basics that the kitchen commander should have, and this man Zalbark was one level above that. No matter what situation comes up, no matter what difficulty arises before him he will solve it all. His will made his body moved before his thoughts could catch up. It was a step that left the time behind. It was the fastest and most flexible step, that was exactly what Zalbark achieved at that time. Precisely because it was Zalbark, no it was the fastest step that only Zalbark could make. No one else could match it. However, a man at the corner of Zalbarka's vision, smirked. Closer to the girls than Zalbark himself, there was a young man with a scowl on his face, it was Kurt. He was a young man who managed the food distribution of this fortress with his excellent brain, and in his hand was a plate that had been polished. And behind him was a wagon with countless dishes lined up neatly. The young man, Kurt, was fed up at the sight of Zalbark, who had never grown up. He was the king here, and he admitted that he had good reactions and judgment. However, what Zalbark was able to do was only after the fact he could only react after the opponent made a move. For Kurt, he was much too slow. When he learned of their visit, the first thing he did was to confirm the information. He first asked the soldiers who were called out by them how many guards there were, and put the information in his own hands. Then, he suppressed the information so that Zalbark would not know about it suppressing it. Haha, ha, no way. I just thought I didn't need to inform him. I never thought that the head chef wouldn't have enough plates for them to use. That said, there are seventeen flat plates in the cupboard I thought it wouldn't be enough if they used two plates per person, so I prepared some, but, well, it was a coincidence. As soon as Kurt entered the kitchen, he checked the cupboards. There were enough bowls for soup and a platter for the whole roasted chicken. However, the number of flat plates is a little dangerous. 9, 18, 27, knowing how many of them there were, he understood the number of plates they would use was one of them, and the nature of these women. Their bodyguards were soldiers, those accustomed to simple meals. They didn't care about reusing plates. They would have no problem putting the meat on one plate and using it for sharing. But the two fairies, they were particular about their food. He was sure that they would divide the plate use. All that remained was the timing to hand it over. Kurt, who had already prepared the plates, was one step behind Zalbark in this, but he was the first to arrive. The talented Kurt was still excellent even in food distribution. Zalbark glared at the fearless Kurt with a scowl on his face, 
as if he were a parent whose child has been murdered, and then laughed. You know what you're missing, you brat? Cuckoo, what are you talking about? You're behind the times, just leave it to the young like me. Zalbark thought as he looked at Kurt. The difference between the two was four steps. Zalbark felt his own aging and though pleased with the growth of the young talent who was always trying to get ahead of him, he gritted his teeth, thinking that he cannot be defeated yet. That one was faster. But that was also because all the conditions are right. After much thought, Zalbark came up with a secret plan. Oops. He pretended to stumble in an empty place. A momentary forward tilt and a jump. Kurt frowned, fed up with it. The same thing over and over again, the same stupid obstruction. Four steps away. His body and preparation were perfect. It didn't matter what despicable deeds this old man did. What are you going to do this time? There was something already flying in front of Kurt, who was thinking so. It was a drop of water. It was a move that would destroy Kurt's perfection. Zalbark, who had just been washing dishes. There was still water on his arm. Zalbark made an attack that was disguised as a jump, thinking that the plate Kurt was holding would be ruined by a splash of water. It was too cowardly. Kurt's eyes were filled with astonishment. He could see the emotion in his eyes you're going to go that far. But even there Kurt was calm. He quickly turned himself around and caught the spray with his back to protect his plate. But even Kurt knew. In that one moment, he had lost his advantage over Zalbark. With a scowl on his face, Kurt glared at Zalbark as if he were a son whose father had been murdered, and laughed. I'm surprised you would go this far, shitty old man, I'm amazed at your despicableness. Nate, you can think about it by putting your hands on your chest first. Which one of us is the coward? The two men were so close in their contest that the others, unable to intervene, had to watch with bated breath. A showdown between the two chiefs. It was a holy war. But once again, the deciding factor was blocked by the presence of a more powerful person. Wow, it smells delicious. Krishsama, shall I help you serve the food? The one who showed up at the right time was Mia, the adjutant of the Black Flag Special Forces Company. It's about time the food was ready, Mia checked it out, and so on, without any respect at all. When they were improving the carriages for the snow-covered roads, the clumsy and free adjutant was assigned to chores. She said she had no choice but to visit the kitchen and her timing was impeccable no calculations, no aiming, she always had bad timing. Yes, it will be finished soon. Mia, a plate please. Yes, um, ah. Mia saw Kurt right next to her. I'm sorry, thank you very much. Ah. She was no less bold than Anne, but she is somewhat out of it and she understood and judged on her own that the plate was offered to her. She handed the plate to Chris J as if nothing had happened, thought for a moment, and turned around. Ah, sorry. Can I borrow a wagon as well? Unfortunately, she was also used to using people. As she ordered Kurt, who stood still in a daze, Chris J let her taste the soup and her cheeks pouted. Hmm. Looking only at this, Mia is quite safer than Anne. She doesn't throw the plate away. Throw the plate away. Ayahaha. Mia, it's nothing, so please don't worry about it. Oh, okay. The two quickly put the dishes on the plate, and Mia took the wagon from Kurt as if it were a matter of course, and she happily put the food on it. The three of them carried the wagon while chatting and laughing, and Barry bowed gracefully while looking curiously at the hardened cooking team. Chris J followed suit and bowed politely, while Mia bowed respectfully in a strange manner. Then the three of them left the kitchen. The men looked at Zalbark and Kurt, who were still frozen, looking at them with pity. Chapter 123, Gargain. From swords and spears to axes. Every kind of blade wielded on the battlefield was on display in the store. At the counter there was an old man with a bald head and a stubble, and a young man looking at him with frowns. Mia and the others looked around the store, while Kalua waited with Berry next to Chris J for the old man to open his mouth. The old man's eyes sharpened and he gazed earnestly at the sword. It was a curved sword, twisted from the base to the side of the blade a sword that the old man had forged himself about three years ago. However, the blade was much thinner and thinner than when he had given it to Cliché. The blade itself had shrunk slightly. The belly of the blade had numerous fine scratches, 
and there were signs that it had been sharpened repeatedly, it was possible to guess that it must have been scraped to fix the nicks on the blade. The wood of the hilt was soaked with blood, and even though it had been carefully wiped, there was faint and mottled discoloration as if the sword had been used for several decades, it spoke of the dense time it has been in use. The battle with the Holy Empire after that, it was this old man, Cause, who sharpened the sword. The burden was placed only on the tip of the blade, and there were only a few nicks. The skill of the person who wielded the blade was reflected in the way the blade was damaged in a way that Cause had never seen before. It was such a strange and surprising sight, that he would be convinced if someone told him that it had slain two hundred people but when he saw how skinny it had become, with no trace of its original form, it sent chills down his spine. Just a few months. How many lives had this sword taken in that time? Kors groaned, and Chris Che looked at the old man apologetically. Sorry. Even though it's a sword that Korsan worked so hard to forge, Chris Che planned to cherish it for the rest of Chris's life but... Ah, no, don't worry about it. If you use it this far, you could say that it's a sword long-cherished desire. Originally, the sword was a consumable item, and the more you sharpen it, the more it will decrease after all. He told Chris J, who seemed to say what she really felt. Yes, swords were consumables. This was the way it should be. Rather, it's a miracle that she used it this far without breaking it, and there was nothing to blame her for that. From the beginning, it could be said that it was a little too slender for use on the battlefield. It's my mistake. General's daughter in that position, cause never thought she would wield her blade on her front line. It was only for self-defense, in line with Krish's wishes. It was designed with portability and other aspects in mind. It was never intended to be used to slay hundreds of people. It would have been nice if Chris J was a little more skillful with swords. Ha ha ha. I have never heard of a swordsman as good as Krishsama. Krishsama fame is well known even in Gargane. The Silver Princess leads a black-clad century to slay enemy generals. The exploits of Chris J. Christand were repeatedly mentioned by wounded soldiers and soldiers returning from the battlefield. During the Civil War, there was also the death of the hero Bogan, and although at first everyone suspected that this was a lie to keep people from paying attention to the fact, the soldiers' tales of the girl's swordsmanship gradually came to be accepted as fact. She is a peerless swordsman who even monsters like Gildenstein and Nakiris couldn't match. There were many who had seen her up close and personal, not just those who had heard about her from others, and there was no one, at least not here in Gargane, who doubted her ability. Kalua, who was standing next to her, was exasperated by Krish's overly humble words and looked at the sword. She must have really thought that she was inexperienced. She had a power that no one, no matter how fierce they were, can match, but she still thought she was not good enough. Kalua sighed thinking that she would probably never be satisfied for the rest of her life. She had slain many times more enemies than Kalua, yet there were no fatal wounds on her sword. It was a far cry from Kalua, who had damaged the sword she had just bought in the last battle I should probably learn from Yuzaja-chan's sword even a little bit. Should we make the edge of the next sword a little harder and thicker? If you have this much skill, it's better to increase the strength of the blade itself than to think about ease of sharpening. Yes. Hmm, putting aside the length, something a little stronger would be. After all, sometimes it needs to cut bones and tear armor. It's strange to be able to cut while avoiding the bones, and it's not like the sword was to rip armor either. It was not a slaughterhouse where she wielded her blade, but on a battlefield where lives were exchanged. It was abnormal in the first place to tear only her flesh, but Kors didn't voice it. The young man who was listening, Kuais, the son of Kors, also had a bewildered expression on his face. The blade was thin, with an unusual bias toward the cutting edge. This was the result of making it unbreakable, tenacious, and suitable for maintenance. On the other hand, if the wielder was as insanely strong as she was, thicker steel would last a lot longer. The harder, stiff, though, it was made, the more easily the sword would break, and the harder it became to push it. But, if she could abuse this slender blade to this extent, then it would be no problem. The gentle unevenness of the tip of the blade, although sharpened, looks more like a trace of a crushed blade rather than a chipped blade. It seems that the person who sharpened it was also a good craftsman. The blade is still alive and well. Hmm, yes. When Chris J tattered it once, he cleaned it up very nicely. 
It's a great thing. Although she usually did her own sharpening, it had been sent to the sharpener on several occasions. It was because the sharpener in the military was very skilled. While thinking for a moment whether she should thank him again in writing or other ways, she continued. It is good that it is heavier, but the balance of the weight should be about the same as before. It is inevitable that it will be heavier as a whole, so Chris J feels that it would be better if it had a little more weight. I understand, that would be better. When will you be going back? Probably in a week or so. Chris J pondered for a moment, and Berry next to her said. It's not urgent, so please send it to the royal capital after it's finished. Of course, we'll pay for it. Thank you very much. I'd like to be given a month's time to complete the work. Because it's the sword that Krishsama will be using, I can't give something that is subpar. Thank you very much. Chris Che and Berry bowed their heads, and Berry reached into her leather purse. Six gold coins were taken out, Chris Che stiffened. This is. Oju-sama. No, from Gatushu-sama, thank you for everything you've done so far. Of course, Christand intends to remain in the same relationship as before, but since we left the North, it will not be the same as before. Thank you for your kindness so far, please accept it. If that's the case, thank you. I'll deliver the best sword. A twenty thousand pumpkin sword was about to be completed. Chris Che involuntarily recoiled at this fact. She had intended to have one sword forged, but it was actually two. It wasn't like that but Berry didn't say anything while smiling wryly at Krish's state. Even Kalua was surprised, but even this was normal for nobles if it was as good a user as Chris J, it wouldn't be strange to spend one hundred gold coins. As she watched the exchange, Kalua looked back to see Mia holding her sword in her hand and grunting. What's wrong, Mia? Eh, ah, I was thinking maybe I should bring at least one sword. Everyone has it but I, the adjutant, was only carrying the sword from provision. There were several candidates for Mia, mainly strong and long swords. Kalua chuckled. I'm telling you, but there's no sword long enough to slash the enemy before the thrown axe reached you, you know. Shut up. Well, it might be better for Mia if it's longer to some extent. Kalua giggled and knocked her head. Well, it looks like Bunny is done, and if you're not sure, why don't you just stop by again on your way home? Hmm, sure. When it comes to buying it, I don't really have a preference. Mia isn't very good at swords in the first place. Geez, making fun of me. Chris Che and Berry looked at those two and the other members. Since you know the location of the estate, isn't it fine after we go shopping? No, I'll think about it later for now. What about Killick and the others? Nothing particularly, this one has never been used since I bought it. Killick's squad which was assigned to Kreskenta's escort, had no wear and tear on their equipment. Chris J nodded, grabbed Berry's hand, and smiled. The baggage to be taken from the estate was not much. The furniture could be sold off as an addition to the house when it was sold, and most of the furnishings were of the same type. When Bogan took over the debts of the Argon family, he had sold what could be called family heirlooms, so there was nothing of historical value. Most of the vases and paintings that were here today were from before he bought the house, and he purchased only a few of them. There aren't many things that can be called memorabilia, so after helping put together the books and alcohol, Mia and the others who accompanied the escorts were assigned to the guest room to rest. When they went out to buy dinner, Berry was worried about the reaction of the people in the town, but should she say it was unexpected? Berry was more than happy to see that they are responding to cliché in much the same way as before. As usual, they called out to her Krishsama, shared some fruit with her, recommended some good ingredients, etc. Of course, everyone talked about her career and Bogan's death, but above all, they were relieved to see Chris J, the cooking-loving lady who they hadn't seen in a long time. The people of Gargane were kind-hearted and good-hearted. Of course, it was because of the relationship they had built up over the years, but she was very happy to see that they were taking such care to keep things the same as before. The more she thought about how nice this town was, the more sentimental she became, and Berry's heart was filled with a sense of loneliness that she had been trying not to think about, and various memories come back to her. She had spent more than half of her life here. There were too many memories to cut and throw away so as not to think about them. This is the wound that Oju-sama made when she was swinging Gatushu-sama's sword in her room while talking about sword training. 
Fufu. At that time Gatushu-sama was troubled. What an idiot. Well, Oju-sama was really small at the time. Bogan's room was simple and mostly just books and liquor. Berry traced the scar on the pillar and smiled. Celine said she wanted to learn swordsmanship from her father, and decided to stop it, saying at least wait until she's a little older, resulting in a fight. Celine, who was reprimanded, didn't seem convinced, and later secretly went to Bogan's room and pulled out Bogan's sword. Apparently, she wanted to show that she could handle the sword properly. However, although it was good up to that point, the sword was a heavy long sword. Unable to swing it, she stumbled and slammed it into a pillar when Lazura saw this, she turned unusually pale and slapped Celine's cheek. Stupid. What would you do if you got irreparably injured because of your silly stubbornness? After that, she lectured Serene in a rage that even Berry had never witnessed before. Bogan's indescribably troubled expression upon his return was so funny that she still laughed when she recalled it. The house was filled with many memories. When she thought about leaving, the scenes of Lazura, Bogan, and small Celine appeared here and there then disappeared. Is Berry lonely? Just a little bit. If I leave here, those memories will gradually fade away. I think that's a little lonely. Forgetting is something Chris J doesn't really understand. Memories are always in your head. There was no memory that Chris J couldn't recall. If she ever wanted to remember, all her memories would come back vividly. The countless books she had read so far what was written on what page and what line. What was the face of the first person she killed on the battlefield, and how did she kill them? Everything from trivial things to... Berry, who knew this, smiled a little troubled. That's probably because Krishsama is much smarter than I am. Unfortunately, even the important things are lost little by little when it comes to the past. B. Berry is much smarter than Chris J. Fufu, I'm glad Krishsama feels that way, but you shouldn't lie. She pressed her fingertips to her lips and smiled. You you you, Chris J said silently, and Berry stroked her head. From Chris J point of view, Berry was a lot smarter than most people. Not only could she calculate, but she has a broad and dexterous view of the world, and she can handle anything with ease and without waste. She was the best, even without favoritism, excluding Kreskenta, but if she thought about it calmly, she couldn't say that she was smarter than her in terms of simple intelligence. Chris J respects Berry and loves her more than anyone else. That's why the feeling she wanted to be so much higher than she existed in her heart, she wants to think that Berry is better than anyone in the world was. Berry was more than happy to hear that. However, she also believed that it should not hinder her growth. It's not like such a simple point of view who's inferior or not inferior will create a good relationship right. Krishsama already knows that, don't you? Yes. Facts are facts, and that's fine. Fufu, but I'm very happy that Krishsama thinks so. I must do my best not to disappoint Krishsama expectations. Berry lightly pressing her lips against hers, Chris J hugged her, her cheeks blushed. Berry is always better than Chris J thinks. That's because I'm stretching myself so that Krishsama thinks so. Stretch. Yes, I'm stretching myself because I want to show only my good points to Krishsama. Berry is amazing and splendid, and I'm glad that Krishsama thinks so, so I'm just doing my best to make it look that way. Berry laughed and patted cliché, saying that she herself was just as stubborn as Oju-sama. Chris J thought of Celine, the hard-working girl, and thought of herself against Berry. She then stared at Berry and she said a little shyly, Chris J might be showing her stretched out much more than Berry. Chris J stood on her tiptoe and stretched, bringing her face closer. She was less than five Shaku one son. Berry was petite even for a woman, but Chris J was even a little shorter than Berry. When standing together, Berry would either bend down or Chris J would stand taller. Then the heights finally matched and the difference between the two became zero. After enjoying her soft touch, Chris J said troubledly, Berry always bends over for Chris J, but it's not easy when Chris J stretches. Berry let out a giggle saying that's troubling, and stood on her tiptoe. As she stretched, she bent down slightly and kissed Chris J lightly. Is it always like this? Fufu, if someone looks at it from the side, it must be a stupid sight. Yes, it might be a little stupid. Berry smiled and put her heels down and caressed the girl lovingly. Chris J, too, 
was relieved to place her heels on the floor and pressed her face against Berry's. Berry looked around the room. One more memory, but a memory is a memory there was nothing more important than the present. Berry said goodbye in her heart and took Krish's hand. Well, it's settled to some extent, so let's take a bath soon. Eh hey, yes. Um, mm, can I make cookies later? For Obasan, ah, uh, yes, of course. I am sure she will be delighted. The last memories of this estate. Berry smiled a little sadly, but happily. Chapter 124, Kalka Village. A few more days after Gargain, Mia and Kalua separated from Chrisjay and the other at Kilnan, and Chrisjay continued northeast for about a day. About a day later, they saw a road leading into the forest from the middle of the road. It was such a narrow road that it was impossible for carriages to pass each other. Proceeding further down the snow-covered road, she finally arrived at a familiar place. Snow piled up on a simple protective fence that didn't have much meaning, and a vigilante man and a boy with boughs stood on a small watchtower that could be called a platform that was only slightly taller than a person. When they saw the carriage, they rang bells and shouted. With that, the villagers came out of their numerous hut-like houses as if in a panic. Berry, please be careful. I'm the one who's supposed to say that though. Fufu, thank you. The one chuckling was a beautiful red-headed servant. The first person to step out of the carriage onto the snow to hold her hand was a girl they also recognize. Rare silver hair. Her eyes, framed by her long eyelashes, were jewel-like purple. She was a little taller than she had been a few years before, and her figure was no longer that of a child. She was dressed in a hand-sewn hat and scarf, and was quite fluffy, but her hair was carefully arranged, and her cloak was simple but of a high quality that could be recognized at a glance as that of a nobleman. Her inner white shirt and black skirt peeking out from within were also quite different from what a village woman would wear. The girl, who was beautiful to begin with, was clothed in the noble atmosphere of a born noblewoman, and had become so beautiful that women who looked at her from a distance admired her at first sight. Chris J. Enitan an androgynous voice in the transitional stage of voice change. The boy jumped down from the watchtower and stood in front of Chris J, a big smile on his face. Mmm, Pell was it? What, did you forget my face? It's not like that. But it's been a long time. It seems you've grown up a lot. Of course, it's already three years ago. He was the boy Chris J used to teach swordsmanship. He was two years younger than Chris J. He should have been as tall as Chris J at the time, but he's a head taller than Chris J, who should have grown since then. I guess you didn't grow tall at all, Chris J any chan. Hmm. Chris J thinks Chris J has grown quite a bit though. Physically, she should have grown. That being said, seeing how the boy in front of her was so taller than her, it might be that she didn't grow that much. She patted Pell on the head, wondering if she would grow a little more in a few years. Pell frantically blushed and pulled back. It's hard to pet Pell head when Pell has grown this big. It used to be easy. Humph, I think I was already bigger by the time Chris J. Enichan left the village. Besides, I'm not at the age to be petted anymore. The closer the distance, the more beautiful Chris J. was, and it was a poison to the eyes of a boy who had entered puberty. The village also has some cute girls in the same age group, but Krish's beauty was no longer within the range of being the most beautiful in the village. Pell distanced himself from Chris J, who seemed to be in too good a mood as before, realizing that she could never be the same as before. Pell distanced himself from Chris J, who didn't change at all from before, realizing that he could never be the same as before. He had seen her cut down bandits up close and heard of her exploits on the battlefield. Furthermore, she was a noble he was worried that she might be a different person now. But while Pell was relieved to see that she looked the same as before, he couldn't help but look away, unable to suppress his throbbing. At the end of his line of sight were five people wearing black armor. Everyone looked like they were soldiers and had a sense of intimidation. He assumed that this might be the rumored black century, and turned his attention to the out-of-place servant girl. She didn't have Krish's dreamlike beauty that made one lose a sense of reality. Her face was young for a face that was bright and gorgeous. Her height, which is not so different from Krish's, and her large brown eyes probably make her look that way. However, if you look at her, you can immediately tell that she had a very well-proportioned face, 
and the eyes that looked at Chris J standing next to her were endlessly kind and charming. Even through her apron dress, he could see her full plumpness, and compared to the slim Chris J, there's something more mature and feminine about her her eyes suddenly glanced at Pell. Question mark. The red-haired girl looked at Pell curiously as their gazes met, then giggled and put her hands in front of her. She gave a slow and beautiful bow. Nice to meet you, I'm Christ and family. Krish Sama's servant Barry Argan. Ah, why eh, nice to meet you, I'm P. Pell. Mm, thank you, uh, taking care Krishna-chan. Berry smiled as if she was troubled by the voice that was cracking, but to Pell, it looked charming. The tension in him grew stronger and stronger. The fact that she gave her family name naturally meant that she came from a good family. Perhaps she was a noble. Pell spoke to Chris J, who was now a great noble, in the same tone as before, but he couldn't do that to her who he just met for the first time. The soldiers guarding her let out an unbearable laugh, and the one-eyed man said, Argansama seems to be a poison to this boy's eyes. He's so mesmerized that his voice cracked. Such a thing. He's just nervous. The red-haired girl said reproachfully, and Chris J furrowed her brows and glared at the one-eyed man. Killick. Killick, how can you say that Berry is poisonous? Even if it's you, Chris J won't forgive it okay? Ha, huh, no, no, I didn't mean it like that. Killick stiffened at the unexpected retort. Berry hurriedly tried to stop the misunderstanding. K. Krishsama, um, that poison for the eye is. Berry knew that her appearance was better than average, and she is used to being looked at and told in that way. But when it came time to explaining it, it was nothing short of embarrassing, and Berry blushed stuttered while blushing. Killick, aware that he had put this beautiful servant in a tight spot, hurriedly straightened his posture at the sight of her. He saluted and told Chris J. Even good medicine turns into poison if you take too much of it. In turn, he was so mesmerized by Argansama's beauty that he couldn't concentrate. It was not, in the sense, to disparage Argansama. Is that so? Berry. A, hey, mm, that, yes. Is she trying to embarrass herself? Even though Bray knew that's not true, she was so embarrassed that she couldn't help but think so. Berry's white cheeks were flushed, and even her were dyed red. Chris J also realized that she had misunderstood something, and while she nodded while thinking there was such an expression, she turned to Pell. It's not good. Pell is not allowed to look at the berry while Chris J is around, do you understand? A. Hum. Ku Krishnichen, I am not. Pell must have been fascinated by the beautiful berry. Right. And no, ah. Uh -huh. What arose was nothing short of a tragedy for the adolescent boy. Killick and the others looked at the boys who were mesmerized over Berry, who looked embarrassed, in pity. Christian. It was a loud voice. A well-dressed woman ran toward her, and Chris J, seeing her, left Pell and ran toward her. Obasan, it's been a long time, Mug. It's been a while, you've grown so much. Chris J was crushed in Gara's arm, whom she had not seen for a long time. Killick and the others were taken aback, and Berry seemed to panic a little. However, seeing Gala's happy smile with tears at the corners of her eyes, Berry and the others understood who she was, and were convinced. Obasan, it hurts. Oh, I'm sorry, I was so happy. No. Eh he, long time no see, Obasan. Chris J smiled, and Gala smiled, too. Oh, welcome home cliché. How are you doing? She smiled, her smile was gentle and full of affection. Yes, I'm fine. I heard that your Obasan collapsed. Ah, I'm sorry for worrying you. Gala smiled as usual but went to her house it didn't come to that. A short old man appeared, wading through the crowd that Gala had come through. He was the village chief. Cree, no, Alberiniasama, welcome to our village. Mr. Village Chief. It's been a while. Yes, yes, for now, this way. The village chief lowered his head and pointed his large house to Chris J. A reunion with Gala that was the purpose of this trip, but even so, there was her position and courtesy to go through. The first thing to do was to greet the village chief, who will be taking care of her in various ways during her stay. Hmm, that's right. Obasan, later. Ah, come over later, I'll be waiting for you. Yes. The same gentle face as before. Chris J smiled and nodded at Gala, 
ordered Kilik and the others to move the carriage, and followed behind the village chief. When they visited the village chief's house, they would serve the town sweets and tea, which they had never seen before when they lived in the village, and welcome the other party with beautiful words and words of welcome. In contrast to Chris J, who has now become a great noble of the kingdom, the faces of the village chief and the men were indescribable with an air of fear about the way they had treated her in the past. He told them that he would host them with a grand feast tonight, and was desperate with Krish, who told them not to worry about them in particular. Given the power that Chris J now held, she could do whatever she wanted with a small village like this. For them, offending Chris J who were in control of their life and death, meant death. Considering this, it was only natural for them to show such hospitality. In addition, they also have a certain sense of guilt and debt about what they have done. It couldn't be said that they weren't lashing out at her in order to drown their sorrows over the death of so many villagers. Many expressed remorse for what they had done too harshly, and some of the men apologized personally. Quite different were the women and children, who were simply delighted to see her growth and welcomed her reunion after so many years, seeing her even more beautiful. They had heard about her performance on the battlefield. The peddlers and the men who went out to Gargain, in particular, have often delivered rumors about Chris J, so there was some uneasiness, but Chris J herself is the same as she was before. More than anything else, they were delighted to see the girl, who was a little strange and cute, just like she used to be. She greeted familiar faces over and over again until they reached Gala's house, and it was well after noon when she was finally able to settle down. Killick and the others were pulled away by the children who wanted them to teach them. At Gala's house there are three people, Chris J, Berry, and Gala. Berry was a bit bewildered by the first experience of sitting directly on the floor, but she brewed a pot of tea in the tea kettle she had brought and put the cookies they had made on a plate. Gala was talking to the two while admiring Berry's polite response to a commoner despite being a noble herself. Even so, you've really grown. Pell said Chris J was small. Many of the children become bigger than Chris J. Ha ha ha, I guess you can't compare it to a man. But you have really become a beautiful woman. I guess going to the city was the right choice after all. It suits you well. A simple linen robe worn by women in the village. Her beauty was out of place since the time she wore it. But in this way, she felt that it really suits Chris J as a noble, and that she shouldn't have spent her time in a village like this. She heard all the rumors about her. That she went to the Christand family and spent time as their adopted daughter. That she went to war and her exploits. That she was also born into a royal family that was abandoned as a cursed child. For some reason or another, she was picked up in this village, but she should have lived in a glamorous place. Gala again felt that she had made the right choice. The red-haired servant who Chris J leaned on as if asking to be pampered looking at her relationship with Berry, she could feel that she was happy now, and that made her happy. Of course, to Gala, it was a little lonely, but she's glad from the bottom of her heart. Chris J doesn't think Chris's face has changed much, though. Rather, is Obasan's body really all right? Ah, as you can see, I'm perfectly healthy. Because I was able to meet Chris Chan like this, all the bad things were blown away. It's true that she was unwell, but one of the reasons was her anxiety. Civil war the Christ and army, which has lost its hero and was in an inferior position. Gala had been worried about Chris J, who was fighting there, and just at that time she fell ill with an epidemic and collapsed. The other day she had collapsed while working in the fields, though not perfect, she didn't have a fever and was stable now. Gala glanced at Chris J as she looked at the cookies on the plate, smiled, took one and put it in her mouth. The cookies were not the nut cookies that Gala used to make, but the sweetness was probably honey. It's just a little too sweet, but she knew exactly whose taste it was. It's delicious. Did you make these, Krishchan? Yes, together with Berry, for Obisan. Berry is a very good cook. Berry taught Chris J how to make these cookies. Fufu, is that so? Guess I'm no match for Krishchan anymore. I wonder if it's because the teacher is good. Berry chuckled at the excited Chris J, and Gala looked at her. No, I'm really good. I have to say thank you to Berry San. Thanks to you, Krishchan looks very happy. No, it's more like Krishsama is the one making me happy. I've always thought that she must have grown up surrounded by good people in the village. I'm a country girl, 
so I'll take your flattery seriously. However, if it's a good person, this child's mother is the best. She laughed nostalgically. She was clumsy and scatterbrained, but she was really a good kid. She's my proud little sister she's called Grace. I've heard from Chris J. It's true, Mom, was really clumsy. When Chris J said as she recalled, Gala smiled a little relieved. She was a little worried that Grace's death might be difficult for her to accept. Chris J, on the other hand, recalled Grace's clumsiness and frowned. She said she will help Chris J, but she put too much salt in the pot, and she insisted she couldn't just leave the cleaning to her daughter alone, and blew away the dust Chris J had collected. Her clumsy appearance for some reason, and came to her mind. She was a very respectable and kind mother, but her clumsy behavior was similar to Anne's, and she was probably close in terms the same kind of person. There was something inside Chris J that didn't want to admit. Like Berisan now, Chris Chan was always attached to her. Fufu, I can remember it like it was yesterday. Is that so? I have to visit the grave later. Haha, -ha. Grace would be happy to hear that Chris Chan has a sister like Berisan. Sister. Berry smiled wryly, as if troubled. Ah, uh, for the record I'll be thirty soon, so being called an older sister is. What? Gala's eye opened wide and stiffen. Then she furrowed her brow and brought her face closer to look at Berry. No matter how you look at it, she was at best just a little older than Chris J. Nobles are often mistaken because they age slowly. I is that so? You're not that different from Grace. No, but, thirty. Grace married Gorka at fourteen, and was thirty when she died. Even Gara was about two years older than that, not so different from Berry. She looked like a girl, who was not even twenty, though she thought she was quite a calm and thoughtful child, she was convinced of the reason. It's strange, isn't it like that? Nobles deal with something called magic power, so I'm told it has an effect on them. That means, Christian too. Well, it seems that there are quite a few individual differences depending on the person. Even those who possess magical power can begin to age somewhat at the age of thirty, but Berry was much slower in this respect. According to research, the aging process slows down in proportion to the amount of magic power used in daily life, and this effect was probably stronger on Berry, who was originally weak and relied on magic power in her daily life. She even wondered if Chris J, who relied more on magic than Berry, would even grow old. He, you're married? Um, ah, uh, yes. Um, the circumstances around that area seem to be different from those in the village. Berry looked at Chris J for a moment, her cheeks blushing and answered vaguely. Most noble women were married before they turned thirty. There are a good number of those who marry beyond that, like Vanatella, but they are generally considered late. Berry, not wanting to get into that area too much, replied like that. Eh he, Berry won't become a bride, so she'll always be with Chris J. Ha ha, I see, this must be difficult. Gala gave a wry smile and stroked Chris J. It must be hard but I'm still happy. She guesses that Berry probably won't leave while taking care of Chris J. Gala was convinced of this. But that's a misunderstanding just like Chris J said, Berry intended to do that, but Berry smiled vaguely while understanding the misunderstanding. She felt a little guilty, but she couldn't openly say that she offered her name to Chris J. She sighed in her heart as thinking it couldn't be helped. If someone like Berry San is by Chris Chan's side, then I'm relieved. A lot has happened, so I want Christian to be really happy. Gala nodded deeply as she listened to the flute outside. They must be practicing before the banquet. The sound was coming from everywhere, as if the villagers were rushing around to prepare for the banquet. Everyone had been informed that Chris J was coming, and it had been decided long before that a banquet would be held to coincide with that. Naturally, preparations had already been made, but it was still a journey after all. It was only natural that the schedule would be disrupted for a day or two depending on the weather, and in the end, full-fledged preparations could only be made on the day of the event. Because of that, the whole village was rushing to prepare for it. There's a lot of commotion for the banquet today. Actually, the first thing I should do is go and show Grace Chan how Chris Chan is doing, but we're talking about leaving the day after tomorrow. Chris Chan, shall we visit the grave tomorrow after the village settles down? Yes. If it's preparing for the banquet, Chris J would like to help as well. 
Haha, it's kind of strange for Krishchan to prepare for a party to welcome Krishchan. Well, if Krishchan says so, I will take you up on it. Gala happily smiled at Krishche, who was still the same as before, and stood up. Today, as usual, I plan to bake a lot of pies in my oven. Can you help me? Yes, do you want to make pumpkin pie too? Of course, Krishchan's pumpkin pie is the best after all. Berry smiled at Krish's happy face and stands up. If that's the case, please let me help you. I don't know if I can be of much help, but that's reassuring. The confrontation of Krishchan's old and new cooking teacher. I need you to show me your skills. Fufu, yes. I heard that Galasama taught Krishsama the basics, so I won't hold back either. Stop calling me Sama, it's so embarrassing. Gala laughed and nodded. Chapter 125, The Moon on the Water Surface Snow was lightly removed from the village square, which was brightly lit by a bonfire despite the night. There, the sound of flutes and drums echoed, and the snow falling from the sky sparkled and shimmered on the bonfire. Here. A.R., thank you. Chris J. joined the women of the village in distributing the meal. The man who received the pie looked very uneasy, but he obediently accepted the pie and thanked her. In the first place, it was a banquet for Chris J., but the women didn't have much doubts about her wanting to help. At village banquets and festivals, the village women cook and serve the food. Since Chris J. always spent time with her mother Grace and Gala on such occasions, it was more comfortable for her to work in this way than to sit in silence. Besides, Krish's interest was always in food. She was happy to serve the food and nibbled on the various dishes, she was enjoying the feast well before the event began. Berry smiled wryly at her, and of course she also helped the women. And if Chris J was to work, Killick and the others would start helping out, so the entertainment did not even begin and the banquet began to fall into chaos. Finally when Pell called out to Chris J, she finally took a seat at the table that had been prepared for her. For the time being, it's treated as the seat of a guest of honor, but it's a simple one with just a chair and a table. When Chris J climbed onto Berry's lap as if a matter of course, Berry smiled a little troubled, but left it as it was, assuming that there would be no problem after looking at the surroundings. Pell sighs exasperated. Krishna Chan is still the same in many ways, hum, doing whatever she pleases, or rather, Krishnichan is the main character today. Even if Pell said Chris J is the main character, Chris J was not told what to do. If it's a wedding or something like that, the star of the show is the woman sitting there, not working. It's their job to sit down. Ha, huh. and the aunties also won't say anything about it either. Ha ha, no, it's been a long time since everyone worked with Krishchan, so. Gala gave a wry smile, and Chris J picked up a small fruit and pushed it into Pell's open mouth. Pell backed away greatly while his face turned bright red. W what are you doing? Getting angry over small things like that is a no, no. It's a rule that everyone should have fun at festivals and banquets. Why you know? It still doesn't seem to work hum. If Chris J remembers correctly, Pell when is angry or crying, he should have calmed down if Chris J let him eat fruit. Just how long ago do you think that was? Berry, holding Chris J, chuckled happily and Pell blushed more and more. And it was Chris J who noticed it. Mew, Chris J said not to, but Pell looked at Berry again. Chris J might have to tell Pell's mother about this and get her to spank you. No, stop. I'm not at that age anymore. Pell is two years younger than Chris J. When Chris J thinks about it, Chris J from two years ago was still a kid, so Pell is still a kid after all. I'm sure I'm better than Krishnichan, who's still a child even now. The women who were watching also laughed as Gala held her stomach at the sight. Berry also laughed and lightly embraced Krish's body, saying, that's no good Krish-sama. Please forget about poison for the eyes. It's embarrassing even for me. It's just a joke from Kilik-sama. Joke. But it's true when Pell is looking at Berry, it seems like he's absent-minded. Anyway, let's stop talking about that. Krishnichan is too extreme. Look. The village chief is here. The village chief, who was wondering what to do since the guest of honor, Chris J, had not taken her seat, seized the opportunity to give a light greeting. He told everyone about the purpose of the banquet, treating Chris J and Galen as heroes who have left the village and saying that he was most happy to welcome them home. 
He did not touch on the circumstances of Krish's departure from the village, and the content of the speech was harmless stuff, but his worry was evident in every word. As he finished, the tone of the flute changed and the hunters with bows stepped forward. They lined up, facing the forest with their bows poised, and with the accelerating music, they pulled the strings. It was an archery ceremony that showed gratitude to the forest. They asked for permission to lavishly use the bounty of the forest for the feast, pray that they will continue to receive the same bounty, and released their arrows. As the strings sounded in unison with the beat of the drums and the arrows disappeared into the snowy forest, the tone of the flute changed once again. That signaled the beginning, and what followed was an entertainment contest. The village's best men gathered to decide who was the best in the village in a variety of events. There were several categories, such as hoisting alcohol barrel contests to test one's strength, a flag-capturing contest in which contestants ran to capture the flag at the finish line, and a target-shooting contest to test their archery skills. The target-shooting was especially exciting because it was a battle between hunters of high status in the village, but now that the undefeated champion Galen is gone, everyone seems to be even more enthusiastic than before. The most exciting battle was the sword fight. The popularity of this event was also high because of its flashy appearance and the fact that the winner was clear-cut. The fact that any man, as long as he was not a child, could participate in the event was also a big factor. Yeah, just you see. I'll be able to participate from this year. Be careful, okay. Pell gets injured a lot after all. Forcibly invited by the men of the village, the one-eyed leader of the 19th squad, Killick, joined as the representative of the Black Flag Special Forces. About 20 people participate in the swordsmanship competition. Pell narrowly won the first match, but was beaten by the favorites in the second. However, the candidate for the championship was also defeated by Killick in the next match, and in the end, an outsider won the sword fight contest, and the atmosphere became awkward. Killick's swordsmanship was second only to Kalua's in the Black Flag Special Force. The village's best men weren't an opponent to him, but even so, as long as Chris J was watching, they couldn't cut corners, and the result was a tragedy. After thinking about how to deal with the atmosphere, he called out to Chris J. As a reward for being the winner, he asked her to about for the first time in a while. Killick, who doesn't know the circumstances behind Chris J's departure from the village, thought that seeing her sword skills would make the place much more lively, but it had the opposite effect. That suggestion made the place feel even more awkward, but Chris J was not a man who could read the atmosphere. As a reward for her subordinates, she stepped forward without being concerned about it. Chris J sword, which had slain the bandit. No one had forgotten it, and for a moment the atmosphere became delicate, but once it began, however, the banquet became quite lively. The dance like Chris swordsmanship, when performed in a place like this, was exactly what you would call a sword dance and it was more beautiful than it was terrifying. From Krish's point of view, it was like giving training to her soldiers. Not decide who wins or loses, but to point out what was wrong and lure him to swing his sword. The battle between the two was a spectacular performance. Although Killick showed overwhelming power, he was like a baby against Chris J. He desperately chased after her, but his sword cut through the air without catching her. Nevertheless, the sound and power of the sword was so powerful that even if it had been avoided, it would have been powerful. The villagers, watching with bated breath Berry watched the battle from her seat, smiling wryly at Gala, who looked at Chris J with concern. Even that bogan became no match to Chris J in a short time. She knew this, so she had no worries and could watch on with peace of mind. Well, I really think she will be fine, but I just can't help it. Fufu, at first I was worried too but I got used to it. That said as expected, when it's time for her to fight on the battlefield, I'm still worried. Gala stared at Berry, nodded, and told her worriedly. Actually, it would be great if she didn't need to swing the sword and just live normally, but I guess I can't say that. That's true. Krishsama is strong after all. Berry nodded and answered. Cleaning the mansion and tending the orchard. Then spend the days in peace. Chris J was too strong to hope for such a life. Even the kind of opponents that Bogan and Celine needed to bet their life on, helplessly fell Chris's strength was much too strong. She has too much power to spend her days as a normal girl. That was both her strength and her misfortune. 
Long ago, I lost my son in an accident. Accident. He fell with his friend, being chased by a wild boar. It was around the time my husband died, so I didn't even know what I should live for. Honestly, I even thought about dying. Gala sipped the sake and lowered her eyes. At that time, because I had an oven in my house Christian came to bake pies almost every day. At first, I thought, please give me a break, but as I spent more and more time with her, I began to look forward to her coming to visit me. I couldn't help but find her adorable before I knew it. Gazing at the reflection of the sparkling surface of the water in the carved wooden cup. With a wry smile, Gala continued. I always knew that she was an unusual child, so at first, I was wondering what her intentions were. Maybe she just wanted to bake a pie, or maybe she really came to comfort me. My child hated that child, and he said a lot of cruel things, so I wondered one thing and another, such as whether that child might have something to do with it over and over again. Having said that, she suddenly relaxed her shoulders. But, when I saw that girl's happy smile when she baked a delicious pie, I didn't care about that kind of thing anymore. I got better and better, and we started to bake pies together, it's thanks to that girl and Grace that I'm alive now. Is that so? Berry sipped her drink, unable to say anything. She had a feeling that Gala didn't particularly want a response either. It was just a reminiscence. It's funny, at first when Grace told me she was going to raise Chrissy, I was more against it than anyone else because I thought she might be an abandoned child of some noble. But now she's more important to me than anyone else. Strange things sure do happen. Foo-foo. But isn't that what life is like? Things we don't understand accumulate and gradually become irreplaceable. Yeah, certainly. Maybe that's how it is. Anyway, said Gala. I want that child to be happier than anyone else. But as expected, with this much distance between us, all I can do is pray, so I was troubled. So, can I entrust you with that child? Yes, definitely. Berry nodded. For that reason, she had already vowed to live, so she had no hesitation or doubt in answering that. Gala smiled with satisfaction when she heard the answer. Ha ha, if it's you, I'm relieved. If Christian got married, I thought I'd beat him up, but I'd definitely like to leave that to you. Be beat him, is it? Ah, I won't forgive people who try to lay their hands on a pure child like Christian. I was worried some bad bugs might hover around her, so I'll leave that to you, okay? Wah. She was slapped on her back, and Berry answered yes with a troubled face. If she thought about who the worst insect was, Berry had someone who came to her mind more than anyone else. Her cheeks reddened and said, I will take it to heart. Having said that, if it makes her happy, there's nothing more to say. At the very least, I think Grace wanted that child to have that kind of happiness. Gala traced the rim of the cup nostalgically. She drew arcs and traced them. Did you ask that girl about her name? The chipped, arcing moon, wasn't it? It's a lovely name. Yeah, it's a good name that can mean a lot of things. Well, Grace didn't give it that much thought. She's a simple girl. Simple, is it? Reflecting the bonfire, the water surface on the wine cup drew a crescent moon. Gala laughed and nodded. It's simple. Seems she. Chris Che is back. Before they knew it, the bout was over. Berry was surprised when she jumped on her lap, and then hugged her with a wry smile so that she wouldn't fall. Welcome back, Krish Sama. I'm home. What were you talking about? Oh, some old memories. Christian is thirsty, right? Would you like some juice? Yes, thank you. When Christian nodded, Gala poured the juice and said, Obasan just said that Obasan is very grateful to Christian. That's why I asked Berisan to take care of Cliche Chan. Grateful. Chris J smiled as she thought about it. Ehehe, Chris J is also very grateful to Obasan. Obasan taught Chris J how to use the oven and how to make pies. Obasan was always nice to Chris J. Ha ha, that's so. That makes me happy. She stroked Chris's head and Chris J narrowed her eyes happily. Yes, so please tell Chris J anything. Chris J also loves Obasan, so Chris J wants to thank Obasan a lot. That's why Chris J wants to do a lot of things that make Obasan happy. Then, as she was about to say something, she stopped. She pondered something, stared at Gala, and then looked at Berry. 
What's wrong? Question mark. Berry also tilted her head and looked at Chris J. Chris J shook her head, her eyes downcast, sipped at her juice, and Gala chuckled. Isn't Chris Chan getting sleepy by now? She's been moving around so much, and she's always been a good sleeper. Certainly, it was early this morning. Are you going to take a rest? Chris J nodded hesitantly. Berry laughed with Gala and picked Chris J up. Despite your appearance, you're quite strong. Are you okay? Yes, I'm used to it. Now, Chris Sama, shall we go? Yes. Chris J nodded quietly and pressed her face against Berry. The next day, they prepared in the morning and went to visit the graves in the snowy forest. Last night, Chris J had been acting a little strange until she fell asleep, but this morning she was back to her normal self. Berry was relieved to see that, changed her clothes and waited for Gala. Gala arrived home just when the morning glow settled down. Unlike the neatly arranged cemeteries in the city, in the village, trees in the forest serve as graves. The burned bones and ashes were buried under the tree of their choice, and a wooden tag with their name written on it was placed on a branch. It was said that when the string on which it was hung naturally decayed and the wooden tag fell off, the dead person would be reborn in a new form. They have a close relationship with the forest, and apart from the blood-worshipping beliefs of the kingdom, which respects blood, they have an indigenous belief that has been handed down since ancient times. Flowers bloom, fruits grow, and seeds fall. In the village, people were said to live in this cycle, and death was not just death, but the beginning of a new life. It was probably created as a consolation for the many hunters who lost their lives while hunting. Berry bowed to the tree, surprised at the unusual shape of the grave. Gorka, Grace. Two wooden tags hung there and tied to the same string had their names written on them, followed by something written on them. It didn't seem to be the Western common language used in the kingdom, but it seemed to be an ancient script that Berry couldn't read. Chris J had them write words that meant that they may be husband and wife too the next time they were born. They were very close. I see. It seems that it was written as the same fate will be tied in the next life. Gala looked at Cliché as if she were a little surprised. In the book that Gatushu Sama had, there was something about the old language used around here. Ha! That's amazing. If Krishchan was in the village, she might have become a priest. I heard that learning the language is quite difficult but, hmm, there are quite a lot of words with similar meanings, so Chris J is not sure if Chris J properly understood it. No, 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 it's great if Chris Chan can even read that much. Chris Chan has always been smart after all. Gala approached the wooden tag and looked at the string. The string was a bit deteriorated and already had some fraying. The ropes were woven in different ways depending on how the person died. In the case of old age or the death of a parent with young children, the cord was woven like a firm rope so that the parents could stay in the village for a long time and watch over their children's growth. In the case of an unfortunate death, a thin rope was woven on purpose so that the person could leave early. In this sense, it was a little difficult to choose the right rope for these two. She felt that a thicker rope would be better for them, but the reason it became a little thinner was because Chris J said she was fine alone. At the time she wondered how it would be, but looking at Chris J now, Gala thought that this was fine. There are those who wish for a thicker cord because of their unfulfilled love for the dead, but no matter what happens, what is lost will not come back. Rather, it was considered better to wish for the rope to break quickly and for the dead to depart. Are Kasama and the others really here? Reincarnation, Chris J can't really believe it. Well, who knows? But if you think they are here, they are here, and if you think they are not, they are not. Gala said and looked up at the tree. But for now, Obasan thinks that she might be watching Krishchan from there like this. Whatever the truth is, I hope it's true, and I'm glad it is. They say people have a soul, but Grace and Gorka are watching over Krishchan. Gala smiled and stroked Krish's head. You interpret what you don't understand in the way that makes you happiest, not whether it's right or wrong. It's not about whether it's right or wrong, it's about how it should be. I believe that's what faith is all about. Is that so? But it's hard to hang around here without a body, so Chris J wants Karsama and the others to go on a journey soon and be happy. Ha ha ha, well, that's true. If Chris Chan said that, then Grace and Gorka would be relieved. 
Chris J bowed to the tree and Gala laughed happily. Barry chuckled at Chris J and bowed to the tree once more. There was so much gratitude that she couldn't put into words, and she really wished they were still here to watch over Chris J. After doing so for a while and looking up, Gala said, I'm sorry, but can I finish it too? Yes, it was close, right? Yeah, that tree over there. Mm. Gala continued on her way, stepping on the snow, and Cliché pulled Berry's hand, who was not used to this. Just as she had said, the tree Gala was aiming for was right nearby. Just. The wooden tag. When Gala saw it, she paused and stared blankly at the tree. The tree no longer had a tag, only a degraded and wound rope remains. She closed her eyes for a moment and crouched down. Gala scraped the snow with her hand and searched under it to find a frozen wooden tag. It was still hanging in the summer but, R.I.C. Because of the storm the other day hum. That's, uh, oh, it's my son. They said he died in an accident. Gala looked at the wooden tag for a while, and she traced the name written there lovingly. Chris J stared at Gala and then suddenly looked up at Berry. When Berry tilted his head, Chris J shook her head and looked at Gala again. He was stupid, selfish, and quick to quarrel. Well, he wasn't a good child, but I still feel lonely. No matter what I said, he was my cute only son after all. Berry was at a loss as to what to say to her, and couldn't think of the right words to say. Giving a wry smile to Berry, Gala said that she was fine. Well, I thought it was about time. It was many years ago, and I've sorted out my mind. This is how he's going to go, I'll be more than happy to see him off with a smile on my face. Berry nodded and bowed to the wooden tag held by Gala. Chris J stared at the situation and asked Gala, Do you want to bury it? Oh, I will. Can you help me? Yes, ah. Uh. Chris will bring a shovel. Chris J ran to the house and immediately brought a shovel. She shoved a wide swath of snow under the trees, poked the shovel into the frozen soil, repeated it several times, and then took a step back without saying a word. Gala looked at the wooden tag for a while, held it to her chest, and wiped her eyes several times. Then she carefully undid the piece of string that remained on the tree, put it together with the wooden tag, and slowly and regretfully placed it in the hole Chris J had dug. Next time, please properly live a long life so as not to make your parents sad. She nodded to Chris J, who then used the shovel to move back the soil, evened it lightly and covered it with snow. Gala bowed her head again, and Berry followed suit. Only Chris J watched Gala bowing like that for a while. With tomorrow's departure, Chris J and Berry had some work to do. They parted ways with Gala, saying that they would see each other later, and went through the procedures to buy food for the return trip. Chris J seemed to have something to say from visiting the grave, and she seemed to be confused. When asked what was wrong, she just shook her head as if she was lost. It must have been around the time they entered Chris's house, which Gala had taken care of, Berry made a pot of tea, and took a break. Watching her face floating in the tea, Chris J quietly opened her mouth. Berry. Yes. Berry smiled as usual. Somehow, faintly. She knew what Chris J was going to talk about. She wouldn't have thought so if it was just from what she heard from Gala last night. But with what happened in the grave, the way her purple eyes were shaking and a little frightened now. It reminded her of when she tried to kill Roland some time ago. She knew she killed bandits when she was in the village. She also knows what she looked like when she tried to kill Roland. If necessary, Chris J has no qualms about killing people. She didn't dare ask, but she thought maybe she had done something like that in the village. Killing bandits Berry did not know if that was truly the only kind of murder she had committed in the village. Obasan's child, a long time ago, Chris J killed him. What kind of person was the girl named Chris J? So with all of that in mind, Berry could predict those words. Chapter 126, The Chipped Girl's Sin and Punishment. Kale and Katia's. The two boys could be described as childhood friends. In a word, annoying. When Chris J was small, she was often dragged along in their fun. She was forced to go along with the unknown, make a believe fight, and roam the village under the guise of exploration. After being scolded by her father Gorka for going into the forest once, she stopped going along with them. It seemed doing something that broke the rules was fun to them, and their company was nothing but a detriment to Chris J, 
who sought recognition from others. Kale Kuhn and the others are playing, you know. I will do it, so Chris J just go play. They're bad boys, so Chris J doesn't enjoy playing with them. Chris J had much more fun helping Karsama. W well, I know they're a bit naughty and I know Chris J is angry about the other day, but it's not good to ignore them. Whether you turn them down or not, you still need to talk to them. Grace told her that at least they were inviting her to play with them because they think it's fun. Chris J also thought Grace was right and went over to them and honestly told them she didn't want to play with them because she didn't enjoy playing with them. If they were inviting her to play with them as a favor, it would be bad to refuse each time. She concluded that it would be better if she told them clearly so that they didn't have to ask her out again. Ah, T that's not what I mean, Chris J. Question mark. Um, hum, what should I say? Um, more importantly Karsama, the pot is boiling, is that okay? Uh. Her clumsy mother made a lot of mistakes, and Chris J wanted to follow her up, and she also loved spending time with Grace. She had plenty of work to do if she wanted to help her mother, and she learned more than she would have with the two children. Karsama, mmm, the soup has too much salt even before the ingredients are added, a little, just a little bit, it's hard for Chris J. T that so, I'm sorry. Ah, no, it's okay, Karsama must be tired from a lot of work, so please sit down. Chris J will make dinner tonight. Especially since she started cooking. After that, the two stopped inviting her to hang out, but instead, they rolled up her skirt, badmouthed her, and harassed her. It was unpleasant, but it was her who refused their favors. Chris J decided to put up with it to some extent. The harassment at that time was trivial, and everyone understood that it was them that was at fault. Thinking that there would be no problem if she left it alone, she spent her days as normal. The trigger that changed that was probably after she showed up at the training ground. We never know when disaster will befall us. At that time, the only thing that can protect you is your own sword, and as we gain strength, we can protect those we love. Know that what you are wielding is not violence, but the power to protect others in times of need. One day, when she happened to pass by the training ground, the vigilante leader Zar was telling the children such a story. She had always thought it was a good idea to learn to use a sword for protection, and she was interested in it, but since Grace hated violence, she found it difficult to bring it up. But those words seemed good to say. Not just for herself, but for someone else. Learning violence to protect someone in an emergency it was a convenient excuse to start learning the sword, and if not for Gorka and Galen, who were great hunters, then at least for Mother. If Mother was in danger, the person who could help her would be her, the person who was closest to her. Chris J told Grace that and asked her if she would be allowed to participate in the training. That night, thanks to Galen and Gorka nodding their heads in agreement, she was allowed to participate in the training despite Grace repeatedly telling her to be careful not to injure herself. Women were allowed to participate if they wanted to, while men were forced to participate once they were able to hold a sword. Naturally, Kale and Katia's were there as well, and when Chris J visited the training grounds, she was harassed as usual. She was fed up with the harassment, which had been going on ever since she turned down their invitation, and it was annoying to have it interfere with her training. If Chris J shows them that Chris J is much stronger, it will surely disappear, she thought. He simply thought so, and after learning the basics of the sword lightly, she decided to show them that on the second day. The two of them were not good at giving up and challenged her many times, so she beat them again and again until they gave up their lack of giving up was not a bad thing as a training partner. Each time she would change her method, play her sword and make them fall, and continued until finally they both cried and left. Grace. What kind of education are you giving that child? No matter how much training it is, Katia's came home crying, you know? Sorry. Stop Kanya. It's a children's quarrel, really. That idiot Kale, your Katia's must have been mean to Krishchan. It's a good lesson, it's going to make them a little more mature. You were too energetic to begin with. The next day, Katia's mother stormed into the house. Gala took control of the situation smiling and saying that Chris J was not to blame. Chris J thought so too, and she didn't hit them with the wooden sword, and she was a little careful when she made him fall. She didn't understand why Katsia's mother was angry. Chris J didn't hurt them or anything. 
The two of them said they wanted to fight many times, so we just had a match. Chris J was angry with them, so you decided to make them cry, didn't you? Chris J didn't want to make them cry. At first, Chris J thought that if they found out that Chris J was stronger than them, they might stop harassing Chris J. After Gala and Katia's mother left, Grace sighed troubled. Is that so? I think both sides are at fault this time. Of course, it's their fault for being mean all this time, and I think Chris J is also a bit at fault to try to do something about it with force. Chris J is also bad? Yes. We have a mouth that we can use to talk properly, so if you want them to stop doing something, you should have a proper discussion first. If you use your power, the other person may listen to what you say, but if that's the correct way to do it, the strongest person is the greatest, and he ends up being obeyed by anyone after all. She held Chris J gently and stroked her head. The touch Grace gives always felt good for Chris J. When there really is nothing you can do about it, there may be situations where you need power, but… but that is only a last resort. I want Chris J to be a child who can solve various problems properly by talking. I know Chris J is not good at talking, but I think Chris J is a good girl who can do that kind of thing. Good child. Yes, Chris J is my proud daughter after all. If there is something that is difficult to say or that you cannot solve by yourself, I will always cooperate with you. I may be unreliable, but Chris J should rely on me once in a while. I am your mother after all. Chris J thought about Grace's words a lot. But it seems to her that it was not wrong to think that the strongest person was the greatest. She thought it would be nice if she could be the strongest and that would solve all the problems. For Chris J, this idea was more appealing than anything else. Children were troublesome when they cried. On the other hand, if it's an adult to some extent, they probably wouldn't cry and tattle. She trained hard against adults, and within a week she was losing less and less, and within a month she was losing to no one but Tsar. When they began to have trouble fighting Chris J, what she began to hear was malicious gossip about Chris J. She's creepy, she's crazy. These were words she hadn't heard in a long time, although they had been said to her often when she was a child, when she used to walk silently behind Grace. Strangely, they seemed to be telling stories that she didn't have any recollections of, such as that the chicken they kept died because Chris J killed it, or that she took out the intestines of the rabbit and ate it. She then realized that it was Kale and Katia's who were spreading it. Maybe it wasn't all. By that time, she had finally begun to realize that it would not be good for her reputation if she beat them too severely, even though it was a match, and she also understood that she had lowered her reputation a lot without realizing it. However, it was also troubling if it spread further. The overt harassment had disappeared, such as the Krish's laundry being the only one falling to the ground, but they continued to harass her in the dark. She thought about having an opportunity to talk with them, just like her mother had told her. However, even if she was asking them to stop swearing and harassing her, there was no reason for Chris J to bow to them in the first place. She had turned down their invitations in the past to go this far just for that reason was beyond somewhat unpleasant. Even if she bowed down to them and asked them to stop, she thought that they would only be more impudent because of it. If she made them think that if they harass her, Chris J will give in and act subservient, then the same thing may happen again and again. Chris J said nothing to Grace. It was because relying on Grace and causing trouble was not something that could be tolerated within Chris J. But Grace tried to talk to them for Chris's sake, but she apologized with a troubled face saying they ran away. She looked at her face and thought for a moment. Why is this guy here, Karchan? Why do you say that? Today is for your tenth birthday feast. And Krishchan said she will also help me. I will never eat that guy's pie all right, it's disgusting. Kale. Boys who turned ten that year were allowed to become apprentices to hunters, and as a turning point, they became the stars of the spring festival. Gala had been looking out for Chris J for a long time and invited her to serve pies there. Maybe that would solve this nonsense, she thought. Chris J, who had been wondering what to do, agreed. She thought she should at least make an effort for Grace, who had gone out of her way to help her. I'm sorry, no matter how many times I said to that stupid son, of mine. I'm really sorry for Chris Chan. No, Chris J doesn't mind. Thank you. I'm really sorry. It's true that she didn't he care. For Chris J, it was meant as a last resort, 
and if he was unwilling to comply, so be it. An existence that makes Chris J uncomfortable and brings disadvantages just by being alive. It's just like the dirt and dust in the house. Simply, if you see it, you clean it up. At least they are not needed around Chris J, and at least Chris J has nothing to worry about even without them. The rule is just a rule, such as not to kill people. The only reason Chris J kept them was simply for the sake of her reputation in the community. If it would be a disadvantage for Chris J, there was no need to follow it, and even if she killed the two of them, it wouldn't be a problem if it wasn't exposed. Chris J had the power to do so, and once she killed them, there was no need to listen to them. They will have neither a mouth to speak nor limbs to harass her after all. She started preparing on that day, and a few days later, she got rid of them. They would never be able to make her uncomfortable again. On the day of the murder, it took her less than half an hour to finish the job, and she helped her mother with her work, feeling refreshed. Gala was sad after the two bodies were found, but Chris J didn't particularly care. She had been allowed to use the oven in Gala's house for a long time, but it was rather convenient because Kale was always getting in the way. Every day she would go to her house, now that she was alone, to bake pies. Krishchan. The oven again? Yes. Also, Karsama said, if Obasan doesn't mind, would you like to have dinner with us? If that's the case, let's have it together. I'm sorry, making Krishchan worry about me. No, Chris J is also allowed to use the oven, and Chris J is very grateful to Obasan for being so kind to Chris J. Gala hugged Chris J and shook her shoulders. I'm sorry, can we stay like this for a little bit? Yes, it's okay. Chris J also likes to be squeezed by an Obasan. Chris J smiled at the sensation. Since then, Gala has been much kinder to Chris J than before. Shortly after that Chris J heard, Katya's mother who wasn't originally friendly to Chris J, and was rather mean, had disappeared while picking edible wild plants. Many unpleasant things disappeared from the village. From the bottom of her heart, she was glad she had killed them both. She didn't question it at the time, and didn't think much of it afterwards. But, Barry listened silently to the old story that was being narrated. Why is Krishsama telling me this? Chris J doesn't he want to hide something, from Barry, so Chris J decided to tell Barry properly. Chris J continued, peeking at Barry's face. After that, Chris J also killed the uncle who was touching Chris's body even before the bandits came, but there was a good reason for both, and even now Chris J still honestly doesn't think Chris J was at fault. Chris J waited for Barry to speak. Barry took in the situation and replied, Is that so? If Chris Sama thinks so, I think so too. Hey. Barry smiled at the confused Chris J. I'm always on Krishsama's side, so it's only natural. If Krishsama says it's right from the bottom of her heart, I'll believe in the same truth as Krishsama. Then she leaned in closer. She looked Chris J straight in the eye and put her hand on her cheek. Please don't worry. I won't hate Krishsama, and even if everyone in the world hates Krishsama, I will still love Krishsama. Because I made a vow and decided like that. Therefore, there is no need to be afraid of being disliked by me. That, that is. Whether it's a sin or not, my number one priority is Krishsama. If Krishsama is to be blamed for that, I will say to that person that Krishsama is right, and I will proudly say that. W wait, wait, please, that's not what Chris J meant. Chris J said in a panic, and Berry, who saw that, chuckled and stroked her head. Then hugged her and asked. Then, what was Krishsama's intention? Th the truth is, Chris J knew it wasn't right, and it s something Berry didn't like. Does Krishsama want me to scold you? Don't know. Berry stroked the bewildered Krish's hair and waited patiently. It's not something that can be easily taught, such as what should be done this way, what should be done that way, and there was no correct answer. If Chris J truly believes that the answer she had just given was the right one, that's fine with Berry but she just thought that it should not be something she could say without hesitation and without worrying about it. What Chris J just said wasn't all a lie, Chris J really thinks so. Even now, Chris J thinks it can't be helped at that time, but Chris J felt very, very bad that Chris J made Obasan sad, but that was a long time ago. So Chris J, don't know what to do. Is, what Krishsama wants to know is whether she should apologize to Gala Sama who doesn't know anything 
or should she keep it a secret? Yes. If there was such a thing as a brilliant answer, she might have wondered if she should tell her. But there was no such answer anywhere. Chris J is like Obasan. Chris J met her for the first time in a long time, and Chris J wanted to make her Obasan happy. But when Chris J remembered that Chris J made Obasan so sad, Chris J wondered if it was really okay or not. It was not about killing people. What Chris J felt guilty about was that she made Gala sad because of it. Chris J did it, knowing it was wrong. Chris J thinks Chris J should apologize properly. But Chris J kept it a secret. So Obasan didn't know either. Chris J thought that if Obasan knew, Obasan would be very sad. But, uh, Chris J doesn't really understand. She didn't think killing people was a bad thing. She killed if necessary. She was originally a person who did not even question it. She learned the rules to fit into society, judged right and wrong against what's right in those rules, and tried hard to be a good girl. She said she couldn't help it, she said she knew it was bad. She regretted not that she killed someone, but that she broke the rules. And she regretted that she made Gala sad. And very sure that the reason she went out of her way to say this was because she was there. She knew she was dependent on her. She knew she was trying hard to be a good girl that she liked. So she seemed to want to be scolded by her in order to manage her guilt. She didn't understand what was normal for people. The good, the bad, the right, and the wrong. She thought it was because she was abnormal and had given up. That's why she needed guidance. She couldn't see the bad things as bad, and she hated herself for that. Chris J is weird, so Chris J doesn't think it's sad or painful to kill someone. Chris J is fine. L. But when Berry sees Chris J, Berry feels painful and sad, right? What this girl longed for was trivial and nothing, just a mere normal. But she knew that her values were out of sync with the norm, and so she entrusted them to her. She was asking her, because she felt that what was right for Berry a normal sin was a sin, and she wanted to accept the punishment. Chris Sama sure is beautiful. Berry, an old sin, even though she didn't need to say it. Rather, if it was truly normal, they would have stayed silent and pretended nothing ever happened. That way, they would not be hurt and the truth could be buried in the dark without causing trouble to anyone. But she was too clumsy to make such a choice. Because she wished more than anyone else, the natural normal. If Krishsama asked me anything, I will try to answer as much as possible. Sometimes she wondered what happiness meant to her. Berry was willing to teach her many things to make her happy, but what bothered her the most was probably the normal happiness that Berry presented. Was it really her happiness for her show Righteous Argument? If she did not know, if she had not been taught, she would have been happy without question. She was stronger and more complete than anyone else, she had that much power and everything. She was sure she could have made her happier than anyone else but she sometimes wondered if she was making her weaker and unhappier than anyone else, and that's why she couldn't answer her own question. But, I still cannot answer that question. It's easy to just say it, and if she presents it appropriately, randomly, it would solve her current troubles. However, it would only solve it, and it would be nothing more than a stopgap that did not lead to the resolution of the fundamental problem. She herself must have been a cowardly villain, she always pushed her selfish good intentions on her and always pushed her around. Even while recognizing that. Like I said earlier. I think what Krishsama thinks, worries, and feels right should be the answer. Berry told her so. Chapter 127 The Arcing Moon The sky was quite clear this evening. The stars were twinkling, and the cold wind was blowing gently. Rising in the sky was a beautiful crescent moon, chipped and arched. It shone in the middle of the sky, fleetingly, it shone silvery white and illuminated the surroundings. Slowly warming her hands with her breath, Berry looked up at the sky. The large, chipped arc was distorted, yet infinitely beautiful. It waxed and waned repeatedly, far from the perfection of a perfect circle, and it seemed in danger of suddenly disappearing from the sky. Berry liked the appearance of that moon. The crisp sound of treading snow echoed from behind her. The steps were just a little slow, erratic, and unsteady. Berry turned around at the sound of approaching footsteps. Welcome back, Krishsama. Yes. Embracing the little body by her side, she combed her silver hair, which resembled the moonlight. Then she stroked it gently. 
Chris J couldn't say. Is that so? Berry said, inviting her inside her own cloak. Look, you can see a beautiful moon today. Like Krishsama's name, it is a very beautiful crescent moon. In order to atone for your sins, you could say that it is generally the right thing to tell them. But I can't say it's a good thing either. It can even destroy all the happiness you had before. You could say it's self-satisfaction. Berry told Chris J. What is important is what Krishsama wants to do and what Krishsama thinks you should do on top of that. That's all that matters, and it's a matter of what's in Krishsama's heart. Just. Without telling her what to do. I believe that Krishsama is right in thinking that way, and that there is no mistake in Krishsama's conclusion. Whatever it may be, at least I think so. She just left the choice to Chris J. Chris J spent the rest of the night wondering what she should do, but she had no answer. It was the same as Goro, who touched her body. She thought he deserved to die, and she felt refreshed when she killed him. She still didn't think it was a complete mistake, but now she felt bad for making Gala sad. Apologizing for it would probably be the right thing to do. But Gala didn't know. She didn't even notice. She seemed to have already accepted her son's death, and she had always had a good relationship with Chris J, and she loved her. Gala would be sad and angry if she knew that Chris J had killed her child. Maybe she would realize that everything she had been through had been a sham, and she would be unhappy. She might think that her love for the abnormal Chris J was a hopeless tragedy. It was right to tell, but it was not good. Maybe that's what Berry was trying to say, and maybe she shouldn't apologize. She never felt bad for the person she had killed. Because she never thought of that in the first place. What's wrong, Krishchan? She had finished eating at Gala's house and asked Berry to leave first. It was Chris J who did the wrong thing, and Chris J didn't want Berry to be yelled at together with her. Berry would probably just take whatever abuse she was given in silence. She would not get angry at them for being unreasonable but would listen to them as if she was the one that had committed the sin. If she was attacked, she might not even resist. Berry always made an effort for Chris J. For Chris's sake, she was willing to go to great lengths. That's why she didn't want her to be here. It was the abnormal Chris J who was at fault, not Berry. She wanted to be the Chris J that Berry loved with all her heart. She wanted to be the Chris J who could see and feel the same things as Berry, and could honestly say that what Berry thought was good was good and what Berry thought was bad was bad. Chris Chan. The trigger was all Berry. Probably because she saw Berry happily talking to Gala. Berry must have been sad to see Gala wiping her tears in front of her grave. So she suddenly remembered something from the past that she didn't even remember anymore. It was something that could have been kept a secret from Berry, but her chest was feeling foggy, and she felt like she had to tell Berry. One thing that came to her mind as to why that was. She didn't want to create a lie in her relationship with Berry. Chris J couldn't understand other people well. Everyone was so ambiguous, had a pretext, and was full of lies. Chris's normal was not even their normal, so she could not understand them. That's why Chris J had spent her days worrying about her reputation, taking care of her appearance so that she could get along with them, trying to look like a good child. So, please tell me about various parts of Krishsama. Leaving aside other people, at least I want to understand each other with Krishsama. If you have common ground, you will enjoy more and more things, and you will be happier. Me and Krishsama. That's why she was so happy to hear that. Berry was the only one who accepted and tried to understand all of Krish's weird parts Chris J didn't want to lie to such Berry. She didn't want to bring Fossids into her relationship with Berry by hiding things like that. Ah, uh, there's something Chris J wants to talk to Obasan about. Chris J began slowly. No matter what kind of sin Krishsama commits in the future, I will continue to love Krishsama. However, it is very painful for a loved one to sin without knowing it, so I taught Krishsama various things to prevent that from happening. I just want Krishsama to live a happy life without committing sin. Sin was something that must be atoned for. At least if you know it was a sin. If Chris J felt it was a sin, that's how it should be. Berry taught Chris J many things so she can be happy. She had always taught her about everything from empathy, love, and cooking Berry always taught her something about spending time with others. At least it wasn't for the fake relationships that Chris J had created. 
What she always offered to Chris J was something to create an authentic relationship. She didn't think it was self-satisfaction, nor did she think it was a good thing. Gala liked Chris J, and Chris J liked Gala. She thought it was a good relationship, but it was a false one. There was nothing but a disadvantage to destroying it, but Chris J felt that it should be done. Chris J wanted to be like Berry. She wanted to see and rejoice in the same things, to see and grieve in the same things, to feel the same things. She didn't know what was right and what was good. However, if Berry was here, she would surely do so, so Chris J spun the words. It's about Obersan's child. Kale. Gala's eyes widened and she stared at the downcast Chris J. Yes. To be honest, even though Chris J said Chris J didn't care, Chris J was concerned about Kale and Katia's saying bad things about Chris J. Gala wrinkled her brow thoughtfully. Chris J was really annoyed that they were badmouthing Chris J to so many people. Chris J thought it would be nice if they just disappeared. She closed her eyes as she listened to Chris's words. That's why, Chris J. Chris J tried to continue her words. Chris Chan, let's stop there. Hey. But Gala stopped it. Gala sighed at the surprised Chris J. I've always thought it was strange when we were cooking and eating, because Chris Chan, who loves to cook and is such a glutton, looked so gloomy. Obersan. Then she smiled and continued. What I just heard convinced me, but I don't want to hear more. So even if Chris Chan wants to talk more, please stop. But. It's okay. Gala looked up at the ceiling and fell silent for a while. She closed her eyes and calmed her breathing. Then she looked at Chris J. I accepted it a long time ago, and today, finally, Kale has left too. Whatever actually happened, whatever it was, it's over now. Obasan doesn't want to hear about it. Gala reached for Chris's head. Chris J was frightened for a moment but held on and did not move. Gala just gently stroked her head. Obasan loves Christian very much, and now, Christian is like Obasan's purpose in life. No matter what the truth was at the time, Obasan spent time thinking that way, and Obasan had thought about various things and decided. While stroking her like that, no matter what Christian says now, Obasan won't hold a grudge against Christian anymore. Gala told her with gentle, slightly sad eyes. At the time, she suspected that Chris J might have had something to do with this. She knew that her son had done terrible things to her, and she knew that the girl Grace had taken in was a little different from the norm. She couldn't say she never thought Chris J might have done something to her son, but she never showed any sign of it, and she would come over to borrow the oven and cook with her. As these days turned into her daily routine, those doubts disappeared before she knew it. She began to see only her good side much more than before. That's why the talk ends here. Chris J killed the bandit to protect the village. Chris J who was spoiled by Grace and herself. Chris J who was hardworking and polite, but also gluttonous and stubborn. Even now, the many images of Chris J from her time in the village would always float behind her eyelids. Whatever truth she was about to tell, Gala had found happiness again by loving her. Nothing more was needed. But Obasan. If Chris Chan isn't convinced, then my punishment for Christian is for Christian to do so and for to keep quiet. Okay, but Chris J was still not convinced. However, looking at Gala's face, she nodded as if she had given up. Why, Ates? Good girl. Come here. Gala held the downcast Chris J and pressed her cheek against her head. Gala smiled as she caressed the silky silver hair. Obasan has decided to love Christian for Grace's part too. Even though Chris Chan came home, please don't make that face. Chris J said nothing and nodded. Gala continued. You're going to say goodbye tomorrow, but if it's like this isn't it sad. Obasan wants Chris Chan to smile. Grace wants that too. Kasama? Yes, Grace too. She patted Chris J on the back, got up, and opened the closed wooden window. It was cloudy all the time, but today is the day when we can see a rare and beautiful crescent moon. She looked at the moon, smiled, and returned to Chris J. On the day that Chris Chan came back by chance, Chris J was floating in the night sky. Obasan thinks Obasan can hear Grace's wish that Chris J would always smile and be happy. Gala laughed at the bewildered Chris J, asking if she couldn't believe it. As she laughed, 
She kissed Chris J on the forehead. Even if it's a coincidence, it's a wonderful thing that's steeped in fate. Anyway, at least Obasan believes so, and Obasan thinks so. Obasan wants Krishchan to smile for Obasan who believes so. Tomorrow, I want Krishchan to go back with a smile and think that Krishchan is glad she came back here. Gala kissed her on the forehead again. Krish's eyes remained downcast, but she nodded firmly. Okay. Okay, that's fine, it's already late today, and Berisan is also waiting for you. Now, go. The voice and face remained gentle to the end. The image of such gala was burned into Krish's eyes. Chris J simply pressed her face against Berry without looking up at the sky. Berry listened in silence as Chris J repeated gala words to her, piece by piece. Berry smiled somewhat relieved and stroked Krish's head. It's what Chris J Sama decided and what Gala Sama wanted, if so, that's all that matters. After listening to the story, Berry said so and smiled. Chris J was not convinced, but there was nothing more she could do now that she had been told not to talk about it. Actually, the truth is trivial. Berry caressed her cheek as Chris J lifted her face. There is no way to know for sure what the truth is, it's just a trick of words. We all live in a place that is convenient for us, so we just choose what is plausible and convenient among the deceptions. If that leads to the person's happiness, then that's fine. Berry said and looked at her own hand. If you are forcing something they don't want on someone because it is the truth and it destroys their happiness, then I don't think it is a good thing to do. Is that, so? Whether it's true or not, at least I think so. People are creatures who choose and decide what is true for themselves. She laughed mischievously and looked at Chris J. Krish Sama, how can Krish Sama believe that I love you? Hey, it's not like Krish Sama can see what's in my heart. But isn't it because Krish Sama thinks it's plausible, a convenient, and a happy truth? That is. When Chris J suddenly became uneasy, Berry smiled wryly. Likewise, I couldn't see what's inside Krish Sama's heart, so I don't know if it's the real truth. But the reality that Krish Sama loves me makes me feel very happy, so I just believe that. She put strength into the hand that held Chris J and kissed her forehead as she held her body close to hers. See, the truth is trivial, isn't it? What is important is the matter of how the person perceives that truth. After saying that Berry turned her eyes to the sky again, a fleeting silver crescent moon in the sky, gently illuminating the area. Rightness and good and evil are all just interpretations that are convenient for someone. Socially, it would be said that the majority is right, and the minority is wrong. In that sense, Krishsama may be wrong and evil. Chris J was frightened by the words, and Berry continued. However, I feel that the answer that Krishsama gave after worrying about it is a good answer. Galasama also thought about various things before telling Krishsama not to say anything, and Krishsama chose to take Galasama's words to heart. She stretched out her hand as if to frame the moon and narrowed her eyes. The result of both of you thinking about each other. I think that the conclusion you should look at is not just something like in general, so I think that's fine. Chris J looked at her and let her gaze wander. She really didn't know if this was correct or not. Even so, Berry still affirmed Chris J. She felt happy, scared, filled with incomprehensible feelings. Actually, just like Krish Sama is worried about it, I don't really understand it either. What is really right and what is good? I don't know for sure. Berry, too? Yes. Some people may say that murder is a sin and should not be forgiven for whatever reason. I can't deny that, and I can also agree with what that's saying. There is a certain righteousness to it. Berry giggled and fell backward. She plunged her body in the knee-deep snow. Berry. Chris J was surprised by the sudden eccentricity, but Berry sprawled on the snow and laughed happily. She giggled like a little girl, and put her hand on Chris's cheek as she crouched down, looking worried. But I don't really care about good and evil and righteousness. I believe in Chris Sama more than anyone else. The feeling of snow on her cold body. She felt her mind, which had been pondering for so long, calm down. No matter how many years ago it happened, Chris J should atone for her sin and be punished according to the law. She didn't think that idea was wrong. If Berry told her to do it, she would do it. But Chris J had strength and political power as a noble. In fact, 
when she left the village, it would be difficult for the village to judge her, who had become a noble of the kingdom. Even more so now, before that political power her sin at this small village was the same as nothing. No matter what Krishsama says, no matter what Krishsama wants, there is no one in the kingdom who can judge Krishsama as a sinner. Even if she talked about the truth because it was the truth, it would only be unhappy for everyone. Then who in the world would judge this girl for her sins? From the point of view of the kingdom's interests, there isn't even a need to weigh the villagers against Krishsama. The law cannot judge Krishsama, nor will Krishsama be judged. For example, even if Krishsama finds me unpleasant and kills me here, even if Krishsama burns this village to the ground, Krishsama will surely be free without being judged by anyone. K. Krish, that kind of thing. Of course, I don't think that Krishsama would do such a thing. But I'm just saying that Krishsama can do it. Was it all right to kill in battle? Is it okay to kill people if they were bandits? There was no difference between killing someone because it is unpleasant. In the end, it was just a just cause for profit, the difference was whether it was a comfortable reason to listen or not. Murder was not justified for any reason, and it was always unjust. Krishsama has the power to break any rule, law, or order. If Krishsama wishes and wields her power, Krishsama will be allowed to do anything. If you have as much power as Krishsama, then that's definitely not a mistake. A. To the puzzled Krishje, Berry continued, saying it's simple. After all, law is only a formality. It is nothing more than a statement that sounds good within the scope of the law and that shows such correctness, the very concepts of justice and evil, sin and punishment do not reside there. At least, she didn't think it was that kind of formality that was important. She stared at the puzzled girl's violet eye and narrowed her eyes. I don't mind if Krishsama kills me. Whether it's the Ojusama or Kriskentasama, even if Krishsama kills all the people in the kingdom, they will forgive Krishsama. As long as Krishsama doesn't care about anyone, Krishsama has the power to do so. I'm sure Krishsama knows that, and it's not wrong for Krishsama to do so. But does Krishsama not do so? Because Krishjay doesn't want to do that. Krish's gaze wavered, as if probing Berry's intentions. Krishjay answered with a look of unease on her face, and Berry caressed her cheek to ease it. Don't want to. In the past, Krishsama said that it's because there is a law against killing people. Do you remember? Chris J did. But, Tha that's not it. Chris J was about to say that it was different now, but it seemed as if nothing had changed in her mind since then. Chris J loved Berry so Chris J wouldn't kill her. Same with Celine and Chris Genta. Chris J didn't want to do anything bad because it would be sad for Berry and the others, and because it would not be good for Chris Genta. That's all there was to it and her vague thoughts didn't turn into words, and she could not say that what she had said was a lie, a mistake, or anything else. She just wanted to do good and be a good girl. And she just wanted to be recognized as such. That's why she stuttered without saying anything, and Berry smiled at her. That's all that matters. I think that the feelings that Krishsama is feeling right now are what Krishsama should cherish above all else. But Krishche is not a good girl at... At least... The current Krishsama is trying to feel righteousness and good and bad, and is trying to cherish it. Krishsama strives to be better for someone else, and the fact that Krishsama thinks seriously about it is proof that Krishsama is a good child more than anything else. Deep down, Berry thought so. That's why she thought Krishche was beautiful. She was too strong and better than anyone else. There was no one in this world who could judge her. No one can deny her righteousness by force. I don't even know if Krishsama's choice is right or not. For her, who tries to live in a normal world despite being different from other people, it was a tragedy above all that there was no one to correct her mistakes. She lacked what she should be and if she still hoped to obtain the happiness that was only natural in the normal world, there was only one way to do it, Berry thought. But I believe that Krishsama is kinder and purer than anyone else. At least, I think that the answer that Krishsama is seriously worried about and arrived at is not wrong. And Berry had decided to believe her. When Berry smiled at her, Krish's gaze wavered as if she were frightened. And, she muttered, Chris J doesn't have confidence. Didn't I tell Krishsama? Even I don't have confidence. She rubbed Krish's cheek lovingly and continued. It's not that the result is right. 
I just believe that it's the right thing for Krishsama to think seriously about a question that has no answer. I believe that the most important thing is always the process. Beckoned by her hand, Chris J fell to her as she sank into the snow. If Krishsama thinks it's a sin, then bear the sin in Krishsama's own way, and if Krishsama thinks Krishsama should be punished, in Krishsama's own way receive the punishment. Reflect on yourself so Krishsama doesn't commit another crime, try to do something good for someone else, don't stop thinking, don't run away. Pofu, a somewhat silly sound resounded, and what she felt was warmth. I believe that it is good to keep trying, and that it will eventually lead to the right thing to do. Of course, it will be very difficult. It may be especially difficult for Krishsama, but I will always be on Krishsama's side. The frosty coldness of the snow accentuated her gentle voice and the sensation of her body. Even if everyone in the world says that Krishsama is wrong, I am the only one who can confidently assert that Krishsama is not wrong. Yes, I will swear with confidence. Is this not enough? Berry said, smiling. Chris J gasped. Everyone in the world, no matter what they think. Berry often used that phrase to talk to Chris J. These words were also the same word as what she said at noon, but it sounded like a completely different word. It was a threatening trust filled with overflowing love. Berry is. No matter how crazy Chris J was, no matter how abnormal she was, no matter what mistake she made because of it, Berry was ready to say it's right in front of her. That's how she intended to stay with Chris J forever. No matter what Chris J did, no matter how she said it, no matter how wrong she was, always. Terribly, scary. She was sure Berry knew Chris J felt that way. So Berry surrendered all of her to Chris J. There was nothing but reckless affection and trust there that's precisely why it's more scary than anything else. That's why I said it right. That I might look like this but I'm persistent. With a mischievous smile, she looked up at the sky. Chris J, entrusting herself to her, suddenly looked up at the sky as if being guided by it. In the star-studded sky of black indigo, the arc-shaped moon was floating in the middle of the sky. The moon and the starry sky. The wind was cold, but the touching skin was warmer than that. The inside of her chest was throbbing, burning, squeezing such a strange feeling. But it's not unpleasant, but rather the exact opposite. There was an elation that made her want to just roll over and run around, and a heat that made her heart leap with joy and happiness, but she couldn't quite put her finger on it. But I hope that Krishsama will love me, and will believe in the vague happiness that I tell Krishsama. I also love Krishsama and have decided to believe Krishsama's everything. So, please don't hate me and always keep me by your side. Ah. There was something that came to Krish's mind with those words. The name Chris J means this crescent moon. It was the one that was floating in the sky the night Krish's mother proposed to Krish's father. I hoped that the happiness I felt that day would come to my daughter. May she be able to see that beautiful moon with someone. That was the name her mother had given her. For a long time, she had no idea what it meant. Chris J did not feel anything when looking at the scenery, and did not think it was beautiful. Mother's wish will never come true she vaguely felt that way, but. She looked next to her. Red hair tangled in scattered snow. Her long eyelashes glisten in the moonlight, and her big, gentle brown eyes surround her. A slender, well-shaped bridge of the nose and soft, pale red lips. As their gazes met, she felt her heart contracted, as if it were in agony. Karsama, maybe. Question mark. After all, it was not unpleasant but filled with an irrepressible sense of happiness. Maybe this is how she felt. Chris J brought her face close to Berry's and put her lips to her lips. Silver hair mingled with red hair, and the moonlight reflected off the snowy earth, glistening. It's beautiful, she felt so, for no reason. She didn't know why, she didn't even know how, it just looked beautiful. The gentle, somewhat happy narrowed eyes, the heat, the touch, everything. It was happier than anything she had ever felt before, and without words, she savored the feeling. Without getting tired of it, letting it show something that cannot be expressed in words. Just like that, over and over again. It was snowing in her hometown. It was a day when an arcing moon was floating in the night sky. Chapter 128, Passing Each Other. In the village square, people were gathering waiting for Krish's depart. There were children and women, 
and even though there were few men there, they parted Chris J reluctantly. Pell, Chris J told you not to look at Berry. I I didn't. Krishna Chan is so persistent, saying it every time we meet. Because Berry is like poison to Pell's eyes. Berry was embarrassed, while the others were just happily teasing Pell. Pell, whose face turned bright red, clicked his tongue and turned to face Killick and the others. Thank you for the training. When I turn fifteen, I will definitely join the army and aim for the black century. Ha ha, you sure are lively. But your muscles are quite good. Regardless of whether or not you join the army, you will become quite good if you train. Do your best. Yes. Pell gives a mimicry salute, and Killick responds with a laugh. But Chris J groaned. Pell can't enter Blackie, Kurofuyo, and Chris J think it would be better if Pell didn't go out on the battlefield and just work for the village. If he goes out on the battlefield, he'll die right away. Chris J Nei Chan, don't say things like, just when I become really motivated, Pell cannot use magic. No matter how good he is, he can't enter the Black Flag Special Force. She only stated the fact, but Pell, who was suddenly frustrated with his start, stared at Chris J. Good grief, Chris J. Nei Chan really doesn't change hum, still can't read that kind of atmosphere since a long time ago. Cuckoo, don't get so angry Pell. Krish Sama is also worried. Besides, it is important to work as a soldier, but it is also important to work as a village vigilante to keep the village peaceful. All the more so if you know the tragedy of lacking strength. Well, that's true but. And it's not just Krish Sama who's worried. Killick turned his gaze elsewhere. A girl who was Pell's childhood friend was staring at him. Pell looked at her, blushed, and turned away. She was a pretty girl who always followed Pell, and Pell was often teased about her. Not honest are you, real? Killick chuckled, and Pell couldn't say anything and kept his mouth shut. Then, the one who stepped forward was a well-built woman Chris J was a little confused as to what kind of face she should make, but she put a slightly awkward smile on her face and Gala smiled gently. She then handed her a wrapped pie that she had baked in the morning, and patted her on the head as she bended down and looked at her. I'm sure Krishchan is busy, and I don't know if I'll be able to see Krishchan anymore if Krishchan live in the royal capital, but Krishchan is welcome to come back anytime when it has calmed down. Yes. Auntie, along with Grace and Gorka, will always be watching over Krishchan from afar so that she can live happily ever after. Gala said so, hugged her little body for just a moment before she turned her gaze to Berry. I leave Krishchan to you. If there's someone like Berry Sana, I'll be able to see off Krishchan with peace of mind. Yes. After bowing deeply to each other, Gala stroked Krishche again. Well then, cliche Chan. Be careful when traveling, after the civil war, it seems that public order isn't good. Yes, Obasan too, please take care of your body. Oh, of course. After seeing Krishchan, all the ailments were blown away, so I'm sure I'll be fine for the next few decades. Gala showed off her bicep and laughed, and her eyes welling up. She wiped her eyes, took a breath, and smiled. Chris J looked at her and leans in. Um, Chris J, love Obasan so much. Gala nodded at that and replied, so does Obasan. Just like Krishchan, Obasan thinks so too. Yes. Chris J nodded happily and moved away. Well then, see you later, Chris Chan. Yes, Chris J will come back when Chris J have time. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Chris J bowed her head and went to the carriage where Berry was. She wrapped her arms around her, leaned in and smiled. She bowed to them again as she get in, and then she and Berry walk into the box carriage. Unlike before, the people who saw them off did not break down in tears. They watched the carriage disappear into the distance with smiles on their faces. A few days ago, Kilnan, a neighboring village of Kalka, was not a very large village, but it was a peaceful village where handicrafts such as weaving thrived, and it was not particularly poor, with a close relationship with the town. It traded with a village a little to the south, turning wool into cloth and clothing for sale to the city, the men hunted and worked in the fields, and the women mostly devoted themselves to weaving. You. Karsan, you don't have to hit me. Do you have any idea how worried I was? Be glad, it's over with just that. Mia grew up in a large family in such a village. Her chestnut hair was tied back, and her features could be described as beautiful. 
Mia pouted her lips as she held her head that was hit by her mother, Myrna who had a string-willed face. Kalua smiled at them as she followed them through the snowy village. The two of them were wearing black cloaks with crescent moon skulls embroidered on their chests, though they were not wearing swords or armor. Their hands were reinforced leather gauntlets, and their boots are rugged and sturdy. You could tell at a glance that they were a soldier, and were quite conspicuous, but there weren't many people outside because of the snow. Only the faint sound of weaving looms could be heard from the huts here and there. The village must have a well-equipped loom, which is rare for a country village. Kalua looked at the village with admiration. Kalua-san, was it? Did Mia cause you trouble? No, on the contrary, she always helped me a lot and we get along well. Kalua sent a meaningful, teasing gaze to Mia. Mia stared at Kalua in annoyance but she only growled and didn't say anything. It seems that she was quite weak to her mother. You can be honest, okay. She's clumsy and scatterbrained, and she can't even weave a plain cloth properly. Fufu, I heard that in exchange, Mia-san was a hard worker in the village. Carrying luggage, right. At that time I wondered how it would be. A graceful lady. It was Kalua who was wearing a mask. Mia was irritated by the artificially polite demeanor, but she didn't want to provoke her mother's wrath by yelling at her. So the three of them headed for a house that was a little bigger than the others in the village. Mia's house looked relatively well off in the village, and Kalua tilted her head. It did not look like the kind of house where Mia would have to go out to work. It seems her mother was a skilled weaver and her father was a good hunter. She was served a cup of tea as she was a guest, and as she looked around the room, she could guess what was going on. Ha! I was completely surprised. Just when she suddenly leave with a military carriage, a short time later, she sent us a large sum of money. What are you thinking? Be because Okasan said finances were really tight. I just told you that father was injured and it's going to be hard for a while. We have. Some savings. Seriously, why are you in the army? Oh, it's Nei Chan. Really, she's back. The two boys, maybe ten years old, emerge from the room. Myrna sighed and told them both. We have a guest, so play outside for now. E. Not E. Now, go go. As she drives away her children with her hands, she cut the fruit in front of Kalua, while saying, sorry about it. Kalua lowered her head and stared at Mia. What, what? No, I just think it's exactly as I imagined. That tone makes me annoyed. Mia. Myrna called her name, exasperated, and Mia was startled and straightened her posture. Kalua quietly held back her laughter. Anyway, finally you come home. For a clumsy soldier like you, no matter how many lives you have, it won't be enough. There's no need to be migrant workers. I it's not like I come back, you know, Okasan, even like this, I'm the adjutant of a great unit under the direct control of Chris J. So what? I know that soldiers are great people who risk their lives to work for the country, but someone like you is ill-suited for it. Myrna sighed again, crossed her hands and said to Mia, It's good that you happen to be safe, but how about you think from my position? Please don't make me worry any more than this. What should I do if something happens on the battlefield and you ended up in a terrible situation? And, do you have the resolve to do so? Yes, I have it now. Besides, I'm not an idiot either, so I've thought about various things and now I'm working in the military. I also have a responsibility, so I can't easily. Mia, listen. Myrna raised her voice and Mia glared at her. Even though I took the trouble to give birth to you so cutely, really this child. What's going on now? You're always yelling at me about how clumsy, stupid, and dumb I am. I can't even weave a weave properly. You always told me that's why no one would take me right. So, what does that have to do with staying in the army? So I decided to do my bit for the family because you made it sound like I was useless. That's why I left home. Don't say things like that. They entered the house and settled down, and then suddenly, out of the blue, a huge argument broke out. Kalua scratched her cheek, troubled. Mia was leaning forward on her desk, her face bright red and angry. Okasama is always like that, because you're criticizing everything I do. It's a loss for me to come back. Wait Mia. Mia stood up and hooked the sword on her waist to the door. She slammed the door and leaves, 
and Myrna sat down in her chair. She then bowed her head embarrassingly to Kalua. I'm sorry, she be always been that kind of girl. Ah, aha her. Well, they do say they get along so well that they can fight. It's fine, you don't have to be considerate. Myrna smiled wryly and sipped her tea. Black Century is a name that can be heard even in this countryside. I thought my heart would jump out of my chest when I saw the money in Mia's name coming from such a place. Certainly, you will be surprised. I heard, isn't it a dangerous unit that fights on the front line? Is that kid really acting as the adjutant? You, yes. In fact, she's working very hard as an adjutant, and I don't think there's a problem with saying that. Mia-san is an excellent commander. Of course, I understand Okasamas, referring to Mia's mother, feelings. Myrna shook her head tiredly as she rubbed her eyes. You relationship with Mia is? We've known each other since the time Black Century is formed, right around the time we were recruited. We were close in age, so that's why we have a connection. For the record, we rented the same house in the royal capital for the time being. I see, I'm grateful. Or should I say, she's a strong-minded girl, but also a timid person, but also strangely stubborn in the strangest place. If someone like Kaluasan is by her side, I can feel a little more at ease. She looked tired in fact, she would be tired. Her daughter who suddenly jumped out was a soldier, and was fighting on the front lines. Kalua felt a little sorry for her. It might be a little rude to say this to Kalua, who is also a soldier and is a woman, but, as her mother I'm worried about her. More so since she's a difficult child. Ahaha. I feel it. Can I ask how it was over there? Yes, of course. Kalua nodded and sipped her tea while looking at the door Mia had left. Showing her anger, Mia walks through the village with a grumpy face as she steps through the snow. A thin young man called out to her. What, it's Basil. Or, what was with that what? I was worried you know, you suddenly left. It has nothing to do with Basil. Ah, did you have a fight with Myrna-san? Well, I guess that's only natural. What the hell with that? I want to be alone though. The young man, Basil, a childhood friend, was stunned by the fact that his first reunion in a long time seemed to be passed off that randomly, but it was always the case. He was used to this kind of treatment. Why are you following me? What about field work? There's no way I can do it with this much snow. The usual place. Didn't you understand that I said I wanted to be alone? What a bad temper. Well, that's how it always was hum. Mia walks off in anger and leaves the village. On the side of the river a little further into the forest the rock there was Mia's fixed position. After brushing off the snow and sitting down, Mia finally asked with a sullen face. Obasan healthy? Ah, she's fine. I'm being yelled at to find a partner quickly. That's so, I'm glad to hear she's okay. He was completely ignored, but this did not break Basil's heart. Basil had learned patience. Is it true about the Black Century? It's true. I guess they are reorganizing now. I'm the adjutant, so I have some work to do, but Krishsama is going back to her hometown, so I was allowed to accompany her and come back. Krishsama, you mean Christand? Yes. Ah. What is it? When Basil tilted his neck, Mia said I remembered. Come to think of it, you said that there was once a beautiful girl in Kalka's carriage, right? Hmm. Ah. Basil nodded while recalling it. It seems that that pretty girl was Krishsama. She's from Kalka. Seriously? I was surprised when I heard that she's from Kalka, but guess that's how a coincidence is. Well, she sure is a very beautiful person. It's a little, no, she's really strange. Mia chuckled happily, and Basil admires the smile of his childhood friend, whom he hadn't seen in a long time. Short chestnut hair that didn't reach the shoulders was silky, and her slightly childish smile was adorable. It was hard to believe that he had been in the battlefield as a soldier. And even more so when it was the Black Century, a unit under the direct control of Chris J. Christand. A young monster that led a civil war that was on the back foot to victory. Almost all of the major generals on Gildenstein's side were either captured or killed by her. It is said that the number of generals and soldiers she had killed with her sword exceeds 1,000 in total, and although there were some who claim that the results are exaggerated, many soldiers who had actually seen her killing said that it was the truth. 
and she commanded a special elite unit called the Black Century. Mia too, ah, uh, in the Twin Mountain? Twin Mountains. Ah, uh, you mean Bernaic? The dragons Mormus Gronia and Bernaic were commonly referred to by as the Twin Mountain. In the military, it was common to call it the dragons Moor, so the unfamiliar sound was a little bewildering. Yeah, it was tough. We were camped out in enemy territory for a whole week. Everyone was injured, some people died, and even Krishsama was running a fever, but she still wouldn't listen, saying just a bit more, just a bit more. She sighed when she remembered it, exasperated. Basil was surprised and asked. Then, killing too. Well, it's a battlefield. But don't ask about it too much. I don't want to be a heroic story. Ah, ah, I'm sorry. She's a hard worker, but was a little out of it, and was an airhead. He had known Mia since she was little but she seemed like a different person. She was not the kind of person who can kill people. If anything, she was a timid, fearful person. They say that the battlefield changes people, but perhaps it can also changes people like Mia. Basil thought about it and patted her shoulder. That was tough, you know. I didn't think it would turn out like this, but, well, for whatever reason, I'm not uncomfortable with it, so it's okay. They're all nice people, do their best. I made a best friend, she said, her lips pouting a little shyly, and she shuffles her feet and kicks up the snow. It was clearly a military society that did not seem to suit her. Basil felt a sense of danger when she said that she wasn't uncomfortable. D did you, have anyone you're interested in, ah, uh, interested in? I mean, as a man, something like that. Hmm. I've never seen it like that before. Everyone is always teasing me and making fun of me, geez. Basil let out a sigh of relief. He even wondered if the time this woman will ever look at a man like that ever came. Mia and her older sister were probably the only ones who were this dense. He had nothing but regrets about Mia who left the village abruptly. After all, no matter what was said, she was still cute and hardworking. He thought he had done everything he could to win her over who was really popular, but he was still naive. This was how she looked at him after a reunion after a long time no matter how you look at it. Basil's treatment was just a childhood friend. She probably didn't even have a silver of awareness that Basil was trying to approach her. Against Mia has no choice but to deliver a straight bore. He was determined that if he ever had the chance again, he would definitely do it. You know, Mia. But the moment he spoke, she abruptly drew her sword from her scabbard. Shin sound resounded, and what appeared was a long sword with many traces of small nicks on the blade. Ha, huh, what should I do? Eh about what? No, I'm thinking of buying a new sword. This one is issued by the military, but I was able to buy and use any weapon I like. She looked at the sword while swinging it left and right and groaned. I'm not very good with swords, but I still have a lot of opportunities to use them, so I'm wondering what to do. I think it would be nice to have a light one, but I often receive opponents' swords with my sword, so I don't think it's bad to have a solid and sturdy one too. Looking at the sharpening marks on the blade, he could tell that it must have been used in actual combat. He was puzzled by her talking about her new sword in her tone of what should we have for dinner tonight? Isn't it fine if you don't buy it? Why? No, that, Mia doesn't have to swing a sword. Question mark. Furrowing her brow, Mia tilted her head, wondering what he was trying to say. He was too roundabout. She couldn't read his intention at all. Basil shook his head and tried to open his mouth but Mia clapped her hands a second faster. So that's what it means. Basil is trying to says the same thing as commander. See commander. Commander, say same thing as me. Yeah, I don't have to swing a sword she said. Does that mean that he will protect you? No way, a propose. Basil's heart was shocked. He had just asked if there was any man she was interested in. Commander, said swinging my sword is a last resort. I've been told so much that I've got calluses in my ears. That's what you mean, right? That's not it. Basil shook his head and sighed. No, that's not it. Yeah, this isn't that kind of problem, it's about what kind of sword I should wield as a last resort. I understand what you're saying, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. She didn't get it at all. Basil was puzzled by the talk which was clearly going in the wrong direction. 
Mia was leading the conversation in such a strange direction that he wondered if she was doing it on purpose. It was the usual occurrence. Mia explained the importance of swords on the battlefield, and talks about what kind of swords should be used, the problem that currently dominates Mia's head. A story of a dimension that Basil, who usually lives by plowing the fields, couldn't understand. He wanted to interject, but he was unable to find the right moment to do so. That's why it's better for me if it's lighter. Wait a minute, don't say anything for a while and just listen. What is it? It was usual Mia. But Basil was different. This time, he had made up his mind. He wanted to tell her clearly without going roundabout. I've wanted to say something to you for a long time. No, I've been saying this vaguely since long ago, but it's an important story. What is more important than the sword that protects my life? Hmm. I'm begging you to shut up, just for a minute is fine so. Mew, dissatisfied Mia folded her arms and looked at Basil. She had a lot of, self, assumptions, was clumsy and scatterbrained, and couldn't see her surroundings when she concentrated. Mia was full of flaw, but she was bright, energetic, a hard worker, and a person who could do her best for someone else. A kind childhood friend who thinks of others before herself he had always loved her. He wondered why I had been going at it in a roundabout way. Was it because he couldn't accept his own love for her honestly, or was it because he teased her as a child and was beaten to a pulp? Was it because his rivals for Mia increased as she grew bigger and more beautiful? Maybe it was because they have known each other since they were small, where discretion was non-existent from the start. But he was done with those excuses. Ever since she suddenly disappeared, he had regretted it. He won't regret anything anymore. Mia, I, oh, there you are. But at that moment, a beautiful black-haired woman jumped down from the tree. Her long hair was pulled back and shiny, and she had a somewhat sexy beauty. She was a little tall for a woman, her body was wrapped in her cloak, but was feminine. Kalua, you make snow for. Ahaha, don't mind, don't mind. Eh, hey, did I disturb you too? Kalua looks at Basil as if she just noticed. When those cat-like eyes of hers, she turned toward him, and Basil's heart fluttered. The appearance of a beautiful woman that Basil saw for the first time. Hmm, you like Kalua? Basil, your cheek is red. I am not. Don't be mad and deny it. Well, Kalua is beautiful, and I think it can't be helped. Mia looks at Basil with disdain and said that. Kalua scratched her cheek troubled, as she alternately looked at Mia and Basil. M, the childhood friend Mia mentioned? Yes, his name is Basil. Ah, so what's the important talk is? The atmosphere was clearly broken. No matter how he looked at it, it's not in a state where he could confess. It was the worst when he fell in love with Kalua for a second. No, today is fine. You will be here tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, right? That's my plan for now. Then I'll talk to you again later. Basil turned his back and left, swallowing his frustration. Kalua looked at his melancholy back and she let out a dry laugh. Man, I went and did it. I don't think you should worry about it too much. No, I think Mia should be a little more concerned though. Mia glared at Kalua, who looked exasperated. What? Various things. Mernasan said be back by dinner. Ha, huh, geez. Mother is always like that. Kalua smiles wryly at Mia who was angry. She's worried about Mia. I think she's a good mother. I know that, but you can't say that. I thought about it and left for the house after all. Seems you won't be in a good mood for a while. There you go treating me like a child. In reality, the way you get angry is just like a child. Kalua laughed and patted her head while Mia looks displeased. All the women in the village are weavers. Among them, Okasama is very good at weaving, and my older sisters are also very good at it. I'm the only one at home who is not good at it. You're clumsy after all. Shut up. Are you making fun of me or comforting me? Ah, comforting you? Don't stare, don't stare. Kalua patted her head and gently hugged her. Mia let out her anger with her sigh, she continued. She thought she should work on something else but in the end, women in the village can make cloths and become independent. When I saw the children younger than me become proficient at weaving, I felt like I didn't belong her. Yeah. 
I've always wanted to leave the village, but I can't go to the city alone. Just then, a recruiting carriage arrived. Well, I never intended to become a soldier though, Mia said, but with some amusement. The battlefield is scary, the responsibility is heavy, and even though I still don't believe I'm experienced enough to be able to do it properly, Krishsama and the captains said a lot of unreasonable things, and I was left in charge. Lately, I've been thinking that it's kind of nice. It wasn't like that in the village, she continued. Dropping her eyes, she clenched her fists. I know what Okasana would say, but, it might be a waste of time, but I'm doing my best, so if she talked to me like that, I get really angry. Look, don't make that kind of face. Isn't your cute face ruined? She took off her gauntlet and wiped her tears, Mia glared at her again. There you go making a fool of me right away. Even though I'm trying to be honest, geez. Come on, don't cry. I'll hold you tight until you stop crying. That's how you're making a fool of me. Even as she cried, she pressed her face against Kalua's chest. Kalua smiled wryly and stroked her head. It seems that it's just right for me to make fun of Mia, so the adjutant Sama says. I didn't say that. You really said it though. Kalua, amusedly, a little sadly said that. Chapter 129, One Who Felt. Mia has two older sisters, two younger brothers, and a younger sister. Her parents were alive and well, her grandparents were in good health both of her sisters were married, but when Mia came home, they all gathered in the house, making the relatively spacious living room seem small. They usually use a desk and chairs, but when this happened, they shoved them into another room, and everyone sat down on the floor to eat. The two younger brothers were excitedly asking Kalua to teach them how to play the sword, and her younger sister, with her eyes twinkling at Kalua's beauty and fake grace was discussing about love life. Mia was a little grumpy with her two older sisters and mother for being scolded, but her father and grandparents kept the mood relaxed. Myrna, I understand how you feel, but since it's a place to celebrate Mia's return, leave that kind of talk for later. But Daza, today is a celebration of Mia's safe return. And also, Kaluasan is here. He was short but had a masculine face. Mia's father was a calm man, with his muscular body and harsh facial features, he looked like a hunter. Mia sighed at the situation and proceeded with her meal. The second daughter approached her and said, So, Mia, did you at least have a lover? It has nothing to do with Mio Nietzschean, right? Fufu, form that looks it seems Mia hasn't got a lover yet. Even though if you're in the military, you can pick all the man you want, even though Mia is so cute. If you say too much, I'll get angry okay? Staring at the second daughter, who was stroking her head teasingly, Mia shook off her hand. The long-haired eldest daughter, who was somewhat gentle, tilted her head and looked at Mia. It's true, isn't it? Mia is very cute. You. Mia is a hard worker and always doing her, Fufu. Well, Mia is a little clumsy, but if Wani-chan is a man, Wani-chan think Wani-chan will definitely fall in love with Mia. The men around Mia doesn't have eyes for women. In contrast to the teasing second daughter, these were words from the heart. Mia loved this somewhat outgoing, kind, and beautiful eldest daughter, but that makes just it even worse. Miazo Nietzschean, you're overestimating me too much. That's not true, Mia. Mia that is not good at that, Mia needs to be more confident. Wani-chan really thinks Mia is a very cute and my proud little sister. I wonder if Wani-chan should ask Tex if he can find someone good. Stop it, it's embarrassing. Tex was Mia's husband. He was a talented hunter and a popular young man with a good face, but it seems that even for him, this easygoing older sister was a difficult prey. Years of earnest approaches to woo her passed, but he was ignored. She could still remember pitying his pitiful figure. Mies was kind and beautiful and was the object of admiration for the men in the village. She sighed thinking there won't be anything good from cooperating with this kind of older sister. Well, it's not good to rush it. Wani-chan too, thought Wani-chan wouldn't have any connection to sort of thing, but Tex suddenly confessed to Wani-chan, that's what marriage is about. Seeing her older sister nodding, the second daughter M.I. sighed with exasperated face. I don't think it was sudden at all thought. It was sudden okay, Wani-chan was really surprised. After the festival, he suddenly, marry me, Mies, 
even though he didn't show any sign of that until then. I thought he was making fun of me. It's just that Wani-san didn't notice it, right? Ha, huh. I say whether it's Wani-san or Mia, why are the both of you like this? I feel sorry for the other person. Mia furrowed her brow and glared at the second daughter. Don't put Miezo Nichin and me together. We're completely different, okay? You're the only one who thinks so. How about Basil? Why Basil? We just met though. You know, didn't he say something? Do you still don't have a partner, he said? Ha, huh, if he have the time to ask such things, I think he should find his own partner first though. Without even noticing the flow of the conversation, M.I. rubbed her inner corners of her eyes, and Miez called out to Kalua, who was looking at them while she was dealing with the children. Kalua-san, how is there? Um, aren't there any good people in the military? Well, I wonder. Kalua, if you say anything weird, I'm going to get angry, okay? Mia grumbled and Kalua smiled wryly. There are several people who seem to be interested in Mia, but even so, it would be difficult to connect them. In addition to her Mia's dullness, there were times when Dagra, who was strict with discipline, sees Mia as a daughter for some reason, and there was also a check between competitor. Anyway, that story is over. Other than that, you say you don't like scolding, so bought out a different topic, so willful. Emeo Nietzsche just wants to tease me right. Anyway, it's over, Mia forcibly cut off the topic. Ha, huh, geez. Emeo Nietzsche has always been like that. Miezo Nietzsche is also Miezo Nietzsche. Hmm. I'm envious of your happy family. In one of the bedrooms, Kalua stroked Mia's sleeping sister's head and smiled. The two rooms for the children and one for the parents. The house was quite large, with three rooms, not including the living room. It's a nice home. In mine, we never laughed like that when we were eating. Really, every house here is like that though. Maybe it depends on the village. The atmosphere is quite different depending on the place, it's kind of fresh. Chuckle Kalua chuckled, and Mia puckers her lips slightly dissatisfied. Well, I guess that's the case with Kalua, the guest. Do you think it's different if you live here? Fufu, Mia sure is luxurious. Noisy. Well, it's fine, it's just for a few days anyway. Mia said while also stroking her little sister's head. Yeah, when I get home, I'm sure they'll say a lot of things. Like, insisting that instead of working alone I should take it easy at my parents' house. How should I say it, I also felt bad leaving all the work to Commander. Well, Commander Bald Eagle seemed to be itching to work. But he just recovered after all, so I'm worried if I don't follow up properly. Also, don't call him Bald Eagle, I get yelled every time because of it okay. She reaches out and tugs at Kalua's cheek. Kalua smiled wryly and told Mia it's okay isn't it? Since you've come back to your hometown, why don't you forget about work and take it easy during that time? Well, that's true. Somehow Kalua, you're acting weird lately. Strange. Enen, like, strangely gentle, something like that. She blushed, embarrassed as she said that. Kalua smiled at her mischievously. I think I've always been kind to Mia though. How sad. Oh no, Mia is a bit perverted, so she likes being teased was it? I withdraw my previous statement. It's the usual Kalua. Mia said so and lay on her back and closed her eyes. Kalua looked at her profile. Tomorrow, why don't you show me around the village? Even though it's snowing? Even though it's snowing? It's fine isn't it? I want to see what Mia's village is like. Mia aside, I may not have another chance. Well, that's fine. There's nothing unusual about it, you know? I don't have any expectations. Fufu, I just want to see Mia, the Kilnan's guide. You're making fun of me again, Mia pouted her lips. Kalua smiled happily and replied that she was not making fun of her. I make fun of people, but I don't really lie. Which one is that? That way of saying it already sounds like a lie, and you're making fun of me again aren't you? Eh, hey, well then, I leave it to you. The next morning Mia woke up to the sound of her younger sister crying as she was hit on the forehead with Mia's elbow. Including today, they have three more days, and the day after tomorrow, they will go out to the street and meet up with Chris J and the others. However, it's not like they had any business in the village, and they spent their time relatively leisurely. Ahihi, hit. 
It's for hitting Milia on the head this morning. Okay, now, let's go. They had promised to play with the children, and the plan guide on this day was Snow Fight. Mia, who was being thrown snowballs by the three and Kalua, ran around on the snow, trying her best to avoid them. Wait, Kalua, why is Kalua throwing it at me too? No, it's just the air. You see, if it's just children, Mia will avoid everything. T that doesn't mean, the opponent was children, as expected she can't use magic power. Mia, who was thrown with snowball from multiple directions, rolled away covered in snow. They ended up spending the day with the children playing in the snow until they were exhausted, even at dinner, Myrna didn't say anything in particular, and Mia ended her second day in a good mood. On the third day, Myrna stopped the children, telling them to restrain themselves a bit, and Mia guided Kalua around the village as had planned. At first, she wondered what was so interesting about it, but it seemed that she started to enjoy it as she toured around the village and went around various places, Mia was in a good mood. The weavers are up to this house, and from this area on there are many craftsmen and artisans. The rest are butchers, warehouses, that kind of thing. There are some fields over there but... Ah, well, I understand. It's all snow. The area where the field was located was completely covered with snow and completely white. In order to give the land a rest, vegetable scraps were thrown in at the beginning of fall and remained there until spring. Many of those who had been working on the farm went to help the artisans or to work in the city or in the army. It snows a lot, doesn't it? Really? It's almost always like this here. Mia sat on the fence watching the snow falling from the sky. But it must have rotted. The fence snapped, and Mia fell backwards and buried herself in the snow from the back of her head. Really Mia is cute. You're stupid. S shut up. Ah, if they found out, I'll get scolded later. Kalua smiled wryly and looked at the fence while pulling Mia's hand up. The fence is a simple one with a board attached to a wooden stake. It marks the boundary between fields. If it's just this much, why don't you fix it yourself? It was rotten anyway. Oh, well, that's true. Help me later. Yes, yes. Mia sat on the fence, this time carefully checking to make sure it was not rotten. Kalua jumped onto a nearby tree branch and sat down, her eyes looking at the village from side to side. On the ground and on the roofs too. It was beautiful, with bright white snow falling. The sounds of clanking metal fittings and the sound of weaving. The occasional sound of conversation. Kalua and Mia were the only ones who liked to walk outside on a day like this, except for the occasional frolicking children. Doesn't it snow at Kalua's place? It's quite a bit south of Royal's territory. In my experience, it doesn't snow this much unless you cross the Corail. The Corail mountain range lie east of the Dragon's Moor, separating the northern and central parts of the kingdom. Although the temperature was cold everywhere in winter, it was north of there that knee-deep snowfalls are commonplace in winter. It was probably a matter of climate. Even though Yuzaja-chan grew up in such a snowy country, why is she sensitive to the cold? Fufu true. It's so cold, isn't it? Even with the cloak that thick, she felt really floofy. Well I know how Yuzaja-chan feels. After all, I'm cold too. Foo fun. Mia laughs happily and jumped to Kalua's branch, she sat down and looks into her face and told her. For Kalua-san who is sensitive to the cold, shall I warm you up? Why you know, Mia? A. Snap a cracking sound was heard from below, followed by a crashing sound. The branch carrying the two fell straight down. Mia sure is child that doesn't learn. Covered in snow, Kalua sighed and with her bottom still in the snow she lamented. You 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 Mia's groan could be heard, and she reluctantly pulled her up. Mia should think a little more before acting, you can tell just by looking at it that two people can't sit on it. I I thought it could handle it so. Kalua smiled wryly as she brushes the snow from Mia's hair. And just like that, she lay down. Somehow, it's really peaceful. It seems like it was a lie that I was fighting on the battlefield until a while ago. Fufu, well, it's so peaceful there's nothing to do. Mia also lay down. Just when I brushed of the snow Kalua said and Mia laughed and asked her to do it again later. I like it. I want to relax in this kind place when I'm old. Don't you like the city better, Kalua? Well, yes. You know, I'm used to living there but... 
I think it's nice to feel like time is passing slowly. Hmm. Is that how it is? That's how it is. Kalua narrowed her eyes as snow fell on her cheeks and nose. What about Mia? Me? Hmm. I've never thought about retirement or anything like that, so I have my hands full right now. I'm not as skillful as Kalua. I don't think it has anything to do with being skillful or clumsy though. T that's not it, how should I say it? Mia thought a little and told her. Unlike Kalua who was searching for Alvina, I didn't leave the village for any particular purpose. I just had this vague feeling. I wanted to change my current environment, that's why I leave the house and was swept away by the current. I do have admiration for Okar-san and Wani-chan but... It's just a vague feeling, Mia continued. Her gaze was far away, like she is watching snowflakes falling from the sky. What I want to do, or what I wish to do, it's not clear, so, I don't really understand. Well, but right now I have a little goal or purpose, or something like that. Purpose? Mia looked at Kaliwa when she asked and laughed meaningfully. Foo fun, what do you think? Then I won't ask. Why? Kaliwa chuckled and hit Mia on the head. Mew. Kaliwa poked the glaring Mia's forehead and raised her body. Mia's guest I guess. Hum. Mia also sat up, and two young men were in Kaliwa's line of sight. One was Basil and the other was Tex, husband of the eldest daughter Mies. The two of them looked at them and talked to each other as they approached, then Tex slapped Basil on the back vigorously. Even though Basil was about to fall over in the snow, he regained her posture and headed over to them alone. Hmm, Basil. Didn't you say he had something important to say to Mia? Ah, come to think of it. It's not an uncommon combination. Ever since Tex married Mies, Basil has been going to Tex's house for some reason. She thought he was having a romantic crush on Mies, but it didn't seem that way, and Mies seemed to be told by Tex that if Mies join then it's going to be confusing, so we will talk alone. She didn't know whether it was simply because they got along well or nor, but anyway without thinking there's anything unusual, she asked him as she sat down. Basil, what's wrong? Oh, I wanted to continue the talk from the day before yesterday. Hmm, it's an important story. Ha, huh. well, that's fine. What is it? Kalua looks exasperated at Mia and then looked at Basil. Basil was looking at Kalua with pleading eyes, and Kalua smiled wryly as she stood up. Hmm, it looks like I'm in the way, so I'll go home first. It's cold anyway. Hum. Ah, okay. Kalua said so and walked toward the house. Mia watched Kalua go, tilting her head, and the two of them were left alone. Mia tilts her head at the brooding Basil, who bowed his head to Kalua's back then turned his face to Mia. What happened to Tex? No, I've been asking him for advice for a long time. He gave me a push. A push? No, let's not talk about the details. It's off topic. How many times have I been dodged like this? Ha, huh. Basil shook his head and looked straight at Mia. Since it's about you, you won't understand even if I say it in a roundabout way, I'll tell you straight. Um, are you making fun of me? Listen. I want you to marry me, Mia. Hum. Mia stiffened at the sudden words and frowned. Um, as I thought your Mac. I'm not kidding. I'm not even silly. I've always liked you. I've been approaching you subtly for a long time, but you just didn't notice. I said I want you to marry me. It is an unmistakable straight ball. Mia's head fell into chaos. Hey, um, hmm. Wait a minute, I'm sorting out my thought. I won't. How many years do you think I spent waiting? I heard it for the first time today though. It's because you're helplessly dull. Basil scratched his head while his face turned bright red, and Mia blushed her cheeks slightly and her eyes watered. At least, it was her first experience such as confession. In her mind, that is. Well, I know I'm not your type. I'm not as handsome as Tex, and I'm not a good hunter or craftsman. There are plenty of better men than me in the army, or even in this village. True. Basil grabbed Mia's shoulders who was nodding, thinking that she shouldn't nod her head there. I know. But, but... I swear that I'll make you happier than anyone else. I will never make you suffer. Even if I can't be the kind of man you like, I swear I'll be your best husband. I, I see. Don't brush it off, I'm proposing here. F for the time being let me go. 
Mia shook off Basil's hand, stepped back and regulates her breathing. Inhale and exhale quietly. After calming herself down, she looked up. You know, Basil, I'm happy, but I'm half position of responsibility in the army. So, I want you to quit the army and marry me. Of course, it might not be right away, but it's not like you're not allowed to be discharged, right? That's right, but... Basil sighed and said he knew. It's a bit sudden for you, and you won't be able to sort it out. You can let me hear the answer, tonight. A, uh, yeah. That's all I want to say. I'm serious about what I just said. I'm not joking or making fun of you, okay? I know, you don't have to say that much. I'm telling you because that's likely to happen if it's you. See you tomorrow, Basil said as he left, and after waving him off, Mia sighed. What a shock. And, she just squatted on the snow. I know Mia is excellent. But she didn't come because she was having trouble with Foos, or because she had some unavoidable circumstances. I understand what you mean. But what you just said isn't Mia's wish, right? Dagra said as he rubbed his aquiline nose, eagle nose. Kalua nodded with a serious face. Yes. It's not like I'm forcing it or anything. This is also my selfish idea. The severity of that battle can be understood more than anything else by looking at the wear and tear of the unit. And many died. You must have your own feelings about it. Yes. I'm not saying absolutely, but if Mia wants to quit the army and live a normal life when she returns to her hometown, I want the captain's permission so that she can quit. It's hard to come back here, and if we come back, Mia seems like she's going to cancel it. Dagra sipped his black bin tea and nodded his head in agreement after a short pause. Thank you. I understand how you feel. She's a good girl. There are many ways she can be happy without being on the battlefield. If that happens, I will tell Krishsama that it was my responsibility. I'm sure Krishsama would agree if I said the reason. It's certainly a shame as a war force, but Dagra continued. You are free to choose how you want to live. I have no right to bind it. If Krishsama hadn't found her by chance, she would have been returned as unsuitable as a soldier. She's here by a series of coincidences, but, well, I don't think it's a good idea to dedicate your life to the army out of inertia. I guess this coincidence also means that the time has come to think about it once more. Yes. I feel that way too. Anyway, it is Mia who will decides. You, her closest friend, should watch over her. Remembering the conversation with Dagra the other day, Kalua looked at Mia crouching down from the shade of the tree. And Kalua nodded a little lonely. This is fine. Clumsy and awkward. But is a caring and kind child. Mia was too good to be on the battlefield. In such a nice village, making a family and be happy. If there was such a future, Kalua thought, what could be better than that? Mia will surely be happy. Saying that in her mind, she returned to Mia's house. Section. Audiobook by Masquerade at Masquerade Audiobooks. Chapter 130. Stubborn. Myrna prepared the foods, and the children were clinging to Kalua. After saying I'm home, Mia took off her coat and put her sword without saying a word. Mia's lip pouted when Kalua asked how the confession went. How do you know it's a confession? Ha, huh, normally you would notice it at a glance all right. Mia is super insensitive, so she may not have noticed, but I likes Mia is clearly written on his face. Mia glared at Kalua, and Myrna laughed in a good mood saying it's a celebration tonight. You don't have to. Because I will turn him down. Ha! What are you talking about? Myrna frowned and looked at Mia. Is Basil really not to your liking? Well, I guess he doesn't look handsome, but he's a nice guy right? I've been watching him since I was little and I'm quite pleased with him. That's right, but that's not it. I already said I'm the adjutant of my unit right, I can't quit so easily because I have a responsibility, and I like it there. Ha, huh, don't be silly. Myrna put her hand on her forehead, exasperated. For the sake of your duty, you would even waste this precious opportunity. What are you going to do from now on? I'll think about it again in the future. You... Are you saying that you're going to give up all your happiness as a woman and devote your life to the military without getting married or starting a family? Even if that's so, what are you going to do about it? The two of them glared at each other for a while, 
and the children, seeing the tense atmosphere, returned to their rooms. However, they were curious about the content, so they secretly opened the door and eavesdropped though it was completely obvious. I respect Okar-san. Okar-san is good at weaving, has a family, and raised us, the same with my sisters. I think they're really very admirable, and that more than anything else, might be what makes me the happiest as a woman but. Mia said with a serious face, keeping her eyes straight. But I don't think that's the only happy future for me. At least, I think I'm very happy right now, and I'm satisfied with my life in spite of all the things I'm going through. Hum, really. Then, what, you went to the battlefield for your country, and even if you were killed or faced something horrifying, can you still say that you had a satisfying life? I think Okar-san is fundamentally misunderstanding the military. Mia shook her head. I will fight as a soldier so that I don't get killed, so that Kalua and others don't get killed. I can't be satisfied with being killed, and if you ask me if I'm really prepared to die, to be honest, I don't really understand. She remembered well when she was actually nearly killed. She was hopelessly scared and would have died if Chris J hadn't come. But even after all that, Mia still wanted to work in that unit. Because she felt that it was worth it. But there's a meaning to me fighting like that, and I feel like I can find something that only I can do. Of course, I might change my mind in five or ten years, but at least that's what I think right now. Mana looks into Mia's eyes and sighed. She rubbed her eyes and leaned back against the wall. I understand what you're saying. It's my loss. It seems you have your own resolve. Okar-san. But, even then I'm still worried about you, you know. Mana stroked her own belly. Nostalgically, lovingly. You were in my womb for almost a year, it's big, it's heavy, and I have to be careful, and it hurts when I give birth. It's not something you can get used to it even if you had given birth to two baby before, at that time I screamed come out quickly, you idiot. But once you were born, you were so cute. The first time I you them crying, I was so happy. I've been watching you get bigger and bigger little by little since then. Of course, compared to the older two, you were a lot slower and took a lot of work, but you were still cute my child. Myrna looked up at her. She just stared at Mia with the face of a mother. It's an honor to serve the country as a soldier. But rather than risking your life to work in a dangerous place and gaining such honor, it doesn't matter if it's not honorable, I want you to make a family with a man who likes you and be happy. Mia averted her eyes from her gaze. She couldn't say she understood her mother's feelings, but she could believe that what her mother said was the truth. Despite her nagging and yelling, it was her mother who had cared for her. Her mother's earnest words had a certain weight to them. But. I'm sorry. But I. Mia. The one who called her name was Kalua, who had remained silent. Honestly, I wasn't sure if I should intervene, but. I think you should think over about it once. Why is Kalua saying that? Because I think it's that kind of opportunity. Kalua pointed to the sword leaning against the corner of the room. There were two swords, Mia's and Kalua's. I can't throw away my sword because I have to repay my debt to Yuzaja-chan. But that's not the case with Mia. Even if you don't do anything dangerous, you can still choose to live a peaceful life in this village. I think that is a happy thing after all, so I think that if you have the choice, you should choose it rather than a battlefield where you can die at any time. Kalua looked at her own hands. With a slightly distant eye. I've done a lot of dirty things, and I've killed quite a few people outside of the battlefield. I can't go back to the village anymore, and I ended up with Yuzaja-chan. I'm satisfied with that. But there are many paths for Mia, and I think it's fine not to force yourself to find a place in such dangerous place. Are you saying that I should quit? Kalua hesitated a little, then lowered her eyes and nodded. Well, I guess this time I'm on Myrna's side because I think Mia has a proper place here. Edge G. Mia banged the desk and stood up. Kalua, you idiot. With her cloak and sword in one hand, she ran out of the house. Kalua sighed quietly and scratched his head. I'm sorry. No. I was thinking the same thing as Myrna-san. She picked up her sword, which was leaned against the wall, and wrapped it around her waist with a belt. She laughed as she saw Mia walking out with a sword, thinking that the habits of the battlefield were already ingrained in her. I'm going out for a while too. Ah, can I ask you? 
Kaluasan would be better off than me. She resembled me in a strange way, and became stubborn. Even though it's okay if we're not similar at that kind of part. Fufu, well, her stubbornness is cute so I like it. She smiled happily. Then, suddenly, she makes a lonely face. She's a good girl after all. It's rare to be like that, but that's precisely why I want Mia to be happy. This is really a good village. I'm sorry, pushing the hard roll on you. No, I came here with the intention of doing so if there was an opportunity. Myrna gets up and bowed her head, and Kaliwa nodded. Then she put on her cloak and went outside. The sky was a madder red at dusk. The thick clouds had mysteriously disappeared and the sky looked crystal clear. The snow tinged with sunset was endlessly beautiful, but there was also something lonely about it. Kaliwa followed Mia's footsteps. The widely spaced footprints, characteristic of people with magical powers, led straight into the forest. There, she probably jumped on a branch and the footprints disappeared, but there were traces of fallen snow on the branches and leaves. Is she trace it, she'll probably be where she was on the first day. She deduced that and headed in that direction. Mia. She found her sitting on a rock. Mia ignores her voice and turned away, Kalua smiled wryly as she come closer, picking up the snow and harden it with her hands. She then walks up to her side and put it on Mia's head. Mia glared at Kalua for a moment as if to say something, but quickly looked away as if determined to ignore her. Kalua puts another snowball on her head, drew a face on it with a fallen branch, and sticks it on the left and right sides of the torso. Um, I'm angry, you know. Mia, who couldn't stand it anymore, opened her mouth. Fufu, I know. Glaring at Kaliwa, she lowered the snowman on top of her head and looked at it. Mia put it on her side while wondering whether to throw it away, it was bad and extremely ugly. Originally, Mia was never one to wield a sword on the battlefield. You're a good girl after all. If you say that, so does Kaliwa. You're a beauty, a young lady giving up everything for her little sister. What's the difference between Kalua and me? Elegance and a bigger chest. Kalua, are you seriously listening? I know, Kalua said again. Kalua laughed troubledly, smiled kindly, and patted her head. As I thought Kalua is beautiful when she's like that. Even though she was a manly woman, the way she smiles was elegant. Each gesture was strangely beautiful and mesmerizing. Her shiny black hair shone in the setting sun, and her cat-like eyes, wrapped in eyelashes, were mischievous, yet kind. Even if you don't make a place for her on the battlefield, Mia has a place to return to. This is a nice village, Mia's family is good people and good children, and if Basil Kuhn is like that, I'm sure he'll make Mia happy. I think that's more happiness than Mia thinks. So you want me to stay here? Yes. Do you hate this village? Mia shook her head. Kalua continued. I also talked to the commander. He said that if it's Mia's happiness, then that's fine. Yuzaja-chan is a good girl, and I'm sure she'll understand. I'm sure the people in the squad are the same. What does Kalua think? I told you earlier, didn't I? No. I want to know Kalua's own feelings. Again, as if troubled. Kalua played with her hair, which hung down like a horse's tail, and pondered for a moment. I want Mia to be happy in this peaceful village, I think. She untied her hair. Her long hair swayed in the wind, glistening and scattering. It's a little lonely, but I think it's good. She pulled Mia's hair back and carefully tied it into a knot. Kalua chuckled and patted her head. Mia cast her eyes down. Adol and Kells were unnecessarily motivated saying things like leave this place to us and go ahead. There was also Bagu that seemed to not die easily even if you kill him, so easily. I was made aware again that the battlefield that kind of place. I am not very strong, I have no power. I can't say with confidence that I will protect Mia. That's why, yeah, I think, I'm scared. Kalua said, breathing quietly. That atmosphere is unique. You could throw away things you would normally cherish without any hesitation. For friends, for honor for stubbornness. The battlefield was full of various reasons for throwing away one's life. The temptation of madness, everyone offered their lives in that way. In a crazy world, you have to be crazy to survive. That's why, I don't want Mia to be there. She didn't think she should be in such a world. 
Her life, which was cherished by so many people, should not be treated that way. So you want me to be happy, hum? Mia took a deep breath and stands up. Then, slowly, she pulled out her sword and pointed it at Kalua. Let's fight, Kalua. Mia! Mia lowered her sword and slowly walked away, smiling. Until I win. If I give up standing, Kalua wins, and I'm going to stay here, just as Kalua says. Simple, isn't it? Kalua stared at Mia, then sighed. She pulled the sword from her waist, slung it over her shoulder, and opened her mouth. Okay, I'll go along with you until you're satisfied, if Mia is satisfied with that. I'm satisfied, I'm definitely going to win after all. You sure said it, I won't go easy on you like usual. I'm saying even then I'll win. Mia smiled at her confidently. She held up her sword and charged. A simple wooden structure with mud walls, more like a hut than a house. But the furniture in it makes it look more like a house, and inside were two young men and a woman. Well, whatever it is, you're doing well. Be confident. Thank you very much, it's thanks to Texan for supporting me. I don't know if I'll get a good answer yet, though. This was the home of the eldest daughter, Miez, and Tex. Ha, Basil sighed, and Tex tapped him on the shoulder while laughing. It's up to Mia Chan, but I think you'll be fine. Is that so? Yeah, you're not a bad guy. I've been watching you for a long time, so at least I think so, and you know it's Mia Chan. Thank you. Tex laughed, saying, no need for thanks to Basil, who bowed his head. Miez, who was watching the two of them, tilted her head and groaned. Both of you are mean. If you had told me sooner that you liked Mia, I would have cooperated properly. It looks like it's going to be complicated if you gr involved so. Tex sighed. They were indeed silent about it, but Tex had been consulting with Basil for nearly two years. From Mie's point of view, it was only natural that she should have guessed and noticed, but just like he guessed. Hum. Basil Kuhn confessed to Mia. Ah, hey. Did you like Mia? It seems she didn't even notice a silver of it. What a terrifyingly denseness. Tex spent ten years trying to get her to marry him. This was the reason why Basil approached Tex for advice, and they have been friends since Basil asked for advice from the predecessors, Tex, in order to seduce Mia, who was also extremely dense. Until then, he was a young man with whom he had no connection, but now he loved him like a younger brother. Well, above all, I'm glad you were able to tell her. A burden has been lifted from my shoulders. Yes, thank you very much. Well then. Ah. I'm waiting for good news. Yes. Basil bowed deeply and left their house. After dinner, the sun had completely set. The crescent moon was floating in the clear sky, as if to bless him on his day. Basil headed for Mia's house, thinking it was about time. Ah, Oni-chan. Oh, Milia. What's wrong, standing outside like this? Did Myrna scold you? No, geez. I won't do anything to get scolded for. Standing in front of the house was Mia's younger sister Milia. She looked around as she hugged Basil. Miro Nietzschean and Kalua-san didn't come back even after we finished eating, so I was looking outside for a while. Mia is. Yeah. Oni-chan, did you confess to Miro Nietzschean? Hmm. Ah, by any chance, did something happen? Milia nodded and told him the talk between Mia and Myrna. Basil frowned and sighed. He stroked Milia's head. Is that so? That guy won't listen once she decide on something. Oni oh, Chan, should I comfort you? Don T talk nonsense, I can't give up so easily. I've been trying for years now, I'll go and tell her one more time and make sure she gets it right. Miria stared up at Basil, and Basil tilted his head. She who was about as tall as Basil's chest, nodded and smiled. Then, if Miro Nietzschean dumps me, I'll be your bride. Ha ha, don't say such an unlucky thing. Well, thank you. Even though I'm serious. He stroked Miria's head as she puffed out her cheeks, smiled wryly, and went straight to the forest. Mia was probably over there. He jogged a bit, trying not to get his feet caught in the snow. And then, what resounded was the sound of swords. Two women were holding swords. The beautiful woman with long black hair was swinging a large curved sword, which she was freely maneuvering to catch the blade. In contrast, the chestnut-haired woman, with a straight sword in her hand, 
ran around the area and swung her sword through the air, blowing snow away. There was no sky or earth with trees as a foothold. The leap was so high that it was incomprehensible. She kicked a branch and plunges head first into the snow. The black cloak she wore the crescent skull engraved on her chest was a reference to the famed Black Century. It was a completely different dimension from the battles he was in vigilante training. He was sure she was Mia, but for a moment he didn't even know who she was. Kaliwa, the beautiful black-haired woman, lightly catches Mia's sword and threw her off her feet. This is the fifty-fourth time. Do you still want to do it? But Mia stood up, her whole body covered in snow, her breathing ragged. Her sweat was like steam. The clinging snow quickly melted and wets her body. In contrast, her best friend is not even out of breath. The great curved sword she carries on her shoulder. The standing figure seems full of gaps, but there was a strange sense of intimidation. Cough, I'm still not done. You can't win even if you continue like this a one thousand times. You never know the one thousand one time. Really stubborn. Kaliwa charged. A gigantic beast-like sprint that knew away all the snow under her feet. Without minding the snow, in the fog of snow-like mist, the sword that twisted made a roaring sound. Behind Mia, who was barely able to avoid it snapping a tree there, Kaliwa twisted her body and delivered a kick. Without any hesitation or reverse, Mia barely caught it with the belly of the sword and was blown away, rolling again. This is fifty-five times. Next time is fifty-six times. You won't stand up. Kalua said uninterestedly and approached Mia, who was unable to get up from the shock. At that point, Basil's stiffness was broken, and he immediately jumped out onto the spot. W wait. I don't know what's going on but calm down a bit. I'm calm, at least I am. Ha. Huh. Kalua sighed and slung her sword over her shoulder again. Coughing, Mia stands up behind Basil. Basil, move. You think I will? What are you thinking? doing this, anyway, stop it. What will you do if you get hurt? It's important to me. Exasperated, Kaliwa jumped to Mia. She pushed her down and thrust her sword into her neck. Fifty-sixth time. Do you think you can really win if you continue like this? The difference in experiences between Mia and me. You know that there is a difference that can't be make up with effort. I don't know. All I know is that Kaliwa will go along with me. Whoops. Mia tried to throw snow at her, and Kaliwa jumped to dodge it. Mia exhales her breath roughly as she rises, brushing the snow off her body and readying her sword. If you let me faint or do anything and seriously try to win, Kaliwa can always beat me any time. That Kaliwa doesn't do that, mean I'm already winning. You know, that statement is cowardly, because I won't give up until I can't no longer move. Kaliwa let out a deep sigh and nodded in agreement. Then I'll do as you say. It's the end that's fine. You're not going to use force to end it. If you say you won't give up if I don't that, then I will. Basil again stepped between them and raised his voice. Wait. Calm down for now. Kaliwa-san, what do you mean? Ha. If I win, Mia will stay in the village. It's that kind of match. As you know, this girl is stubborn. Ah. Basil held his head with an indescribable face. Then he looked at Mia. Mia, do you hate me that much? It's not. That's not it. Then, what's no good? I'll definitely make you happy, just like I said. I'm not lying, I really believe that from the bottom of my heart. I. That. Mia clutched her sword and looked at Kaliwa and Basil. I was surprised that Basil said that, but of course I'm happy but it's different. Then she shook her head and smiled. Become happy, I want to make you happy, Okar-san, Basil, and Kaliwa all say things like that, but I'm more than happy enough now. Mia. It just so happened that I became a soldier, and it was really hard at first, but I worked hard there, and was recognized and entrusted with many things. I was very happy. For the first time the clumsy, awkward, stupid me, I felt like I was able to obtain something like that with my own hands. Mia looked straight at Kaliwa. Krishsama, Commander, everyone. Kaliwa, I'm really happy to have met everyone. It's just a chance encounter, but it's very important. That's why I want to continue working in that place with everyone. That's why I'm being so stubborn. 
Then she stepped forward and approaches Kalua. I told you once right, I wield my sword for Krishsama and Kalua. I don't know what Kalua thought about it, but I'm serious about it. I really wanted to be that kind of person I seriously think so. Kalua also looked back into Mia's eyes and then looked away. Mia moved further forward. To Kalua's side. Kalua, if you think that's annoying, you can do whatever you want, I'll give up if I lose this time. Mia said that. The woman in front of Kalua was open and unresisting winning is easy, easier than taking a candy from a baby, but more difficult than anything. After all, it's kind of cowardly. Kalua didn't answer and dropped her shoulders. I know that Kalua is kinder than anyone else. I was told that the basics of tactics are to understand your opponent and target their weaknesses. Mia said and thrust her straight sword into Kalua's center of her chest her heart. Then, like a child, she smiled broadly. Now I've won. See, I was right, wasn't I? Yes yes, Mia-sama's win. As she gave up, Kalua wiped her curved sword with her cloak and put it in the scabbard. Mia hugged Kalua happily and laughed while looking tired. I'm sorry. I love that part of Kalua. How should I say it, geez. Kalua sighed exasperated and pulled Mia's cheek. Still, Mia smiles happily, and then she turned to Basil. I don't hate Basil. It's true that I was happy, but I have something I want to do now. So, don't apologize, it will make me miserable. Basil falls on his buttocks as it is and, like Kalua, sighed with his shoulders slumped. Would I have had a chance before you left the village? Might be. I see. That's all I need to hear. Saying that, he closed his eyes and stood up. He laughed and said to not to leave any regrets behind. I'll take that as a lesson. Next time, I'll start from the beginning and go straight from the front. Hmm. No, I was really surprised because it was too sudden, and I think it's usually better to take a small step first. You. Exasperated. Basil scratched his head and looked at Kalua. I'm leaving Mia to you. Even if I fight, I wouldn't even reach Mia's feet, so it's stupid to worry about Mia like this, but I want to say it. Okay. I understand. Fufu, Basil Kuan Shaw is a good man. She chuckled and hit Mia on the head. If it's Basil Kuan, even if it's not Mia, I'm sure you'll find a good girl. Haha, -ha, there are hardly any people of the same age left in the village. Ah. That's a pity. Ha, huh, should I just mix in with the carriage escort and go to the city? Kalua smiled wryly, and Basil also smiled. Then Basil looks up at the sky and nodded once. Well then, see you later. You're leaving the morning of day after tomorrow, right? Yes. I'm going to see you off. Saying so, Basil turned his back and walked away. Kalua looked at Mia exasperated. It's a waste. Even though he's a good guy, even though you might never get another chance. Shut up, even though Kalua will miss me when I'm gone. Hmm, that's right. Well, I won't deny it. I'm lonely. Why yeah? Why are you embarrassed when you said it yourself? S shut up. Lightly tapping Mia's head whose face reddened, Kalua held out her hand. Let's go home. Yes. Taking her hand, Mia smiled. Kalua sighed several times today. Mia should explain it to Myrna-san. I'll pass. Why? Let's persuade Okar-san together. It's okay if it's the Mia just now, you, LL be fine, I'm tired anyway, also I'm an outsider. It's cunning to suddenly become an outsider like that. Who is the cunning one here? And so the two of them walked on. The night road shining in the crescent moon. In the grey forest, only the Bayong seemed to shine. Chapter 131 old enemies and putting it off. Leaving Kalka, they picked up Mia and Kalua. If they passed through this forest, they would reach Gargane, and today they would spend the night in this forest. The members of the Black Flag Special Forces took turns walking in the snow, warming their hands against the cold. In the carriage, as usual, there was a girl wrapped in a blanket and snuggling on the servant's lap. Ah, ah, Krishsama. She stared endlessly at the servant's face. It's not like she's that bad with the stare, but when someone stared at her like this, it made her feel strangely embarrassed, wondering if there was something on her face. When Berry tilted her head in embarrassment with a blush on her cheeks, Chris J happily hugged her. 
Eh, hey, very so warm. Is that so? That's good then. If Chris J had a tail, it would be wagging from side to side. Three days after leaving the village, she was in a very good mood. And Berry couldn't say she had no idea about the cause. Perhaps it was her acceptance of her relationship with her gala. Perhaps it was the fact that she was so pleased with her words. Regardless of whether she was different from others or not. Even if she could guess what other people were thinking, in the first place it was impossible to understand everything. Berry, appropriately convinced her, lightly kissed and hugged Krisky as she raised her head expectantly. While repeating like, like, Chris J snuggled her body against Berry. For the most part, it's the same as usual, the problem was her defenselessness, which always tested Berry's reason. How could she be so defenseless? It was frightening. Remembering the exchange the other day, and although she was not in a position to speak for others, she still found this affection and trust painful. The distorted affection, mischievousness, and other etc. in Berry's heart. As if to contain it all with her reason, Berry groaned and looked out the window. Outside, the sun was shining through the clouds, and if you catch the shadows on the trees, it was just before noon. It was about time to take a break and prepare for lunch. In the village, they refrained from taking the shared precious meat, and all that was left was dried meat. As expected, it will be soup again today. Fortunately, vegetables were plentiful. It might be better to mix dried meat into small pieces and mix it to make dumplings she was thinking that when. W what's the matter? Chris J suddenly jumped to her feet and looked to the left and right. Focusing on the ear as if trying to listen to something like dogger like Crescenta, she had such rude thoughts, but when she looked at Chris J, she was very serious. Her purple eyes were icy and puppet-like. Her eyebrows furrowed, and she took the sword at her side and looked at Berry. Chris J can hear the sound of swords clashing and cursing. It's a little further ahead. Bandits, perhaps? Maybe. Maybe some wagons are being attacked. Berry, mm. Yes. Please be careful. Chris J smiled and nodded, then stepped out of the carriage. A blanket of snow. Chris's feet sunk into the snow. Outside, Kaliwa and the others seemed to have noticed and had grim expressions on their faces. Can you see it? From here, no. Perhaps a carriage somewhere is being attacked by bandits. There were originally many around here. Really? I haven't heard much about that. Kaliwa tilted her head and Kilik told her. When I was young, there were a lot of bandits in the area. The reason it was so safe was because the previous General Christ and regularly held training here to maintain public order. It's close to Gargain after all. Ah, I see, the northern part is just vacant right now. Kaliwa nodded in agreement. Chris J thought for a moment as she surveyed the forest to his left and right. There were no enemy shadows around her. The scale of the enemies was unknown. If the enemy had noticed their side thinking of the possibility of the scale being even larger, it would be better for a number of people to remain here. Berry shouldn't be hurt in any chance, and if that's the case, there's a risk that Chris J alone wouldn't be enough. Chris J assumed the worst-case scenario and thought about how to move. Even if it's just that the caravan was being attacked, if Chris J was going alone, she wouldn't get hurt. How troubling. Chris J is going to see it, but we don't know how many enemies there are, so you guys need to protect Berry. I won't forgive you if Berry gets even one injury okay. Ahaha, understood. Yes, m. After Chris J said that, she pulled Mia's cheek, who was groaning alone. Mia, are you listening? You, yes. No, um. Mm. I was impressed that everyone could hear that kind of sound. It's a problem that Mia's hearing is bad. Should Chris J make Mia live blindfolded for a while when we get back? Hey. Anyway, Chris J left it to you. Chris J said and leaped up into the tree. It was not good to have her feet caught in the snow. She didn't want the snow to enter her boots. She looked for a dead tree without leaves and jumped over it, moving through the forest. The source of the sound was right through the trees. It's not a bandit. What's going on? By the time she arrived, Everything was already over. Three sleigh wagons, three merchants, and three guards. One of the escorts seemed to have a minor injury and was being treated by the other, but the wound didn't look that deep. He wouldn't die even if left alone. Four guards. Of the four, 
The latter two were a handsome young man with brown hair and an old man with one arm. Both were clad in sand-colored cloaks and seemed to be magic possessor. She tilted his head for a moment, wondering if the old man's arm had been cut off, but he did not seem to be in pain. He must have been one-armed since the start. Both of them looked at Cliché with a stunned look on their faces, and Cliché pondered for a moment before saying, I thought it was a bandit's attack and came to the rescue from the other side. Hum, what show you? Before the young man could shout, Chris J twisted her hip. The survivor of the bandit who was trying to grab her from behind. Chris J, without looking over, kicked him back, sinking his sternum with the heel of her reinforced boot. There was no scream, only a dull sound, and the bandit's body slammed into the tree behind and collapsed. His heart ruptured, and he died instantly. It looks like it's almost over. Is everything all right? A silver-haired girl with a white woolen hat covering her ears. The young man who was about to jump out to save Chris J froze in place. The others who saw it also froze. Only the old man recovered first and slowly opened his mouth. You are. Ah, I hadn't given my name yet. I'm Chris J Alberinia Christand. I'd like to ask about the number of bandits but... The face of the old man who stepped forward was familiar. Who was he? Checking the whatever, don't care, list in her memory, Chris J clapped her hands. What a coincidence, Grislander san. I'm glad it seems like you lived properly. Oh, did you remember? Yes, I remember. Chris J was the one who cut off the arm after all. The young man next to him looked at Chris J with even more surprise, and then looked at the old man Waltzer. Walstel Grislandi. He was an assistant general of the Holy Elsren Empire and the old man whose arm Chris J had cut off. The memory of their polite greeting all the way to the battlefield was still fresh, and he was remembered in Chris's mind as one of the strange old men. The old man placed his remaining right hand on his chest and saluted. Ha ha, to be able to meet in a place like this, should I say it's a god's prank? I've always wanted to thank you for that time. Young master, this girl is... Chris J. Christand. The figure that didn't show any turmoil in a surprise attack from a completely blind spot, and counterattacks without changing even a change in expression. Ability that does not match the appearance of a little girl. Surprised and confused, the beautiful young man with brown hair Aleha nodded and took a deep breath. No need to thank you. This person is the young master hum. That said. Chris J. tilted her head troubled. Why are the Empire's soldiers in the kingdom? Depending on the reason, Chris J will need to capture you, but this time not as a prisoner of war, so he will be in prison instead of house arrest, all right? She put her right hand on the hilt of the sword at her waist and toyed with it. Military personnel from another country in the kingdom for no official reason. It is reasonable to assume that they are there to obtain inside information or plan some kind of sabotage, in such cases, they are usually tortured and disposed of without ever seeing the sun again. Ostensibly, they are people who should not exist, since there was no law that allows military personnel to cross borders without official reason. They were not treated as military personnel and were not in violation of the Holy Spirit Covenant and just like bandits, any punishment was permissible as long as it was within the scope of the laws of the kingdom. Even if it was for private purposes, if they were using official documents to inform the kingdom of their visit, they should have some kind of government official on their side, but if they didn't have one, they were illegal immigrants. A little more troublesome than bandits, Chris J narrowed her eyes. Whether it was interrogation or torture, she needed to take them in a condition where they still can talk. She considered severing the tendons in both hands when Waltzer dropped his sword to show that they were not hostile. I am a human who has already abandoned my status as an empire noble. Same with the young master, we're no longer the Empire soldiers. Right now, we're just travelers, the Empire should have officially issued a letter of excommunication, so if you check that, I think you'll understand. Excommunication? Do you mean deprivation of peerage? You can think of it as something more serious than a deprivation of peerage. It's not possible to have it reinstated. For the time being, I would like you to believe that statement, but now we are mere travelers. I have already abandoned my family name, but still, I swear by this name that remains, I am not lying. Mew, that's even more complicated. Chris J groaned and turned her gaze to the driver who looked frightened at her. 
Just go straight back down this road a little way and tell Krish's carriage to come this way. It has the Kristan's banner so you'll know. Why yes. Immediately. A beautiful girl with silver hair Krishje Krishtand, as the gossip said. And the bandit who tried to attack her and died instantly. It was like killing an insect or something. The appearance of the girl who calmly talked to them as if nothing had happened reminded him of the various rumors about her and made him recognize it as true, and he immediately ran to his feet. A frightened coachman was running, his feet caught in the snow and rolling. Chris J glanced at it sideways wondering if he was okay. Well, that's fine. For the time being, Chris J and the others are planning to have lunch, so let's go a little further to prepare and talk after lunch. Why yes. Chris J decided to prioritize joining and eating before the long talk. There was snow on the ground and the ground was frozen to even bury the bodies. After meeting up with the others, they had no choice but to throw the bodies into a small area of the forest. It wasn't a good feeling to eat in a dirty place with blood splattered all over it. Chris J, who dislikes dirt, also has general sensibilities in that area, so it was decided to have a meal a little further in the carriage. She put off the talk with the two of them for later, laid a large wooden board on the snow, stepped on it, and set up a bonfire. It was too much trouble to dig out the snow every time, so they often used the wooden planks as a floor, except at night. The flame went up. The wooden planks were only slightly charred, and they were stable enough to be used as a cooking area if you stepped on them with the snow. If it was just to boil water, they can use a magic crystal stove, but to keep warm due to the temperature, it is better to cook over an open fire like this. Hmm, is this okay? Berry glanced behind her with a troubled look on her face and asked Chris J. In the same way, others were setting up bonfires behind them, and of course, the Black Flag Special Force and the coachman, even Aleha and Waltzer, were joining them without complaining. The Black Flag Special Forces have been told by Crescheto to keep an eye on the two, so Kalua and Kilik have been keeping an eye on them for the time being, but they don't know what to say about this situation. Only Mia, who was working hard to build a fire, looked the same as usual. In case of suspicion, they are naturally allowed to detain them, but they have declared that they have resigned from the Empire military. Swear by name, were heavy words for nobles. Chris J lightly explained the situation to everyone, including Berry, to see how they would react, but there was nothing suspicious about the two men's attitude as they honestly surrendered their swords and said they would comply with the restraints. Everyone agreed that there would be no problem, and Chris J followed their lead. If what Waltzer said was true, they were simply innocent travelers. Chris J concluded that it would be wrong for her to detain innocent people and that she would leave them under surveillance for the time being, taking only their weapons. The two men were unarmed, and Cliché was on Berry's side she was confident that she could do anything even if they suddenly attacked her. As a result, the priority in Krish's mind was to prepare a meal rather than to have a talk with them. The other party was a former Empire soldier, a former general, and a former assistant general. It was Areha Sarchenka who easily defeated Kalmida, the general in the eastern part of the kingdom in the previous battle. Even though he was defeated by Bogan, his military fame was well known throughout the kingdom, and everyone was exasperated that Chris J was putting off such an opponent because she was hungry. Chris J told them we'll have a talk after preparing and eating lunch, so it's okay. I is that so? Yes. A, more than that, it's good that they shared the meat. The merchant just had salted pork, and he gave it to them. Thanks to that, Chris J was in a good mood without worrying about the two of them. Berry gave a wry smile, wondering what to do, but tried not to worry, thinking that it was better than having a bleak mealtime. Well, it looks like it will be much tastier than dried meat. Yes. Chris Che will need the dumplings, so Berry needs a kitchen knife. Are you sure? It's cold, isn't it? It was Chris Che that was especially bad with cold. You you you, Chris Che snuggled up to Berry while groaning. Chris Che always lets Berry deal with the cold so... Today Chris J will handle it. Fufu, Krish Sama doesn't have to worry about it, but, then, can I ask Krish Sama to do it this time? While smiling Chris J, Berry said that. Red and silver, the appearance of the two huddled together was indescribable, and the others were looking at them with indescribable expressions. They are always so close to each other that it is beyond the level of being close, but no one says anything about it now. Aleha, Waltzer, the merchant, 
and the other guests who were watching the scene were also glancing at the immoral-looking couple, but there was no way they could say anything. There was no conversation except between the two, and a very awkward atmosphere was drifting between them and those left alone. The 19th squad leader, Killick, who was trying to change the atmosphere, opened his mouth. B but, what a coincidence to meet the famous Aleja Dono in a place like this. I feel honored. Brown hair, brushing off the snow on it, Aleja, who should be called a handsome young man, went along with it. It was a gentle voice. Honor you said. I thought I was hated by the kingdom. And no need to thank me, I am already neither a soldier nor a noble. Ha ha, even so, if you become a former general, you won't be able to speak normally. If Aleja Dono is concerned about the fact that you were originally a soldier of the empire, please rest assured. Kellick looked at the other six and said, There is no one here who participated in the previous battle. Everyone joined the army during the civil war the other day there are those who respect you as a warrior, but there is no one who holds a grudge against you as an individual. I see, I'll be grateful and accept it obediently. But, from the civil war? With a hand on his chin, Aleha looked at the seven. Seeing that standing figure and the fluctuation of magical power that seemed to cling to their body, his clever eyes frowned. And as if he realized something, he muttered, I see. An elite unit under the direct control of Chris J. Christ and alongside the wolf pack of Granmeld Varkas. I heard rumors about the name of the Black Century. Was it you guys? Yes. Right now, we're escorting Krish Sama. The black leather armor they wore and the black cloak with the crescent skull emblem painted darkly on their chests. All seven of them were magic possessors it was easy to understand that they were no ordinary soldiers who were escorting nobles. But there was something strange about them. Usually, nobles were chosen for such missions due to their credibility, ability, and various other points of view, but they didn't look like nobles. If this was the case, they were private soldiers, and the answer was easy to find, based on the rumors he had heard. It seems I'm the one who should feel honored. The Sword Princess, Chris J. Christand, who was said to have led the Civil War to victory. Along with her was the elite Black Century, said to be elected from among the commoners. The people were very pleased with the success of this group of commoners. Aleha felt that there was some exaggeration in the greatness of their achievements, but realized that this was a misunderstanding. The answer to this dubious tale lies in the soldiers in front of him. The Black Century was probably a unit composed entirely of magic possessors. By being composed entirely of magic possessors, the Black Century was uniquely specialized to create a high degree of coordination, enable maneuver warfare, and create an overwhelming localized advantage. More flexible than cavalry, they can traverse any terrain. They can hide in the lines of battle and in the woods. And with its unrivaled head-on combat power, it is capable of single-handed head-hunting tactics against a core-sized opponent despite being a small elite unit of a century. All of them are made up of magic possessors Aleha immediately understood the terrifying meaning of that. If they had been there during the Battle of the Arzulan River, there was a possibility that they would have fallen into a situation where they would not even be able to withdraw. I've heard that the military name of the unit was quite active. I heard many times during the trip that you were the strongest century of the kingdom. Thank you for your kind words. That being said, it's not like we're being humble, it's not because of our credit, but because of that person's strength. Both in name and reality, Krishsama has no equal in the world, though it might not seem like it. Killick turned his gaze to Krishche, happily cooking with Berry. Her two tails of silver hair sway from side to side, and she wore a lovely woolen white hat up to her ears. Her back figure was that of a simple, excited child. As Killick said that, it wasn't like he didn't have thought about being the representative of the kingdom's strongest warrior, but if that was the normal her, then it couldn't be helped. However, Aleha showed a straightforward understanding of his words, and so did Waltzer, the old soldier next to him. He knew that she was the one who had led him into a trap and lured him into the mud with her army of 30,000 men and brought about his defeat. She built a vicious fort in front of the river, bypassed the mountains, and attacked the command post. She took the heads of the adjutant and assistant adjutant generals. In front of Waltzer and his elite, who came forward as the rear, she appeared alone, cut off his arm, and took him as a prisoner he has never forgotten her name. Defeated on the battlefield. 
It was just that she was the strong one and he was the weak one. He didn't mean to hold a grudge, but it should be said that it was God's arrangement that they were able to meet like this. He had a strong interest in what kind of person she herself was. He owed her a debt of gratitude for letting Waltzer live. The tragedy of the Arzulan River, hum, fufu, I've never forgotten that time. I thought that if possible, I would like to meet and talk with her. It may have been a fortune to have chosen the kingdom as our destination, Waltzer. Indeed. I should say that it was God's guidance, young master. With a slightly serious face, Killick timidly asked. Travel. But why are you two in the kingdom? We asked to take responsibility for the defeat. I was excommunicated from the Curia well, what you would call deprivation of peerage. Unable to remain in the empire, I wondered where to go, so I came here. To visit a grave. Visiting a grave? Yes, Aleha nodded and looked at the thunder and hawk crest on the carriage. Yes, a private grave visit. Minced meat and vegetables wrapped in cabbage leaves are thrown into a tomato-based soup. It was a simple combination of soup and bread for a lunch meal, but the aroma of herbs and the flavor of the meat and vegetables melting into the soup stimulated the stomach from the olfactory sense. It's delicious. Ahahi, Krish's glad the vegetables were finely chopped, and they melted properly even in a short amount of time. Fufu, Krish Sama, you can't test taste it anymore. It's time to eat. Ah, yes. The soup served on the plate was distributed to everyone. The soup was quite elaborate considering that it was completed in less than an hour from the start of the installation work. As usual from the familiar Black Flag Special Force, the others take it in amazement. After confirming that it had reached everyone, Chris J couldn't wait and said, Shall we eat then? She takes a sip of the soup and begins to eat it happily before anyone else. Aleha also followed suit and sipped the soup, nodded at the taste that didn't seem to be outdoors, and called out to Chris J. General Christ and, or what should I call you? Hmm. Whatever you call it, ah, but if it's the family name, it's hard to tell with Celine, so Chris J thinks Chris J would be better. Chris's even not sure if Chris J could be called General. Then, Chris Sana. About the reason we visited the kingdom earlier. Aleha cuts in with a serious face. What would former Holy Empire General Areha Sarchenka say? Everyone waited with bated breath, but Krish's reaction was quicker than anyone expected. Please wait, that's going to take a long time, and the soup is going to get cold, ah uh, no, later, after we've settled down. It's going to be very troublesome. Ahum, Chris J feels like it's a very important and serious topic, so Chris J thinks it probably shouldn't be done during meals. Aleha and those who were listening, stiffened at Krish's words, which were not roundabout at all. Chapter 132, On the Road. In the end, Aleha was only able to talk after dinner, which was not the case. Chris J muttered that the sky was a little suspicious, and told Aleha that she wanted to move quickly and arrive quickly at the planned location. Certainly, the sky looked like it had changed, and Aleha agreed. He watched Chris J happily tidying up with Berry. Then, as for during the trip, there was always the possibility that the one in a million chance may happen in the enclosed space of the carriage. Chris J did not want to welcome the two of them, but the thought of talking with them while walking in the cold outside was not an option for her. She put it off saying that we should talk until we arrived at the scheduled place. It's going to be windy today, and we need to finish our meal early. And just like that she put it off again. The reason was certainly clear. However, around here, both Aleha and Waltzer naturally understood that the girl wasn't interested in them at all. Even though they knew she felt it was bothersome, it was impossible for them not to talk to her about it. How they will be treated in the future was a very serious matter for them at least at the very least, it was necessary to have her to listen to their story. Considering the appropriateness, randomness, of the situation, it seemed to be a declaration of intention that there was no intention to do anything wrong, but clear words are always important. After finishing the meal, Chris J yawned and said let's rest early today, see you tomorrow try to postpone the story, Berry extended a helping hand, thinking that it was pitiful for the two of them. Kree Krish Sama, wouldn't it be better to talk about the future of the two of them for the time being? Finally, in the evening, a place for discussion is finally created. The fire glowed brightly in the tent, 
which was firmly roped to the trees and had a large ventilation opening. Sitting on top of Berry, who was sitting on a box right next to the bonfire, Chris J looked at them as she put her hand to the fire. Chris J and the others slept in relatively well-insulated carriages, so this tent was for others. It was planned to be used by everyone, including the coachman, and although it was made spacious, it would be cramped for fourteen people. With the exception of Killick, two others, and one of the injured people, who were on guard duty at night, they were asked to go outside for now. From the front, Mia's voice could be heard whispering to Kaliwa, who has taken up a position by the fire. For now, it's not like your suspicions have been cleared for the time being, but you too will not be restrained. Chris J and the others will keep the sword until we get confirmation, but we will take care of it and return it as soon as the suspicions are cleared up. Any questions? No, it's a natural procedure. Nodding as if satisfied with Aleha's answer, Chris J continued. Chris J and the others are just about to return to the royal's territory, so you will accompany Chris J and the others there. Chris J knows you have your own objectives for the trip, but the priority is to prove your innocence. Chris J understands the inconvenience, but in the meantime, you will not be allowed to go alone. You must understand that you will be supervised at all times. L that's all, said Chris J, looking up at Berry with satisfaction and trying to stand up. As if to say that this was the end of the conversation, Chris J was ready to go back to the carriage and go to bed. Berry smiled wryly as she was troubled, and held Chris J by the waist with both arms, preventing her from standing up. The other side seemed to want to talk about something, and as expected she would feel sorry for them if they were being put off again and again. She looked at Aleha, who was looking exasperated, bowed lightly to Berry and opened his mouth. I heard that Kristan's mansion is in Gargane, if you don't mind, I would like to offer flowers in front of the grave of the former General Christand. Chris J, who was embraced by Berry, looked at him strangely, pondered over his words and told him. Christan's grave is not Gargane, but the royal capital. Christand has moved from the north to the center. It would be best if the destination is the same. Shall Chris J show you around when we get there? Is that so? Well then, thank you. Chris J, seeing Aleha thanking her, looked up at Berry again with satisfaction. The conversation was over, and it was time for Chrissy to go to sleep. She made an appeal to Berry to go back to the carriage, but Berry, understanding her appeal, put a cookie in her mouth to stop her from moving. Although he was an enemy, General Christ and was a warrior I aspired to be and respected. Even though death on the battlefield is the fate of a warrior, I would like to express my deepest condolences. Mugu, mm, thank you. If it was possible, I would have liked to meet him once and talk to him directly, but, even if I regret it, it can't be helped. Chris J was on Berry's lap, listening to him as she was having trouble figuring out what to do. Aleha didn't care and continued. I crossed blades with General Christ and several times before I became general. Each time I was defeated, and out of frustration I repeatedly read battle records of General Christ and, learned from it, and developed countermeasures and tactics. Then I became a general and had my first confrontation with him I had the superior force, and when I think about the efforts I've made for that, I don't think we can lose, but even so, we were defeated. While looking at the girl with silver hair, she was a girl who was held on the lap of a servant, wearing a woolen cap and tightly wrapped around a scarf. Usually noble even military personnel are concerned about their appearance, but this girl didn't seem to be bothered at all and was warming her hands over the fire in a fluffy outfit. Sweet and childish. She showed not a shred of interest in her enemies, Aleha and the others. Her looks and her temperament, however, betrayed her ability that made her look like a genius. She was not an experienced soldier like Bogan, and her appearance was too far from the ideal of a soldier. What this girl had was only a remarkable talent to the point of being distorted, and Aleha felt that this was why he had failed so miserably. Even if he attacked her now, he would be cut down with a single swing. Even though she was sitting there, her sword was by her side, and she was not the slightest bit careless or careless. The reason I set out on this journey like this is to re-examine my conceited self. I have learned many things as a soldier from my men and from General Christand. That is why I thought that the kingdom was the right place for this journey, and here I am. He never felt that his talents were inferior to others. 
Despite his misgivings, he ultimately went ahead, overconfident in his own abilities and talent the cause of his defeat was probably his conceit. That was why Aleha lost when she had to lose. She was defeated by this little girl. It could be said that I was most fortunate to have met Krishsama along the way. First of all, thank you for saving Waltzer without taking her life. Aleha stood up, and so did Waltzer. The two bowed their heads deeply. Formerly though they were, it was rare for a noble to bow his head like this. Berry looked at it with a bit of surprise, and Chris J groaned you 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 looking troubled. The battle at that place was in a state where it could be said that it was over, and Chris J was only complying with the Holy Spirit covenant. Chris J may have treated him, but it was also Chris J who cut him down, and Selene was the one who decided to take him prisoner. If it's a thank you, Chris J feels like it's better to say it to Selene. Even so, there aren't many people who can help someone with whom they have crossed swords without hesitation. Waltzer was like a parent to me, so I am deeply grateful to Krishsama for saving his life. Aleha said that and raised his face. Perhaps it is God's arrangement that we meet in a place like this, to return the favor. I'm no longer bound by any ties I'll return the favor in some form or another. Hmm. Thank you. Since he said he's grateful, that's probably a personal problem. While thinking that something was strange with Chris J being thanked, she turned her gaze to Waltzer. The bearded old man's eyes squinted softly, and his gaze turned briefly to Berry, then to Chris J again. To return to the mansion, cook, and have a tea party when I asked Krishsama what you were fighting for, you said so. Then, following his master's lead, he spoke in a somewhat more polite tone. Yes. Since then, there has been a civil war, and there must have been some hardships. But now that wish seems to have come true, more than anything else I am glad Krishsama is happy. Her appearance on the battlefield. He had never seen a warrior like that. Even if the enemy he faced was the leader of the wolf pack, the famous Grandmeld, he was confident that he would be able to compete, that's just how much he had studied. No matter what kind of opponent comes out, he won't just lose without doing anything. Walster, who had made up his mind to do so, was pushed down by force. More than surprising, it was to the point that it was refreshing. When he asked why the girl would do such a thing, Waltzer was speechless at the answer he received. But the way she was looking at him now, it made sense. Her true nature must be here. Eh hey, yes. Chris J is very happy right now. Right, Berry. Chris J said and pressed her face against Berry's chest, and Berry gave a wry smile. And when Aleha saw Chris J yawning a little, he said, I'm sorry for keeping you associated with us. This is the end of the talk, putting it in one word, I just wanted to say thank you. Is that so? Hmm. Chris J got off of Berry and stretched, while holding Berry's hand as if to tug on it. After pondering for a moment, she said, The kingdom has a lot of vacancies due to the civil war, and Alehasan is a former general, so if you need a job after visiting the grave, it might be good to work for the royal army. Selene is also complaining about the lack of people, so it might be a good way to return the favor. Um, what? Alehasan lost to Gatushu Sama, but Alehasan was able to put up a good fight against Gatushu Sama. Chris J thinks Alehasan is enough. Well, unless Alehasan and the others have plans. Then see you tomorrow, said Chris J as she hurriedly pulling Berry's hand out of the tent. The former general of the enemy country was at a loss at the very simple solicitation, and Killick and the others who were listening to it also froze. Three days passed. They stopped at Gargane, loaded up their belongings, and headed home. Mia was very happy after purchasing a sword at the Kors blacksmith shop. She was so happy that Kalua had to confiscate it before she went to bed after she smashed the sheath on her head of who was sleeping right next to her. Aleha and Waltzer finally began to know them well, and the trip went without any particular problems. It seems Adjutant Mia has some strange habits. Habit. Night a snowfield glistening in the bonfire and moonlight. Aleha, dressed in the same sandy colors as Waltzer, was taking part in a light sword training session and giving instruction. The lecture by Aleha, who had been trained in the fundamentals of swordsmanship from an early age, was easy for them to understand. You're swinging my sword with all your strength too much. It's like that your body was pulled away and so it lost its balance. After all, 
He was a former General Killick and the others told him that using a polite tone of voice would make him look more dignified, so he was now speaking as usual. And if there was a possibility of becoming a superior officer in the future, it is good to avoid confusion. Enemy General. Moreover, less than a year has passed since the last battle. Inviting such an opponent to join the kingdom's army was astonishing, but Krish's position was the kingdom's second-ranked military officer, and she had a close relationship with the queen, Kriskenta, and the marshal, Selene. They could easily imagine that if Krishje wanted to, Aleha would eventually be judged according to her wishes, even if he did not suddenly become a general. It's common when you're just starting out, the more you want your sword to be faster the more you will only swing with your arms, putting unnecessary force on your body. If the body and the sword move separately, the sword will slip. And a collapsed center of gravity will create a clear gap, inviting the opponent's sword. Aleha borrowed Mia's thick sword and showed a sample. He stepped in, swung, and thrusted. The series of movements was solid and had a flowing beauty. Killick, Mia, and the others were impressed, while Kalua looked at him with a slightly pursed lip and a glare. Kalua lost in a match the other day, after being pointed out that her sword was too rough, and she was now trying to somehow find a strategy against Aleha's swordsmanship. Kalua has a certain amount of confidence in her sword. Putting Krishche aside, losing to other opponents was extremely frustrating. On the battlefield, you use a more practical, rough sword. I understand that's what Adjutant Mia was taught, but it's also important to learn the basics. Putting a hand to his chin as if in thought, Aleha continued. Right, how should I say it? The basics are just the basics. I don't think there will be many opportunities to wield a sword according to the basics in actual combat. However, by repeating these basics and soaking them into your body, your body will gradually remade itself into something that can be used to wield a sword. Remade, is it? Yes. In any kind of swordsmanship, the basic stance is usually focused on keeping the body axis centered. So that the power of the sword you swing doesn't overwhelm your body, so that you can always swing the next swing with stability. Next, roughly with one hand. The sword swinging up and down and left and right while scattering snow particles as it steps in was almost impossible to see. The roar of the sword was so powerful and violent that it was hard to believe it was a sword, yet there was no stagnation, no pause. Maintain your own axis. If you let your body remember this, you will be able to unconsciously maintain your ideal balance no matter how tired you are. That's amazing. I see, the basics. That's right, Mia. Mia should practice about a thousand times a day. E e e. Chris Che, who finished washing the dishes, told Mia while trying to return to the carriage. Mia's hands and feet are disconnected, and Mia's sword cannot even bisect leather armor. Mia has to be more conscious of the ellipse and be able to use her whole body. She was wearing a brown woolen hat and wrapped the scarf tightly. The fluffy Alberinia, who only came out when she's cooking, put her hand on her waist and looked at Mia. At the very least, Krisht like everyone the Black Flag Special Force to be able to bisect sheet metal armor, with the adjutant, Mia like this what are you doing? While investigate tactics, Mia should also do it seriously. Even new, I'm still working hard on various things, but Mia should work ten times as hard as she does now. You you you. Mia looked at Kalua, Killick, and the others as if asking for help, but everyone had a blank look on their faces. Even though they were magic possessors that were several times stronger than normal humans, only Kalua and Killick could say that they could cut through sheet metal armor even if. It is stationary. There are only a few that can be counted in the entire Black Flag Special Force that could do it. Berry looked at Mia with a little pity, but for a soldier, training was directly linked to life. Unable to interject, she watched the situation with a vague, troubled smile on her face. Aleha opened his mouth. I heard that Cliché Sama's swordsmanship is unique, but I'm interested. If you don't mind, can I ask you for a light match? A match? Yes, a light exercise after meals. Chris Che looked at her feet. It was snowing. Chilly and cold. Cold. Snow on her clothes. Another time. Usachan. Take vengeance for your cute apprentice. I want you to show them Yuzaja-chan's self-taught swordsmanship. Kalua hugged her from the side while she was about to say it. 
Chris J looked at Kaliwa with a sideways glare. Chris J doesn't remember making Kaliwa Krish's apprentice. Besides, it's true that Kaliwa's sword is unskillful and rough, even if it's not here. Yuzaja chan I think there will be battles in bad conditions like this in the snow. Isn't it very fruitful for Yuzaja chan the leader, to show an example directly? Look, Mia also wants to see how to move on the snow. You you you, this time the cliché groaned. Mia glared at Kaliwa. I didn't say that. Mia doesn't want to see it. A bit. Kaliwa looked at Kilik and the others and asked for their consent with her eyes. She gripped Krish's weak point the ability to manipulate the air at will and sophism. And Chris J was basically a girl who couldn't say no. With a pout of her lips, she stepped forward and said just one time, okay. Chapter 133, Boundless Sky. A moonlit snowfield. Confronting each other was a young man with brown hair, Aleha Sarchenka, a general who once obtained the title of Holy Knight at a young age, and a petite silver-haired girl who was no taller than his chest. She was the kingdom's strongest Albarinia, Chris J. Christand. The two redded themselves and faced each other not. Mm. Aleha was perplexed by the girl who held her curved sword in her right hand and continued to stomp the snow beneath her feet. She really didn't want to get snow in her boots. The girl was absorbed in her work without paying any attention to Aleha. Any time is fine, you know? Even if you say so, how do I say it? It's hard to do anything about it. When Aleha called out to her, Chris J tilted her head curiously and continued her work. Chris J doesn't particularly have any stand, so any time is fine. Chris J wants to get back to the carriage as soon as possible. She bit off a small yawn and didn't even have a shred of motivation. She was dealing with Aleha as if she was dealing with a child. In fact, that's probably what she was thinking. Excessive attitude, as expected of the mild-mannered Aleha, felt a slight irritation. He had a certain amount of pride in his sword, which he has trained since childhood. He knew that this girl had easily slain the elite led by Waltzer, but she was too careless. Then, without reservation, his sharp eyes narrowed and he readied his sword. His left stance with his left foot forward, and both hands above the head. Dijodan, overhead swing stance, the one usually seen on anime, kendo stance. He was of medium build and height, and could be said to be average height for a man, but his slender arms and legs were long, and when he stood up like that, he was accompanied by a certain intimidating feeling. The distance separating the two was 3 ken, 5.5 m. The distance of one swing. Her brown gold hair and sand colored cloak swayed in the wind and powdery snowflakes danced in the air. At that moment, Aleha stepped forward. He creates a white storm, ignoring the snow up to his knees. The complete opposite of his usual calm demeanor, a step towards liberating his violent fighting spirit. Without even a blink of an eye, he was in front of Chris J, swinging his blade down. Step in and swing down from overhead. The Dijodan was an easy-to-read stance, but by eliminating the upswing action, the thing that could be obtained was a tremendous sword speed. Speed and weight, one wouldn't even be able to receive a single stroke that has received the benefits of both. A normal opponent would be cut in half without even being able to react. However, Aleha was convinced that this girl would surely dodge it. Therefore, this was not a swing to bring her down. A follow-up attack with an upward slash that was what Aleha was aiming for. With this two-stage attack, Aleha had cut down many fierce fighters. A scream-like voice rose from those who were watching, but, at that moment, Aleha saw Krish's back spinning around. Why before he could think further, the feel of the sword disappeared from his hand. A dull metallic sound echoed, and what he saw was the right heel of her boot. It was a backward roundhouse kick that was twisted from her hips. She kicked away Aleha's fastest sword with her heel from the side. Geez, the snow has gotten inside now. Before he knew it, she had switched to her left hand and had the curved sword crawling down Aleha's neck. T the sword I just bought is. Yes, yes, sit down. Mia's screamed voice echoed, but it did not reach Aleha's ears. Chris J flaps her cloak, removes snow from scarves and hat, and looks at Aleha. There was no surprise in her violet eyes but rather, they had an emotionless, cold gleam in them. It's fairly fast, but that it's too easy to read is the problem. 
Alehasana may have intended to decide with a subsequent slash or sweep, but Alehasana should consider the possibility of being matched from the side. Even if it's not with their feet like Chris Che like Chris Che some peoples. Hum, sometimes there are people like that. Aleha was stunned by surprise, but soon recovered from his loss. I see. You seem to be out of my imagination. That's right. You lose because you can't imagine your opponent's ability. Chris J said as if it was a matter of course and adjusted her hat. It's not that she moved terribly fast. Rather, it appeared relaxed and minimal. She saw through Aleha's sword and just matched it. Accuracy of movement and insight. She is so far above the rest that she could easily match her heels with the sword as it was being swung. For a small opponent like Chris J, it would be better to swing the sword more finely at the very edge of the range. Like hooking the tip of the sword. You're too forward, rushing the match too much. What if I stepped in even further? With the momentum of hitting your body. Hmm, then it's like this. Passing through the left side of Aleha. The blade was perfectly aligned with his neck. From the left stance in front of the left foot, the sword swings inevitably from the upper right to the lower left, so before that, pass through the left side and take the neck. If you switch legs, do the opposite. If you step in that much, you won't be able to kill the acceleration and you won't be able to stop it. Chris Che puts her finger to her lips and thinks for a moment. Even though they possess magical powers with excellent athletic ability, they cannot defy the laws of physics and the human body structure, including joints. If you determine the opponent's maximum speed, maximum acceleration, and the width of the blade range, you will inevitably find an answer as to what to do. It's all calculated, Chris J continued. The sword swing was pretty good, so Alehasan might want to use your head a little more in that area. You don't have to be decisive, but rather calculate and execute the best move on the spot. That is the most important thing after learning how to swing a sword. The words he spoke were simple and clear, but that was the ideal of the sword a mindset that could be called a secret technique. Determine everything in a moment's time and take the lead. It was easy to understand in words, but difficult to implement. But she was precisely in that state. Can I ask you one more time? Hey. Chris J looked at the carriage and blatantly showed she wanted to return, but Aleha picked up the sword regardless. Feeling an overwhelming difference in power, it was the first time except for when he was a child. It wasn't that I was mad, but something inside him just boiled over. Please. He raised his sword and fixed his eyes on the girl. Oh dear, a complete defeat, Waltzer. To think she was that strong. Inside the tent, Aleha announced with a fresh smile on his face. After that, they had seven matches in a row, and personally he wanted to continue, but Chris J seemed to want to return to the carriage as soon as possible, so he had no choice but to give up. Still, one could say it was a rewarding time for him. Compared to when I saw it before, it looked like her movements were even more polished. If that battle had happened a little later, I wouldn't have been able to get by with just my arms either. Walster laughed gleefully and slapped his severed left arm. Aleha nodded saying it was a fortune and Killick, who had been listening to the story, said. But still, it was a really brilliant swordsmanship, if it were not Krishsama, there would be no one who could match Aleha Dono. I'm proud of myself, but there are still many warriors in the kingdom. I once had a fight with Kolki Zagrand, but, against such a splendid warrior, I still have much to go. With a grand corps commander. Aleha nodded. Back when he was also leading a single corp, Aleha launched a surprise attack on Bogan's left flank and pierced his flank. He cut his way through the mighty ranks of the second corp, where he met with Kolkis. It was a battle that could be said to have been evenly contested as it was not clear which side would fall, but if they kept fighting like that, Aleha would probably have lost. Not to mention his military drill, he also can freely swing his full-body steel war spear. On the battlefield, he is like a giant. I was unable to approach the main camp, and the main camp on my side was destroyed by the Nozen Vereich, the first corps, so I withdrew. He casted his eyes down as he thought back. I have not achieved my purpose, they have achieved their purpose. Considering that it was a surprise attack, it must have been a complete defeat for me. If the timing was just a little bit different, we would have been cut off from retreat and killed. It's nostalgic, 
It's rare that a young master would drown in alcohol. Cuckoo. It was a close call. Putting my own incompetence on display and showing an ugly appearance. Rather than spectacular victories in various places, what comes to mind was the battle with Christ and. He could remember every battle as if it had happened only a few days ago. The thunder and the hawk is the strongest in the kingdom. The unrivaled army led by the hero Christ and. To me, they were a hateful opponent who had humiliated me countless times, and a goal to overcome, at the same time, they were also my admiration. With the loss of General Christ and, I felt like I had lost my way, but. Long silver hair, jewel-like purple eyes, a petite and lovely, a fairer-like girl was drawn in his mind. But I'm honestly elated to know that's not the case. Christan's Alberinia will make the thunder and falcon crests shine even brighter. Just as the height of the sky is unknown, I cannot measure it with my ruler. He clenched his fists in glee. He then looked at Mia, who was eagerly looking at the sword to see if there were any scratches on it. I'm sorry about the sword you lent me. Enno, it's okay. Mia jumped up and answered. Kalua looked at Mia sideways, exasperated. Sword is a consumable item, she sighed as she wondered what to do with minor wounds. But it looks like you've got a good sword. The center of gravity is in your hand, and the thickness is thick enough to swing lightly. Even with your physique, it's easy to use. Right. It's a good sword, isn't it? Why yeah. He smiled wryly while pulling back at Mia who bit the topic eagerly. It's about when I was a child, but I understand how you feel. The first sword you hold in your hand looks like a jewel. You can rest assured, it had been sent flying so spectacularly, but even like that she held back. Is that so? Ah, though you could also say that there was that much of a gap between me and Krishsama in terms of ability. Aleha laughed happily, and Kalua, who saw that, pricked her lips, looking bored. Even though you lost that badly to Yuzaja-chan, you don't seem to be vexed hum. Of course I'm vexed. But more than that I'm glad to see that there's still a long way to go. He returned Kalua's sarcasm with a refreshing smile and looked at his own hand. I've been wielding a sword and learning tactics for thirty years since I was able to hold a sword. I thought I had put in as much effort as I could, and I had a certain amount of pride in what I had built up. Someday I think I will be able to reach a higher place than anyone else. Blessed with talent. He worked hard and gained a lot of experience. So he thought he would eventually make it. But the sky is more boundless than I imagined, and I may never reach the moon or the stars, even if I bet my whole life on it. She taught me that I still have to work hard and that I can go even higher. I guess it should be something to be happy about. Ha, huh, what a strange person. Oh no, what a great hard worker. Mia hurriedly apologized, and Aleha smiled wryly. Kalua also looked at Aleha in amazement and put her hands behind her and bent back. Thirty years hum. It looks like there's still a long way to go. You look young, how old are you? Twenty, three or four. I see, but for your age, you're pretty good at it. I'm sure that if you work hard and don't cut corners, you will be able to reach even greater heights. Cuckoo, laughing, Kalua looked outside over the tent, towards the carriage. Even so, Yuzaja-chan. It seems that she is quite fond of her. Well, she's a bit strange, but he's a good child and as a commander, there's nothing she lacked. The ideal superior, some people are scared of her, but she's a very kind child you know. As you can see, Kalua continued, Aleha nodded. She certainly doesn't look like a soldier. A kind child, hum? Aleha smiled and turned his face to Waltzer. It probably won't go smoothly, but my heart is made up. If she seeks my power, I will pick up the sword for the kingdom. You don't mind right, Waltzer? Of course, young master, the purpose of the trip is there after all. I can't go to the front line anymore, but please let me assist you even if it's just a little. Oh, I'm counting on you. You're worth a thousand soldiers even with just one arm. Aleha laughed and said that, looked at his palm, and grasped it. Putting something that he obtained earlier than he imagined along with various emotions. Chapter 134 Pandemonium The White City Albanaria the royal capital. A meeting was being held in the audience chamber of the royal castle. I'm afraid it's too tyrannical, your majesty. 
A series of pillars support the ceiling that one must look up to see. The red carpet reminiscent of blood was trimmed in gold. The nobles lined up on the left and right were all well known and prominent in the kingdom, and at the far end of the center on a throne at the top of a small staircase sat a petite girl with an upright posture. Her golden hair dyed red by the sunlight shining in, her intelligent purple eyes. Dressed in a white dress, her figure was absolutely beautiful. Queen Crescenta tilted her head at the words of her vassal, the Duke of Arcasacos, and gave her a troubled look. However, we need everyone's cooperation to rebuild the kingdom's finances that Ojisama had wasted. From the point of view of the kingdom's national defense, armaments reorganization is an urgent matter. You understand that, right? But that doesn't mean we should lower our quotas. Among the nobles, there are those who are entrusted with some areas as administrative territories. Nonetheless, it's just management all the land is officially owned by the king, and the tax revenue obtained there was also the king's. Quotations were part of the tax revenue given to nobles who had territories under their management. Crescenta was trying to fix the country's finances by lowering that, but of course the nobles will not unanimously agree to this. The lanky old man with a long beard the words of the Duke of Arcasacos were predictable. Her Majesty the Queen is putting effort into new endeavors in various places, including the establishment of military academies, but, when looking at finances, I think that is the first point that needs to be reconsidered. If our quotas were lowered on the spur of the moment, we wouldn't be able to make ends meet. Thankfully, the military academy receives donations from many nobles, so it seems like the kingdom doesn't have any financial expenditures. As for the citizen elementary school, it is basically only the system that had been created. Expenditures are trivial subsidies, they are insignificant. Citizen elementary school a system that could not even be called a school built in the city. Most towns have some sort of facility, such as a conference hall owned by the country. These facilities, which were only used once a month or so, were provided as educational facilities, and teachers recruited from the general public were asked to teach writing and arithmetic. It was not obligatory, and was only encouraged. The teachers would be paid enough to keep them fed, and the children would be offered a loaf of bread if they came to the classes, which would help the people reduce their food expenses. It was thought that a certain number of children would be attracted to the school. Those with administrative territory would be ordered to implement the system and pay for it out of their own pockets. It would be an act of charity for children who had never had the opportunity to learn, and no one could refuse it outright if they were told that it was intended to increase national power in the future. The establishment of a school would have an impact on the country's finances, but the expense would be minimal. Donations will probably be collected for this as well, and as long as they put a little money as initial investment, the school will develop on its own. Once it takes shape to a certain degree, a school can be built. In this way, the intellectual level of the people will be raised, and eventually, the incompetent nobles would be replaced with new ones by means of examinations. This was a plan that would take several decades to complete. Crescenta glanced at one of the nobles with no intention of making a complaint. Ah, Duke Arcasacos, your words are too much for Her Majesty the Queen. You. I am sure we are all satisfied with what has been done. I think that the reduction of our quota is unavoidable, as Her Majesty the Queen has said. Our relations with the three neighboring countries are still not secure, aren't we supposed to put the kingdom first? The young Margrave who raised his voice was pale and had cold sweat on his face. He glared at Arkasakos as if he were about to shoot him, but he never looked in his direction. And along with his words, several others agreed with him. Everyone that spoke had a relationship with Arkasakos, and the old man's face was dyed red. He clenched his fists so tight they turned white as he said, you betrayed me. Crescenta laughed inside her heart. The secret ledger of Rolando Saver, a major merchant who was dealt with by her sister. The legacy he left behind in the center of the kingdom central was quite useful. The names of many of the kingdom's leading nobles were recorded there. From the slave trade to the trade in stolen goods, including illegal drugs the secret ledger was the most useful evidence to undermine the power of the Arcasacos faction that rebelled against Crescenta. I, too, have made a difficult decision. Of course, if the country is revived, I promise to return it to its original state. Ten years at most, for that long, would you please cooperate with me? 
It seems I'm the only one complaining that he can't accept it. Please forgive me, your majesty the queen. Trembling, Akasakos bows his head. Crescenta looked at him with a smile. No, I'm the one who's being unreasonable. Please raise your head. Yes, your majesty. Crescenta looked at his anguished face with a queen's face. I swear that in time I will repay your loyalty with what it deserves. Even if it's painful right now, please accept that. Though when that time comes your face won't be here. Continuing in her heart with a sneer, Crescenta turned her attention to the future. The place was a mansion built in a prime location in the royal city, in its office. The furnishings on the shelves and walls were of the highest quality, as were the chairs and desks. Damn, that cursed child. Each and every one of them being ensnared by that damned cursed child. On that desk. Slamming his favorite sake cup on the desk, the old man with a long beard Arkasakos raged. Shards flew off and the servants screamed, but Arkasakos ignored them. Calm down father, don't lose your composure. Calm down, is this a situation where you can be calm? The old man's voice was a shriek, his wrinkled vocal cords trembling and his voice almost turned inside out. The old man barked at the servants, with veins appearing on his forehead, alcohol, no matter how you look at it, that cursed child is trying to kick me out of my position. If that happens, you will have the same fate, Foray. Of course I understand. I have made some plans as well. Foray Arkasakos, a thin man who looked to be in his prime, sat on the center sofa, sighing, his brow furrowed at his father's disgraceful behavior. The old man also violently sat down on the opposite sofa as if he was venting out his anger, and fanned the alcohol cup brought by the servant. It seems that Roland Saver's secret ledger is in Her Majesty's hands. Roland the pig merchant. Yes, it seems that the Christ and cursed child got rid of him in the chaos of the Civil War. It's probably a decision that took into account post-war politics. She is surprisingly intelligent for someone who seems to be all about war. So it's all because of those cursed child hum, damn it. He cursed and pointed the empty cup at the servant. The young servant trembled as if he was frightened, but slowly poured the sake. Foray told the servant me too, and the servant panicked. He was young, but he was a member of a branch of the family, it doesn't matter if he listened to them. I see, however, if you think of the face of the traitors, it is not hard to understand. This is what happens when even though you're a noble, you associate with pigs, those scum. However, we are in a bit of a quagmire. We have to start building relationships from scratch again. Arkasakos snorted at Foray's words. Oi, that's enough. Put down the alcohol and go outside. Arkasakos drove the servant out. Foray frowned and looked at his father. Too naive Foray, if we fall behind, we're already stuck. If we are passive, we will be at the mercy of that cursed child. But there's no other way to do it. Any clever plan? Ha, such a clever plan. It's simple. Arkasakos spread out his hands. He turned around and smiled cheerfully. Less than half a year has passed since the Civil War, and the kingdom is in the midst of turmoil. The remnants of the younger brother's faction, the turbulent castle anything can happen, don't you agree? No way. From the beginning, the royal family has a bloody history. In ten years, no one will care. Arkasakos said as if it were a matter of course and sipped his wine. The previous king was also a worthless man, but in this case Gildenstein would have been better. It was all well and good until he took down Christ and, but, humph, making us waste our time. Foray nodded with a sigh while looking at the old man who was speaking in disgust. Okay, let's move like that. Oh, but, don't aim for the throne, it's too blatant. Don't be greedy. That's how the house of Arkasakos continues to this day. I know. When? Up to you. But within these six months, Arkasakos orders Foray to go, and he leaves the room. Arkasakos, who was left alone, folded his arms and told him to spit out his word. Damned cursed child. I'll make you regret underestimating me. While imagining that doll-like beauty. Wani-sama, if you're back, why didn't you come to me fur? Her reddish-gold hair was shaking and she was chagrined. The queen, as if expressing that, returned to the estate and immediately went to the living room where she could hear voices, leaving and behind, 
and threw open the door in front of her. Crescenta, you're a nuisance. You're being rude. She stiffened on the spot. There was a beautiful young man with brownish-gold hair and an old man with one arm, both of whom were unfamiliar to her. Celine was holding her hand to her head as if she had a headache, Chris J was glaring at her younger sister's misbehavior, and Berry was smiling with a troubled look on her face. No matter how she looked at it, they were dealing with guests. Crescenta's cheeks were flushed when she saw it, and Anne, who was chasing the fast-paced queen while holding her package in her hands, was Crescenta Sama, called her from behind. Crescenta slammed the door shut and quietly closed her eyes. After catching her breath several times, she stared at Anne as if to tell her to open the door. A, hey, uh, hum. While Anne wondered why she closed her door, she opened the door quite normally and urged Crescenta. Queen Crescenta smiled elegantly. Oh, there was a visitor. Excuse me. Then she entered the room as if nothing had happened. The elegance in the air, the grace in her steps and smile, as if she were the queen herself. The two men are taken aback and look at each other in bewilderment. Wanisama, can you introduce them to me? Aleha san and Waltza san. Chris J met them by chance on the way home and brought them back. Anyway, who are you trying to deceive? What would you do if the door got damaged Mugu? K Krish sama, for now, let's leave it there. Berry looked at Kriskenta, who was desperately trying to keep up her appearance, and stopped Krish's mouth. The two were puzzled, and she whispered to them of her position as the queen. Immediately, the two stood up in a panic, put their hands on their chests and saluted. It's an honor, your majesty. I am Aleha, this person is Waltzer, and we do not have a family name. During our journey, we met Chris J, and due to fate I was invited to this estate. Due to fate? Is that so? Please enjoy your stay. Ha, huh, thank you for your kind words. However, the sun has already set, and I'm afraid we will only be bothering you. We will take our leave now. Crescenta tilted her head to look at Celine. Celine nodded as if tired. I am done talking with the two of you. I have to ask Her Majesty the Queen about something, so I will ask you two to leave now for today. I will send someone out later, and when you have found a place to stay, please inform me of your whereabouts. Understood. Just give Kristan's name at the inn. Wait a minute. Celine took a piece of parchment from the shelf, wrote in it in a neat stroke, and handed. That was enough. No one in the royal capital would have the guts to pretend to be a marshal of the kingdom just for the cost of lodging. Thank you very much. Now, if you'll excuse me, yes. And, sorry, but please see them off. Why yes, come, come this way. The two bowed deeply before leaving the room and left. Celine let out a deep sigh that echoed throughout the room. Really? I want to see what's stuck in your head. It's the brain. That's not what I mean. You, you, you. Celine stood up and pinched Chris's cheeks and stretched them. Crescenta asked curiously, What's wrong with those two? Before the Civil War, there was a war with the Holy Empire, right? N.N., there was. Aleha Sarchenka, the general who fought against the Christ and Army at that time, and Waltzer Grislandi, the assistant to the general, they are people that this child brought along. Ha! Crescenta stiffened for the second time today. She looked at her older sister as if she was doubting her sanity. No way, even Wanisama wouldn't do such a thing. It's that no way. I wonder what kind of nerves she has to be able to do such a thing. Gumu, if it doesn't work, then Chris J is fine with it. Chris J, who seemed to be being blamed for something, looked at Celine dissatisfied. Chris J heard that they want to repay Celine, so Chris J only brought them here, and if it doesn't work, Chris J thinks we should just say goodbye. Celine sighs at Chris J who told her that while pouting her lips while going humph, humph. That's not how it is. If they asked for a way to return the favor, refusing it would be dishonorable. Hmm. Then what should we do? Well, it can't be helped, what's done is done. The Empire will attack us no matter what the reason is. NN, that's true. Either way, the result will be the same. Crescenta snuggled up to Chris J and sat on the couch holding her arm. With that, a cup of tea was placed in front of her, mixed with plenty of milk and honey. She continued, looking unhappy at Berry's usual appearance. Aleha Sarchenka. 
I heard that he was an excellent general who received the title of Holy Knight at a young age. General Kalmida in the East was easily killed. It doesn't seem that bad if you look at it in terms of strength. That's right, it was the opponent that even father was careful with, it's better than having such a person taken by another country. Above all, the empire's strength lies in its nomadic cavalry. Skilled light cavalry who could easily handle bows on horseback furthermore, the enemy had an advantage in numbers, and the commander was Aleha Sarchenka, who easily defeated the eastern general Kalmida. The fact that even the kingdom's strongest army, the Christand, chose a cautious plan and avoided settling the battle in the field because of his superiority. If it wasn't for Chris J, Christand would have been stuck there. If there's a problem then it's the internal I guess. It's not a very good time to attack at that kind of place, and it's a bit troublesome. Time. Kriskenta nodded to Celine and sipped her tea, and rubbed her cheek against Chris J. Thanks to the ledger Wanisama gave, things have become quite stable, but the problem is Duke Akasako's. They're unexpectedly troublesome not showing a single gap. If Wanisama can help me, there's a very easy solution. Chris's help, is it? Chris J tilted her head and Kriskenta smiled. I want Wanisama to get rid of the Duke of Akasako's. He's really a nuisance. She said with the face of a lovely girl. Chapter 135 The Royal Capital's Black Wing Pale in the moonlight. The royal capital of Albanaria the white city was filled with silence, even the cold air was hard. A red-roofed mansion in the first-class city within the city walls. There was a large mansion of the Duke of Akasako's, which was 150 shaku high, 45 m, a shadow overlooking it from the great bell tower. Wrapped in a black cloak, peeking out from the hood were silver hair and white beauty, and the jewel-like purple eyes. It's cold. Burying her nose into the black scarf, Chris J glanced at the structure of the mansion below her. A U-shaped two-story building. Akasako's bedroom is said to be in the west room, opposite to the east where Chris J was. There was an orchard in the front yard, but there was no other place to hide. It was probably purposely made to have a good field of vision. There were about ten armed guards with torches in pairs. Despite the cold weather, several windows were open and human figures could be seen. They were probably monitoring the surrounding area. The level of vigilance was unusual for a first-class city with a high level of security. Maybe they are aware of the fact that they were being resented, or maybe it was their personalities. Either way, it didn't matter. Let's finish it quickly. One yawn. She threw herself out of the big bell tower and kicked the wall vigorously at about the halfway mark of the great bell tower. Converting the acceleration of the fall to the horizontal direction, she grabbed the hem of her overcoat with both hands and glided in the wind jumped onto the mansion's red roof and rolled over. After breaking in unnoticed, she walked across the roof to the west. This was the tallest mansion in the area and had a large garden. Even those with magical powers could not jump here from the roofs of other houses, so no one cared about the sky, and no one seemed to think that anyone would jump from the bell tower. Looking at the men who were wary of the surroundings with a serious face without even chatting, she gave a harsh evaluation that although they were excellent guards, they lacked imagination. Perhaps the Black Flag Special Forces should be given more advanced training that requires more imagination. With the grueling training schedule in her head, she landed on the balcony where the bedroom was. There were also four men here who were vigilant outside the iron fence, looking down at the back of the heads of the men who were walking around seriously about their job, thinking there was no problem. She looked at the door from the inside. It was a whitewashed double door with a bar lock on the inside. It seems to be of high quality and there are no gaps, normally there was no way to open it, and she put her hand on it. By manipulating the metal fittings with magic to remove the lock, she slid inside as if nothing happened and pulled out the knife. There was an old man sleeping quietly the figure of the Duke of Akasakos. Kreskenta told Chris J while tightly embracing her arm. If we leave him alone, he will eventually try to kill me. It's safer and more convenient to get rid of him before that. I thought it would be easy for Wanisama you you you. You idiot. Please don't ask Chris J to do that kind of thing. Celine sighed again and pinched the happy Kreskenta's cheek. What are you doing? Kreskenta shook off her hand and glared at Celine. Why are you and Chris J so short-sighted? 
I thought about it properly, you know. How rude. She inflated her cheeks. Crescenta told Celine as she sat on Krish's lap. There's no absolute defense against assassination. It's good that Wanisama and Argan cooked for us. But what if the ingredients that come here were mixed with poison? Well water, cosmetics. What if something was planted in the finished dress? Crescenta pulled Krish's hands and held her waist while she held up her fingers. Selene Sama, who grew up in the military, may not understand, but if there's anxiety left in the royal palace, you will have to be suspicious of such trivial things. I think it would be fine if I could be dismissed by political means, but it seems like it will take time and is troublesome. It's quicker this way. Crescenta turned around on her knees and hugged Chris J, saying, it would be quicker to kill him. Chris J stroked her head and thought, did he do something bad? He'll do it from now on. He's hiding it on the surface, but I'm sure there's a lot of bad things. Otherwise, he won't stay in the center of the royal palace that was so chaotic. Crescenta raised her finger. If it's a battle, you'll kill the enemy standing in front of you, right? It's the same thing even if you don't point your swords at each other. There's no point in putting it off. If there is a problem, shouldn't it be taken care of before it grows? But, Crescenta, Chris J doesn't think assassination is a good way to go. If your opponent is following the rules on the surface, you should also follow the rules on the surface, right? Wanisama can do it without being noticed. There's no problem, right? The dead don't talk, Krishenta said naturally, putting her hand on Krish's cheek. I do my best for Wanisama. Wanisama too do her best for me. Only then will the birdcage be perfect. Wanisama should understand that even the slightest crack will threaten it. It's Crescenta's bad habit to try to kill people right away. I'm sure I didn't kill even one hundredth of Wanisama's, you know? Mew, Chris J pulled her little sister's cheek while looking at Berry. Berry was making a fresh pot of tea, seemingly unconcerned. Berry had decided to just trust Chris J, so she didn't say anything. She neither advised her nor encouraged her. Tea. Chris J, who knew that, thought and said, If you do bad things, you can easily solve various problems. But Chris J wants to try to do good things rather than bad things as much as possible. Chris J thinks, Chris J wants Crescenta to be like that too. Being fixated by that, what is Wanisama going to do when it becomes too late? Certainly, it worries Chris J too. So, a compromise. The point is, making him think to not do bad things right? Celine, who was silently listening to the story, what are you going to do? Tilted her head. Simply tell them that you can kill them at any time. If that's all Chris J has to do, Chris J will go. It's very cold today. Chris J pouted her lips and looked displeased, but said it can't be helped. Chris Genta happily rubbed against Chris's cheek and smiled happily. You foo-foo, I thought you would say that to me. Ah, where was it? As if trying to remember, Crescenta looked towards the door. She beckoned Anne, who had just returned, to bring some kind of package. While everyone looked puzzled, what came out of the package was parchment and a knife that had been rolled up and tied with a string. It was getting more and more puzzling, and Chris J asked. What is that? A little letter and a knife. I have already prepared it. Please put it by his pillow along with the knife. Cheerfully, Crescenta showed the knife. The knife is exquisitely crafted, and the crest of a rooster was engraved on the knife. The rooster was the coat of arms of the House of Arkasakos. A personal item with a family crest on it and when it comes to a knife this splendid, the ones that have it are limited. It probably belonged to someone close to the head of the Arkasakos family. Chris J did not know how she had obtained it, but it was not something that could be easily obtained. No matter how she thought about it, it must have been prepared in advance in anticipation of what would happen. It says I'm always watching from your side in a world where you don't know who's your enemy. The knife belongs to the son of the Duke of Arkasakos, and although it was a bit difficult to get hold of, if you leave it together, the relatives will make a fuss on their own. You're pretty well prepared. Crescenta smiled when Celine said that exasperated. Of course, the best thing is to get rid of him but I'm sure Selene Sama and Argan Sama will get in the way. So the next best thing is important. Mew. Yunya. Chris J pinched Crescenta's cheek with some dissatisfaction. It's sly, she said, 
as she pulled Crescenta's soft cheek with both hands. It makes Chris J, who had seriously thought of a compromise, look like a fool. Fuefunya, Ixfani if on fikama krilla hum yui k mui. Killing is on hold for now. Chris J has decided to be a good girl for now. Chris J let go of Crescenta's cheeks and kissed her on the mouth, looking into Crescenta's eyes. Chris J wants Crescenta to try to be a good girl too. If we can live with that, it might be a great thing, but we should do what we need to do before we become a good child. Argansama's head is a little flower garden. Please don't be affected by her too much. Glaring at Berry with moist eyes, the red-haired servant just chuckled. Well, if you say it's a flower garden, I can't deny it. Maybe it's as Crescentasama says. I don't like that relaxed feeling. I'm being sarcastic though Mugu. Crescenta is really a bad girl. First of all, we need to start with that bad mouth hum. What does it mean to have a flower garden in your head? Chris J, who had been pondering for a moment, clamped her hand over her sister's mouth and raised her eyebrows slightly. Crescenta turned over again, leaned her back on Chris J, and took her hand. It's a fact after all. Even if I overlook Wanisama sister to Argansama at this time, it's necessary to make efforts so that Argansama, whose head is a flower garden, can live safely and securely, right? Please wait until then to corrupt Argansama. Thinking that it was reasonable, Chris J thought a little. Chris Genta hugged Chris J again as if to say that she had a good idea. She was a queen who had been restless on Chris's knees since a few minutes ago. That's right. If I let Wanisama become my escort for a while, most of the problems will be solved. Argansama will take care of the small things in the mansion, and then I will be a good child. Chris J doesn't like it because it's troublesome. Chris J has a lot of things to do, and Chris J wants to cook with Berry. Ua, it's cruel, always Argansama, it's unfair. Chris Genta, who answered immediately, glared at Berry with sideways glances dissatisfied. Chris J stroked her head and said, for the time being, it can't be helped. Anyway, Chris will finish Chris Genta's request by today. Wouldn't it be a little easier then? Really? Chris J had just returned today, said as if to say that the journey had been difficult, but Chris J, who was snugly in the carriage and clinging to Berry, had no troubles along the way. Berry, who was listening to the conversation, laughed, and Chris Genta looked up at her sister as if she were troubled. I'll stay up and wait until Wanisama comes home. Please leave it to me. Chris J recalled the exchange. Chris J put the drawn knife and the letter by his bedside. She thought it might be a good idea to kill him, as Chris Genta said, but again, that's not good. Duke Akasako's was troublesome in other words, it took time and effort to oust him from the royal palace. It's not that he couldn't be handled. After worrying about it a little, Chris J leaves the place. Just as when she entered, she closed the balcony door and jumped onto the roof and looked around again. She looked at the back of the men's heads and nodded that there's no problem, yawned and shivered because of the cold. Then she lightly made a run-up, flew in the air, then she ran along the roof and lightly ran up the castle wall and headed to the estate. It did not take her long to finish the work and return. Krishsama must have been tired, um, well, Krishgentasama really did her best to wait for Krishsama but... Kriskenta was happily curled up in bed snugly asleep. Chris J, who had been battling drowsiness and working in the cold, silently pulled her cheek. The queen was fast asleep. The next morning, screams rang out in Akasako's bedroom, and the queen's excuses rang out in the royal estate. In the capital, a trivial rumor about the sighting of a large bat, a magical beast, dancing in the darkness of the night, was passed on as a funny story. Chapter 136 Loyalty. Aleha and Waltzer were temporarily assigned to work with Dagra and the others as Black Flag Special Force Training Instructors. If possible, they would like to use them as generals or corps commanders, but considering the trust of others and the reputation of the kingdom, they cannot use them openly for the time being. Selene and Crescenta agreed that it was best to avoid troubles in the current situation where meetings with each country are scheduled to coincide with the unveiling. The problem was the Kristan's core commander who crossed swords with him. It was necessary to talk to them about this, so they gathered at the Kristan's mansion for a face-to-face -face meeting but... Ha ha ha, it's the first time we've met like this, but I remember it well. Even though you're young, you're skilled, if I have the opportunity, 
I would like to cross blades with you again. Yes, by all means. I would also like to have the opportunity to rematch. The general also regarded you highly. I am sure he would be surprised to hear that Aleha Sarchenka is here like this. Laughing happily was a large man whose face was made of muscles Second Corps Commander Kolki Zagrand. Next to him, smiling wickedly, was Eluga Ferran, former Fourth Corps Commander and assistant to the Marshal. While smiling at Chris J, who sat next to him and continued to eat cookies endlessly, he turned his gaze to Celine, next to Aleha and Waltzer, who were facing him. General Vareich won't be particularly opposed to what Celine Sama and Krish Sama have decided. He's a refreshingly straightforward person in that area. Yes, I was a little relieved. I was wondering if you guys will be against it. Putting aside the surroundings, if those who had been with the Christand and her father's subordinate were against it, then she thought she would need to think it over again. Although Aleha has the potential to become an excellent general, if it becomes a source of discord, the problem that it would create would be greater. The problem was that Chris J didn't care too much about it. Even if she was killing each other, she would smile and say hello toward the other party when the battle was over. In a sense, it could be said to be a healthy and wholesome way of being, but it was much too healthy and wholesome for the people around her to keep up. Relieved to see the two reactions to it, Celine finally felt like a weight had been lifted off her shoulders. Leaving the talking to Celine with the aura of it was no concern of mine. Chris J, who had turned into a cookie cracker, finally opened her mouth. For the time being, both of you will be appointed as aides to the Black Flag Special Forces. Due to the increase in personnel, there will probably be a shortage of people who can command. Chris J is thinking of entrusting the Fourth Corps if there's a chance. That would be good. Command and operation skills, they have more than enough ability for it. The First Corps would be led by Keith, former commander of the 3rd Battalion, to whom Chris J had entrusted various things in the past. The Second Corps will be Kolkis, same as before. The Third Corps will be led by Begil, former commander of the 1st Battalion. Since in the first place Begil had that much ability, but the problem was the Fourth Corps, which needed to be reorganized. Assistant Marshal in some cases, Eluga, who travels around various places as Celine's hands and feet, also needed some war potential, and the former Fourth Corps officers and soldiers were reassigned together with him as they were. Since the Christ and Army led by Chris J would move to support the central government in various areas, there would be no major problem with the absence of one corps, but she wanted there to be four corps eventually. However, there was no one who was suitable for the job. The 4th Battalion commander, Varga, did not get along well with Chris J, and he was assigned as Keith's second-in-command to assist him. The 2nd Battalion commander, Fagrin, seems to like his position as battalion commander and was now under Begil's command. In addition, he apparently did not like the idea of being in the same position, as corps commander as his former superiors in the wolf pack, Begil and Gran Meld. The commander of the 5th Battalion, Gaines, was also excellent, but he declined because he was a hunter and had little tactical knowledge, so he refused to become the commander of the 4th Corps. They could have been chosen from the 3rd Army Corps led by Terius, but the most important people were transferred to Nozen in the east, and Felworth in the west, who urgently needed to recover their strength. There were many excellent officers, but when it came to entrusting a corps commander, the only ones left were those with poor track records. It was Aleha who appeared right at that moment. Originally, he was of general rank aside from the various circumstances, he was a person who she could give a stamp of approval in terms of ability, and as a corps commander, he was the most suitable. She had planned to use him as a general in the future, of course, but it takes years and a proven track record to be a general, and he had been an enemy general, so he needed to gain the trust of those around him. However, the situation was still very complicated, with the reorganization of the Fourth Corps not yet in sight, and the royal court was still in turmoil. For the time being, they would be working under Dagra as an assistant to Chris J and as a trainer for Mia and the other members of the Black Flag Special Force. It is quite a bold move to put a former general of an enemy country in the position of corps commander but... Eluga looked at Aleha and Waltzer. The two of them slightly adjusted their posture in the face of the cold and guileful gaze. Although he held the position of corps commander until the other day, his military career and success on the battlefield were glorious. 
The soldiers sometimes showed as much strong respect for such experience as those in high rank. Having fought as enemies many times, they know that Eluga Farron was a powerful person who was not lacking for his current position. That attitude was natural. He was not lying when he said that he had learned his tactics from Christand and respected Bogan as an opponent to be surpassed. I have always sensed that he had an extraordinary obsession with the tactics he used. Eluga recalled. Even if I see them like this, they have clear eyes, I feel that these two men are worthy of trust. Is that so? Eh eh eh. Chris J thought it would probably be okay, but if Skeleton says that, then Chris J can relax. Chris J looked up at Eluga with a smile, and he gave back a wicked smile and stroked her head. He was puzzled by the naming Skeleton, but when he realized that he seemed to have survived for the time being, Aleha bowed his head in relief and thanked him. If it's thanks then just say it to Krishsama. Just one thing. What is it? Krishsama is more talented than anyone else and is an excellent warrior. And she is also a kinder and purer person than anyone else. Will you pledge your loyalty here and now to never betray that trust, no matter what happens in the future? Eluga deepened his smile at Aleha, who looked a little surprised. I plan to live a long life for Krishsama, but I am also old. I want to be able to face my final days with peace of mind. As if convinced by those words, Aleha nodded with a serious face. He then stood up, walked over to Krish's side, kneeled down, and put his hand on his own chest. Without forgetting this favor, I will dedicate this sword for the rest of my own life as the sole warrior, I swear on this body, this name of Aleha. Ah! Chris Che looked at Eluga as if troubled. Eluga laughed and told her, I take thy oath to my heart, is the formula for such cases. Ha, I take thy oath to my heart. When Chris J said that, Aleha said thank you and looked up. It's a bit old-fashioned. It's good to remember it now, in case something like this happens. Hmm. <clears throat> there is a lot to it, hum. There's not much about it in the books, and Chris J is not very. Ah, you can sit down. Yes, Chris J said and then looked at Berry who was standing next to her with good posture, as if she remembered something. Berry tilted her head, her cheeks flushed slightly at the mention of the old etiquette, and held up a finger in front of her mouth. It's a secret, her mouth moved silently, and Cliché smiled somewhat happily. Céline stared at the secret exchange with a sulking tone, exasperated. The underground laboratory of the royal palace. The framework is complete, Krishsama. The Black Flag Special Force Craft Squad, led by wounded soldier Nugga, nodded at the workmanship of the completed doll and called out to Chris J. In front of Chris J, transparent glass and small bottles filled with powder and mysterious liquids were lined up, and looking or holding up the magic crystal, not much involved in making the doll. Chris J nodded and stood up when she was called out, and looked at the table in the center of the room the iron doll lying there. Elvina, who was by her side, also followed her master. It's something like an iron skeletal specimen with its body and head replaced with a birdcage. Unlike the previous version, which was chained together, it used spherical joints, and magic crystals were inserted inside the joints. Its limbs were roughly the same as those of the human body, but its legs were made thick in particular to withstand its weight, and two thick springs were attached to the Achilles tendon. Considering the weight of the body, it was thought that the greatest burden would be placed on the legs, and this was an attempt to relieve that burden. Its feet were about twice the size of a human and slightly crooked, and it was already wearing big wooden shoes. Its shape was quite awkward, it would distribute the load better. I scraped and adjusted the finer details, so there shouldn't be any problems. Is that so? Chris J will start. Chris J held up the necklace and let her magic power flow. The magic crystal on the pendant repeatedly blinked irregularly, and the magic crystal in the birdcage on the head the core also blinked in a slightly different way. The heart emitted light in a chain reaction, and the magic crystal emitted blue light as if it were connected to the limbs from there. Chris J told the nugger to stay back a little and continued. First, let's do some warm-up exercises. Chris's magic crystal flickered again, and the core reacted. With a jiggy sound, the iron doll raised itself up and stretched out on the spot, bending back at the waist. This was a common action for Serene. As soon as it got off the platform, it twisted its waist, bent its waist back and forth, left and right, 
and began to bend and stretch it repeated such stupid movements, but the appearance was far more eerie than funny. Elvina backed up slightly and hit herself behind Krish's back. The others watched in amazement. What a strange thing. What should be for this to be like this, I completely have no idea. The waves of magic power are sent to each other. Long wave emission and short wave emission just combine them to create a pattern and operate it. The mechanism is simple. Chris J made it flicker again on the pendant, the transmitter. That moment. Hum. Kia. As if suddenly baring his fangs, the iron doll swings down its sword at Chris J. But it stopped just before the sword hit her, and the iron doll froze. The human body itself isn't difficult when it comes to movement. Muscles either contract or relax, and it's not difficult to move, is it? All you have to do is tell a specific part whether to stretch or contract the imaginary muscle, and the timing and strength. Ha, huh, I kind of understand but also not at the same time. However, whether you can understand it or not is another thing. Thinking about how vast that pattern would be, the only one who could grasp it was this girl in front of him. Elvina, who was about to sit up, shook her head at Nugger's gaze while clutching Chris's shoulder. She, too, has little understanding of the pattern. When the transmitter flickered, the iron doll straightened its posture and saluted, making a Duran sound. The sound was made by the chains that had been extended to hold the spherical joints in place. Chris J thought for a moment and clapped her hands. Let's make it a Jaragasha. M. Krishsama, that's. Look, the chain is jingling, Jarajara, and the sound of walking is Shan Gashan. It's a very easy to understand name. Chris J nodded and looked at Elvina. Elvina was also at a loss as to what to call it, so it's just right, right? Why yeah? Jaragasha. Elvina was dumbfounded as she looked at the doll that was named dumbly with pity. Chris J, who seemed satisfied with her reaction, told Nugger. This is just the template model for the time being. From now on, it will be able to connect directly to the weapon without making the hand, so Chris J thinks it will be a little easier. We won't make the hands. The number of parts will increase, and it's too complicated, so it's likely to break as soon as it's put out on the battlefield. The weapons will also be larger than those that ordinary soldiers can use, and durability will also be a problem. Chris J had a different purpose this time, so Chris J made it. Nugger and the others tilted their heads, and Chris J pointed to Nugger's left wrist and to the feet of the seated work crew. Those were parts of the body that had been injured and lost on the battlefield. It's inconvenient to have no limbs, so if you don't have them, Chris J thought it would be good to make them fit your body. You guys can use magic, so if we adjust the size of Jaragasha's arms and legs and use wood or something else, you can use them as temporary arms and legs, right? It might be hard until you get used to it though, Chris J said as if it was nothing. Nugger and the others looked at each other, speechless. Chris J tilted her head and looked at Elvina. Elvina, who had heard about it beforehand, laughed and told her they were surprised. Going that far, for us? What such a thing? It's a private army that Chris J maintains at her own expense, so it's only natural to try to improve efficiency. It's troublesome that Chris J has to help with everything, even carrying luggage, and even if it's temporary, if you have hands and feet, you can work a little more, right? In the end, Chris would like to leave all this troublesome work to you guys. Otherwise, there's no point in hiring you guys, said Chris J, putting her hand on her waist. Nugger and the others looked at each other again and nodded to each other. They clicked their heels and saluted in unison, though their arms were on different sides. Some of them were so moved that their eyes welled up. Thank you. This debt, let us all dedicate our life to Krishsama. Acting like bald eagle. Krish'll kick you out when you become old and useless, so you don't have to devote your life to Chris J. Please work as hard as you can when you can. Yes, of course. Nevertheless, we will serve Krishsama with such feeling. The one-armed man supporting the one-legged man patted him on the head saying what are you crying about? However, the man's eyes were moist, and when it was pointed out, the sound of laughter resounded. Staring at such a spectacle, Elvina told Chris J. She whispered with a gentle smile. I am also proud to have been able to serve Krishsama. You're all weird people hum. Krishsama is the weirdest one you know. 
She let out a lovely smile and gently stroked her small head. Then there was a knock. Chris J, it's me. May I come in? Ah, Celine. Chris J approached the door and invited her inside. Four people appeared. The four of them were Marshal Celine Christand, Marshal Assistant Elie Gafferin, and the Queen of the Kingdom, Crescenta Alberin. Everyone stiffened at the sight of the faces who opened the door, and clicked their heels again in a panic and straightened their posture. Now now, come in your majesty. And then, a shadow danced out before anyone else. Everyone except Chris J and Elvina saluted at the house of Christans, who was now the greatest noble in the kingdom, servant, the buttocks of Ungitten. Chapter 137, Jarea Gashia. This is the weapon Chris J was making. In the underground laboratory of the royal palace Selene approached the iron doll with trepidation. The body was nearly 8 shaku, 2.4 m, tall. Its build was larger than the large Grand Meld and Kolkis, probably because of its body made of iron. Even in its skeletal state, it had an oddly intimidating appearance. When Chris J flashed the transmitter, the iron doll suddenly dropped to its knees before Serene's eyes. HG. Surprised Celine immediately jumped back. It was just a consideration to make it easier to see the hole, but Celine's hand was hanging on the sword on her left hip because of her surprise. Chris J looked at Celine, exasperated at that excessive reaction. What are you doing? S shut up, I was just a little surprised. Blushing embarrassedly, Celine approached the iron doll again. Aruga also looked more serious than usual, wrinkling his eyebrows and looking at each part of the iron doll. Somehow the presence of something evil emanating from him. The frightened and slowly hides behind Elvina's back and grabs her sleeve, and Elvina glanced at her unreliable senior with a troubled face. Although she knew that Eluga was probably not a bad person, Elvina was also afraid of him. So the orders is sent with that magic crystal. Is it a pattern of short and long emission? Crescenta, who seemed to have understood the principle immediately, snuggled up to her sister and entwined her arms. It was her pretext to approach her sister rather than her question. Once she understood the principles, even Crescenta could easily imagine the rest. The magic crystal memorized countless patterns, and the magic crystal on the head, which acted as the control tower, transmitted the information to each part according to those patterns then, as long as there was magic power through mutual communication, a certain action would be repeated until another order was given. She was impressed with her idea of using magic by sending out magic, but that was all. There was no surprise in her like in the others. It's Pika Pika, Glint Gliant. Mm. Pika, Glint, Pika, Glint, short and long wave, is how the orders are sent, so Chris J gave it a name that is easy to understand. Please call it Pika Pika, Glint Gliant, from now on. Rather, what surprised her was the naming sense. She knew that Chris's naming sense was devastating, but her sister's sense was literally equivalent to that of a little girl, kid. Crescenta's cheeks twitched. I is that so? Chris J named this iron doll Jaragasha. Fufun, it's a good name right? Her older sister who said that proudly. Crescenta's cheeks twitched and she looked at Serene, asking what should we do? Celine looked back to Crescenta as if saying do something about it, and Crescenta's brilliant mind went into a never-seen-before full-speed searching in her own database. And she clapped her hand. T that's a nice name. Jarea Gashia. Yes, it's a very nice name. Hmm, the pronunciation is a bit strange. It's Jaragas. The Iron of Victory. It's rugged, but also a very gallant name. Pretending that she couldn't hear her older sister's words, Crescenta looked at Celine. From the pronunciation, she applied it to random words in ancient language in her knowledge. Jarea is to defeat, superior, excellent. Gashia is one that is dull and shiny, or, mineral, crystal. They are often translated as victory and iron, respectively, which aren't a bad, even if not great name for this iron doll. Jora. Jarea Gashia, that's an unusually good name, Chris J, I'll give you a compliment for this one. Celine nodded to Crescenta, who had invented a name that sounded all right. She glanced at the craftsmen as if glaring at them. You guys think so too, don't. You. Why asm? I think it's a wonderful name. Jarea Gashia, what a gallant name. A farce that suddenly began. 
The soldiers felt that their lord's hope, to whom they had just pledged their allegiance, was being distorted, but they could not resist the flow. The men, as if it was already arranged beforehand, said to each other that Jerea Gashia was a good name. Chris J was hum, tilted her head and opened her mouth. Mm, it's not Jarea, it's Wanisama, rather than that it seems that the two of them want to know about this ability. Mm, hum, somehow, moo, blatant. It was a complete misdirection. As expected even Chris J started to doubt it, but Celine intervenes. That's true, rather than the name, I wonder what the purpose is. We have to think about various things such as cost, deployment, and production, so I'd like Chris J to explain that first. Can you do that for me? Celine approached Chris J to cheer her up and stroked his head. Eh hey, that's true. Chris J was shy and was easily deceived. Jaragasha is a weapon for short-term decisive battles aimed at breaking through enemy lines. The large wooden board by the wall was covered with a cloth, and Chris J drew a diagram on it with charcoal while standing on a box. The lines of battle facing each other are drawn, with the enemy army on top and her own army on the bottom. A battlefield with the same number of soldiers was depicted with symbols. Basically, it is placed in front of the battle line. It can be said that it is a weapon that specializes in disrupting and breaking through the enemy line of battle by having them charge ahead of the soldier's assault. It can't get hurt or die from arrows, that it can be handled roughly, is probably one of its advantage. It outperforms the armored cavalry in that regard, Chris J continued. As you can see, it's heavy, so it's not good with a loose foothold, but you can use heavy weapons for that, and even if you us it to rush in like woof woof, you can knock down the enemy's heavy infantry. A long spear is meaningless in front of this weight, and even in a battle with the same or inferior numbers of troops, it will be possible to defeat them head-on if you have a certain number of them. The model for Jaragasha was Gran Meld. Wielding a large iron club, he proceeded to crush the enemy from atop their shield. From Krish's point of view, it was a violent and forceful way of fighting, but that was enough to deal with the common soldiers. If they were simply competing on the number of kills, Gran Meld was overwhelmingly more efficient than Krish's fighting style. The idea that it would be easier if there were a whole bunch of woof woof was at the root of the direction of this iron doll, the direction in which it was headed. Jaragasha cannot literally fight like Gran Meld, and its behavior was patterned to some extent. Even if detailed instructions are given, it wouldn't be as flexible as the flesh and blood Gran Meld. However, if they put on armor, their total weight is equivalent to that of five adult men with their weight far exceeding that of a man, their monstrous strength, and their simple armored strength, common soldiers who just readied themselves in a line of battle were no match. This is made with the simple idea that skill and responsiveness should be compensated for by with pure basic body strength. By filling the heart of the chest with magic power, there will be about a koku and a half, three hours, in combat maneuvers. Of course, you can simply increase the operating time by adding spare magic crystals but considering that each one requires about three magic possessors, the cost efficiency is not compatible with the current situation. A koku and a half. That's short. We can make it longer, but it will reduce performance during combat maneuvers. This is only for a short-term decisive battle. Chris J answered Celine while writing on the diagram. It's not meant for skirmishes, it's meant to crush enemy lines with a single blow. If its first move is definitely successful, then its role is over, and if the first move is successful, then we win, so we don't have to worry too much about how to dispose of the remaining soldiers. That way of thinking. I guess it's like an elephant that is handled in the south. A huge monster, twice the height of a man, with a long snout and tusk. She had never seen the real thing, but she had heard that such creatures were used in the south. That's right. Chris J think they are similar in operation. Chris J think this one is more flexible, and feels it is superior in terms of maintenance, transportation, and defense. There are detailed records of elephants in the time of the Gravarain. Its intimidating appearance terrifies the soldiers, and its superhuman strength mowed down the battle lines. They had tough, thick skin that could not be pierced by a spear without full strength from the waist, and it was considered foolhardy to challenge them head-on in battle. However, it seems to be a timid creature by nature, and it is not nimble or smart. Once they started running, they could only go straight and immediately ran away. 
The way to deal with them had also been established make a path for them to run, and to thrust spears and arrows at them from the side, which was a well-developed strategy. The mighty general of the south, Dagrin Garka, seems to have fought with it several times, and she remembered hearing him brag about it at a dinner party at some point. Hmm, interesting. But wouldn't it be tough for it to deal with magic possessor? Eluga, who finished observing the Iron Doll Jaragasha, asked Chris J. It will be tough when the opponent is on Woof Woof's level. But this is to break through the battle line, and that's not its purpose, so it doesn't matter. The purpose is against the general soldiers who make up the battle line. Besides, Chris J continued, Right now it's just the skeleton, but after this we'll wrap it in cloth to make it thicker, and cover it with sheet metal armor. It's very strong against shocks, and it's sturdy because it can wear armor that's thicker than normal. If it's an opponent with a low degree of magical power, it can easily defeat them. If it's just to defeat Selene, it might be able to do it if Chris J tired her best, it doesn't seem like Selene's skill can cut moving iron. Why you know? Selene, who felt as though her skill was being casually criticized, glared at her in half-exasperation. There are only a handful of people in this world who could bisect their enemy along with their plate armor. With the exception of superhumans like Kolkis, she was confident that she was quite strong, and it was somewhat unreasonable to be compared to them. Chris J was just stating the fact. Chris's cheeks were pinched as she tilted her head curiously, wondering if she had said something funny, and Eliga, seeing this, smiled pleasantly. Cuckoo, I see. Well, it's true that with heavy armor like that, there are only a few people who can take on opponents, even without thinking about it, it won't be a problem, hum? Ah, that's right. Basically, it won't stop unless the heart or the magic crystal in the head, which is the control tower, is broken, so even if such an opponent were to target it, it would probably work a little. Chris J answered while rubbing the cheek that was pulled by Celine. It hurts a little, but she recognized that pinching and pulling her cheek is also Celine's way of showing affection. While puffing out her cheeks, Cliché seemed to be subtly happy, and Chris Genta, next to her, was puzzled by her older sister's reaction to being pinched on the cheek, which she doesn't understand, and was worried about her future. Only a pervert would be pleased by something painful. Asserting that it was all the red-haired servant's fault, Crescenta reached out and rubbed her older sister's cheek. The weak point is the head hum. I guess it's easy to understand. It can't be helped here because it needs to be exposed to some extent in order to distinguish between friends and foes. Chris J made it taller to make it less vulnerable to attacks, and it's quite fast, so Chris J doesn't think it will be a problem to some extent. Fast. This. Decent. Chris J said that and held up the transmitter Pika Pika, Glint Gliant. The head core of the iron figure emitted light. HG. At that moment, with surprising agility, it charged toward Chris J. A thunderous roar and wind noise shook the basement. A fist pierced slightly to the left of Krish's well-organized face. Ho! Oh, this fast, that's more than I expected. Eluga smiled wickedly. Selene was surprised, but she certainly agrees with Eluga. Despite being huge, its speed is not much different from that of a magic possessor. Useful, or rather, it's amazing. This size and this speed. If mass-produced, we will have an overwhelming advantage over other countries. I agree. The problem on the battlefield is that it is so revolutionary, how do we incorporate it into our tactics? That's right. Elvina, who was behind Chris J, leaned back, and then pulled her back and hugged Elvina the two of them supported each other and made the character of person. Celine looked at them with pity. Basically, Chris J lacked consideration. Putting aside Chris J, it seems to be difficult for other people to handle. Even from the general's point of view, I feel uneasy about suddenly entrusting it with the front row, and it will take some time before the soldiers accept it. Hmm, the mechanism itself is simple, and if it starts moving, it will automatically do the work but. Test operations is important, Chris J. It may be perfect and very useful in your head, but it might not be that way other people. Celine put her hand to her chin and looked at the distorted iron figure. It took decades for the usefulness of ranks, which are now common knowledge, to be recognized, and even things that are easy to understand, such as stone throwers, became popular in the form of test operations, and everyone was made aware of their abilities. 
Military personnel in particular are conservative because they value experience. An era when personal prowess was considered the most important thing. The small tribe that was the origin of Alberin could be said to be weak, and if anything, they were on the side of being exploited by other tribes, but they possessed wisdom and skills that were second to none. They shot out at the enemy heroes with well-coordinated arrows, lined up their shields and unleashed their spears, and built fortresses to keep them at bay. They found a way to defeat the enemy tribe, which should be called a pack, through tactics, and in the blink of an eye, they swallowed up the smaller tribes around them. Even if they felt the usefulness of their tactics, other tribes could not accept it due to their pride and perished warriors are sometimes paralyzed by honor and pride, and die clinging to old ideas rather than new principles and order. This was not a rare occurrence, but a common occurrence. There will probably be a fair amount of people who show disgust at this innovative and amazing weapon created by Chris J that could deprive warriors of their place of activity. The possibility of problems arising from this was foreseeable. Since Chris J had no such imagination, Celine and the other had to be careful to avoid any negative consequences, and they had to carefully lay the groundwork for the project. That's why my father was having trouble establishing the general staff department. Even if it's inefficient, no one wants their status and power to be reduced. This is certainly a wonderful thing, but there will always be complaints from those who have risked their lives to make a name for themselves. On the battlefield, where the heroes fight, how can we let a doll like this lead the way in the battle of warrior? Some people will complain. Chris J doesn't understand. Hmm, let's see. Celine thought for a moment and raised her finger. Suppose you could create a doll that is very good at cooking. What would you think if that doll took the job of cooking from Chris J or Berry? As if some puppet could take Chris J and Berry's. It's just a hypothetical. Think in terms of what IFS. Chris J thought for a moment and replied that she might not like it. Celine nodded in satisfaction. That's probably how they will feel. That's why we need a little consideration and time for that kind of thing. Look, don't sulk. I'm not saying that this child is no good. Celine tugged at Chris's cheek, who pouted her lips. Chris J was a little unhappy, as she seemed to think she was being criticized. It's not like I'm specifically talking about this kid. At least I and Assistant Farron think they're very useful. Personally, I would like to put mass-produce it immediately, train personnel and build a production system as soon as possible. But, Celine looked at Chris Genta. Unlike school-related, it seems like it will cost a lot of money. Donations will be collected for school, so there won't be a problem on that side but... Wanisama, what is the production cost? Hmm, it's the first one, so it's pretty expensive. Pump. Wanisama, I don't need to convert it into pumpkins, so please tell me the amount. Unlike her older sister, Kraskenta wasn't familiar with the current pumpkin market, and she's not interested. She cut it short beforehand, exasperated. Even though Chris J made it, she sat down on a random chair and put Crescenta on her lap. The soldiers were perplexed by the fact that Chris J had just put the queen on her lap, but they weren't particularly upset because of it was Chris J. If you add up the cost of this alone, it will be three small gold coins and four pennant silver coins. From now on, we will reduce the number of extra parts, and if we continue to order from the place we ordered, Chris J think it will be reduced to around three small gold coins. Oh, it's quite cheap, isn't it? Crescenta was a little embarrassed by such gazes, but she couldn't reject Chris J. She blushed slightly, but she didn't show any particular reaction, and acted like it was natural. Since it's the cost price, Chris J didn't include the labor cost of the craft team. From the Chris's point of view, this was also a luxury item, but even so, most of it was for the processing cost of the magic crystal and iron. It takes a lot of time and effort to make it purely by forging an iron bar, and there was also the raw number of magic crystals. Since it was not a purchase for private use, Chris J thought that it was inevitable as an expense. Whether it is a few swords or leather armor that he lends to his soldiers, the cost was trivial compared to the amount of money that the military swallows on a daily basis, from paychecks and rations to everything else. It was a small price to pay considering the low cost of maintenance and the fact that one of them could match dozens of the best soldiers in the army. As a military man, Chris J also has a proper sense of propriety in this area. Finally, how many do you need for one army? That's right. In the end, 
Chris J is thinking about ten per corp, so forty. Putting aside that the production cost is quite high, and the maintenance cost itself, it takes three magic possessor to replenish it, so that's the realistic limit. Chris J hugged Crescento waist saying, it's still a bit difficult at the moment. For the time being, I'm thinking of deploying about ten of them in Chris's army and using them until some sort of system is in place. That's fine. Just like Celine said, it's easier for Chris J to do various things and prove its abilities in actual combat. Chris Genta, seemingly having given up worrying about her appearance, grabbed Chris's hand and played with it. Two lovely girls, they were too out of place in this cold basement. If there is no problem with the craftsmen, please tell them that there will be long-term orders from the kingdom later. It will probably make it a little cheaper, and the craftsmen will be enthusiastic. Yeah, understand. It might be better for the country to put a little more effort into securing magic possessor. There are people who are researching magic crystals, and we need to think about how to select the best ones from among the citizens. Once the royal palace is settled down, I will think of various ways to improve efficiency. Crescenta looked up at Chris J with expectant eyes, and Chris J patted her little sister on the head. The younger sister happily rubbed her cheek against her older sister's modest chest. Although it was under the direct control of Chris J, Celine wrapped her hair around her fingertips and sighed, exasperated at Crescenta, who easily threw away her appearance as a queen in front of the soldiers. As long as she was being pampered by Chris J like this, this queen was also an innocent child at least it wouldn't give off any bad impression. For the time being, is it okay to proceed this way? Yes, I trust Wanisama more than anyone else regarding this kind of thing. If that Wanisama says it's useful, it's also useful for me. I don't have the option not to proceed. Ha, huh, is that so? Of course, we might have to wait for various reasons though Crescenta continued. For the time being, it will be Wanisama personal thing. However, in the future, I will move with the idea of deploying it for the entire army under the initiative of the kingdom. Celine Sama and Assistant Marshal Farron will also think about that and consider various things in that regard. Wani Sama is not good at such details. Well, that's how it is. I'll think about it. Yes, understood. The Iron Machine soldier that ruled the world for hundreds of years after that its prototype. Jarea Gashia was born quietly in the basement of the royal palace. Um, now that the conversation is over and has calmed down, it's about the name. But Chris J think it's a little weird after all. What Chris J said was Jaragasha, not Jer. Chris J, you're done with your work for the time being, aren't you? Isn't it time to go home and have tea with Berry? Ah, right, it's almost time, hmm? Ah! Hundreds of years later the process of its birth was described in many books, from memoirs and scholarly books to entertainment novels, with imaginative influences. What's wrong? We were also thinking of taking a break at the estate today, so why don't we go together? How about you, Farron? Why, yes, of course, if you will have me. Um, somehow, Mew. Jaragashan. The true origin of the name was never written. Chapter 138 Pet owner and dog. Even though you're descended from the Arkasakos family, you're too lax. Do you understand, Fair? The old man spat and howled at Fair Arkasakos, who kept bowing his head. The other day, a knife by Arkasakos bedside. Since then, the relationship between the two, who had never been good to begin with, had become even worse. He never had any rebellion against his father. Fair's explanation that the knife had been stolen finally convinced him, but the criticism became more severe than before, and Fair who bowed his head was fed up with it. Yes, father. I'll be careful from now on. Be careful, you said. Don't let this happen again. Don't disappoint me any more than this. He wondered how many times had he responded to the old man's unreasonable demands, prostrating his head. Remembering that, he felt agitation in his gut, but he didn't show it. He had spent several decades under the old man's care in that way. It was meaningless. Seeing that the old man's anger had finally calmed down, Fair lifted his head. Father, about the queen. You know we won't be able to move for a while, right? That's the message. It's troublesome. Entering the mansion without anyone noticing, putting a knife on the neck of the Duke of the Kingdom, among those guards. At least the queen has a piece that could do that. 
he said as if spitting it out. Akasakos suspected an inside job first, interrogating everyone from the servants to the gardeners who came and went. Fair was, of course, no exception. With Fair's confirmed succession to the family, there was no sense in him betraying his father, and there was no merit in it. It was something that was obvious after a little thought, but even so, the old man was still not convinced. He looked down on everything and was frightened of everything. The Duke of Arcasarcos of the kingdom was such a small human being. The cursed child Crische. If the rumored ability is true, then it must be her. It was a trivial gossip in the city that led them to believe that Chris J. Christ and might have been responsible for this incident. It was a silly talk about a giant bat flying over the royal capital. Although it was not impossible because of the existence of magical beasts, there had never been a case of a magical beast appearing in the royal capital. They live in deep forests and mountains, and rarely appear in human settlements. However, assuming that the sighting was not a mistake, and that there was indeed something flying in the skies of the capital, it would be safe to assume that it was a human who was a magic possessor. It wasn't unusual for an assassin to invade a mansion along the roof, and above all, the origin of the rumor was in a first-class town, so the relevance to this case was high, and there was only one person that comes to mind. The Arkasakos family's connections were deep and wide. The house was well built, with first-class guards and a good view an assassin with the skill to get in and out without anyone noticing. If there is a person who is that skilled in the underground business, they would have already spent money on that person. Even if they were not, it was impossible that they did not know of that existence. This was a warning from Queen Crescenta. The implication that if they disobey, she can kill them any time. Her Majesty the Queen seems to be exactly as rumored. Considering this case, it's quite difficult to kill her without being killed. What are we going to do? The Duke of Arcasarcos rubbed his eyes and said, We can't move right away. But if we don't move, we'll just get out limbs unilaterally ripped off. We need to change the board. The meeting in two weeks' time, that's where we will sow the seeds. Once the kingdom is stable, it can no longer be stopped. That must be avoided. Once the kingdom is stable, it would be fine even if Crescenta only look inward. She will move to cut off what is inconvenient for her. Of course Arkasako's head would also be included in there. But in the event of war, Crescenta would not be to easily move. If she disturbed the royal palace in the middle of a war, they would be at the mercy of other countries, so she would not be able to do anything to cut off Arkasako's, even if they were an eyesore. The Arkasakos family, which has been at the center of the royal palace since ancient times, had a wide and deep network of contacts. That would bring benefit to the queen, and Crescenta would probably think of disposing of the Arkasakos family only after she had taken control of their personal connections. It was reasonable to think that that was the reason why she gave a warning instead of an assassination, if so there was some leeway. Another war after the civil war is over. It could be a double-edged sword. The royal capital will not be attacked. Even though they are exhausted, the royal army is strong. They will fight well for the sake of the kingdom. The old man let out a vicious laugh, which Foray stared at with sober eyes. It's about time for father to retire. A reception room decorated with gorgeous furnishings. It was the drawing room of Count Norks in a first-class town. Count Norks used his mansion as a meeting place, and many nobles used it to conduct transactions that could not be disclosed to the public. Whether it was meeting for underground business or anything else, nobles had their reputation to consider, to avoid suspicion or leave no evidence behind. It is common for them to use intermediaries in this way, and Fair was one of them. That's, that's right. There is no way to confront that queen. That said, this time he was talking to Count Norks himself. The Norx family itself was noble family appointed by the Duke of Arcasarcos, but after Fair began to take over various jobs on his behalf, embraced it over time and was taken in hand as Fair's own protégé. The information network of Norx, who acted as an intermediary, was extensive, and it was just the right means to counter his father, who controlled the information network of the Arcasarcos family. If father continues to cling to power, the Arcasarcos family will surely be destroyed. What the queen wants is a blind servant, someone who is too self-willed won't be able to survive in the kingdom after this. He sipped his wine and looks at Nork's face. 
Knox was examining Fair's words and thinking. He was now considering whether it would be better for him to follow Fair or his father, the Duke of Arcasarcos. For many nobles, self-preservation comes before anything else, and this man was no exception. They appeared to be in their mid-thirties. Fair and Knox, who turned sixty this year, were close in age, and perhaps their relationship was close to that of childhood friends because of their parents' relationship. When they were young, they often talked about their dreams and ideals, and they knew each other well, from each other hobbies to what kind of women they liked. They had what could be called friendship, but they would easily throw it away like garbage for the sake of profit. They can never let down their guard. That is the nature of nobles, otherwise they would not be able to survive in royal's territory. In some cases, this man could easily betray him, and he himself could easily discard this man. It seemed like an endlessly cold relationship, but that was the kind of friendship that Noble had. Nox you sure have aged. Your grey hair stands out a lot. Hum. Ah, that's right, you age quickly. Nox stroked his hair, which he brushed back. Grey hair. Compared to Foray, who still looks like his in his mid-thirties, Nox looked old. In terms of age, he should be a few years younger than Foray, but was it a constitutional problem or the effect of fatigue? He laughed as he recalls the days when he hid from his parents and went out to buy women. The handsome man of those days was gone. He was quite strong in such matters, and even pulled fair over, but the long years since then were reflected in his hair. In the past I used to mock you for not being greedy, but I guess I'm getting old, I'm thinking the same thing, I'm a little tired. For Asama. I don't have the lust for power that my father has. It takes a lot of hard work to stay in the high branches of the kingdom, and what you get for doing so is meager. Let's talk now as friends, Foray said. In any case, the Arkasako's family has no future, and it will be difficult to maintain it as it is. It means that the time has come for both you and I to think about how we should behave in the future. Ha ha, relaxing in the countryside, hum? I don't think that's a bad thing these days. Cuckoo, laughing, Foray sank into the sofa as if tired. It's difficult to kill my father with these hands. It is highly probable that I will be retaliated against. But there's an easy way to do it. An easy way. Give that queen a reason. That will be easy. He sipped his wine and squinted. Isn't there a job he's already working on? It's fine to use it. Then the queen will easily kill my father. You mean? Nox leaned forward, propped his elbows on the desk, and looked at Fair. The assassination was a failure, that's fine. The point is, all we need is the fact that it happened. Originally, great care was taken to avoid suspicion of the involvement of the Arkasakos family. Even if the queen cannot punish the Arkasakos publicly, she won't ignore it either. It's reasonable to think that father got into a frenzy out of fear, so it's reasonable to dispose of him for the sake of the future. Fair looked straight into his eyes and continued. At best, let them kill each other as they like. After that, if we show my submission and show our stomach, the Arkasakos family's connections also wouldn't be bad for the queen. Whatever form it takes, we will be able to continue to breath. His father was an eyesore to the queen. She would probably want to kill him if she could. The only reason she didn't choose to do so was because she saw value in the Arkasakos family. If Fair offers it and shows complete obedience, the queen will not do such pointless thing as destroying the Arkasakos. Prostrating his head it was no longer a hardship to live that way this in the game. It would be a little better than bowing to that old man. Until a little while ago, I was doubting if that queen was really a cursed child, but, in truth, she's a monster after all. The deaths of the young princes were also her doings. Considering that, the road of hostility against her isn't long. No blood, no tears, no empathy, cursed child is such a creature. Now that such a thing has won the throne, we should think about how to wag our tail. It's the same as before, said Fair with a wry smile, and Nox also laughed. Surely. Nothing has changed from before, for me and for you. Yeah. Only the owner can change, but if everything settle with that, there's nothing to say. Nox nodded at Fair, who seemed somewhat tired. Ouch. Okay, Chris Genta lost. Chris J thought Chris Genta would remember a little better but... Chris J, who had just put flick to Chris Genta forehead, hummed and read with her long sword in her hand. 
holding her forehead and getting teary-eyed, Kriskenta looked at her older sister with dissatisfaction. It was a spacious indoor training room in the royal palace. Kriskenta always tries to find some way to spend time with her older sister. So what she set her sights on was her self-defense training. Considering the danger of my life being targeted, it was better to learn a sword to the extent that I can protect myself. That way, Wanisama can feel a little more at ease even when Wanisama isn't around. And so on were enough reasons to persuade Chris J. As expected, even Chris J couldn't refuse this request, with saying it's troublesome, so they were supposed to do light training like this once every three days. From my point of view, I think it's a great improvement. Berry, who was observing while preparing tea, said with a troubled expression, and Chris J tilted her head in dissatisfaction. Chris Genta's improvement, who had never held a sword properly, was unbelievable for ordinary people, but for Chris J who compared her to herself, it's not so. You, the sword is heavy after all. My hand hurts too, and Wanisama hits my forehead. It's because Chris Genta doesn't take things seriously. Do you know? When you train a dog, you have to hit it and tell it that what's no is a no. I'm not a dog. Kriskenta's purpose was to have fun practicing with her older sister. Kriskenta was happy to be taught every step of the way by Chris J, and naturally didn't put herself into training. Even so, her growth was more than enough for an ordinary person, but Chris J was a very stoic creature when it comes to self-improvement. Chris J was not willing to allow her little sister slack, and after thinking about how to motivate her, she decided to give Kriskenta a strict discipline. Every time she lost a bout, she would do one flick on her forehead. Really, Kriskenta shouldn't be so unserious. If Kriskenta charged like before, first. Ehehe, what should I do? However, it was a bit tricky to say whether there was an effect. It certainly hurts to be hit on the forehead. That being said, even that was within the limits of what she could endure, and the reward of being taught how to do things after that was bigger for Kriskenta. Krish's disciplining didn't go very well. Kriskenta asked this and that while pretending to be enthusiastic. Basically, the lecture time was longer than the sword swing time. She was dressed in a dress that made it difficult to move around Kriskenta, like Chris J, has similar sensibilities in this area and dislikes pants and it was adorable to watch her rub against her sister and smile. Berry smiled wryly at the sight of that queen. Kriskenta, who was spoiled by cliches, looked very happy and seeing her like that makes her smile. Berry was aware that this training was an excuse for Kraskenta, but she said nothing about it. Even if it was a one-sided effort, the results were more than enough, and as long as she was happy, that was all that mattered. But of course, he also thought that if he was going to do it, she would prefer something a little more fruitful. Hmm, that's right, Krishsama. Isn't it better for Kraskenta-sama to learn pure self-defense techniques rather than handling sword? Self-defense. Yes, there aren't many opportunities for Her Majesty the Queen to wield a sword, it's more about fighting with bare hands and daggers. The handling of the sword is more than enough even now. That's right, Wanisama, I prefer that one. Kreskenta said and immediately put the long sword she was holding on the shelf. She could wield the long sword, but it would peel the skin off her hand. Naturally it hurts. And Kreskenta did not like pain. Even though she started it herself, Kraskenta thought was there any way she would be able to let go of this sword or not, so she immediately decided to go along with the proposal of the hated berry. Occasionally, Argansama also says good things hum. That makes a lot more sense. I see. Thank you. Berry chuckled and Chris J pulled Kraskenta's cheek with a troubled face. It's true that it's as Berry said, but it's difficult to hold back. Chris J doesn't know how self-defense techniques should be taught. If Chris Genta just dodge Chris's sword, it will only become a game of tag. Simple hand-to-hand -hand combat or something. Hmm, that's right. Berry approached them and beckons to Chris Genta. She called out to Chris Genta who tilted her head and approached her, saying please excuse me, and took Chris Genta's right hand. Wah. She twisted it lightly as it was. Chris Genta's right arm was fully extended, and she lightly pressed down on her shoulder to block her movement. Her arm was completely jointed, and she lost her balance and was on the verge of falling Kraskenta screamed as she tried to resist. Ah, I'm sorry. It's been a while and I'm a little sloppy. W what are you doing? You you you, 
holding Chris Genta's arm from behind and stroking her head to cheer her up, Berry looked at Chris J. Chris J nodded with a little admiration. Oh, so that's how it is. Chris J doesn't do that very often, so Chris J completely forgot about it. Fufu, I think it's appropriate way to deal with an attacker. I've only learned a little from Gatushu Sama, but it's very theoretical. Chris J basically thinks only about killing the opponent. It was a simple and very easy way to eliminate danger, but it would be difficult for Chris Genta, who usually wears a dress and doesn't have a weapon. Even a single kick can be used as a lethal means because Chris J usually wears reinforced boots, but not Chris Genta. Chris Genta's attack power may be insufficient against a trained opponent, let alone against an amateur. If you can't kill them with a single blow, attacking was rather risky. It was obvious that the side with inferior physique would be at a disadvantage if the opponent grabbed them. If so, the next step should be to block the opponent's movement, and that was what Berry suggested. If she could master the joints, she would be able to handle even an opponent with far superior physical ability. I thought that something like this would be easier for Kreskentasama to remember this than something intuitive. If you practice the sword every day, you will improve quickly, but this one won't take much time, and once Kreskentasama learn the logic, it will be easier for Kreskentasama. You, please let me go. Berry smiled happily while holding down Kreskenta, who was twisting and writhing. Chris J nodded as she poked at Kreskenta's cheek. Then, let's start with the structure of the body. One by one, such as joints and muscles. And then, about an hour later, when Celine, who heard that they were practicing swordsmanship, entered the room with Anne. Ah, what are you doing? A moo There was Kreskenta rolling on the couch with her hands and feet tied. Chris J tilted her head and looked at it, and Berry looked at Celine with a troubled look. Ah, ah, we've changed direction a little from self-defense training to how to get out from the rope. Look, Chris Genta. Celine has arrived. Chris V.E. made it so that if you remove the joint properly, you can get out, so do your best. Otherwise, you won't have snacks. Mugu, ah. Celine pressed her forehead and sighed deeply, and stared at the bound queen while her face is red. In her mind, Kristan's immorality had now advanced to the point of no return. Chapter 139, Mad Innocence. The meeting, which also served as the unveiling of the new queen, was soon to come. Even the Holy Elsren Empire, which had not replied, eventually announced its participation, perhaps to keep pace with neighboring countries, and the royal capital was a bit hectic. Vice-Chancellor Oregon from Gulshan, High Priestess Anna from the Anna Imperial State had already arrived in Royal's territory, Prime Minister Krolus from the Eldorant Kingdom, and Archbishop Elberbert from the Holy Elsren Empire had visited the nearby area. While people of the second or third rank in each country were visiting, only the Archbishop of Elsren was of a somewhat lower rank. This was an expression from the Holy Empire that they were above the kingdom. This was the unveiling of the Queen who rules the Alberan Kingdom. Normally, Instead of sending an archbishop who oversees the bishops of the western region of the empire, it would have been logical to send the supreme archbishop who oversees all archbishops, or a cardinal, but the reason for not doing so was probably for the purpose of demonstrating. From the empire's point of view, it's like saying that the Alberan kingdom was no different from a small country on the western frontier or the inauguration of a single feudal lord. Some of the nobles of the kingdom were dissatisfied with this, but Queen Crescenta did not care in particular. The only thing that mattered to Crescenta was that the meeting took place. The goal was to buy time to restore the kingdom's finances and reorganize its armed forces. The conference purpose was to buy time for that, and it was not a big problem what kind of attitude other countries take toward the kingdom. Once they chose to show up for this unveiling, the kingdom managed to obtain another six months of time. It's because a customary thing, while blessing the auspicious event like the inauguration of the new ruler like this, fundamentally such ill-mannered conduct like immediately sending their armies to that country wouldn't be taken. This was not explicitly stated in the Holy Spirit Covenant, but is a kind of diplomatic etiquette. At the very least, with this, it means the kingdom could rest assured that they won't be attacked until the next autumn the harvest season. It was especially important for the kingdom to have a stable harvest next season from the breadbasket areas in the south and southeast region of the kingdom. Welcome Zanalibiasama, 
Thank you for coming all the way from afar. I welcome you. Yes, your majesty the queen. First of all, please let me congratulate your majesty from the bottom of my heart on this occasion. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that. Shaking golden hair that glitters in red, Crescenta smiled with her queen's mask. It was only natural to greet once before the conference, and such trivial groundwork around will be effective later on. The meeting conference, any discussion, was all ultimately a mere farce. Ninety percent of things have been decided through prior discussions. That lady over there, perhaps? As you can guess, she's Chris J. Alberinia Christ and my esteemed older sister, Anegemi. Chris J., who was politely standing behind Crescenta, wore a white one-piece dress that was a little more elegant than usual, and bowed gracefully according to the etiquette. She looked at Zanalibia with her purple eyes disinterestedly and then looked at Berry, who was standing next to her. Berry quietly whispered, and Chris J. did as instructed and sat down next to Crescenta, saying, Excuse me. When Chris J. minded her manner, no matter how you look her manner was perfect. Her tranquil beauty was just like that of a doll princess, and she was the complete opposite of the bright and lovely Crescenta. However, her fairy-like appearance and the atmosphere she wears seem to overlap with Crescenta's in every way, and if it was said that they are sisters, it would immediately make sense. Although her rumors of being a matchless warrior and general were at odds with her appearance, Zanalibia, who knew Crescenta's intelligence and boldness did not match her appearance, had no desire to underestimate her. My, my, it's nice to meet you. My name is Zanalibia, Alberinia. It's an honor to be able to meet the patriotic warrior who saved the kingdom. It was generally preferable to use their honorary peerage as a title of honor for those who do not have the title of duke or margrave, but have a unique honorary peerage. As a courtesy, Zanalibia extended his hand, and Chris J complied. Zanalibia felt the hardness of a sword in her small, slender hand rather than its softness, and understood that this girl was unmistakably a warrior. He thought that she shouldn't be taken lightly after all, but didn't show it on his face. Yes, Chris J is also Hono, Red. Chris J glanced at Berry pouring the tea beside her, met her eyes and smiled softly at each other. He guessed it from the fact that she was on the queen's side before, but she must be a very trusted servant. A servant who could attend to this kind an event calmly must have been born into a good family, or perhaps. Zana Libya stroked his chin. There have been many people in history who, while ostensibly serving as servants to the side, have acted as advisors to the government, manipulating and controlling it behind the scenes. A person who can be trusted so much by the too cursed child he returned his gaze to Crescenta, thinking that if he had the chance, he might have to look into it. Thanks to the Arna Imperial State, we were able to keep other countries in check, it was really helpful. It was thanks to the help of Princess Mikosama that we were able to grasp peace for a while. Please convey our thanks. I understand. Princess Mikosama will be pleased with Her Majesty's words. With the decision of this conference, the Imperial Army had already pulled out. At the same time as the end of the Civil War the role of the Arna Imperial State, which appeared as reinforcements, was extremely large, and that was probably the reason why Gulshan in the South, which was apparently showing some disturbing movements, gave up on the invasion. She was right when she said that it was only with Anna's help that they were able to hold conferences like this, and their achievements were very significant. Crescenta thought that she would have them carry the kingdom for the time being and use them conveniently. However, there may be times when I will ask the On Imperial State for help again soon. Perhaps next year, this peace will crumble. I guess, unfortunately. A five-year armistice was also signed between Eldorant and Gulshan. A truce was recently concluded between the Kingdom of Eldorant and the Republic of Gulshan, which were at war. Gulshan was dominant in the beginning, but gradually showed a stalemate. They probably thought that it would be more disadvantageous for both of them if they continued. Besides, above all else, the delicious prey, the Alberin Kingdom was lying right next to them. It is more beneficial for both countries to aim for this than to fight in a stalemate. Considering that Elsren came here, it's possible that the three countries will attack at the same time. It will probably come to that. If that happens, it will be difficult. Crescenta showed agreement with his words. The conference was, in effect, a truce. If there was no merit to comply with it, 
they would not participate in such a ridiculous event as the Queen's unveiling. If you're aiming for the kingdom, there's no better chance than now. If they were abandoning that choice that and agreed to the conference, the possibility that could be thought of become clearer. Regardless of whether or not they form an alliance, at least the two countries of Elsren and Gulshan will move, and it seems will be difficult to defend the whole country. Simultaneous invasion by coordinating with other countries it was very clear that it was for that preparation. The problem in attacking the kingdom was the Anna imperial state. As long as it is intact, the other countries will always be forced into a two-on-one situation against the kingdom. The only way to deal with this is to invade with a large force, as Elsren did the other day, or to invade simultaneously. For Elsren, the defeat the other day couldn't have been painless, and seeing that they hadn't attacked during the civil war, they shouldn't have been in a state where they could make another solo invasion. The same went for Gulshan, who had skirmishes with Eldorant in that case, it was more than likely that these two countries would communicate behind the scenes and plan a simultaneous invasion. It would be great if we were to hold each other's hands and celebrate peace, but that's not the case, is it? Crescenta said with a troubled expression, and Xanalibia gave a wry smile. Things certainly won't go that convenient. War will be inevitable. We are also preparing for the expedition, assuming every possible situation. Thank goodness. How about a joint military exercise in the north during the next harvest season? It's not bad as a restraint. Xanalibia narrowed his eyes. The distance between the kingdom and the empire means that in the event of an emergency, they would still be one step behind no matter what. Under the guise of exercises, it can be considered as an option to keep the army in the kingdom ahead of other countries as a check. The most important problem for the defense of the kingdom was the loss of the northern Christ and army, which was the key to the defense of the kingdom. The armies of the north are the cornerstones of defense against attacks from the east and west, as well as Eldorant and Elsren. It is only because of such northern movements that the territory of the kingdom has been protected, and in the kingdom, the northern generals are considered more important than the generals of the east and west, just like the generals of the south, who are in charge of the longest front line. As a result of the loss of soldiers in the civil war, the imperial state was also concerned about the northern part of the kingdom, which was left blank, and was thinking about some countermeasures then, Xanalibia suddenly frowned. Why was the important north region still vacant? Thinking about it again, he began to understand Queen Crescenta's intentions. No, was that your majesty's intention from the beginning? What are you talking about? With her red glittering golden hair swaying, Crescenta deliberately tilted her head. Even if the ability was insufficient, the kingdom will have a problem if someone was not appointed as the northern general. Otherwise, the army would not be able to take action when the time came. However, to the north of the kingdom is Anna imperial state. If Anna moved to defend the kingdom, there was no doubt that they would inevitably stay in the north and send reinforcements to the east and west. This queen was completely relying on that and was completely neglecting the north. There may be a reason that there was no suitable person to be appointed as the northern general. However, her primary goal was to cut military spending by operating the Anna imperial state as a temporary northern army, she was trying to save the northern region's enormous military spending. It was a half-dumbfounded idea for one nation to completely entrust the key to its national defense to another nation. Even though she didn't have even a shred of pride, this queen probably doesn't even feel ashamed of it. She just goes to great lengths to pursue her own interests, she was that kind of creature. For Anna national defense, cooperation with the kingdom is essential, and they had no choice but to send out their army to protect the kingdom, no matter what. Even if they felt dissatisfied with this blatant use of convenience, there was nothing they could do about it. If the kingdom sinks, the imperial state will sink with it, and she was taking advantage of it. Crescenta looked at Xanalibia, who was thinking what to do, had a sour look on her face, and let out a giggle. Fufu, it's just a joke. Of course, the kingdom will not forget this favor. We are willing to make the necessary concessions regarding tariff relief that you have been proposing for some time. Really, I'd like to ask for your forgiveness for such heartbreaking teasing. Xanalibia sipped sweet tea and took a sip, thinking that in exchange for the relaxation of tariffs it might not be a bad idea. The Anna Imperial State is a major producer of magic crystals and other ores, 
and it also puts a lot of effort into the crafting and processing of these ores. The largest proportion of the country's exports were such processed ore products, but since there were also a good number of mines in the northern part of the kingdom, they competed with each other and there were problems with exporting to the kingdom. The ones from the imperial state were of better quality, the craftsmanship was better, and the prices were even cheaper it could be said that it was inevitable that a high tariff would be imposed from the perspective of protecting the mining and processing industries within the kingdom. Although exports were carried out by sea too, the sea route was not as profitable as expected due to the risk of sinking, and the domestic market was already saturated and prices were falling. In this circumstance, the tariff relaxation from the kingdom was a very big deal. Although they had been sounding it out for a long time, the kingdom had shown reluctance about the tariff relaxation. Looking at the long-term benefits that would come from the temporary burden of the Imperial Army's expedition, it wasn't a bad deal. It's just a bit of mischief, Crescenta said, gazing happily at Zanalibia's relief. If research using magic crystals continues to develop, centered around Crisje, including Jarea Gashia, the value of magic crystals would skyrocket, especially within the kingdom. Under the pretense of deregulation of tariffs, she was planning to buy a large amount of cheap and high-quality magic crystals from the imperial state now, though she wouldn't say it. In exchange, I would like to receive military assistance from the imperial state for the next few years with appropriate reasons such as cultural exchanges. It is a good opportunity for me to enact various policies in the country, but I'm not in a position to do so at present and there are only a limited number of people in the center who can be trusted at the moment. Crescenta looks up at him with a troubled puppy eyes look in her eyes. The price for the dispatch of troops was a good pretext for easing tariffs, as if it was too sudden it might raise suspicions. The kingdom's profits, including the military expenses that would be saved, would be enormous since the imperial state would dispatch troops to the kingdom, not only free of charge, but also come with a bonus. Crescenta had a big smile on her face. Well, it can't be helped. I understand the situation in the kingdom very well. It's really helpful to hear that. It's much safer to entrust the north to the imperial state than to leave it to someone who doesn't know if you can trust. It's not like I'm using it for convenience, okay? Zanalibia couldn't say anything and smiled wryly. In truth, they were being used as a handyman but Zanalibia also had some understanding of the situation in the kingdom. The terrible thing about civil wars was that, more than anything else, they caused discord within the country. It would create further sparks, and if one misjudged the personnel to be placed in the position of northern general, it would become a great fire that would destroy the kingdom in the worst possible way. It is a reasonable and rational thing to want to move cautiously at this time. Not realizing that they were being preyed on instead of being used as a convenience, Zanalibia looked at her situation sensibly and was convinced that there was nothing to be done about it. We will talk about tariffs later, but for now let's talk about national defense. Wanisama. Kriskenta turned her attention to the cookie cracker her older sister Chris J. Chris J tilted her head as she ate the cookie. Kriskenta's cheeks puffed out in exasperation with a G's. We are talking about the military situation in the north. Zanalibia Sama is also very knowledgeable in that area, so Wanisama can talk about it with him. Chris J thinks Celine would have been better after all. Chris J said a little dissatisfied and turned to Zanalibia. Celine was better suited for this kind of discussion. Chris's presence here was half because of Kriskenta's selfishness. M, is Zanalibia Sama, okay? Yes, Alberinia. Nice to meet you. First of all, I would like to ask you how many troops you have in mind. A sweet voice that echoes quietly. Unlike Crescenta's somewhat dignified voice, there was no vigor. What comes out of Krish's mouth is the voice of a girl, just as she looked. It's probably a matter of temperament. As sisters, the two looked alike, but they also seemed to be opposites. From her, it seemed as if she lacked everything needed to run an army, which made Zanalibia a little uneasy. Chris J hoped for about 1,000 or 2,000 men. However, Chris J would like you to select some personnel above the Centurion so that one command army can be deployed on two fronts. The words that follow were even more incomprehensible. 1,000 or 2,000? Yes. As for the soldiers, they are available, and that amount is enough for the personnel from the Imperial State Army. In the North, 
There is only a lack of commanders, not a lack of soldiers itself. I feel there will be many problems with using the kingdom's soldiers. Besides, that number wouldn't be a restraint on other countries, would it? Chris J nodded at Zanalibia, who wrinkled his brows more and more wondering what she meant. Chris Genta, who was listening beside her, was also drinking lukewarm tea and glancing at her older sister. That's fine. It's more convenient to be attacked without it being a check. Besides, if the Imperial State dispatches a large army, there is the problem of maintenance costs, so we won't be able to maintain it for a long time. All the enemy has to do is wait a bit, and if it's Chris J, Chris J will either attack after the Imperial State withdraws or after the financial burden hits the kingdom. Certainly, that may be so but. In peacetime, the kingdom's army is reduced and maintained by a fraction of its size, in some cases it's even less than a tenth. Fundamentally, the constant employment in the kingdom is for officers above the rank of centurion, and the amount deposited by the center of the kingdom to each region in the name of military maintenance costs is only enough to feed a captain or above at best. Of course, the amount would vary greatly depending on the importance of the region and the level of tension, but regardless of the situation, the financial burden of supporting a 20,000-strong army was significant, and the kingdom did not have the strength to maintain a standing army of 20,000 troops for a region. If the imperial army were to bring a large army here, food and maintenance costs, everything except wages would be borne by the kingdom, but being a soldier of the empire would be a big problem. Since it is an expedition from the imperial state, it is impossible to downsize the army there, no matter how heavy the burden may be. Putting aside if it's a temporary reinforcements, but if it was a long-term expedition, the financial burden was sure to be too much to ignore, and if the enemy chose to wait, that would be a situation where they cannot send back the army. If they pulled out their forces, they would be attacked. However, if left unattended, the finances will collapse. They need to avoid being forced into such a situation. Therefore, the number of personnel should be kept to a minimum. We will use the soldiers of the kingdom for training under the guise of military exchange, and have their generals and officers fill in the gaps during their stay in the kingdom. We don't think too much about actual warfare, a certain amount is enough. It's a mock army. A mock army. Yes. There is no way to invade the north from either the east or the west. Just with the imperial state dispatching an army to the kingdom, the enemy's possible actions will be narrowed down. I see, if they target the north, the enemy will have to fight the imperial state itself. That's how it is. If the enemy were to target the north, even if the imperial expeditionary force deployed in the northern area were defeated, it would be the main body of the imperial state that would be waiting behind it. No one would be foolish enough to aim there. Therefore, it did not matter if the imperial expeditionary force was vulnerable, that was the implication. The anxiety and bewilderment he had earlier had disappeared from Zanalibia. Already more than enough, this girl has future battles in her mind. The important thing is that the imperial state is leading the army. It's enough if that is fulfilled. Besides, if other countries are frightened by the empire's large army, the tension will continue and it will be difficult, if they want to attack, it's easier if they come early. Wouldn't it be more convenient for the kingdom to buy more time? In that case, the imperial army's maintenance costs will be heavy, and in the end they will attack in a few years, so the result will not change anyway. Chris J continued, they won't miss a great opportunity to attack the kingdom. No matter what, there was no doubt that the enemy would attack before the kingdom was completely stabilized. It was a decisive decision that there was no point in delaying it a little. Alberinia seems to have a lot of confidence. The current complicated situation of the kingdom being targeted by the three countries. If I were in the kingdom's position, for example, in your position, I would have a stomach ache from anxiety and I wouldn't be able to eat. And she could be said to be a very confident type. The situation was dangerous, even if it is understated, the three surrounding countries could attack. Even in the imperial state, tensions were rising about the future of the kingdom. Even so, the silver-haired girl tilted her head curiously, picked up a cookie, and swallowed it. Mew, if all three countries are going to attack, all we have to do is crush them one by one. Then there will be peace, nothing complicated, right? Rather, I think it's a very simple thing though, she replied with the face of an adorable little girl. She never hypothesized that she would lose. 
she had no doubts that she would win. If she didn't feel that it was natural from the bottom of her heart, she wouldn't say such words. I see. I can understand why Her Majesty the Queen trusts Alberinia. Precisely because it was such a perfectly natural word, she seemed completely insane. Chapter 140, Noble and Vulgar. Ehehe, is Chris J cute? Yes, it suits Krishsama very well. Chris J fluttered the skirt of her dress. Chris J, the dress-up doll, spun around happily, showing off her dress. Berry, even as she imagined that Celine would later complain that she was cowardly, smiled softly at the pretty figure of Chris J. The prelude to the dress war in anticipation of the conference had already begun. Um, Chris J, would like to choose the dress Chris J is going to wear next time. No breakfast, no pre-breakfast, and no choice but to watch the end of the battle between her sister and servants. It was in the morning that she told Berry this in order to prevent such a tragedy from happening again. Naturally, this is the best proposal for Berry. If she could choose everything from the dress to the decorations in advance under Krish's consent, you will have an overwhelming advantage in the upcoming battles. It was very important that the one that had made the proposal was Chris J. Even if she was called cowardly and despicable, there was no need to be concerned because she had the just cause of having been told to do so by none other than Chris J. As expected if it was Krish's will, Celine would not be able to go on the offensive in that direction. It was a vicious, cowardly, and despicable thing to do to Celine, who was too busy to make any advance arrangements, but in the servant's mind, it was a perfect rationalization. Berry basically never bends to her will, no matter who she was dealing with. Although she was gentle and soft-spoken, and at first glance appears to be a wise woman to be reasoned with, Berry Argon at her core was a very stubborn and self-centered woman full of aristocratic sensibilities. It was to the point that her clarity in cutting and throwing everything for her own wishes was all the more refreshing, and she was more suited to be a military man or a politician than a cook. It's quite unusual for Krishsama to say something like this. I'm very happy that Krishsama cares about her own dress and costume like this but... Eh he, Chris J, recently also feel like have come to understand what pretty is. Chris J put her hands on her hips and puffed out her modest chest. Krish's appearance in the light blue dress was endlessly adorable. Berry was a little surprised, as she exclaimed my, and gently combed her silver hair. Chris J feels like it's a bit difficult to put into words. Chris J approached and snuggled up to Berry and looked at her with upturned eyes, puppy eyes. Chris J was even a little smaller than the already small Berry, and her every natural gesture was charming and endearing. Her sparkling purple eyes, Berry had read in many books that upturned eyes are attractive to gentlemen, and she could understand why. Berry could also feel it when she saw Chris J in her everyday life. If a pretty girl like Chris J were to come up to you like this and ask you for a favor while looking up at you, wouldn't anyone would be willing to risk a life or two for a chance to see her precisely because there was no hidden motives that Chris's innocence was demonic? It may be something like that. It's very difficult to put into words the feeling of being beautiful. It's just beautiful. If I'm a poet, it might be different though. Berry said embarrassedly, and Chris J holding Berry cheeks between her hands, said so it's difficult even for Berry. She stood on her toe a little bit and kissed her happily, then loosened her cheeks and fluttered her dress. To say the least, Chris J was impossibly cute. At least to Berry this creature could only be described as beautiful or cute. It's hard to put it into words, even as she said that, Berry was blushing. But, after all, I think it's close to the kind feeling of being happy, so if Berry thinks Krish is pretty, then Chris J will be happy too. So, Chris J will be together with Berry as much as Chris J want. Fufu, thank you. Krish's beauty was probably a reflection of her feelings toward Berry, but Berry rather than questioning what her beauty was for, she was more pleased that it was a good thing for Chris J. Because her growth is the most important thing for Berry. Whatever the case may be, it is good to know that Chris J was beginning to take an interest in her attire rather than some obsession, skirts, stubbornly, so she did not ask those questions too deeply. Though it was also because it was difficult to put into words. Eh, hey, Berry too always very beautiful. Thank you very much. But Krish Sama is much more beautiful than me. Self-absorbed and gifted in many ways, but with basically low self-esteem, she was unable to connect those feelings of Chris J. 
who had recently always been staring at her face Berry was basically insensitive to goodwill from others. This may be due in part to the fact that Krish's goodwill and skinship had long been, and generally were, excessive. And Chris J also thought that there was no need to ask Berry to explain her feelings again, and was more than satisfied with the current situation. Berry said Chris J was beautiful, and Chris J thinks she was beautiful, too. In Chris J it was mutual in the Chris J there was the teaching of the Berry scriptures that the truth is trivial. In light of this, there is no need to confirm each other's words. Originally, the relationship was so physical that other people even doubted the nature of their relationship, and now it just has become more balanced from both sides. Chris J was more than satisfied. Ah, that's right. Chris J headed for the shelf as if remembering. Then she took something out of her bag. A magic crystal a thing covered with metal and processed. A rather thick string was attached to the metal fittings, it was probably a necklace. Although it's a little rough, the magic crystal's blue glow was beautiful. Kreskenta said something about poison, so Chris J thought I'd give it to Berry just in case. Poison. Yes. Chris J gathered the poison that exists around here and made poison pyrrhin that reacts to poison. It's easy to use, just bring it closer and let the magic flow, then it will sound piripiri. Ha! Berry took it and looked at it. The complex magic formula engraved on the magic crystal changed and transformed over time. According to Chris J, the Unyun. Elvina named cryptographic engraving, taking from the word code, password, cipher, used in grimoires. It absorbs the surrounding magical power, and that magical power rewrites the surface layer of the formula over time, protecting the inner core of the formula. When touched by a magic possessor like Berry, it would be further activated, and the undulating, unyun, geometric patterns change within the magic crystal. It was a mechanism completely beyond Berry's comprehension. To disable this, draw a magic formula in the air it seems that you have to use magic to undo the drawing, but even Berry, who knows how it works, can't tell how many years it will take to disable it by fumbling around. Naturally, she had no idea how this magic crystal would work. How can it tell if something is poisonous? It was a little difficult for cliché, too. When you analyze something, it is made up of small grains, and these grains are combined making up various things. They are all attached to each other and become various things but... Chris J pointed to the ceiling and walls. Look, it's like how the estate is made of wood and stone. Grains. It's grains. Chris J and the others' bodies are also made of a lot of those grains gathering. It's hard to explain, Chris J said, resting her hand on her chin in contemplation. The heart, the blood, the things that move the body are all made up of grains like that and the poison is made up of the same grains. When it enters the body, the grains of poison do bad things to various parts of the body, and it seems that people get sick or die from it. There are many kinds of poison, so Chris J doesn't really know which one affects which one, or whether it works because it's too enormous. How troubling, saying that Chris J raised her finger. The magic power shook and swayed. If Chris J know it, Chris J might be able to create something like an all-purpose healing magic crystal, but it would require tens of thousands, tens of millions of experiments, so Chris J gave up and decided to look in a different direction. Magic power, is it? Yes. Magic power can interfere with those grains and decompose or reconfigure them, so Chris J made it memorize and identify specific grains configurations, and for the time being, Chris J was able to make it detect the poison that is used around here. It's like even with your eyes closed, if you touch it, you can tell it's a pumpkin, probably. It was both an easy to understand and a weird analogy, but she understood what Chris J was trying to say. Despite the way she spoke about it, it was very sophisticated it's like the mechanism of this world. It was as if she had touched on a part of it. Something small and invisible makes up everything in the world. An interesting idea no, it must be true if Chris J said so. She remembered the contents of the book she had read before. Chris J had read a book about the hypothesis that the world is made up of magical powers, right? A phenomenon that occurs when physical expansion or magic crystals are used. Objects were heated and moved without being touched. Matter is born from magical power, and that's why magical power can interfere with all kinds of things. Such a hypothesis was written in an old book. Hmm, you might be able to say that. Magic power becomes small particles, 
and small particles can become magical power. It's a story about whether magic power came first, or matter came first. Which came first, the egg or the chicken? Hum. Berry chuckled happily. When she was a little girl, she was thinking she wanted to do that kind of research. This is kind of fun, isn't it? Is it fun? Yes. I find it very interesting to learn about things I don't understand. Berry smiled. Chris J also smiled. Ehehe. Chris J also likes to learn new things. It's empathy. Equals together plus feeling. Fufu. It's the same. Berry stroked Chris's head that was hugging her tightly and looked at the magic crystal in her hand. The swaying geometric patterns were beautiful and vivid. The magic crystal's blue glow was so beautiful that it seemed to draw her in. Berry tied the string of the necklace around the back of her neck and let it hang. Berry didn't particularly like accessories, but this was something special. I will take good care of it. Thank you. Ehehe, it really suits Berry. Even if it was a simple compliment, it felt different when it came from Chris J. She gently kissed her forehead. Even as she felt tickly, Chris J was mew and pouted her lips. But it was a little big. It might get in the way of work. Should Chris J make it a little smaller? It's okay. It's not good to show off too much, so I usually keep it inside. Saying so Berry take the necklace from the neck to the inside. The necklace dropped into her abundant chest. Chris J stared at it and said with a serious face. It might be useful to use it like a pocket if you have a large chest hum. K. Krish Sama. Berry blushed and gave a wry smile. Chris J joyfully rubbed her cheek against Berry's breast, saying that she loved Berry's breasts because they were so soft. And shyly, Chris J raised her face. A about what Chris J was talking about earlier. Earlier? Mm, it's not just because Chris V E come to know what is pretty. Mm, well, Chris J want to do something about Berry and Celine arguing about choosing Chris J dresses every time. Oh, I see. Fufu, it's like a little playfulness. Berry chuckled and told Chris J doesn't it feel like peace? A dress is such a trivial thing, but it's wonderful to be able to argue with each other that this is good. When it comes to battle, you have to worry about life-threatening exchanges, but the only thing you lose in the dress quarrel is the desired Krishsama outfit. I'm sure Ojusama thinks it's fun to argue over such nonsense, and so do I. Therefore, there is nothing to worry about, Krishsama. Berry put her finger up and smiled saying don't worry. Berry spoke to Chris J to relieve her, thinking that she was probably worried because the exchange between the two, her sister and servant looks like a fight. Rather, Chris's concern was the breakfasts that would be lost because of it. Chris J was not at all worried about their quarrel, and Berry's explanation was completely off the mark. However, the Chris J aesthetic sense did not allow her to say shameless words such as Chris J want to do something about not being able to eat breakfast without roundabout ways. A, hey, uh, yes. Worrying about trivial things with all your strength, arguing. It's the most wonderful thing to be able to have this kind of leeway, and it's a time that can be obtained only because it's peaceful. Neither I nor the Ojusama hate each other, and after all it's just a little playful, so don't worry. We're not really arguing, okay? Chris J nodded as Berry gently stroked her head. As expected even Chris J did not think they were really fighting, but she knew agreeing with Berry here was also a worldly wisdom. Chris J couldn't say that she didn't like the fact that she was hungry because of the two of them, who were using all their strength for that playfulness. Especially if Berry was enjoying herself. Krish's first priority is to make Berry happy. Well, I feel like my victory has been decided this time, it's a bit disappointing. I is that so? As Chris J said, she convinced herself that if she decided on a dress first, there wouldn't be any problems after. This time, she would not go hungry on the day of the wedding. She was sure Celine would also quietly withdraw, and though Chris J thought Celine looked a little pitiful, for Chris J her own breakfast was more important. You know, it's absolutely ridiculous that Chris J, who holds the same position as a general, would be wearing a dress. As a nation, who are you going to show to? A soldier wearing a cute dress. Aren't you an idiot? Ojusama's personality of being so quick to criticize is, really. Even if Krishsama is wearing a splendid and pretty military outfit, people in other countries, not to mention fearing her, would look down on her. Rather than showing something inconsistent, 
isn't it obvious that it is much better to face the occasion in a dress as royalty? No matter what you do, she can't look like a brave general, so don't you think it would be much more appropriate for her to wear a dress that would raise the morale of the soldiers? It's not your hobby. Chris J is a warrior with the highest honorary title, Alberinia, in the kingdom. If it needs to be a dress, there's a dress that seems more like a warrior, isn't there? I return those back to Ojusama. Isn't that just a hobby of the Ojusama? Look, this is the dress that Krishsama chose for herself. Shouldn't we put the wishes of none other than Krishsama first here? That's why what you're doing is cowardly and insidious. Just because I'm busy with military duties, are you still a servant of the noble Christ and family like that? I am a servant of the Christ and family, but I am also a personal attendant of Krishsama, so my first and foremost priority is Krishsama. What do you mean cowardly? It is the role of a servant to do their master's bidding, and to call that role cowardly is a bit too much to ask, don't you think? Then I'll ask Chris J. Is that okay with you? You're not interested in my opinion, you don't need it. Hum. You you you. What a cowardly thing to do. Which one is the coward here? But the unexpected future shattered Chris's relief. Chapter 141. Meow meow. There was no particular substance to the unveiling ceremony. Congratulatory messages from various countries were read aloud for Queen Alberon's coronation, and appropriate gifts were received. Flowery phrases there was nothing more than a trivial exchange of rhetoric and superficiality. What was important was the conference that followed. In the meeting room of the royal castle, Queen Criscenta, High Priestess Zanalibia, Gulshan's Vice Chairman Oregon, Chancellor Crowless of the Kingdom of Eldorant, an Archbishop of the Western Empire, Elberbert were gathered around a rectangular desk. From other countries, they were the countries number two or number three. They were the ones who had the authority to decide the future of the country by their own will. Elberbert, who had no authority and was several ranks lower than the others, wiped away cold sweat as his face turned blue. It was as if he had been drawn the short end of stick line for the, the upper echelons of the country's face. This was a place for discussions between countries. Originally, a small item like Elberbert not a high priest who governs the parish of the western region, but a chief high priest or a cardinal should have been the one sitting here. Obviously, he would not have the right status to be present at such a place. Elberbert, as if he didn't feel comfortable and hoping for it to be over soon, behaved a little suspiciously and looked next to him. A small country in the southwestern part of the kingdom Clouser, the royal prince of Cusulan kingdom, which is far inferior to these four countries, was sitting there. However, should it be said as expected of royalty, he looked dignified even in this situation. There were no Elberbert companions here. However, your majesty, you say peace and peace, but if you say that, first of all, shouldn't you settle the barbaric acts of the kingdom so far? It was Gulshan's vice-chairman, Oregon, who opened his mouth. Crescenta looked at him. A vulgar face full of beards that resembles the mighty general of the south, Duglin Garka. He seemed more like a bandit than anything else. However, even though he looked like this, he was originally a member of the royal family, so it was surprising. Gulshan became a republic only about twenty years ago. Until then, it was a monarchy like Alberon, but for some reason, this man, despite being a member of the royal family, started a rebellion to correct the corruption of the royal family. As a result, the royal family was overthrown and a republic was established. Even after the republic was established, he took the position of vice-chairman, saying, me sitting in the chair is no different from me just usurping the throne. He's a weird person who Crescenta didn't really understand what he wanted. At any rate, for the time being Crescenta disliked him because of his loud voice. Twenty years ago during the civil war the northern territory that the kingdom plundered. The grief of the dispossessed people has not yet disappeared. What are your thoughts on that? Crescenta tilted her head as if troubled. That war was a request from the Gulshan royal family at the time. It was certainly not an invasion. Besides, the talk about that should have ended fifteen years ago with your country's acknowledgement. Acknowledgement? I see. Are you saying that was a legitimate discussion? A meeting that threatened military power against our weakened country? Oregon asked, as if challenging her. This was before Crescenta was born. How could she possibly know the details? Of course, 
It's about the generation before her. It's not like I have anything to say about it to the current queen. However, as the heir to the kingdom of Alberin, I think that before talking about peace, you should first settle the accounts that Alberin has done so far, that is if Her Majesty the Queen truly desires peace. Otherwise, even the people who were driven from their homes would not be able to be satisfied with it. Oregon's words were a clear threat. Crescenta parried it with a smile. I see. So, if I pay you, it will be fine? Crescenta continues, before the frowning Oregon could speak. No, right. The hatred and resentment that arises in battle is like that, they don't just disappear the next day that easily. Once you show your weakness, it's over. In diplomacy, you will only be preyed upon. It was necessary to always take advantage of the atmosphere and words of the place. Gulshan and Alberin have fought many wars over the years, all the resentments that arise from such killings cannot be resolved with a temporary amount of money, can they? Crescenta continued. If you go back a few decades further, that land belongs to the kingdom of Alberin. The people who were forced to flee their homeland, as you say, were destroyed and ruled by Gulshan in the time of your grandfather. We are repeating such things. Don't you think it's unproductive? Are you bring up things a thousand years ago next? Fufu, that's not it. Crescenta smiled happily. Oregon Sama's feelings for the people are wonderful but I think it will take a long time to resolve it. Oregon crossed his arms and looked into Crescenta's eyes, wondering what she wanted to say. If there are people who want to return to their homeland, and if that person is truly from the land, the kingdom will do its utmost to accommodate them. The southern part of the country is a rich land, and there are many projects to be undertaken, places to live and jobs to be found. We may not be able to recover what we have lost, but we can make a new home for ourselves. Crescenta looked back into his eyes and smiled more and more. Somehow, she had an arrogant smile on her face. The only things that will be needed after this are the cooperation of the two countries, and the time it takes for the hatred to fade away and get used to a new life. What do you think? If we put the people first, then this should not be a bad proposal for both countries. Of course, that is only with the proviso Oregon Sama genuinely wishes for peace. The young queen gleefully answered Oregon's words. She then sipped the sweet tea brewed by the red-headed servant Berry behind her. The young queen's words were half provocative, and the nobles present were startled, but what resounded was laughter that shook the room. Ha ha ha, my my, forgive me that was a rude question. Even though the queen is young she isn't disturbed and has dignity. Your majesty seems to be a very intelligent person. I beg your pardon. Don't mind it. I'm glad to hear you say so, Oregon Sama. Shaking her red glittering gold hair, the queen, like a fairy, had a soft smile on her beautiful face. Inwardly, she resisted the urge to cover her ears from the loud voice. The question was probably intended to gauge Crescenta. If Crescenta was merely an idealist afraid of war and willing to do as she was told and give money, he was willing to squeeze her before the war. It would be far more profitable than a costly war. After reducing the power of the country, they could then invade and take the land. Against that black lion. I was surprised when I heard that your majesty had defeated the Alberin's Grand Duke and assumed the throne, but I can understand. It looks like the future of the kingdom will be bright. As proof of that, Oregon ignored Crescenta's proposal by layering up flowery rhetoric. He had no intention of doing anything other than making an arrangement that puts Gulshan in advantage, and attacking Alberin was probably already half fact. Crescenta was not particularly concerned, and went along with it. Thank you. If peace can be brought to the kingdom in the future, I would like to make it reality. I can't let those words slide. Crolus, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Eldorant, intervened from the side. The old man played with his long beard and glared at Crescenta. It's as if anything that what disturbs the peace is from outside. Looking at history, it's clear which country will spread disaster to neighboring countries in any era. You mean Alberin? Yes. The word peace that Alberin speaks of is nothing but a preparatory period for its next invasion. Just how many times have we been burned by their words? Crescenta smiled, even as she thought what he said was absolutely correct. Although the kingdom of Eldorant called itself a kingdom, unlike the absolute monarchy of Alberin, 
it was more like a barbarian clan alliance. Rather than a feudal state, it was more of a confederation, with the powerful tribal chiefs serving as allies and calling themselves the kings of Eldorant. Once a king was decided, the chiefs of the tribes will be loyal to the king, but the relationship between the tribes is naturally not good, and civil wars were common. Furthermore, every time a king died, powerful tribes would fight over the next king and reducing each other's power, and Eve Time Alberin would always have on reason or another to seize their territory. You may be reciprocating my words, but in the western part of the kingdom, not a day goes by without hearing provocative border crossings and looting by the Eldorant army. If we heard such a report, we also have to deal with it. First of all, I would like to ask for your cooperation so as not to create a spark of war between our country. You are simply blaming our country for the raids of bandits. Of course, there is no way they would admit such a fact. Eldorant has a territory that is the same as the kingdom and extends to the mountains in the west, but it was probably due to such internal disputes that it fell one step behind the neighboring countries. Technically and culturally, they are civilized in their own way, but in her head they were uncivilized race. Barbarians. They were a group of bandits in the shape of a country, and a very annoying presence. However, the rich plains bordering the west have been taken by the kingdom, and all that remains were forests. Since most of Eldorant was forest, it was difficult to attack and destroy them, and the return for it was small too. That's why the country still exists, and Crescenta resented the previous kings, thinking that it would have been better if they had destroyed it before it became her generation. The current king was from the eastern part of the Eldorant and was naturally not favorable to Alberin. Looking at this prime minister's bullish appearance, it's certain that they would attack. In the end, both the south and the west were the same, there was no reason not to attack the kingdom. Elsren in the east had also sent a completely meaningless messenger, and it seems that there were no other incompetent people in the region. Thinking that it would be difficult to recover from this, Crescenta quickly gave up trying to avoid war, and hoped that this meeting would end soon. That queen is quite a masterpiece. Did you like it? Oh, I like it. I'll prepare for the army when I get back. Are you going to attack because you like it? But still, starting the preparation from now? A white corridor made of transmuted rock the tall and slender military chief Zalvag made an exasperated face at the words of Vice Chairman Oregon in the middle of the passage. A featureless face with nothing particularly worthy of note. Although he was in the position of chief of staff, Gulshan, the head of the military officer, Zalvag's face was lackluster. Originally, he was not a noble, but a commoner and a shoemaker. He joined the rebel side during the Civil War twenty years ago and rose through the ranks on the battlefield and become Oregon's assistant, and he was Oregon's most trusted military man. He was also accompanying us on this visit as the chief of the bodyguard. Although Oregon himself has no interest in power, Gulshan's government was based on his popularity. Putting aside his position as vice chairman, he was the de facto head of Gulshan, an existence that must never be lost. It was only natural that Chief Military Officer Zalvag would guard him with rigor. If you're going to attack, that Garka is the opponent. It would be good to prepare in term of several years. Duglin Garka. He was a fierce general who had defeated Gulshan many times. That man was the only one who can fight against wild animals such as elephants that much. Despite his impregnable formation, he did not lose his flexibility, for Gulshan, the first thing that comes to mind when speaking of the kingdom's army was that man. The reason why Oregon end the battle in northwestern Eldorant early after hearing of the recent civil war was unable to move despite actively looking for an opportunity was because Garka was watching the south without letting his guard down. He was a dangerous opponent to challenge with Eldorant's forces split. The reason why he took up Crescenta's invitation this time was partly because he wanted to see Crescenta once, but above all, it was to prepare the position of Gulshan. A country will not fully recover from the civil war in a few months or a year. Unlike mere warfare, all the wear and tear on both sides caused by a civil war puts a burden on the finances of the country. It was only natural that Gulshan, which originally had more strength, would have the upper hand, even if it was only for a few months. Before he left Gulshan, he was approached by the empire. Perhaps, unlike last time, this time it would be a joint operation. The same request had been made at the time of the previous empire invasion, 
but he had turned it down at the time because he felt uncomfortable as it seemed like an attempt to aim for when Garka was absent. Oregon knew nothing more exciting than a battle of life, death, and pride. He didn't want to resort to despicable mean as to strike Garka, whom he had chosen as a worthy opponent, from the back. Hmm. Oregon turned his attention to the courtyard. There was a large man and a beautiful silver-haired girl in a light blue dress. Hmm. This is. Ha ha ha. Isn't it beautifully crafted? This was made by the same craftsman who made Bogans, after being yelled at by the corps commander Melchikos a long time ago to at least pay attention to the armor. Kolkis was wearing his armor at the ceremony and happened to run into Krisje, who was waiting for Berry who was attached to Kriskenta. They talked a little while they waited. Krisje showed an interest in the heroic helmet, which was modeled after a tiger. Kolkis took off the helmet and showed it to her explaining its history. As you can see, it's a tig. Meow meow. Chris Che looked up with a twinkle in her eye. Eh he, it's a cat, isn't it? Berry likes it. Meow 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 right. Does Kolkis like it too? Hum. Ah, no, it's not a cat. It would certainly be nice to call Kolkis instead of call Commander a Grand. But, as a matter of fact, among the soldiers of the army, Nicknames that convey a sense of familiarity is popular right now. And nickname is it? Yes, look, like a skeleton. He he, Chris J nicknamed Skeleton. His face looked like a skeleton, right? All right. The only person who called Eliga by that horrible and unmentionable nickname was Chris J, and the nickname is only popular within Chris J, not the military. Kolkis took an extremely mature approach. Chris J wanted to give Kolkis who was going to work under Chris J, a nickname instead of calling by first name. Chris J couldn't quite think of it, but now it's suddenly come to Chris J. From now on, Chris J will call Kolkis Meow Meow. Ha! Core Commander Varkas is a woof woof. The atmosphere is a bit similar, right? It's very nice to call both woof woof and meow meow together. Besides, it's easy to say. Hop hop while making a small jump. Chris J was in a very good mood. Krish's overflowing smile, which had never been seen since their first encounter, had the power to make Kolki, who was known for his bravery, flinch. Here, Krish will return Meow Meow's helmet. Chris J stretched out, took a small leap, and placed the heroic helmet in the shape of a tiger on Kolshus's head, and Chris J nodded repeatedly, as if satisfied. Kolki's glanced at the pond on his side, and saw the reflection of the giant man in armor. The body of a warrior, covered in muscle and steel armor. That's meow meow. It was insanity. I see, so this is how Assistant Marshal Farron and Granmeld were done in by this. I won't make the same mistake. Kolkis uttered as if he was in a hurry. Enno, please wait Krishsana, did that nickname is as expected. Hum, is someone coming? Is it an acquaintance of meow meow? But Krish's interest was already elsewhere. The sound of a sweet voice calling out him, meow meow, that naturalness seemed to Kolkis as if to indicate that it was irreversible. N.N., the person who came to the conference just now, right? Gulshan's vice-chairman Oregon? As expected, his physique was inferior to that of Kolkis, but it could be said that he is still a sufficiently large man. A middle-aged man with a beard walked in a dress that looks like as if his muscles were going to burst. Oh, this is a face I've seen before. Chris stands. It's Corps Commander Agrand, Vice Chairman. Kolkis immediately straightened and clicked his heels. He folded his hands behind his waist to indicate that he meant no harm when addressing foreign dignitaries. That's right, Chris stands Corps Commander. It's been a long time ago, so my memory is vague. But then, people like you are not so easily forgotten at a glance. While watching Kolkis, Chris J slightly lifted her skirt and bowed. She looked like a princess and had a graceful appearance. You wouldn't think that it's the devil who had just tried to force her subordinate to be called Meow Meow until just now. If I'm not wrong, you were the on next to Her Majesty the Queen. It's Chris J. Alberinia Kristansama. Kolkis answered without hesitation. Chris J. did not mind, but it is a rule that royalty do not name themselves. In this way, it was natural for someone by her side to introduce her and for the time being Kolkis was treating Chris J as a member of the royal family. He was also a little uneasy about letting the VIPs of other countries speak to Chris J. 
Alberinia, who was the woman standing next to Queen Crescenta, there was no introduction, and everyone was wondering about it. The queen had an older sister, and rumor had it that she was the hero who had defeated the generals who had sided with Guildenstein in the Civil War, and had cut him down. Everyone thinks that could it be, but no one could openly ask anyone about it. It was the height of rudeness and impoliteness in any country to ask for the names of royalty. Basically, they had no choice but to find out the name beforehand or wait for the other side to introduce it to them, as they are doing now. It was usual for the other party to took care to avoid embarrassing the guest. Rinia was an honorary title that indicates a knight of the kingdom, and Alberinia, an unfamiliar title that was probably taken from the name of the kingdom. This was exactly what this girl was. She had a doll-like expressionless face, and only the purple eyes that were observing him were shining inorganically. No affection, no cheerful smile. She looked like Crescenta but was nothing like her, with a somewhat chilling beauty the magical power she wore could be described as serene. An extension of the body imaginary muscles with magical power. He frowned when he noticed that it was already deployed. He wondered if she was wary of him, and intuitively sensed that was not it. There was no tension in her stance, no muscle tension or strain. She must have always been that way on a daily basis. It was a frightening concentration and stability. It is very difficult to handle magic on a daily basis. A force that was too strong compared to that of the body putting aside if it was on the battlefield, it was difficult to make even the slightest adjustments. Oregon was half skeptical when he heard rumors of another Alberin princess. The sword princess who had defeated the ever victorious and undefeated Oregon Hilkintos and the black lion Guildenstein Alberin all while losing Bogan Christand, the kingdom's hero whose name had made its mark even in Golshan. When he looked, it was a girl who was less than fifteen. A battlefield is not sweet enough for such a girl to dance on it. Because he knew the battlefield better than anyone else, Oregon doubted it. He thought that she was most likely trying to take the credit for the victory. However, when he saw the girl in front of him, he felt that it was not impossible. The girl's appearance was so strange that it gave Oregon an indescribable sense of uneasiness. She was different from any warrior he had ever seen. Nor was she oppressive like Kolki's. A tingling sensation down his spine it was the same feeling that he had felt as a child when he was up close and personal with a captured magical beast. The fear that came from instinct. I see, Alberinia, if one look closely, one'll understand. It seems like the rumors are true. Oregon held out his right hand. Chris J looked at it curiously and held out her hand a little reluctantly. Like his face, the back of his hand was hairy. It looked filthy. As a fellow warrior, I am honored to be able to meet you like this. We may meet again someday in the not-too-distant future. Ha, huh, thank you very much. With her right hand being help, Chris J bowed lightly while thinking about how to kill him if he attacked. Fundamentally, she didn't like handshakes that take away the freedom of one hand, and his hands were also hairy and slightly sweaty. It was filthier than normal. Already inside Chris J., Oregon's evaluation was leaning towards dislike. As soon as he let go of her hand, Chris J. immediately picked up a handkerchief and gently wiped her hand. Oregon didn't care, but the faces of cautious and military chief Zalvag were perturbed. It was so rude and extremely disrespectful. In some cases, it was a rudeness that could develop into an international problem. Nonetheless, Chris J. was a self-proclaimed good-natured girl in her mind, it was a logical etiquette to wash your hands after touching something dirty, and it was rather a clean and sensible manner. Rudeness that was not in her knowledge did not count for her. Without questioning anything, she carefully cleanses every corner of her right hand that she shook hands with. Kolkis and Zalvag looked at her dumbfounded. Gulshan has a variety of beasts that cannot be seen in the kingdom. In that case, by all means, I would like to show it to Alberinia. Hmm. Thank you. It was a declaration of war of some sort, but Chris J tilted her head, simply wondering if it was that kind of greeting. He said he'll show her all sorts of beasts, so she should say thank you for now. That was the extent of his understanding. He did not understand that he was saying, see you on the battlefield in a roundabout way. Well then, see you later. Let's go Zalvag. However, unaware that Chris J did not understand his meaning at all, Oregon walked briskly 
flipping his cloak as if to say that he had already declared war. Zalvag soon followed. Look, Salvag. That's a monster to be reckoned with. That's certainly amazing. Something like shaking hands and suddenly wiping it with a handkerchief. Chem. No, it's nothing. Did you like that one too? I like it. Cuckoo, isn't the kingdom interesting? This sure is getting exciting. Laughing like a beast, Oregon smiled like a beast. What's wrong? Meow meow. No, no, it's the same as the name, but that's bad. Wiping your hands suddenly after shaking hands. Chris J, want to keep Chris's hands clean. And no, it's not like that. It took him half a koku to convince Chris J that it was rude to wipe your hands after shaking hands. Chapter 142, Royal Palace Incident. For example, you can't kill the skirmisher with only heavily armed infantry. They will not be able to catch up with the lightly armed infantry, and they will be unilaterally swatted to death. However, skirmishers alone cannot resist cavalry. They have no armor to protect them when pressed at speed and in hand-to-hand -hand combat. However, the cavalry cannot kill infantrymen with spears. Even if they plan to charge using their speed and weight, the tip of their spear will pierce the horse itself. Each one is in a three-way deadlock, and that's why the army has everything. Cavalry against enemy skirmishers. Hit the opponent's cavalry with spears, and shoot arrows at spears. But the Black Flag Special Force was both a horse and a spear. They already have both at a very high level, and if one-sided shooting from a distance was added, there was nothing that could counter them. Outside the walls of Albanaria, the Black Flag Special Forces were training at a large-scale training site built there. The Black Flag Special Forces training site was basically in a corner of the training grounds, on the side of the city walls. A corner surrounded by trees that can hardly be called a forest was allocated for their training. In the grove, the spears thrown by the Black Flag Special Force soldiers pierced through the trees and thundered, and the crackling of the bowstrings echoed here and there. How are things going, Bald Eagle? How's the training going? No problem. It's going very well. Krishsama, Galansama. Galen, accompanied by Krishche, looks at the situation with interest. They had been on a tour, seeing the corps, and this is the last one. It was the first time he had seen Black Flag Special Force training, which was basically under Krish's direct control, and everything felt new. Although it was a training for new recruits, there was no sign of any basic training, such as marching in formation or defending formations. It's probably because their names have become known due to their success in the Civil War. The recruits sent by the selection team are all full of motivation, saying they were selected as the most elite of the kingdom. Hum, that's good. That looks like spear-throwing training, but what you have is a little different. The roar of gouging trees echoed from earlier. What the Black Flag Special Forces soldiers grabbed and threw at the tree was a dull shiny iron bar, the handle was wrapped in linen, but the whole body seemed to be made of iron. It's just a bar of iron. Ordinary spears will break a lot and the expense isn't light, so Krishsama said she would think about something. Mia. Oh, yes. Mia grabbed the iron rod that was standing around and brought it to Galen, and presented it to him. Galen who received it instantly put his strength and endured it. It was too heavy for Galen who didn't handle magic. Are you throwing something this heavy? Magic possessors have physical abilities sure are different. I can't throw it at all. Galen returned the iron spear to Mia in amazement. The girl, who was much smaller and more delicate than Galen, received it lightly and bowed her head. It's probably due to the amount of magical power she was born with. Her sword skills aside, Mia was one of the best in the squad. Haha, ha, even among us, there are only a handful of people who can throw this properly. Rather than throwing javelin training, it's more apt to say that what we're doing here is mastering body manipulation. Although slender, the iron was nearly 6 shaku, 1.8 m, long. It's not something that can be thrown with human strength, and it's not even easy to swing around. Only by manipulating the body using magical power and stabilizing the body, will this iron spear fly to the target for the first time. Most of the people training with this iron spear here are new recruits, and the main purpose was to teach them how to use their imaginary muscles and bodies. Once they learned how to use their bodies without relying on their physical muscles, they could apply it to their actual spear-throwing and sword-fighting training. 
Since the number of personnel has increased from the century, Chris J would like to train them to be able to do various things other than hand-to-hand -hand combat. Archers. Yes. Kuro Fuyo often acts independently, so Chris would like to be able to coordinate actions in the core from a distance. Chris J heard from Meow Meow that Ojasama used to do that. Meow Meow? It's Kolkis. Galen's eyes widened at the words, then paused for a moment and laughed merrily. Cuckoo. Kolkis is Meow Meow. I see. It's a very pleasant name if you look at it together with his appearance. Ehehe. That's right, Ojasama. Chris J thinks Meow Meow is a really good nickname. Hearing the name Meow Meow given to his former subordinate Kolkis, Gaolen laughed happily and petted Chris's head. Gaolen had no problem with the terrible, punishment-like name given to Kolkis. What his cute grandchild would do. Gaolen is strict with himself and others, but he makes an exception for Chris J. Chris J, who thought she'd been complimented, snuggled up to Gaolen and happily relaxed her cheeks. She was in a good mood, saying, Ojasama understands me very well, after all. What ensued was a negative spiral. Seeing her grandfather's reaction, Chris J becomes more and more confident that her naming sense was not so bad after all. With a hopeless naming sense, a mysterious confidence and the power of Alberinia, Chris J was like a sudden natural disaster, with increasing threat day by day. Bald Eagle. Dagra looked at Mia beside him with pity for the new victim, Kolkis, and any future victims. Swoosh swoosh Mia shook her head as if to say, it's not my fault. It was Kalua who was at fault, and certainly not me. It's too unreasonable to be blamed for this. Certainly, there was such a thing. During the withdrawal battle, I gathered the defeated soldiers and created a temporary fire support unit. It was when he was leading Bogan and his men. At that time, they lost the battle due to the general's incompetence, were heavily pursued by the enemy, and had no choice but to leave the rest to luck. In that case, Gaolen thought of avenging the commander of the enemy pursuit force. For he could see that the enemy was complacent about victory. Gaolen sent Bogan and his men on a run to gather the remnants of the defeated army, thus creating a small force of spear throwers and archers. If spears and shields create the balance in warfare, ranged weapons create the advantage, an advantage so decisive in a small battle that a one-sided attack can decide the outcome. Even if the whole army has an advantage of 2,000 more soldiers against 10,000 enemies, nothing will change, but the difference that was bought when just 20 people cut off 100 enemies in front of them has a tremendous impact on the soldiers of the enemy and allies. In a battlefield where more than 10,000 lives collide, it was trivial, but the only thing anyone can feel is the superiority and inferiority created by the dozens of people around them. People with low morale were given spears, and as spear throwers, and they were forbidden to engage hand-to-hand. -hand. Even a poorly thrown javelin, a cavalry that is chasing them is a huge target. Above all, it was important to have a huge amount of it. Using themselves as bait, they would stand in front of the enemy and fire a volley of shots at the point where the enemy was lured into a charge. Cut the advantage in this way, and attack the disturbed enemy. While it is a strong shield, it also possesses decisive breakthrough power I see, and after that, if you have archers who can create an advantage, there will be no gaps. What Chris Che was trying to create in the Black Flag Special Forces was a mini-army. Since the Black Flag Special Forces are all magic possessors they are the best infantry and they also serve as powerful cavalry. Add in the ability to shoot from a distance to create an even greater advantage, and no enemy will be able to oppose them. The problem with Kurofuyo is that they're generally terrible with the sword, so Chris J wanted a way to unilaterally defeat an opponent who Kurofuyo lost to purely combat ability. A lot died in the last fight after all. I'm sorry. If I had been a little resourceful, I might have been able to reduce the damage a little more. It's not Ojasama's fault. Chris J heard from Selene that Ojasama was doing a great job. While acting as commander of the whole and bringing the whole to a stalemate, he personally killed five people who were magic possessors in a sense, Galen achieved the greatest military results as someone without magical power. There was no one in the world who could blame the old man. For Chris J, much like Berry, she was a kind grandfather who taught her many things and who always gave her love. Even if her mouth was torn, she could not blame Galen, the admirable Ojasama she respected in short, just like her grandfather, his grandchild, 
who was both moderately strict with herself and others, was very lenient with her grandfather. Don't make that face. Krishsama isn't blaming you. Yes. Dagra smiled as he hit Mia, who was depressed by Krish's words, on the head. There was damage. Many died. But even in such a harsh battlefield, it's because you played your part that the squad survived, and now it's being reorganized like this. If you look like that, it's an insult to those who died under your command. It is your role to reflect on your experiences, but not to regret them, and to aim to be an even better commander than you are now. Be proud of yourself. Dagra said and looked at Chris J. Seeing Mia's despondent face, Chris J., who seems to have gotten the message, pondered for a moment and then says, Hmm. Chris J. was a little worried that Mia would wipe out the squad, so the result is still better if you think that way. Mia did her best to the extent that Chris J. could give a 3 on a 10-point scale, so Chris J. isn't angry. THR 3 out of 10. The usual Mia is about 1.5 points, so considering that it's enough. Chris J. nodded. Mia was even more shocked. I I'll do my best. Galen, who was listening, chuckled and patted Chris J. on the head. Chris J. sure is though. But from what I've seen, it was a good command. Just like Dagra said, be proud of yourself. There is no such thing as a battle without reflection. Learn from the experience one by one and connect it to the next. You still have a long way to go. Yes, thank you. Galansama. Mia bowed her head happily. After finishing the conversation in a light-hearted manner, the next step was to go to archery training. Originally used for hand-to-hand -hand spears, the bow made of hard and sticky Arjana wood was 4 Shaku, 1.2M, compared to the 8, 2.4M, Shaku longbow commonly used in the military, it was relatively short, and good maneuverability was prioritized over range. Even among the archers, the bows were from a special unit, and they were provided on a loan basis. About fifty of the soldiers were training here. What are you doing? Kalua. There was Kalua crouching down, holding her right breast. Ah, no, she said she wanted to try it, so I lent her a bow, but it seems the string hit her in the chest. A soldier from the archery battalion next to Kalua answered Krish's question. The cause was probably that she was holding a long bow, as opposed to a short bow with a short drawstring. Kalua, who had been crouching, stood up with tears streaming down her eyes. Ah, uh, it hurts, it's not a normal pain. Idiot. Uwa, uncool. Kalua frowned as Mia continued after Chris J showing her agreement. Unlike Mia, I have breasts after all. I think it's really rude to say that. Ah, I wouldn't have felt this pain if I had a chopping board with a flat chest like Mia's. This, this. Certainly, even if Mia failed, it doesn't seem like it will hit her chest. You 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 you. Chris J nodded, comparing Kalua's ample chest to Mia's lanky bosom. The other soldiers also looked at Mia's chest and agreed. Mia's face turned bright red and she glared at the soldiers. Gao Len smiled wryly and stroked his chin. Well, that's one of the reasons we don't have female hunters. It would be a hindrance to drawing a bow. Once you get used to it, it won't be a problem but... Bows and breasts were not a good match. While ample breasts were often favored as nurturing good children, they were only a hindrance when it comes to the hunter. In particular, female apprentice hunters, who learn from their masters from an early age, are often unable to draw a bow as a result of physical growth, just like the division of labor that gradually took place in the village of Kalka. Although it was possible by shooting a bow in the correct stance, it was not always possible to do so especially on the hunting grounds or battlefield, it is not always possible. In archery, which requires concentration, breasts were not a benefit. However, a breast hit is a matter of stance and skill. Show me your stance. A. Hey, why yes. Kalua felt like she never wanted to touch a bow again, but it was Galen, the general's adjutant, who told her directly. She held the bow and arrow in her hand and lightly pulled the string. Don't try to pull it with your arms. Open your shoulders and be conscious of using your back. It's a bow that even this old man can pull. Yes, I'll like this. Well, you have always had good posture, so just be natural. If you try to pull with your arms because you have the strength, it will collapse and your stance will shake, and as a result the string will move unexpectedly. Gal then manually fine-tuned Kalua's arms and shoulders, 
and although the soldiers who were looking at him enviously, Kalua couldn't afford to worry about that in front of Galen's serious face. Only Mia was giving the soldiers a look of disdain. Turn your body as it is. That's the basic posture of the upper body without moving it. Yes. Kalua let go of the string and it was as if the target, which was made of a simple piece of wood, sucked the arrow knot, but it was thrust near the center of the target. Kalua, who was a little nervous, let out a voice of admiration, as if surprised herself. Gaolen smiled happily and patted her on the head. That's good. Don't forget the feeling. Why yes, thank you very much. Kalua looked up at Gaolen, a little embarrassed wondering how long it's been since she's been hit on the head like this. With roughly stretched grey hair even though he was old, his face was masculine, and he had a calm charm. She nodded her head, evaluating that he must have been very popular in his younger days. Ehehe, this is what Chris J wanted my Ojasama to see. Chris J had Gain's Archer Battalion come to see but, Chris J was wondering if Ojasama could give out some good advice. Chris J could teach them, but Chris J is not very good at teaching other people so. If you keep your body straight like this, if you release it with your body like this, it will fly straight Chris's explanation was very intuitive. Naturally, it was unpopular with the soldiers. I see. If it is a bow, then surely there is something I can teach you. I'll think about it. There was no way he could refuse a request from his adorable grandchild. Gao Len responded with a friendly old man's face. Chris J happily took Galen's arm, and Kalua, who was watching such a situation, suddenly looked up at the sky. The sun was already slightly tilted. Normally, Chris J would have been happily returning to the estate. Even so, it sure is rare for Yuzaja chan to show up at this time of the day. Because Berry has been with Crescenta all this time, dinner is a little late. Ah, the conference hum. Yes, it seems that everyone will finally return tomorrow. The conference itself is over, but not all the people who came here have returned to their countries. By setting up a place for private discussions and having dinner, naturally Crescenta needs to show up here and there as a companion. As expected, Crescenta asked her not to put Anne in such a situation, so Berry was always present as her attendant. Elvina can't help because she's busy with Krish's errands. The lack of servants was a problem in such a situation, even if it was not a problem in everyday life. I see, it seems like I've heard some good news. A youthful voice. The two men who emerged from the bushes were an old, one-armed soldier and a beautiful young man. Aleha Sarchenka approached Chris J, sword in hand, and smiled. Chris J did the exact opposite, taking a step back from him and looking away from him. I heard Chris Sama was coming, and I was wondering if Chris be willing to join me for a spa but, I'm glad it seems Chris Sama has some time today. You. Since then, Aleha has been earnestly wishing for a match at every opportunity. To Chris J it was bothersome and she had escaped using one reason or another, but today she had said it. Chris J told him while her eyes were swimming. Koo Chris, seems like I have something to do today. Ah, Beberry might be back soon and Chris will need to prepare the food. I see. But it's a rare opportunity for me as well, it's okay, it won't take much time. Please. Can I ask you to join me for a spa? Chris J made excuses, but the enemy was no different. Aleha, who already understood Chris's character, boldly pushed. She was a person who found things to be troublesome, but he knew that she was basically incapable of refusing requests from others. In order to improve the skills of these unskilled subordinates, I would like to receive guidance from Chris Sama. G guidance. It was the killing sentence. He was saying that a subordinate under her direct control wanted to ask for guidance from her. Chris J, a self-proclaimed serious and hard-working person, could not easily refuse the request. Teach that, ah, uh, just one time, okay? Twice or three times is no good, okay? Yes. I promise you, at the very least, until the sun goes down. Hum. Mm. Just one time. Now, come on. Please prepare yourself. He made no promises, but she couldn't ask any more questions with his sword at the ready. Chris J turns to him, still feeling unconvinced. It was a time like that when they were having such a silly exchange. Chris Sama, running toward them was a man with one arm and a prosthetic hand nugger of the crafts team. Chris J frowned and put her hands on her hips. Nugger, 
Chris J told you not to wear the prosthetic arm outside yet, right? I'm sorry, it's urgent. Urgent. Please go back immediately. Berry Sama. Ha, the boring discussion is finally over. Fufu, thank you for your hard work. Berry smiled at Crescenta who pricked her lips as she walked through the corridors of the royal castle. In fact, Crescenta was so busy with personal meetings with dignitaries from various countries that she had no time to catch her breath, so it seemed inevitable that she was fed up with it. In his spare time, he read and signed various documents one of the reasons why she was so busy was that she wanted to spend the night with Chris J, but the schedule until the sun went down was so busy that it would not be strange for her to collapse. The reason why she can do it was probably because she had a genius brain that could easily find solutions to any difficult problem. Her diligence in government affairs, coupled with her insistence on perfection, made her look like a great ruler, and Berry was more than happy to see that. If the people are impoverished, it would affect the country's finances and development. Therefore, she wanted to provide a better life and livelihood for her people. Her logic was always based on numbers, not good intentions or conscience. However, she hates luxuries as waste, and in some cases, selling royal treasures for the people and giving alms to them is something that should be called her a wise ruler, and at least Berry was proud of that figure. A little peace, a little happiness. What this girl wished for was the same thing that Berry loves from the bottom of her heart something purer than anyone else in this world. Berry's face breaks into a smile, knowing that if it's like this it would be all right. The whole discussion is over. Tomorrow, all the messengers from other countries will now return to their countries. The little queen has done her job, and Berry's job is to give this girl some peace. I'll go ahead and prepare tea in the room. I'd like to have some cookies, too. Yes, of course. Crescenta had some business to attend to, but it did not require Berry. In such cases, Berry always prepared the room ahead of time. She prepares milk, boils water, lights the fireplace in the room, and examines today's tea leaves. More than anything else Berry loved the time and effort of doing this for someone else. With a joyful smile on her face, she grabbed some milk from the kitchen of the royal castle and headed for the office. Intruder. After him. However, when she approached Crescenta's office, that voice resounded. The guards that should always be there in front of the office weren't there, and Berry frowned at the odd situation. The voice that echoed was a long way ahead, at least not in this area, but listening to the footsteps, they were probably chasing someone. There was a flurry of noise coming from the end of the corridor. Perhaps the guards had also followed the intruder, in any case, it was not a good situation. She tried to hide herself in the office for the time being, but, ah, there was a visitor. She was a female servant who she remembered seeing several times in the royal castle. Did she escape on the spur of the moment, just as I did, even so it's strange. The inner lock was not locked, and she was somehow by the tea set. The moment she saw Berry, she looked frightened and separated from the tea set. I am sorry, when I saw a strange man running, I rushed to Her Majesty's room. Was it something she thought of on the spur of the moment? It was unnatural. There was always a guard standing in front of the office. If a suspicious person came running in front of the office, they would surely be there. Usually, you won't bother to hide yourself in the office, but behind them. She saw the guards disappear from in front of the office and went inside. It made more sense to think so. A slight disturbance in the placed tea utensils Berry didn't overlook it. She took out the magic crystal given to her by Chris J from her chest and brought it closer. A tingling sensation of numbness was conveyed from the faintly emitting magic crystal. Yes. Chris J gathered the poison that exists around here and made poison pyrurin that reacts to poison. It's easy to use. Just bring it closer and let the magic flow, then it will sound piripiri. Berry sighed and told the bewildered woman, If you are willing to turn yourself in now, I will petition Her Majesty the Queen to spare the lives of you and your relatives. From your appearance, I don't think this is something you did willingly. Exclamation point. The woman paled at those words and shuddered. To attempt the life of royalty, the death penalty of dismemberment is handed down. Even relatives are implicated and hanged, the most severe punishment imaginable. A servant who has worked in the royal castle for many years, there's no way she's a person working behind the scenes. 
and it's not like she didn't understand the weight of their sins. She probably did this because someone threatened her. Therefore, please turn yourself in. I am not. I swear to this name what I just said. Her Majesty the Queen is a kind person, so I'm sure she will understand. Surely this woman would be dismembered if she did not plead for her life. Crescenta's innocence makes her the most ruthless girl, yet she believed that if she asked sincerely, she would be granted her wish. The woman trembles with fear, her tears covering her face. Barry approached her slowly so as not to frighten her. It's all right, please calm down. The one who should be punished is the one who made you do it now sit over there. She knew there is malice in the world. However, Berry did not doubt that everything was so, rather she was a person who believed in humans' goodness. That's precisely why it could be said that what it invited was a tragedy. She believed that the other party would believe her words. Ah. She didn't. She realized that after the blade pierced her abdomen. T there's no way I'll be forgiven. Clutching the blood-soaked knife, with her face stiffened with fear, the woman screamed and turned her body. T there's no way that cursed child will let me live. Berry reacted to the words she heard and grabbed her arm as her face contorted in her pain. Hi. And slammed the woman's body into her floor, knocking her unconscious, but until there. She fell down on top of the unconscious woman and squats down holding her stomach regretting her carelessness. Chris J. Sama. The only thing that came to her in her hazy mind was the face of her beloved girl. Chapter 143, Royal Capital of Blood. The doctor stood up and looked at Crescenta and Selene. For the time being, there's nothing more that can be done. Your Majesty the Queen has dealt with it well, and I've done all I can, but whether or not she can make it through tonight we can only pray. Thank you. You may go. Understood. Then please excuse me. Lying on the bed was a red-haired servant. She was unconscious, just asleep. At her side, Cliché just looked at her face. And Anne Elvina watched the doctor get up and leave, and Crescenta looked at her sister's expressionless face. M. Wanisama. Until now Crische hadn't said a single word. She just caressed Berry's cheek as she slept. The woman had been caught. She doesn't seem to know anything, but I'll soon find and catch the one who did this. So, ah, Crescenta had a frightened look on her face. It was none other than Berry who had been stabbed. She didn't know what her sister would do. The knife contained a deadly poison called a drop one night. It is a well-known poison in its own right, and Crescenta also had the antidote in her possession. Crescenta rushed to the scene and immediately made a judgment based on the symptoms, and gave him first aid, but poison is not something you can let your guard down. Rather, it's more likely that Berry will die at this rate. In the first place, the poison was aimed at Crescenta, and in a sense, the cause was her own. That's why Crescenta was afraid of her older sister. Krish's purple color glanced at Crescenta. Crescenta's body stiffened. It's okay, Crescenta. Berry won't die, Chris J said to the frightened Crescenta and stroked her head. Chris J puts her hand on Berry, seemingly oblivious to the confused Crescenta. At that moment a pale magic surged out from her hand. Celine's eyes widened and Crescenta frowned. What emerged from Krish's hand was a geometric pattern of magical power. It was similar to the technique used to engrave magic crystals, the main difference being the unusual density of the patterns, and that it was being drawn in midair. Lines and lines that emit a bluish-white light drew arcs and acute angles, crossed each other, and were connected. The pattern that was drawn grew at an accelerated rate and filled the room. Celine, and and the others had no idea what was happening, and only Crescenta understood the meaning of the patterns created by her older sister what it meant. The magic that covered the room converged, and a blue-gray sphere enveloping the bed a semi-transparent sphere was created on the spot. Chris J, what are you? Before Celine, who could not hide her surprise, could ask, the staggering Chris J collapsed on the spot. Crescenta immediately supported her. Wanisama drew a formula in the air. Engraving the formula on her own magic, the principle is the same as the magic crystal. Holding her mouth as if she was nauseated, Chris J wrinkled her eyebrows and shook her body. The reason she seemed so weak compared to usual was probably because she had spit out all the magic from her body. 
The amount of magic released in that instant was so huge that it could not be compared to the physical strengthening. Suspension, stagnation, immobility, maintenance, that's about all the formula Crescenta could read. However, when she saw Berry wrapped in a sphere, she could understand what had happened. The breathing that had taken place until just before was gone. Berry's chest didn't move up and down, and it seemed as if she was dead. But no. Even the tiny dust particles floating in the air stopped inside. It wasn't just as if, but literally time had stopped. Wanisama probably stopped time. Time. Serene approached and reached for the sphere. There it was, hard and smooth as glass. It's a strange feeling, like there's an invisible wall. Crescenta. Crescenta was embraced by Chris J with a weak force. Without her magical power, Chris J was nothing more than a little girl as just she looked. Just a bit. Uh. Her magic power was sucked up from the part where it made contact, a strange sensation. Crescenta did not resist and let Chris J do as she wanted. Soon it was over and Chris J took a deep breath and raised herself up. Chris J cut out that space and made it a different space. With this, the berry won't die. Different space. It would be too long to explain in detail but... Chris J said and looked at Elvina. Chris will do something about it during this time. Elvina, please help. Help, is it? What should I do? We're going to do some research in the archives. Let's do what we can for now. And, please make dinner. Why yes, I understand. And nodded while correcting her posture even though she was confused. Chris's word, who they thought would be more shaken than anyone else, was so clear that even the confused and recovered from her powerful words. Celine and the others are fine as usual. Chris J will take care of everything, so don't worry about it. Even if you say so. Is there anything I can help you with? Hmm. Please take care of Jaragasha and Chris's army for now. Saying that, Chris J quickly left the room. Elvina soon followed her, and Celine and Crescenta looked at Berry sleeping. Even if you say to do what we can, we have no choice but to leave it to Wanisama until she is satisfied. Crescenta sat down in her chair and breathed deeply. Then she looked at the sphere and narrowed her eyes. If it's possible, Wanisama will definitely try it. Rather, if we don't let Wanisama, we wouldn't know what will happen in the future. Seems so, hum. I wonder if Argansama knows how important her body is to the kingdom. Now matter to think she would get herself stabbed, how imprudent. While glaring at the sleeping berry, Crescenta stood up. Selene Sama, just do as Wanisama said. I have a little something to do, so I will excuse myself. Okay, I understand. Please be careful. Who do you think you are talking to? Crescenta pouted her lips and left the room. The escorts, Killick, were waiting outside the mansion, but and followed them in a hurry to see them off. Left alone, Celine sat on the bedside chair, covered her face and sighed. I guess I'm the one who's the most upset when you're like this. How pathetic hum, Berry. Then, as if to hold back the tears in her eyes, she pressed both of her palms over her eyelids. In the basement of the royal castle, there is a prison where criminals, including royalty, who cannot be shown to the public, were held. It had not been used for a long time, but this was where the woman was currently being held. Dargris, you didn't lay your hand on her, right? Yes, your majesty. Roland's former spy. Dargris was now the queen's eye and limbs. The underground people who have been used in the royal palace for a long time basically have various ties and troubles. The man who Crescenta ordered for her personal errands was basically this man who seems to have pledged allegiance to Chris J. Crescenta was satisfied with Dargris, who was not greedy and had no shortage of ability as a secret agent. Why your majesty, forgive me, f forgive me. The woman tied to the chair trembled at the sight of Crescenta, and Crescenta smiled. Well, well, to think you did the most troublesome thing possible. I'm a pretty mild person, but this time I'm pretty angry. Hi. I've been thinking about how to hurt you and kill you, but I'm not into vulgarity, so I'm going to keep it simple this time. The woman's features were relatively well-groomed. Many perverts would be happy if she ordered them to torture her, but that's not Crescenta's hobby. Considering that the more people she used, the more trouble she would need to deal with, it was best to do it in secret. 
why this woman wanted to kill her, there were too many reasons that came to mind, and she was not particularly interested in that. She won't spit out much information even when tortured. The one that was used was a drop one night, this well-known poison was too popular, and it was difficult to pinpoint the route to obtain it perhaps it was used precisely because of that. She was a royal servant, and the number of nobles she interacted with on a daily basis was enormous. It is unlikely that the culprit on the other side of several layers of cushions could be identified from this woman's testimony. In short, this was pointless torture. For Crescenta, this was a relatively unusual action. Killing her would have been the end of it she didn't even need to dirty her own hands but in this case, if she didn't she won't be able to settle down. At least this woman did the worst thing she could do. The woman's hands were spread out on the table. Crescenta picked up a hammer from the tools Dargris had prepared and smiled at the woman. Then, she suddenly slammed the hammer down on the woman's finger. Her fingertips were shattered along with her nails and bones, and a loud scream erupted. Crescenta frowned as the sound reverberated through the prison, and the woman begged for forgiveness, saying that she will tell her everything. Crescenta smiled and gagged her. Don't worry. I'm not interested in the information that comes out of your mouth. You probably don't know much anyway, and it's pointless to ask. It's your role to feel pain until I'm refreshed and tired of it, and then die. Crescenta had no hesitation. After she gagged her, she swung the hammer down and crushed her fingers as naturally as she would massage it. She did not have the proper nerve to have her conscience pricked at the thought of hurting someone else. The Duke of Arcasacos, I suppose. But still, it's a little sloppy. Certainly, it's a little strange. It's like asking to be killed. It's also possible that the threat didn't work but... Dargris responded to Crescenta, who naturally opened her mouth while crushing the woman's fingers. He already knew that the lovely princess, who seems wouldn't even kill an insect, was in fact a deviant. Simple, as she had said, the torture of crushing her fingers was also something her was familiar with from years of experience, and Dargris did not particularly care. Dargris was also crazy to the extent that he could eat while torturing people. I wonder if the method was a bit naive. After all, it might have been better to kill him early. Above all, Argensama. After crushing the fingertips of her left hand, she moved on to the woman's right hand. She sighed while making a pleasant sound. If Wanisama goes to your place, cooperate as much as possible. Regardless of what happens later, it's fine. If you disobey, you will probably be killed. Wanisama is furious right now. To disobey. I understand the terror of that lady firsthand. Dargris recalled her appearance in an alley in Kaluaren and said that. It was mere suicide to make an enemy of Chris J. And Dargris had no suicidal thoughts. In a sense, it seems like it will make the job a lot easier. No questions asked. I'm a little disappointed that my efforts so far seem to be in vain. Crescenta pressed her fingertips against her cherry-red lips and made a troubled face. Then she casually smashed the last finger of the woman's right hand. If anything, I prefer the image of a good and respectable ruler who is kind to the people. The people are more willing to give their lives that way, right? Well, I can't deny it. From the point of view of seizing power, I don't think it's a bad way to tie them down with fear but... That kind of method will make enemies. Do you know Grabarain? I don't know the details, but, was she poisoned at the end? Crescenta nodded and crouched down. When she was done with the woman's hands, now it was her feet. She took off the woman's shoes, leaving her barefoot, and swung the hammer down again. The woman's fingers were crushed. Even a queen who has built an invincible superpower ends up like that. I don't want to go through the same thing. So, I'm trying to be careful not to make the same mistake. Of course, it's certainly easier to do that. She rhythmically crushed the woman's fingers and pricked her lips. I could smash this woman's face, cut off her limbs, and send the finished product back to the house where she was born, but that would only cause unnecessary resentment, wouldn't it? For a while, they might be afraid of me and obey me, but that kind of hatred won't disappear with time. It would be better to say that she died in an accident during the torture, so that there would be no repercussions later. It is inevitable that a person who wants the queen's life should be tortured and die as a result. Crescenta smashed both toes, then went back to the woman's hands. 
Next she picked up a pair of large, blunt scissors. The woman who had nearly fainted from the pain and fear increased her resistance again. I want to punish her as much as possible, but I want to settle it that way. Well, at this point, I don't care about the noble. She put the woman's fingers between the gaps in the blade, and without hesitation she tightened her grip on the handle. Even as she was gagged, the screams filled the room and echoed. The problem is the public's feelings, is it? That's right. Crescenta turned her gaze to Dargris, wondering if he had any good ideas. Dargris thought for a moment and opened his mouth. If your majesty wants to avoid dishonoring your majesty's name, then your majesty probably needs a substitute. I wonder if that will be the case after all. Crescenta's lips twitched in dissatisfaction. The only thing that makes her look like a child is the way she did that while cutting off the human fingers with scissors. Well, it depends on what happens. Argansama is a break for Wanisama. It's obvious. Crescenta said exasperatedly. Borrowing everyone else's, Wanisama originally had the same disease as me. While pointing to her head. For several days, Chris J and Elvina had been locked in the library of the royal castle. The books piled up in front of her, she quickly put them away and brought a new one. She digests the books at a speed that makes it seem as if she is just rolling up the pages, whether she is reading them or not. The librarians in the library were all mobilized, and they were just working for her. A hectic time continued until she finished reading a random one from a collection of over 10,000 books, and when she was done, Chris J drank the tea Elvina had brewed and crossed her arms. Surprisingly from Elvina's point of view, Chris J seemed calm. Considering her usual appearance of being spoiled by Berry, it felt unnatural, and even when Elvina asked her to rest and eat, she obediently responded without any particular resistance. There are 3,875 items that are described as secret medicines or elixir and have such descriptions. If we exclude those that are considered to be identical or the same, there are 37 of them. Of these, 23 are probably no more than mere medicines, and 12 are of doubtful existence. That leaves two that Chris J thinks are worth trying. Less than expected, Chris J said. The librarians were bewildered by her unusual words, but Elvina was no longer surprised. Her intelligence was on a level that couldn't be compared to that of a normal human being. 2. It looks like it will take some time to find the ingredients for the first one, so let's leave it for later. First, the other one, it looks like it can be done right away. Chris J knows where it is. That is. But even Elvina widened her eyes at those words. She understood what the two, that Chris J was talking about. Krishsama, that's. Chris's only doing what is worth trying. It was the coldest voice she had ever heard. There was no room for objection, and Elvina finally realized there that Chris J was only pretending to be calm. If Celine hears it, she'll say no, so please keep quiet until Chris J goes. Yes. Chris J caressed Elvina's cheeks as if troubled. Chris J doesn't want to get angry at Elvina, and Chris J doesn't want to fight with Celine, so please promise Chris J, okay? Understood. As Chris Sama's will. Until Chris J comes back, please share the workload with Anne and take care of Crescenta and the mansion. With that, Chris J turned away. Chris J Sama, are you leaving now? It was night when the sun had already set. The moonlight was hidden behind clouds, and darkness spread outside the window. N.N. Chris J has some business to do, so Chris will leave the capital after finishing it. It's more convenient at night anyway. The woman ended up hurting the servant. They didn't want her to succeed, so you could say that she did well. Well, the failure is as planned the rest is how the queen will act. Fore Arkasakos sat down on the sofa and sipped a glass of wine. The restless Count Narx looked at Fore in amazement. Ha, huh, how can you be so calm? In the end, it's just what's going to happen. Whether you expect it or get anxious, it doesn't mean that the card you've put down will change. You can think about what will happen after you flip it up. Don't you agree? You may be reluctant, but you resemble your father in that way. I can't do that. Narx, looking even older, takes a sip of wine and sighs. Don't rot like that. I need someone like you on my side. I want to cherish someone who can see things objectively. Father didn't have that kind of existence, so as he got older, his pride grew. 
Foray said, pouring down the wine, rolling it on his tongue and tasting it. It's going well, there's no proof. Even if it didn't go well, my father wouldn't think it was our fault. I hope so. Knox, perhaps wanting to change his mood, headed to the window and Foray smiled wryly. Once everything is over, I'd like to take it easy and go hunting for the first time in a long time. I'm not very good at it, but you must have been good at it right. Hunting. Sounds good. Knox opened the window and answered. Foray wasn't good with swords or bows, but Knox was different. They have different personalities and likes and dislikes. But strangely enough, they got along well. Friendship is not about ability, it's probably something you feel in a different part. Decades of throwing away various things Foray wanted to regain even a little of that. Deer are good. That one I ate when I was young was exceptional. I'm sure the meat was tough but... This time there was a short pause. There was no reply, instead a thud sounded. He frowned and looked at it. Knox was lying on the floor. Foray furrowed his eyebrows thinking he shouldn't have drunk enough to be dead drunk. Then he felt a hard sensation in his throat. Silver flickered at the edge of his vision. Under the fallen Knox's neck he could see a pool of blood spreading there. Foray's breathing almost stopped. W. Wait, do you know who I am? Foray Arkasakos. Heard you are the legitimate son of the Duke of Arkasakos. The voice that tickled his ear was somewhat childish. It was a voice very similar to that of the Queen. The silver hair that's been glimpsed in the edge of his vision. Foray finally understood who's behind him. W. Wait. Why, why me? I swear, I have nothing to do with this incident. Is that so? But either way is fine. What? Ka? Suddenly he couldn't breathe. He couldn't even speak. Instead an eerie thumping sound resounded under his chin. Foray rolled over, feeling a burning pain in his throat. Don't worry. Krish's just killing the nobles of the royal palace who don't follow Kraskenta right now as disobedience to the royal family. It's not like Krishje decided on her own that you're the culprit. The bad, worst, person will die together properly. A sharp pain runs through his right shoulder and he writhes uncontrollably. Chris J doesn't really know who the bad person is, but if Chris J does the same to all of you then that's it. He realized a little later that he had lost feeling in his right arm. I'm doing this because treason is a dismemberment, but if it was not, Chris J might think it was a bit excessive as a punishment for disobedience. But don't worry, creatures will let everyone go through the same thing. It's not like you're the only one who hurts. He stretched out his left arm as if crawling to escape and was immediately amputated. Like a hot knife cutting into a hot butter, Foray lost both. Arms without any resistance. Ah, but Chris J killed Count Narx first, hum? Isn't that a little unfair? Well, Chris will do the same for him later, so after becoming a corpse, both will be the same. Without uttering a single word, he turned around with only his neck. A beautiful silver-haired girl, her eyes sparkled like jewels, purple. Chris J just wants to prevent something like this from happening again. Look, if the room is dirty, you'll clean it, right? Just like that. There was a smile on her lips. Her eyes were icy, full of anger and hatred. Clean up all the bad things, and then Chris J can relax. Then his leg was severed. Kingdom History Years 458 Shortly after the coronation of the new queen on this year, an unprecedented big incident occurred in the royal capital of Albanaria, in which seventeen nobles were slaughtered and their limbs cut off in one night. The culprit was never caught, and there was no eyewitness testimony. There is also a description that all the victims were conservative aristocrats who did not show allegiance to the new Queen Crescenta, and despite the grave murder of the aristocrat, the subsequent investigation was discontinued. For this reason, there was a strong opinion that it may have been caused by Queen Alberin, whose evaluation is still divided, and it is often called the Great Purge of Crescenta. Many memoirs suggest that the main culprit was Crescenta's older sister, Chris J. Christand, but there was no official record of her being tried. Chapter 144, One Who Pierced Through The Suiko is 2.4 meters high at the shoulder, and its total length, including the tail, is about 6 meters. Located northwest of the kingdom and southwest of the imperial state, Mount Arbiagal was home to the Kreshirana clan. 
They were the descendants of the bravest and most powerful of the tribes that once flourished in the northern part of the kingdom, around Gargane. A war of aggression against the kingdom of Alberon that took place about 500 years ago. Defeated, they were driven from their land and fled to this Arbiagal to continue their resistance, but eventually they were exhausted by the endless battle. The mountains, their natural fortress, and the power of the griffins who were their friends, could protect them, but they were worn out after losing the battle and losing the rich plains. The certainty that they will be defeated and destroyed, and the kingdom, knowing this, continues to reject Kreisharana's offer of peace, saying that they will not talk to the barbarians. So, risking the survival of their clan, they pleaded with the dragon that lived in Arbiagal Yaganaz to mediate peace. The dragon listened to the words of the people of Kreisharana, and what is known as the Holy Spirit Covenant was said to have originated from this peace agreement between Alberin and Kreisharana. The founding king of Alberin, who was forced to give up a war that he could win due to the absolute power of the dragon, was not happy that Yaganaz was only joining Kreisharana, so the king gathered the heads and kings of the surrounding countries and held a conference with the dragon. The purpose of the conference was to bring harmony to a world without order, with the dragon as the absolute backing. The great achievement of Bazarish, the founding king of Alberin, who created the Holy Spirit Covenant with an ancient dragon, was spread throughout the continent by the invasion of the powerful queen of Alberin, Grabarain, and the Holy Spirit Covenant was now recognized as an absolute rule in the struggle between nations. Since the start there was no one who did not know the existence of the absolute being who once ruled the world the dragon. The name of the dragon was convenient for conquerors to use as a means of drawing uncivilized barbarians to the negotiating table, and for weaker nations to force conquerors to put down their swords and join them at the table. The reason why the Holy Spirit Covenant is still recognized today was probably due to the fact that its contents are fair to all, and more than that there is the threat that the dragon will burn the entire country to the ground if the Holy Spirit Covenant is violated. At present, there was no story that the dragon Yaganaus actually destroyed a country that did not keep the Holy Spirit Covenant. Because of this, though the Kreisharana were well known along with Alberin, their lives were modest. They now have a religious relationship with the former traitorous Anna imperial state, and although they have not abandoned their ancient customs, they are not an uncivilized barbarian tribe. However they were born in the mountains, grew up in the mountains, and buried their bones in the mountains without leaving the mountains. They lived a peaceful, if not prosperous, life. I'll feed you meat later, but don't eat this. In the forest. A figure with a lot of exposure, with a simple cloth wrapped around her chest and waist a girl with short black hair tied behind her ears and a lovely face said that. She lightly tapped the head of the creature that was about to stick its head into the basket, and scolded it. What was there was a strange creature. It has the face of a bird of prey, like an eagle, and the body of a lion. On its shoulders sprouted a pair of massive wings. Griffin. They were the beasts used in Kreisharana that once tormented the kingdom. Its shoulders were as tall as a girl's waist, but it was probably still a child. The figure that cried Kyuru was somehow pathetic, contrary to its majestic appearance. If you're going to eat it, at least eat the one hanging on the branch. You can fly, so why are you trying to eat the fruit I've worked so hard to pick? The girl held up her finger as if teaching a child. Naturally, they can only understand the cry, sound anime, but they are somewhat smarter than horses. If she kept teaching it like this, it would eventually come to understand, but it was still a naughty child who did not listen to her. That said it was one and a half years old. Well, it can't be helped, she sighed. The griffin was the first child her brother let her take care of. She had been taking care of it since it was born, and she really thinks of it as if it was her little sister. The girl. Lyra smiled while scolding it and gently patted its head. Then she gave it one of the fruits from her basket. The griffin. Larnell squealed with delight and sucked the fruit into his mouth. One might say she was spoiling it too much again, but it was still a child. Lila thought this was just right, it was not a warrior griffin for fighting, but a female for breeding after all. She patted Lanelle's head as she ate the sweet fruit, thinking that everyone was being a little too strict with discipline. Even so, guess we went a little too deep into the woods. Thanks to that, I was able to pick a lot of fruit though. The abundance of fruit means that no one has come this far. At least, it was a place where one could feel safe as usual. 
If it was just tigers and wolves, it was fine, but demonic beasts like Suiko, Ranka, and Ranyoku also lived in this mountain. Even the best selected warriors of the village would risk their lives if they fought against them. If she were to encounter such a beast, she would not be able to escape even on Larnell's back. Let's go back, Larnell. It looks kind of dangerous here. With a Kyuru, as if understanding. Larnell lowered its posture and turned the saddle on its hips toward Lyra. Fufu, good girl, good girl. When we get home, I'll give you some deer meat. It was when Lila said so and was about to straddle Larnell. What? Suddenly, Larnell jerked up and spread her wings as wide as she could. What are you? The roar was lower than usual. Lyra soon realized what it meant. It was the voice of a griffin, indicating alarm, intimidation, and hostility. Larnell walked over and stood in front of Lyra, and beyond it, breaking through the bushes, it appeared. Suiko. It was a tiger monster with beautiful green fur. It has a shoulder height of eight shaku, a large mouth that can eat a person's entire upper body, and log-like limbs. The body, which looked supple, was more than two yu long, including the tail. Slowly and without any caution, the Suiko stood in front of Larnell. Lyra was frightened by the sight of a Suiko for the first time, and fell to her knees on the spot. Not even a wild griffin could stand up to it, and she had no choice but to run for her life. The still young Larnell was no match for it, and the Suiko seemed to understand that. The king of the forest approaches the intimidating Larnell with ease. The distance between them was twenty ken. There seemed to be some distance, but it was already within the Suiko's range. If they tried to escape into the sky, they would be caught. Despite its huge size, Suiko's movement was said to be incomparable to that of a mere tiger. If you are going to hunt a Suiko, you have to deal with it from the sky with a javelin. Even then, the Suikos can leap higher than the trees and prey on the hunters. Lila's brother told her that no creature could match a Suiko at close quarters. La, Larnell, run away. Leave me and... Standing on trembling legs, Lyra told Larnell. There was a decoy. Lila could not escape by using Larnell as a decoy. Then Lyra should be the one to do it. Larnell is a griffin entrusted to her care by her brother. She could not let Larnell be killed. Determined, Lyra stepped in front of Larnell, but again she stiffened. From the direction of Lyra's left hand, the one that appeared from there was a new Suiko. The Suiko in front of her jumped to the side as if on alert, and turned its gaze over there. The magical beast is the ruler of the forest. No two of them can exist in the same place. The newly appeared Suiko groaned and bared its fangs at the previous Suiko. A territorial dispute. Larnell. On second thought I take it back. Run away with me. Lyra hurriedly climbed onto Larnell's saddle. Chait. But before she could jump up, there was a roaring sound. On the side where the new Suiko appeared, something flew through the bush and pierced the body of the first Suiko. A cloud of blood danced in the air, and the Suiko shrieked as it rolled away. A single spear pierced its belly. For the third time, Lyra was completely frozen in surprise. On the side of the new Suiko, a silver shadow that danced out of the bush in her left hand's direction kicked through the stabbing spear that had pierced the fallen Suiko's chest with its heel as if pushing it further. A high-pitched metallic sound, the heel of the boot sparks with the butt end of the spear, and the Suiko's body convulses. The forest supreme ruler did not move again. Hmm, there are a lot of big meow meows here, and they're ferocious. It was not the language spoken in Kreisharana, but the language of the plains. It's good, Krishvii made a meal for Gururun. It's a big game and it's just right. The Suiko that appeared later groaned and approached the girl. Thinking the girl would be eaten, Lyra stiffened for the fourth time. But the Suiko did not show its ferociousness and rubbed its nose against the girl's arm as if asking to be pampered. A little later, a large horse carrying a large amount of luggage and countless spears approached the girl, and the girl patted it gently on the neck. Then she finally looked at Lyra. Are you okay? A little later and you might be eaten hum. Hey, ah, and no. Lyra answered while straddling Larnell. Lila, who couldn't keep up with the sudden development, looked at the Suiko and the horse by the girl's side and got off Larnell wondering if it's safe now. Teach that Suiko. Is it okay? Suiko. 
The silver girl tilted her head and she stared at the Suiko, rubbing its own nose against her. And the girls went ah, clapped her hands together like she finally understood something. Speaking of which, it matches the characteristics written in the book. Chris J thought it was quite a big meow meow, but is this the one called Suiko? I think no matter how you look at it, it's a Suiko and not a cat though. The horse's baggage suggested that the girls were traveling. She looked young to travel, but you can't tell someone's age just by their looks. She was wearing a beautiful cloak of fabric and a dress through this bush. Fluffy white hat and muffler. She did not look like a traveler at all, but Lyra didn't know what life was like on the plains. It might have been normal to travel in such an outfit. She remembered seeing Princess Miko of the Anna Imperial once, who also wore a fluttering outfit like this. Oh, um, thank you very much. For saving me. Chris J just wanted to feed Guru Run, so please don't worry about it. Ah, there should be a river around here but, do you know it? River? Yes, Chris J wants to draw some water, bathe, and cut the meat, if you know, Chris'd like you to guide Chris J. The map wasn't very reliable, so Chris J is a little lost. Lila nodded at those words. In that case, it's probably nearby. Ah, I'll guide you. Having the Suiko drag the Suiko's corpse. Once on the side of the river, the girl ripped open the belly, removed the entrails and laid them in front of Suiko which seems to be called Guru Run. She then wrapped a rope around the hind legs of the gutted Suiko and tried to hang it from a thick tree trunk, but it seemed to be too heavy, so she quickly split its body in half and hung it up separately. She wields a curved sword similar to the warrior's sword used in Kreisharana, and it was possible that she may have a close relationship with the village. Beautiful silver hair. Her face was beautiful to the point of being mystical, and her jewels like purple eyes. The clothes she wore were all of high quality, and the Suiko hunt she just witnessed was truly just a hunt. It was not a fight. She remembers the legend of the hunter god fairy of Kreisharana, and Lyra looked at her beautiful form, wondering if she was the fairy of that legend. Even though it's winter, it's pretty warm here. There's no snow. Her skin was like snow with no tan. The girl said while carefully wiping it. Her well-shaped breasts and buttocks, her tight waist, and her long, slender limbs. Her nude body was also like a work of art and was something you couldn't help but admire. Well, it's very hot in the summer, but in the winter it's always like this. Does that mean it's close? Question mark. The girl said, when she got out of the water, and put on her clothes, after them with a dry cloth and she shook her body a little and warmed her body by the fire, drying her wet hair. But, as expected, it's cold after all. Esso, you're a normal person in that way. Lyra was a little relieved to know that even though she was a fairy, she could still feel cold. A normal person? No, no. Mm, you have the Suiko tagging along with you, and the techniques you used to hunt earlier. I wondered if it was Rashurna-sama, who was said to be the god of hunters. You got the wrong person. Chris Che is not. The girl looked at Lyra and went ah as if she understood something. Chris J haven't tell Chris's name yet right? Chris's name is Chris J Christand. Chris Sama. My name is Lyra Shorana. Lyra stood up in a panic, and she bowed her head deeply. Chris J met Gururun three days ago, and it's strangely attached to Chris J, so Chris J brought it along. There are a lot of Suiko around here. There's also a big, blue deer. Maybe it's because the area around here has a lot of fluffy fluffy, Fuyo Fuyo, Chris's name for magical power. That's probably Ranka. A deer magical beast as tall as a hut. It was a genuine monster that could knock down trees just by running. I see, there are a lot of magic beasts that Chris V.E. never seen before. It's good that they're big and have a good flavor, but it would be nice if the meat was a little softer. Guru Run was very happy to eat it though. This Suiko was what Chris J met three days ago when she was dismantling a giant blue deer ranker. A big meow meow that threatened her even while looking frightened. Chris J had already encountered and killed several of them, but the meat was tough except for the belly, and the amount was too many, so Chris J didn't really want to kill it. For Chris J, who grew up in a hunter's family, it's not very pleasant to kill an animal that she couldn't even finish eating. The deer she had killed wasn't small enough to be finished all by herself, so she cut off some of its meat and gave it to the Suiko as a test after that, she spent three days with this Suiko. 
Lyra looks at the girl in amazement. Due to its large size, Ranko was a more formidable magic beast than Suiko in some cases. But this girl probably hunted it all by herself. Chris J skinned the tiger hanging from the tree and cut off the meat from its girth and roasted it on the fire. The limbs were stringy and hard, but the belly meat was reasonably tender and fatty. Do you want to eat too, Lyra? Hey, um, if I may. When someone hunt a magical beast, a feast would be held in the village. The meat was usually eaten by the men, as it was believed that eating the meat of the beast will give you its power, and Lyra never tasted it. Chris J sprinkled salt and spices over the meat to slightly adjust the flavor and adjust the heat. The fat dripped and bounced on the fire, and the smell of the meat tickled her nostrils, making Lyra's stomach rumble. Mmm, does this bird eat child meat too? Hum. Ah, yes. Griffin is an omnivore, but they would prefer to eat meat. Chris J cuts off one of Suiko Corpse's legs and places it in front of Larnell. The precious Suiko meat it was so luxurious that Lyra looked at Chris J uncomfortably, wondering if it was really okay. This is a griffin, it flies in the sky, doesn't it? Chris J ignored the gaze and looked at the griffin's wings and waist saddle. Yes, she is only one and a half years old, but she can fly with someone my size. Compared to adults, her flying still has a long way to go though. Chris J nibbled at the grilled meat while looking at Griffin with interest. As if waiting for that, the Suiko finally took a bite of the meat that was placed in front of it. Even as Lyra was surprised that the Suiko seems to have completely recognized Chris J as its master, she receives one of the skewers and bites into the meat. The fat-dripping belly meat has a rich flavor, with just the right amount of salt and tangy spices. It probably had to do with how it's cooked. It tasted better than any meat Lyra had ever eaten. Delicious. Hmm, it smells a bit. Chris J didn't drain enough blood. It would have been nice if Chris J could have caught it alive. It was insane to catch a green tiger alive. Lyra withdrew a little, but she was dumbfounded by Chris J who calmly said that. She regarded the green tigers that the warriors risk their lives to challenge as mere prey to hunt. Lyra was getting more and more confused about this girl. She wasn't a normal human being, and it was easier to be convinced if someone told her the girl was a hunter god, just as Lila thought she was. The girl took a frying pan from her back while giving the horse a radish. She melted the fat in the frying pan, and then roasted the cut pieces of meat over the fire. The rich aroma of the meat tickled Lyra's nostrils again and made her drool in her mouth. The technique was brilliant, the meat was lightly seasoned and cooked, and the juices were transferred to another pan, where they were used to make a sauce with wine, honey, and fruit. Then the meat was cooked again, placed on a wooden plate, cut into pieces, and topped with the sauce a full course of the most exquisite meat she had never tasted in the village. The seasoning, the degree of cooking, all of it was so delicious that her cheeks might fall off. Chris J continued to cook, looking happy to see Lyra eating the delicious, delicious meat. First appetite rather than trivial questions. Lyra tasted the meat with Chris J until she was full, and then she wondered about the family name, Christ and. The name Christ and did not sound familiar to her. However, none of the imperial state people who visited here had a surname. M, is Krishsama by any chance, someone from the kingdom? Even though a person from Kresharana hates luxury and usually wore simple clothing, they could tell if the clothes the other person was wearing were of high quality or not. The hat and scarf are hand-knitted of wool and yarn, but the wearer wore a smooth, seamless, high-quality cloak and dress. At the very least, she is not a mere commoner. She must be a member of the upper class in her circle. However, the upper class of the imperial state a priest doesn't not give their surname because they have abandoned their surname. That said, she didn't look like a merchant, it was that kind of process of elimination. Yes. I I knew it. Lyra made a troubled face. People of the imperial state were allowed to visit here, but not people of the kingdom. It was five hundred years ago but there were still many people in the village who showed disgust and hatred towards the people of the kingdom. Kresharana does not tolerate the people of the kingdom, even if they are travelers. This is the land of Kresharana. I don't know if you know it, but the people of Kresharana hate the kingdom, so you better get off the mountain early. That's just right. Maybe Lyra is also someone from Kresharana, right? Hum. Hmm. Yes, just right. 
Could she be a messenger of the kingdom or something? Lyra hastily straightened her back. Chris J is looking for a dragon now. Yaganau's Sama? Yes, I was wondering if someone from Kraysharana knew. Chris J knows the dragon is in this mountain, but Chris J doesn't really know the exact location. An audience with the Holy Spirit. This was a big deal. Even the people of the village were not allowed to approach it except when offering tribute. If you want an audience with Yaganau Sama, you must first ask the elders. Besides, even if the kingdom suddenly asks for an audience, whether it will be granted. I see, it's not an audience, but it seems troublesome after all. Chris J put her fingertips to her lips and stared at Lyra. It's a cute gesture, but somehow a chill ran down her spine. What do you mean it's not an audience? Chris J wants to ask Lyra for guidance. Chris J came to kill that dragon called Yaganaus. Hum. Chris J wants the heart of a dragon, said Chris J. With a snap, the blade was pressed against Lyra's neck. She moved so fast that Lyra didn't even notice that the blade had been pulled out. Chris J doesn't want to kill Lyra, who Chris J just helped out, and Chris J also doesn't want to be killed by Lyra, that's why Chris J wants Lyra to respond honestly. A, hey, you, K Krishsama, you're joking, aren't you? No. Chris J is not joking, Chris J is serious. With a troubled face, the girl named Chris J looked into Lila's eyes. The jewel-like purple color just let out an inorganic sparkle. If Lyra can't guide Chris J, Chris J LL have to go and ask each and every one of the people in the Kresharana clan. Please think about which is more important, faith or village, and decide what to do. Lyra recalled the figure of the girl who killed Suiko as if she was hunting a rabbit. Faith or village, she was asking seriously. Larnell noticed the situation and spread her wings and roared menacingly. In front of Larnell, the Suiko was standing in its way. Chris J doesn't really want to do bad things. But if Chris J were to look around randomly, Chris J sure Krish'd run into one of you and end up killing each other, right? Chris J would have to kill them if they got in Krish's way, that's why as much as possible Chris J is asking Lyra to do this to avoid that. The blade didn't even twitch. It was really not a joke or anything. The strange look she saw earlier told her that the words weren't just a joke. She was serious when she said that. Krish's aim is not to Krasharana, but the heart of a dragon. But if Lyra says that she won't guide Chris J, Chris J can only think it can't be helped, so please think carefully before answering. Lyra gulped. A dragon is not just a mere creature. It was a fundamentally different existence from magic beasts. Its power can destroy even nations and distort and change the terrain. A dragon slayer. It was not a sane behavior. It was a reckless barbaric act, like stabbing a blade into the heavens. But she said that she was going to kill the dragon on top of being aware of that. Please reconsider. No matter how strong Krishsama is, challenging Yaganalsama is too reckless. If you touch Yaganalsama's wrath, even the kingdom you live in will perish. Lyra imagined the catastrophe that would happen in the future and said so. It was not just about her own life. In some cases, the enraged Holy Spirit could destroy everything in the vicinity. It's okay. You don't have to worry about that. A dragon can't do that. As if it were an indisputable fact. As if it were an absolute principle. The girl, just, asserts with her purple eyes. Because that dragon is going to be killed by Chris J. Lila didn't know. The words were not a joke, nor were they reckless, it was the distorted and crazy Alberin in front of her. For what she desires, the only one who would not hesitate to thrust her blade into heaven. She is the one and only cursed sword that pierces everything that stands in its way. End of Volume 6